Morning, everyone, we might get underway. I declare open this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. Today, the committee will continue its examination of the additional estimates for 2021-2022. The committee will hear from the department and agencies of the finance portfolio as listed on today's program. The committee is also scheduled a further hearing on Friday the 18th of February for the cross-portfolio Indigenous matters. The committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure the additional estimates 2021-2022 hearings are conducted in a COVID safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering to these arrangements. Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session, and this includes answers to questions on notice. The committee would appreciate if senators could please provide any written questions on notice to the Secretariat by Friday the 4th of March 2022. However, reminds all senators as well as departments and agencies that written questions on notice can be provided at any time. The committee has fixed Friday the 25th of March 2022 as the date for the return of answers to questions taken on notice. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimates hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations from the parliament or its committees unless the parliament has expressly provided otherwise. I particularly draw the attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009, specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. The Senate has also resolved that an officer of a department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. An officer called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly and into the microphones to assist Hansard to record proceedings. I remind everyone in the hearing room to switch off your mobile phone and other devices or turn them to silent. I also remind those senators and witnesses appearing via video conference who are not speaking to mute your microphones. Officers are requested to keep opening statements brief or seek to incorporate longer statements into the Hansard. Finally, the committee has agreed to allow media into the hearing room. In doing so, the committee reminds the media that they must follow the directions of the committee and the secretariat and remain within those areas clearly marked for the media. In addition, recording must not occur from behind the committee or between the committee and the witnesses, and computer screens and documents belonging to senators must not be filmed, photographed or recorded. Witnesses are reminded that they can object to being recorded at any time. And the committee thanks the media in advance for maintaining a COVID safe approach while in the hearing room. It being after 9am, I welcome the Minister for Finance, Senator the Honourable Simon Birmingham, Ms Rosemary Huxtable, Secretary of the Department of Finance and via video conference, Mr Stuart Wiley, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of ASC Proprietary Limited and other officers. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement at this time? Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Senators. Yesterday was so much fun. Let's uh, do it again. But uh, I don't have an opening statement. Mr Wiley may. Uh, Ms Huxtable, do you wish to make an opening uh, statement no, at this time? No, thank you, Chair. Mr Wiley, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, thank you, Chair. Very good. Uh, Senator Smith, I'll give the call to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr Wiley. Um, in response to a uh, question on notice number 51, when you were asked what role ASC expected to play in the construction of the new submarines, you said that no decision had been taken yet. Can I ask what expertise ASC could provide to this program if you were called upon? Um, I, I think, as I said last time as a Senate estimates, um, 
ASC is obviously the, um, the country's premier uh, submarine agency from an engineering perspective and build perspective. Um, we, over the last 30 years, built a, a huge wealth of knowledge in what it was to build the Collins class and now to sustain the Collins class. Um, so I think coming to the future, you know, we could bring a lot of those lessons learned and that capability to support that program, those programs for the, the nuclear program. But. And no, no decision by government has been taken since that response as to your role? You don't have any clarity on that? N not at this stage, no. OK. Um, what are you doing to get ready to participate in that process? How are you planning to sort of develop the skill set that you might need um, to support the, the nuclear powered submarine program in terms of training programs or secondments your ASA employees may need to take? Um, again, as I as mentioned at the last Senate hearing, um, ASC has been uh, contracted to by the SSTP, which is the Sovereign Shipbuilding Talent Pool, to uh, build um, a capability of uh, uh, workforce that could be used to seed a future nuclear build environment. Um, that, that capability is looking across uh, a number of streams of work, including overseas placement to uh, educational and industrial uh, capabilities to bring, to bring up our nuclear scrap, uh, a learning and development program associated with what is to be a, a workforce to build a, a, a nuclear submarine, and also um, you know, support uh, in terms of direct taskings into the task force itself. Right. But beyond the SSTP, I've got further questions on that program in a moment, but beyond that, what are you doing to get ready? I mean, it will be ultimately your responsibility for ensuring the success of this program. So how are you preparing for that beyond the SSTP? So from a business uh, operating model perspective, what we've done is actually quarantine um, the, the Collins business unit, so we continue to make sure we're successful and, and maintain the delivery of, of the Collins business unit. And we've set up a separate business unit inside the organisation to look at what's required from uh, a nuclear program perspective and how we, uh, you know, what capabilities we need to build to bring forward to help us in our best endeavours to support the, that national endeavour. And can you share with me anything that has that unit has identified? So at this point in time, we're, we're just we're in the uh, the process of uh, building up that workforce. So obviously, that some of that workforce will be seeded by members that are coming across to the SSTP. But we've actually gone to overseas uh, and recruited some nuclear scrap. Uh, we've actually gone through our process of identifying uh, what nuclear experience we've got in, uh, as a core business capability inside our organisation today, and. Uh, We've identified those skills, core skills inside our business and how they can be utilised inside those future endeavours. Um, at this stage, it's really quite early in terms of our preparatory work, but generally our focus has been, over this last three to four months, has been supporting the SSTP. Hey, can I ask about the Nuclear Powered Submarine Task Force? How many ASC employees are on that task force? Um, we're not actually working inside the task force. We're actually supporting the task force. Um, you know, as I said, one of the screens that we have inside the SSTP is to provide expert advice into the task force, and uh, we have uh, some individuals reporting at this point in time. So, what sort of support are they providing? Um, today, um, that support uh, is primarily in an infrastructure uh, 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 case, but we are looking to potentially provide support in other areas such as AIC and supply chain. Okay. So how do you provide that support and that advice when we don't yet have a specification for the type of nuclear submarine to be built? So that comes from taskings that have come directly from the task force itself? Yes, but, but what sort of advice are you providing? You mentioned some of, some of the advice you're providing in terms of infrastructure, a response to a corn also references workforce training, supply chain, industrial base. But how do you provide that advice specifically when you're not yet sure what is to be built? Um, I mean, at, at this point in time, obviously, we, you know, as, as you indicate, there's no platform collected. However, there is a, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in preparatory work in terms of that that's generic to uh, a nuclear you know, builder, whether it be you know, uh, US or UK. And you know, we can do, we can consider what, what we can actually do to support that in that generic sense. In terms of infrastructure, we can inform potentially what the infrastructure may or may not look like based on uh, the requirements for a nuclear build. Same way we can consider you know, what we have in the country today in terms of 
you know, the base uh, foundations of a supply chain. There's a number of things we can do to consider ahead of selection of a platform. Okay. And Mr. Wiley, are you aware of over the next 18 months, whilst the consult consultation period is taking place, of any paid work available to Australian businesses that they can undertake on the new submarine program? Um, well, uh, ASC is getting funded for the work it's undertaking in support of the task force. Is that your question? No, my question is over the next 18 months, while we're waiting for a decision to be made, are you aware of any paid work being available to Australian businesses to support the program? Oh, that, that would be a question for the task force. Okay, Minister, is that something you can shed light on? Um, Senator, I, yeah, I imagine the task force will be drawing on whatever skills they see they need in terms of uh, external expertise or otherwise, but, uh, but that is a question really for Vice Admiral Mead and Defence. But, but your expectation is yes, there will be paid work for Australian businesses? Um, well, Senator, uh, that, let's say, that is a question for Vice Admiral Mead and for Defence in terms of um, what additional skills or information they need to draw on. Okay. Will Australian industry be engaged in any contracted work on the new nuclear submarine program in the next 18 months? That includes a working relationship with ASA. We'll separate perhaps uh, the, uh, the two components there. The first part in terms of the general will any Australian businesses is really your previous question. Um, and so, uh, so I'd refer you to Vice Admiral Mead and the task force in terms of what their needs will be, um, in terms of whether ASC would need to contract anybody for the role ASC is providing in terms of providing information to the task force? I suspect the answer to that would be no, but uh, um, uh, Mr Wiley can confirm that and, uh, and if need be add more generally to where ASC uh, is contracting Australian businesses and industry. Okay. I want to go to some questions on life of type extension now, Mr Wiley, um, and I'm going to reference uh, the answer uh, to supplementary budget estimates question on notice number one. Um, Senator Wong asked at the last estimates about the potential extension of uh, LOAT. And in the response to the question on notice, um, you said, oh, sorry, uh, Senator Wong asked if ASA was aware of any other country having done a second round of LOAT. Uh, in response to that question, you said that ASC had not undertaken research in regard to whether submarine fleets owned by other nations had undergone more than one life of type extension. It doesn't really answer the question from Senator Wong. Since that answer, or indeed since it was first floated at the Economics References Committee that there may be another round of load, has ASC done any further research to identify where this may have happened overseas? Uh, no, we haven't. Why not? Uh, well, at this stage, I think the second round of a uh, load is a hypothetical question, and certainly a question for defence, not of ASC. But given ASC would ultimately be responsible for delivering that second round, surely you would have done some research since the Chief of Navy floated it as to what that might look like if it has been done before to inform your potential work on that project? Um, currently, we're focused on uh, the load program itself. We, we, we're not contemplating uh, a second round. Government has not directed us to consider a second round of uh, load. Um, so we, we, we're focused our efforts on, on the first, you know, like the first round of load at this point in time. But is that correct, Minister? Because the Chief of Navy flagged that. So is it correct that there won't be a second round of load? Uh, well, Senator, such decisions would be uh, likely some distance away. Um, ASC is contracted uh, by defence to, uh, to deliver uh, the life of type extension. That's starting in 2026 in terms of when, uh, when Farmcom will come in for, uh, for that work to begin, um, and that runs over a period of time from there. Um, if uh, if Defence uh, want advice from ASC in relation to uh, their knowledge and, uh, and potentials for, uh, for a further load um, uh, many years down the track, um, that's a matter that, uh, that, of course, I'm sure ASC would then, at that time, if, uh, if Defence asked, uh, research and provide that analysis. But Minister, this would be a significant project, so surely someone in government has considered whether a second round of load has been done on a submarine fleet elsewhere in the world. Have you considered that or asked that question? Uh, well, Senator, uh, Senator I, uh, I back the, uh, the knowledge and skills of Chief of Navy uh, ahead of my own in terms of, uh, in terms of the management of, uh, of uh, naval fleets, including submarine fleets. 
um, uh, the decision in terms of whether um, uh, Navy and government wish to investigate further LOAT projects beyond uh, the one commencing in 2026 um, you know, is a decision that has not yet been taken. Uh, um, and as I say, if, uh, if Navy want to work that up, then, um, uh, then you know, they may ask ASC for analysis or advice at that time. But, OK, well, since the Chief of Navy made that comment, have you spoken to him about what that would look like or what that may mean, Minister? No, Senator. And Mr Wiley, have you had a conversation with the Chief of Navy about that? No, I haven't. No. I just, that really surprises me given how substantive that project would be and Mr Wiley, your role in delivering it, um, given you're leading that entity and Minister, given the significance of that to our submarine capability. So I just want to be absolutely clear, no one in government has asked the question, undertaken the search term, spoken to colleagues overseas about whether this has happened anywhere else in the world. Well, Senator, uh, the government's priority uh, at present is ensuring that the LOAT program um, for the Collins class that commences in 2026 um, uh, is delivered um, as efficiently and successfully as possible. And I have complete confidence, given the uh, um, exemplary work ASC has done in recent years in terms of the maintenance and availability of the Collins class, that they will be well placed to deliver on that life of type extension commencing in 2026 uh, for, uh, for the Collins class fleet. Um, the other priority in relation to the submarine fleet uh, is the work around the nuclear powered submarine task force uh, and ensuring that uh, we have conclusion within the 18 month time frame uh, around the model for delivery of nuclear powered submarines and building and construction of them in Australia uh, and uh, getting the first of those, as the Minister for Defence has highlighted, um, delivered as soon as possible. Um, now, I would imagine in terms of further contemplation of any uh, additional extension of the Collins class fleet, uh, you would want to see um, uh, logically those decisions um, around the nuclear powered submarines and some certainty around timelines for those settled before you would start having the types of conversations you think should have been occurring um, uh, in, uh, in the last few months. Uh, there's, a, there's a crucial piece of work there uh, that uh, the defence uh, are doing around the task force, which is all about determining um, the means and the model and the type and the process uh, for construction of those nuclear powered submarines. And at that point, we will also then have greater certainty and clarity around the likely delivery schedule for them. Sure, Minister, but given the challenges which have beset this program over the past years and given the uncertainty in the future about our capability and capacity as a nation, surely if the Chief of Navy floats an idea like this of a further round of load, oh, someone Senator, in your government would Senator, have asked Senator, a question Senator, about what that might look like Senator, or what that might mean. Senator Smith, I think you're verbaling the Chief of Navy right now. I don't think he floated oh, an me, idea right. I think that's I, a very unfair characterisation, Chair. Uh, well, that is a very unfair character. I think it's very. I did not the minister, the chief the of I, I think it's a very accurate. I don't think I chief think that's of navy. Absolutely unfair, senator. I, I referenced a comment made by the chief of navy, and I asked if your government I, had asked a question after he put this I, idea I, forward I, at a references committee. And I'd like you to apologise. I did not verbal <laughs> the chief of navy. That's ridiculous. Senator Smith, the minister is responding to your Senator, question. Senator Smith. Uh, I don't think the Chief of Navy was floating an idea. I think he was responding to questions. The Chief of Navy presented the idea of a, round of, a second round of vote at the committee hearing. I have not verbaled the Chief of Navy. I find that deeply offensive, Minister. And I think you know that. I think that was deeply inappropriate and deeply offensive. My questions are, when, when has your government made any further inquiries or taken any questions as to whether what, that, what this may look like. And your answer is clearly no, that you haven't, you haven't done that. Oh, Senator, Senator Smith, uh, my answer is clearly that there are priorities for Navy and for government for ASC at present. For ASC, it's delivering the life of type extension that doesn't actually even commence in terms of the first boat coming in until 2026 and getting that work done. And ASC are doing an exemplary job uh, in terms of uh, the current maintenance of the Collins class, the availability of the Co Collins class, uh, and now working through with defence the scoping uh, of that life of type extension, uh, and I have full confidence in them in terms of the delivery of it. Um, if you were to contemplate 
Uh, and I'm not the expert here, uh, Mr Wiley may, uh, may wish to add, but if you were to contemplate a second life of type extension, I imagine that, for example, the learnings from the first life of type extension would be an important input to that, Senator Smith. So, uh, so in fact, what ASC will learn as they start that process of the first life of type extension about the Collins class fleet, um, the state of them at present, what they can achieve from the life of type extension will all be important information in, uh, in that regard. Um, Navy uh, has a very clear priority in defence uh, for the government in relation to the nuclear powered submarine program. So I appreciate you're wanting to ask questions uh, about a matter quite some steps potentially down the track, uh, but the current priorities are very well defined, very clearly defined, and, uh, and that's what um, Defence, Navy, ASC are all variously getting on with. Mr Wiley, as has been discussed previously, and the Minister referred to it previously, the first Collins class submarine is due for late in 2026. Is that still the date and the time frame that ASC is working towards? That's correct. The implementation of the HMS Barnacle in 2026 is the first implementation of late. OK. And Mr Wiley, at the last estimates, you confirmed that Rankin will be in the water until 2048. Is that still the anticipated lifespan of HMAS Rankin? That's correct, yes. OK. Um, I want to come back to the SSTP now, Mr Wiley. I noted that the advertiser got the scoop before the Senate on some of these figures, but if we can go through them together. Um, how many people have applied for the SSTP? Uh, the number of eligible workers that have applied is 294. 294. And how many have successfully applied? So of that 294, 53 have withdrawn. Uh, we made 288 offers and today 222 have accepted. 222, okay. And Previously, Mr Wiley, you've characterised the SSTP as having five work streams. Um, the core Collins class sustainment work, seconding persons into other shipbuilding programs, um, placing displaced people into overseas secondments with the nuclear industries and universities overseas, establishing a future focused learning and development program and providing people into the nuclear powered task force. Have those people, the 200 and 222 who've successfully applied for the SSTP been notified as to which stream they will be allocated to as yet? So um, of the 222 who have been successful, 112 have actually transitioned across into ASC. Um, we've got another 30 that are in transition at this point in time. Um, those employees are being taken into, uh, into the core work streams inside ASC. So the majority of those are currently working inside the, the Collins and Lake programs and then supporting some other taskings. Okay, I'm just not clear on your answer. So have they been made aware of which stream they'll be going in or not? So uh, the, the, the people who have started have jobs and have been not obviously they're notified in the role they're actually operating, yes. Okay, and can you just clarify what number that was? That was 112 who... No. 112 people at this point in time, yeah. And the uh, others. All, all, so, sorry, sorry. All, all of them, all of them, we notified what department or what uh, part of the organisation they're going to be working for. Okay, so all, of the 112 all the, or of the 222. All, all, all the 222 have been had an offer and been told what department they're going to okay. be working for and their role. Are you able to provide to the committee a breakdown of the 222 workers and which stream that they'll be moving into? Um, I won't be able to provide the, the stream because obviously that's quite fluid as the, as the streams evolve and the work scope evolve. Also the streams are available to other ASC workers so they're, they're coming in to be an ASC employee. So those streams are not just limited for the Naval Group and LMA affected workers. Those streams are going to be available for the entire ASC workforce. So the, as the roles come up you know, on a case by case basis, people will apply for them. So it's not appropriate that I can provide that. But I can certainly give you a breakdown of um, where they sit inside the corporation and what department and where they're going to work as, as a core capability, if you like. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. And if I understand what you're saying, but if it's possible to provide a more detailed breakdown, even if it's at a point in time noting the fluidity in the movement of, of staff, that would be appreciated. But I take your point. So if that's not possible, if you could provide the other information. Okay. Um, Senator Smith, you've been going for about 20 minutes and I do want to share the call around a little. 
um, because we have Senator Patrick here, who I'm sure is very interested in this topic, and I'd like to ask a couple of questions as well. I've probably got about six more questions. Is that all right to work through that? Yep, let's work through that, and then I'll go to Senator Patrick. Okay. How many ASC staff have left since the AUKUS announcement on 16 September 2021? Um, bear with me. I don't think I have that information here. I'll just have a look. Um, I don't think I have that specific... I'll take that question on notice. OK. Um, you've previously referenced the Future Focus Learning and Development Program, which will be part of the SSTP. Have any ASC staff been sent to any training programs specifically in relation to nuclear submarines or nuclear engineering? Not at this stage. We're currently going through a market scan to understand what the learning and development program uh, scope may be. Uh, once we have that uh, scope fully finalised, we'll sit down and share that with uh, the, the, the task force uh, to develop an action plan to deliver that. Okay. And has ASC sought to recruit any nuclear engineers or personnel with specific skill sets in nuclear submarine technology? Yes, we have. Okay. Can you expand on that, please? Um, as part of setting up, a, a, if you like, a separate uh, division inside the company to look at focus on nuclear, um, I've uh, recruited uh, three uh, nuclear... Ex I'm in the process of recruiting three nuclear sweat uh, who work at executive level. OK. Um, just some questions on workforce. Um, I note that you provided some answers regarding uh, your recruitment of skilled employees on notice. But can you tell me how many skilled positions at ASC currently remain vacant? Um, again, I think I have, would have to take that question on notice. Okay, uh, can you tell me how many skilled roles ASC is actively trying to fill right now? Um, again, I don't have that data in front of me. I would take that question on notice. Okay, can you tell me what concerns ASC has about the current availability of suitably skilled technical and engineering people available to fill positions with ASC? Currently, I, I, I believe that we certainly have got the, in terms of our Collins work scope and the late work scope, we, we have a plan to address that. That has been certainly helped by the transition of you know, um, a large proportion of engineering capability that's come from those groups. So generally, I think uh, in terms of columns and load space, we have what we need. Obviously, the, we're not sure at this point on what our scope may be inside the support of the task force, and you know, that will develop. So in terms of what I know today, I don't believe we've got any specific the concerns on any specific uh, technical skills or traits. OK. Um, now, in terms of the facilities Naval Group have been using, has there been any consultation with Naval Group and yourself around how these facilities might be used to transition to nuclear-powered submarines or what the impact will be on that infrastructure? Um, so, so I'm not quite following your, your question in terms of what facilities are you referring to? So the current facilities being used to develop the future subs program and the work which has been undertaken so far, when we transition to building nuclear submarines, whatever they may look like, obviously there will need to be some kind of calibration or review of the facilities being used to date or being built to date. Have you had any consultation regarding those facilities? Um, that, that's really a question for the task force there, obviously looking at the, the investment for what they've made in infrastructure to date, and they will be, I'm sure that'll be part of their considerations for the future. Okay. I just have uh, one further question on the SSTP. Um, can you just, there was, um, sorry, just give me a moment. Actually, if you can, can I come back to this after you, Rex? Is that all right to come back for one more? I do want to ask a couple of questions after Senator Patrick, but yes, we'll give the call to him and we'll circle back to you. Thank you. Senator Thanks. Thanks. Senator Patrick. Who knows, I might ask your question. Maybe. Uh, you Senator. might. You sorry. might read my mind today, Senator yes. Patrick. OK. Um, uh, good morning, Mr White. I just want to go uh, to a, a couple of topics that, that have been talked about. Um, the Nuclear Submarine Task Force, how many people have you got working on that? Uh, directly into the task force? Yes. Today? I think um, basically directly is contracted one. So it's a contract of one, did you say? At this point, at this point in time, yes. 
Okay, so that's a. Um, so, so it's not like you've been given some sort of support contract for the task group. It's it's simply a, a time and materials contract, is it? Yeah, we we, we receive taskings um, from the nuclear task force. There are a number of taskings that are can be considered, and we're looking at how we respond to those taskings. But specifically, providing advice into the task force today, we have one person. Okay, and you've engaged the task force, I imagine, to let them know your capabilities and what you're prepared to do in terms of assistance? Yeah, that's correct. We have, we've had numerous meetings with the task force to, to um, engage them in terms of our broad capabilities and how we can support them. So those, those conversations are ongoing and uh, very fruitful. Um, in the past, General Dynamics has had uh, personnel based at Osborne. Uh, are, they, are they still there and are they going to play any role in the, uh, uh, in, in the nuclear submarine task force or uh, indeed the still, program? We, we currently don't have any EB workers uh, working here at Osborne, um, but we still have a relationship with EB. Um, they're, they're, we have no engagement with EB relating to this particular when, uh, when did that stop and why? Um, I believe it, it was... It's actually, it hasn't stopped, it's actually on pause. Um, I, look, I'll take the question on notice to actually give you the actual date. It was, it was only, I believe, 12 months ago or something like that. I, I'll take the question on notice. Okay, thank you. Um, just in relation to the task, uh, the, the sovereign shipbuilding ta talent pool, um, I think I got the numbers right. You said you've got 223 accepted, 135 that had, been, that had joined the company. Is that right? Did I hear that? Um, right? No, just bear with me a second. Let's get my numbers. So there's 112 that actually commenced inside the company. Right? And we have 30 that's currently sitting in, a, we have a transition centre in Port Adelaide and they're going through a, a transition and an induction system process at the Sorry, time. that was 3 zero? Yeah, 3 zero, yes. Thank you. I might have walked past them when I was out of that building. Can you tell me, um, how long have you been at leasing that, the building at Port Adelaide? Um, October, we took that building over in October to establish that uh, you know, immediate transition centre so we could, you know, with the guys and girls in the um, Naval Group being in Port Adelaide, it was an obvious place to, to move in effectively. And so Naval Group have vacated the uh, western part of that building. Is it your intention to take that over? You, you, you're sort of in the centre sandwich between the Fishing Academy and Naval Group. No, it's, uh, we, we, our footprint is pretty well fixed. We're not going to take on any more space in that building. So is it, is it, is it a lease arrangement or a, some sort of hire arrangement? Um, I'm going to have to cover it's, lease. It's a lease? Yeah. It's a lease arrangement. How long is the lease for? Uh, to the end of March. We, we've, I'm told we've got to the end of March next year with options for extension. Okay, thank you. Um, so with this... Uh, talent pool of 112 people with 30 being transitioned now how is that paid for is is that is there some uh time and material contract between you and the commonwealth uh to, to pay for that yeah we, we have an agreement with the the, the commonwealth for uh, the sstp that provides funding for uh staff um Obviously, those those members that come on and join Collins or Lope, they will get funded directly uh, through those contracts. Others that effectively may be surplus to requirements that enter into a training program, they will get funded through the, the, the SSTP uh, funding arrangements. So, bottom line is, if you can sell them out to a task like Collins or Lote or um, perhaps the, the future um, submarine task force, although there's only one person there, then, then you bear the cost. If, if they're, for want of a better word, idle, getting trained, then the Commonwealth bears the cost. Uh, yeah, the, the intention is that we obviously don't want anybody idle. We've, the whole problem of putting the program of the five streams of work is to create an environment to grow and nurture that capability required for that future build requirement. You know, there's going to be um, overseas deployments, uh, training programs, you know, direct taskings into the task force. And as I said, there's only one today, but I'm sure in a very short period of time, it'll be uh, uh, more people will be working, supporting the task force. So you have a contract in place for the Commonwealth that allows you to bring these people on. If you sell them out to your own 
genuine tasks, you bear the cost. Um, if you, if they're in a holding pattern doing um, useful things, but not your contracted tasks, then the, the contract then says that you can recover that cost from the Commonwealth. That's correct. How, how long does that contract go for? So it's a, it's a three year contract with options to extend for two, uh, another three years, two years plus one year, I think it's broken Okay, down. so you said this is to prepare for the future submarine build. Um, do you have a timeline associated with that or is that, that just built into that flexibility of the, of, of the contract? The, the, really, the, the time for, we, we don't have that, but that would be a question for the, the task force. Uh, yes and no. You, you run a business, you're responsible for its bottom line. Uh, you must uh, be looking forward. That's, a, that's a, a, a job that would be the responsibility of the CEO. You're taking these people on. There is in some sense a, uh, 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 even a, a, if not a legal obligation, a moral obligation to be able to you know, give these people a future. I'm just wondering about the, the sort of lens that you're looking through. How long are you looking out in terms so of these I, people? Look, I, I, you know, as I said, the, the, this, this is um, you know, preparatory work. What we're doing is preparatory work for that for, uh, future build environment. The, the, obviously, the task force will consider the schedule for that build. Uh, the contract we have um, is flexible enough to dovetail into whatever that schedule, I believe, potentially has been developed by the task force. Of the people that you've got, how many people came from AS, uh, from um, uh, Naval Group and how many people came from Lockheed Martin? So, um, 211 came from Naval Group and 11 came from Lockheed Martin. Well, so of the accepted, what people have accepted, 211 came from Naval Group and 11 came from uh, Lockheed Martin. Mm. Of the people who actually commenced, 101 came from uh, Naval Group and 11 came from Lockheed Martin. Now, on the basis that you have an obligation to defence to um, to, or an agreement with defence to charge these people to particular jobs or indeed charge the Commonwealth, then um, I find it difficult to accept the answer you gave Senator Smith that you don't know where these people have gone. Um, I accept you might not have the, the numbers at hand, but you know, people that come in the door won't be sitting there for now three months um, not, not having been given some direction of where they're heading. So I apologise if that's the impression I gave. That was never my intention. What I'm saying is today that those those people have come in, they've all got jobs. They're all part of the organisation. Sure. A large, you know, some of them are working directly into Lowe and Collins today. Others are in supporting corporate activities. Everybody has a position inside the organisation. My, my, my point is that Senator Smith asked for, in a, in a sense, the breakdown. And whilst you might not have it here, I think it's a question you probably should take on notice, just how they've gone between those, those streams. I think he did. I, I certainly can take it on where, the, if you like, where their entry is into the business. I can take that question on notice. Well, I suppose um, what, what I was trying to maybe answer was you know, where ultimately they may end up. I, 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 you know, at this point in time, uh, those streams are still under development. And you know, as mm. we uh, get more and more development, those scopes will open up and then the opportunity to move people around. The other point I did make is that um, the, the streams of work are open to all AC employees, not just the uh, Naval Group and Lockheed Martin people. I don't want that impression that we are just segregating. We have a two-tier a two -tier workforce, so to speak. We want a homogeneous workforce. All those employees that come in, they're treated effectively as permanent AAC employees. We have one AAC those streams of work will be available to all employees. So where we're bringing them in, through the transition centre, and then making up those opportunities across the business to all ASE employees. So I'm, that's what I'm trying to, to separate here. This is not a initiative just to wedge the uh, LMA and um, Naval Group workers into. Thank you. Now that, that, that explains that. So you've, t you've taken some questions on us. Chair, you just wanted to manage the time here. I do, Senator so Patrick. What's, what I have a couple of questions and then I believe Senator Smith had one or two and we are due to finish up with this witness in four minutes. Okay, so I still have further questions. Uh, I think I said this last time, it is tradition that this, this, this goes beyond this. And if the Secretariat, or sorry, if the, sorry, I won't say that, 
if the committee doesn't recognise what has happened in the past, this, this session always goes for at least an hour. And I might indicate, I don't have a lot of questions for A&I. That might be helpful too. OK, well, how about I ask my questions sure. and then we'll go back to Senator Smith and then we'll see how we're going time-wise. And I'll use that opportunity to have a chat with Labor senators and see how we can manage to get to morning tea in a sure. timely fashion. No Thank you, Senator Patrick. Um, I just wanted to clear up, uh, speaking of Senator Smith and Senator Patrick, some of, um, touch on a few of the questions that they asked and responses that were given. Um, just around those comments from um, the Chief of the Navy and um, what Sen Senator Smith was referring to, which I think might have been said at a, a Senate hearing in reference to the extension of the Collins class. Um, Minister, do you know what the Chief of Navy actually said in that situation? Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Chair. Look, uh, I've had a chance to get a copy of those exact comments, and so Thank I think uh, for context in terms of the discussions we were having, it's uh, useful for them to be on the record here that, uh, that at that Senate hearing on 15 October, uh, the Chief of Navy, 15 October 2021, Chief of Navy stated in relation to the Collins class that we will, I quote, upgrade all six as per the government's announcement on 16 September. I would expect that, with the first one being loaded in 2026, the first submarine will have a capability out until 2038, uh, and then we will see the second one with an extended life as well. I don't write off the opportunity for us to further upgrade those submarines beyond that period of load. Uh, at the same hearing, uh, in relation to um, uh, that question of, uh, of the Chief of Navy saying he didn't write off the opportunity, um, the General Manager of Submarines, uh, Mr Samet, uh, formerly Rear Admiral Samet, uh, said, uh, and I quote, uh, we haven't done any work on work to date looking at that. I think that would be subject to outcomes of the work that Vice Admiral Mead will be leading in terms of the optimal path to acquire nuclear powered submarine capability. I think the Chief of Navy was talking about the fact he hasn't ruled it out, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's ruled in. So we need to determine, should it become a necessity? Um, so I just uh, uh, put those on the record, Chair, uh, in the context of, uh, of the answer that I gave, which was, uh, was precisely as, uh, as Mr Samet emphasised there. Uh, there's a timeline and a priority of work to be done uh, around the nuclear-powered submarine. Uh, there's a timeline and a priority of work to be done in delivering uh, the first uh, LOAT rollout. Uh, and, uh, and of course, um, as Chief of Navy has said, um, options for looking at the future utilisation of Collins beyond that first load rollout um, uh, haven't been ruled out, uh, but they would be things to be looked at once there's greater certainty around those other two matters. Indeed. Thank you very much for clarifying that, Minister. Um, just a couple of questions for Mr Wiley around um, workforce and, and jobs in relation to shipbuilding. We've talked a lot about um, what's been happening through this transition period and employees coming over to the, um, the talent pool. But looking forward, how many jobs do we expect are going to be created by this shipbuilding enterprise in South Australia, say, by the end of the decade? Oh, look, I think those are questions for the task force, not for ASC. Obviously, we're, we're, we're supporting the task force, but we've not done any speculative work of what the, that, that may uh, end up like. Uh, like obviously, it would be schedule dependent and subject to other um, decisions by government. So I think those are questions. Thanks. Okay. Um, my next question was going to be how many more jobs do we expect to be created by the um, Collins mm. Light, but I'm guessing you can't provide me with that response either, uh, Mr Wiley. No, I can give you, uh, sorry, I can give you an insight to the Collins Light. Certainly Thank we're, you. We've, we've, uh, in, we're in the design phase at this point in time. We've generated uh, 130 new positions supporting the design. We anticipate that will peak at around about 160. Um, once we get into that, uh, out of that, there, um, we're not anticipating a huge number in during the planning and the implementation phase. So I think 160 new engineering positions is probably where we're heading as a, as a peak at this point in time. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Wiley. Uh, Senator Smith, back to you. Can, can, can I just? Or Senator just, so, Sorry, can I just ask one thing? I'm sorry, Se Minister. It's entirely circular logic, your proposition, isn't it? So, so the, the government's made a decision, broadly supported, uh, to abandon the attack class submarine um, 
and to, and to move to the nuclear powered submarine option. There's an 18 month optimal path process that's largely unseen to the public in the parliament at the moment. You're asking us to have confidence that you'd be able to deliver that on time. What, one of the risks in the decision that the government has made, all of these big projects come with risk, is that uh, a capability gap will emerge. Essentially, like, let's not go through all the tables, but essentially sometime in the 2040s. And um, it is a fair characterisation to say, uh, albeit um, a nice pun, that the, um, that the Chief of Navy floated this proposition uh, in the Senate References Committee inquiry on this subject. Now, it's a reasonable question. Um, if, if the government's answer is, we're not going to consider whether a second load is technically feasible or technically possible until we decide whether or not we have a capability gap, well, how on earth is a rational decision going to be made about that? Surely that is one of the inputs into the decision-making process that the Optimal Path Task Force has to undertake. Is this, is a second load technically feasible? Um, that's where Senator Wong was trying to, that, that's the questions that Senator Wong was trying to ask in last defence estimates um, without getting any clarity from Navy. There's an opportunity here to, it seems to me that what you're saying is well, it's not an input into the decision-making process and we haven't done any work and that makes perfect sense. Well, it makes no sense. Well, Sen Senator, that's, uh, that's your characterisation. Um, the government is you know, well aware of the timeline in relation to the current uh, scheduled first conclusion of the, uh, of the uh, extension period for the FANCOM, which stretches out to 2038 um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the uh, additional extension the life of type will provide uh, to that uh, boat. Now, uh, our desire in, uh, in the pursuit of the nuclear-powered submarine program uh, is to, as the uh, Defence Minister has said, bring those on as quickly as possible. Um, that's precisely uh, what, uh, what the task force is looking at as a key component uh, of their work. Um, the means by which we achieve that capability built in Australia as quickly as possible. Um, and, uh, and so uh, that's how those decisions are being made. Um, uh, there are uh, decisions around Collins looking beyond uh, that first life of type extension. Uh, as the Chief of Navy has said, um, it's not something that he writes off as a possibility, um, but it is, uh, as Mr Samet has made clear, not something that is uh, is being examined in this context at present. But, but I've seen the government go from there will be, there will be no ga gap in capability to we'll have one submarine for load to having five submarines to load to having all submarines for load. So this goes to the, what Senator Ayres is raising is in terms of planning, surely the lessons that we've been through in the past, the, the Chief of Navy's floated a sensible idea I don't understand why you wouldn't examine it. It seems um, no wonder all of, no, no, no wonder a substantial number of these projects are have difficulties being delivered on time and on budget and have capability gaps. Like if you can't think your way through the problem, plan your way through the problem. Se Senator, I guess we'll come to these se issues se se in se more se detail Senator later in the week. We'll come to them in more detail with uh, with defence, I'm sure. I just think the, it's unimaginable the, that, the that this technical has, question is not been addressed um, in, the, in, in this process. But no, well, look, I'm, well, I'm sorry we'll, I asked we'll because it, no, it, 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 it leads it, us nowhere. Um, well, I, 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 and, I and would, that's the problem. I mean, the decision has been made to undertake the life of type extension for all six of the Collins class. Um, uh, that, uh, that decision was announced in, uh, in September last year and, uh, and of course, the, uh, the awarding of that work uh, appropriately to ASC to undertake that. Uh, as I indicated, in terms of the um, uh, technical issues in relation to the operation of the Collins class, 
I would fully expect that in undertaking that work, ASC will develop further technical awareness and knowledge uh, about the Collins class uh, at that time. Obviously, they are the experts uh, in the operation of those boats now, but, uh, but more will be learned as that work is undertaken. So uh, that will obviously inform uh, further capability upgrades. Uh, as these um, get uh, capability upgrades, get adjusted depending on ability to deliver them all of the time. There are different things that, uh, uh, that ASC do today in terms of mid-cycle docking that would previously have only been contemplated as part of full-cycle docking activities, where they have um, uh, managed to see uh, the ability across their operations in Osborne and in Henderson uh, to be able to do more to the boats uh, in terms of enhancing them at different points in time uh, as a result of improved systems and technologies and so on. And, uh, and I know ASC will continue to, to look for those opportunities and, uh, and discuss them with defence where appropriate. The government will close the staple door after the horse is bolted, but so, sorry, I was interrupted. You did, Senator Ayres. Senator Smith, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. And I just note, uh, Senator Ayres and Senator Patrick just pursued the same line of questioning I did. Oh. They used specifically the same phrase I used regarding the comments made by the Chief of Navy. At no point did the Minister say that these two Senators verbaled the Chief of Navy. He reserved oh. that assessment for me. I am deeply uh, offended by it, given I have Senator members Smith. of my family who have served. I am deeply respectful of those in our defence forces. And I'm well, just not sure why well, he made that assessment of me and not Senator Patrick and not Senator okay. Ayres. Well, we'll say, well, Senator Smith, if it will help us to move on and your feelings are hurt, I will apologise for that. I've placed on the record in this you committee may. precisely what the Chief of Navy said. I think it is very clear uh, that contrary to the colourful turn of phrase used by all three of you that he floated an idea, that he was responding to questions, uh, that he simply said it was not something to be ruled out, contrary to the way in which it was put by any of you. But if your feelings are hurt, any of the three of you who I think might have verbaled him uh, in terms of the way you've reflected it, and perhaps the lesson in future is bring the precise quote and use the precise quote don't paraphrase, Senators. But if your feelings are hurt, I apologise. Thank you. Well, I'm happy Minister. to do both of those things if we want to keep going. Thank you for your apology, Minister. My feelings aren't hurt, but I am deeply offended by what you said, and I think you know that, and I think that's why you use those phrases. Senator Smith, question. Mr Wiley, has ASC been consulted in relation to any projections the government may have taken or undertaken on the total number of workers? who will be impacted by the government's decision to cancel its contract with Naval Group? Um, I, I, I don't think we have. No, I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, discussions on that. I, I said the only discussions we've had are related to the SSTP and related to what is deemed an effective workers. So uh, there's been uh, no discussions other than that. OK. And are you aware of any such projections being undertaken? No, I'm not. OK. And Mr Wiley, in terms of the SSTP which you are involved in, are you aware of how many workers who we know are without work as a result of the, the loss of the contract with Naval Group who are not eligible for the SSTP? No, I'm not. Okay. Senator Chandler, they were my further questions. So oh, to... thank you very much, Senator Smith. Um, Senator Patrick. All right, just going quickly back to, to Lote this, uh, now. Has the, has the scope of Lote been finalised? Um, the, the core uh, scope of work, uh, Lote remains as is at this point in time. Has it, has it been fi You can have a baseline um, that is, that's unchanged, but has it, has it been finalised? I think um, so. Lote, in terms of our current contract and scope, has not changed. Um, you know, as as uh, as the platforms age and issues occur, you know, I, I'm not. You know, I'm anticipating that the scope may change based on what we see in terms of the platforms and how we may need to address those issues. And there may be capability issues that uh, government or maybe want to address in terms of platform. But today's scope, uh, as uh, that we're currently working on, it remains unchanged. Has has ASC been advised that load load has been approved? 
Uh, well, like, as I said, the, the, the core scope of work um, uh, has been effectively contracted to AC in terms of uh, its commitment. Uh, we, we're in the systems and detail design phase, so those core packages of work. Uh, long lead items, what, what's, what's happening in relation to those? So we're obviously in uh, discussions with the subcontractors. The, those contracts are due to the, commence to be let in uh, Q2 of this year. But you've got one with Jumont already, haven't you? Yeah, we've got, we've got contracts with all of them, and uh, those contracts are trying to help us inform what those long lead items may not be, but the actual procurement of those items has yet to commence, and I said that, that's due to commence in Q2 of this year. Are they foreign contracts or through a local um, representative? They will be through the, uh, initially, they will be through the uh, overseas tariff. Okay. And does, does the activity you're working on at the moment include discussing technology transfer and local content? Very much so. Um, in, in, but each of those is the development of an AIC, AI, AIC plan uh, requirement. Uh, and one of the things that we've learned uh, through the Collins experience is to make sure we maximise the AIP and uh, transfer knowledge. You know, it's a key foundation to our success in uh, delivering availability uh, for the Collins class. So we will look to, to do work with those contractors and look at how much we can bring into the country and make sure we bring the right elements of the IP and uh, supply chain into country so we can maintain uh, availability for those issues and those equipments through the life of Collins. Have you got to the point where you've combined a load schedule with a full cycle docking schedule? No, we, we're not into that. We, we've done some preliminary analysis about what we can and don't, but to have, we haven't got a fully integrated uh, work scope schedule yet. Um, that's probably going to be commenced around the 2024 period when we do the detailed planning, we commence the detailed planning phase. Thank you. Um, now, this goes to uh, the LOAT, um, second LOAT question. Uh, and there's a fundamental input to that, to that question, and it's something that you've been, we've talked about in the past, and that is whole life. Um, have you done any work? Have you been tasked to do any work uh, in relation to the ability of the hull to go through a second load uh, stage? Because that would seem to me to be a fundamental question. Uh, that if they get, you know, before you'd even go and look at what, you know planning and spending Commonwealth money to look to a, uh, to, to a second round of load? There's, there's no, we've done no work regarding any aspect of the boat regarding a second load. However, inside the load core work package, that there is work related to the hull. Okay. Um, but you must have done an assessment first time around that uh, the boats can go through a first load. That's right. I, that was subject to an, um, an independent report, I believe. Okay. Has Saab Cockham's, as opposed to uh, uh, Saab Technology Australia, uh, so has Saab Cockham's been engaged regarding support for LOAT? They were in uh, contract negotiations currently with Saab Cockham's to support us through the LOAT endeavour. Okay. Mm -hmm. And are you in a position to uh, provide any details as to the workforce, workforce size for LOAT? So, as I indicated, the, the, in terms of the, the scope of engineering capacity today, we anticipate we're going to peak at around about 160 in terms of the engineering growth. Uh, I think it's a bit too early to, to say whether we need to expand our workforce for the actual implementation of this phase. Thank you. That's very helpful, the, the quick answers. Just one last line of questioning, just in relation to COVID. Um, I understand that, that ASC might have brought in a requirement for uh, for personnel to be fully vaccinated, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Now I just say this, and, and uh, you, just to declare, I am fully vaccinated myself. Um, but I just wonder, having watched some of the fair work cases that are streaming past now in relation to this, uh, was that done on the basis of uh, uh, me medical advice, and was there consultation involved with the workforce? Certainly, there was definitely a consultation involved with the workforce, and. I think it's, uh, it's known practice that uh, vaccination improves uh, personal safety regarding COVID. So, it's, you know, as officers of the company, we have to make sure the workforce, uh, workplace is safe. And so it's done in ensuring that, that we could actually deliver that uh, capability to our workforce. Yeah, not, it's not a criticism. I'm just trying to, having watched what's happening in the Fair Work Commission, uh, just seeing whether, whether or not we're avoiding problems that might arise in, in the future. Just a last question. Um, uh, 
As with other workforces, there will be people who've said, no, I'm not prepared to get vaccinated. Um, have you encountered that at ASC? Have, we, have you lost any, uh, any employees as a result of that, that sort of situation? And if so, has that, in, has that or will that in any way uh, affect schedules? What sort of numbers are we talking about? Uh, look, um, I, it's, we're going through that process at the moment. We've given ourselves the 28th of March to fully implement that, that uh, uh, policy. We're going through a point, process of consultation in the workforce. Uh, we've identified those potential candidates who haven't uh, yet uh, indicated are vaccinated, uh, and we're going through a process of engagement with them. And we're not anticipating this point in time there's going to be any impact to the, to the program. Okay, so w w what's the quantum of people? Um, I, I'll have to take that question on notes, but so it changes on a daily basis. Um, as and when you know, people do and don't get vaccinated. You know, we're working through the numbers, um, so maybe I'll take that question on notice. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a, a, a piece of uh, advice. I know when I talked to the Air Force about this, they said one of the best things they did was uh, send everyone who was adverse to go and see a doctor funded, paid for by the company, and that got rid of a, a lot more of, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the issues they were having. Anyway, I'll just leave that as a comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Um, we're all good with ASA Labor Senators. Thank you very much to the ASA for appearing today. We'll now move on to A&I. Thank you. Senator, constructive suggestions, Senator Patrick. <laughs> Oh, that was just a, like, you know, the Air Force, the yeah. Defence Force have taken that approach. It isn't sensible. But they've said to anyone who's a bit adverse, how about we let you go and talk to a doctor and we'll pay for it. We are still broadcasting, Senators. Um, I welcome via video conference Mr Andrew Seaton, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Australian Naval Infrastructure Proprietary Limited. Uh, Mr Seaton, do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, I will. OK, thank you, Mr Seaton. Thank you. Um, since the last hearing, ANI has continued to proactively manage the wind down of activities at the Osborne North Development Project following the AUKUS announcement and the decision to not proceed with the attack class program. Work on the combat system physical integration facility and site-wide utilities is now nearing completion with commissioning well advanced. All other site-based activities have ceased with the construction sites for the platform land-based test facility and the hull manufacturing and sub submarine consolidation halls made safe and secured. The total project workforce, including site and office space roles, is now below 50 on a daily basis. Contractor and subcontractor payment claims, including for demobilisation costs where appropriate, are continuing to be managed fairly with respect and in accordance with the underlying contracts. At the end of January, a total of $422 million had been spent by ANI on the project from inception. Of the total approved funding of $554 million, we now estimate that less than $490 million will have been spent once all the subcontractor, once all the contractor and subcontractor claims have been resolved. ANI is now working with the Commonwealth Nuclear Powered Submarine Task Force to understand the suite of requirements that underpin nuclear stewardship, including infrastructure. This will include an assessment of what parts of the already completed works at Osborne can be repurposed for a nuclear powered submarine build and what additional facilities are required. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Seaton. Senator Smith, you have the call. Hello, good morning, Mr. Seaton. Um, Mr. Seaton, at the last estimates, you agreed uh, with a question I asked regarding the impact of the AUKUS announcement on jobs. And I think we clarified that the AUKUS announcement put over 500 jobs, uh, I'll, I'll make sure I use the exact wording for Senator Birmingham. I said over 500 jobs have been placed in uncertainty as a result of this decision as it relates to your work. And you said that's correct. Um, do you have any clarity now on how many jobs were lost following the AUKUS decision? Uh, Senator, we are an infrastructure developer and so the, the jobs that we had on site were construction related jobs. Um, so they're 
uh, different trades at different times. So, you know, you have earthworks, then you have foundations, then you have steelwork, then you have cladding. Then, so it, it's a natural progression through trades. So th these, these were not long-term jobs. These were jobs associated with the construction of the specific facilities at Osborne. I, at the last Senate estimates, I uh, stated that between 560 550 and 600 people were working on the project at the time of the AUKUS announcement. In my opening remarks, I've just said that about 50 people are now working on the project. So what we've done is, is wound down those trades. Now, these were contractor and subcontractor roles. Our expectation is that those contractors and subcontractors have moved on to other construction projects, either within the state or, or further afield. I, I appreciate that in terms of the movement of workers. Can I ask how many people were working for ANI as at the 16th September 2021 who are now no longer ANI employees? ANI at the time of the announcement had about 45 employees. Since the announcement, we've had two resignations, a graduate architect and a graduate um, civil engineer. Okay. So, and now, in terms of the last estimates, um, we, we spoke about the government support available for affected shipyard construction workers. Has support been provided to affected shipyard construction workers from the government, or has that support not been forthcoming? Again, Senator, I'll, I'll differentiate. Um, these are construction workers mm -hmm. who, who were constructing the infrastructure. So that they're not actually shipyard workers, if you like. They're, they're infrastructure construction contractors. Um, I guess the answer is that we've been managing our contractor and subcontractor workforce fairly with respect, winding down their contracts and making payments that were due to them under their contracts. But there has not been a specific government program um, of support. These are contracting organisations that, that contract to, to many different infrastructure projects. And so with the cancellation of our project, it's, it, the, uh, the subcontractor workforce has gone out and, and sought other work and redeployed their personnel onto other projects. Now, I, I appreciate that they were contracted. I've spoken to many small and medium enterprises who were contracted or seeking to be contracted on this program, and many were very distressed about the, their capacity or ability to find equivalent projects to work on or equivalent opportunities. So my question is, has the government provided any support to those workers who are expected to work on these projects or not? For the infrastructure construction, the answer is no. The senators, I think I uh, referenced you to last time. Um, uh, Defence has, uh, has stood up, um, and I forget the exact form of words, um, but a, a unit there that, uh, that is, uh, is seeking in terms of other contracting work that, uh, that Defence has coming along to, uh, to try to uh, make sure that those who uh, were participants or had expected to be participants in the uh, ANI North um, uh, Osborne North uh, project development um, have uh, have uh, access to other possible defence uh, defence work, but uh, but in terms of how that engagement has worked, that's a question for defence, not A and I. Does A and I have any clarity yet on whether it will make a contribution to the nuclear submarine task force? Yes, we are. Oh, sorry, apologies. You actually did mention that in your opening statement and you mentioned infrastructure as, as one part of it. I apologise. Could you just expand a bit further on your opening statement, if there's anything further you can share with us on what that contribution will look like? Um, so we're very engaged with the Nuclear Submarine Task Force. Um, there is a, an infrastructure uh, arm of that task force and um, we are working with them to help them understand uh, what facilities already exist at Osborne and, and really the art of the possible around um, what a future nuclear um, uh, construction site would look like at Osborne. 
Um, Mr. Seaton, also further to the last estimates, um, we learned that there would be around 35 businesses who were working on the project at the time of the announcement whose contracts would be impacted by the announcement. Do you have anything further you can share on what happened with those subcontracts? Have they been since cancelled or what is the status of those subcontracts, the 35? No, we've been working through with all of the subcontractors. Um, some of them have finished their work scope as originally contemplated on the combat systems building or the, some of the site-wide utilities that we've put in. Um, so those contracts have been completed and, and rolled off. Some of the other contracts have, have been de-scoped where we've, um, we've reduced the scope as we've wound down the site activities. But each of the contractors has been um, reimbursed for works completed to date, um, materials procured to date, and, and we've taken delivery of a lot of those materials, and also for reasonable costs of demobilisation. So that, that process has been a very orderly process that's been uh, run in conjunction with our um, managing contractor, Lang O'Rourke, uh, ever since the, the AUKUS announcement. Can you provide to the committee a breakdown of those 35 contracts and I mean I, I appreciate the the, the different have we As Senator we did um, in uh, response to question on notice F006 I don't have that one in front of me apologies Mr Seaton but what I'm looking for um, I can't see you I'm not sure if, if you're able to put your your video back on okay. Sorry, my video's on, Senator. Okay. That's all right. The committee... Right. Is it just me or has everyone yeah, lost... Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. But I think you can still hear us. And yes, we can as still long as you can so still hear okay. me, that's okay. Um, I'd like if you can take on notice to provide the details of each of the 35 subcontracts, including those which have been de-scoped, those which may have been cancelled, and if you're able to provide us with the names of the companies affected, the values of the contract, the type of work and the numbers of workers affected within each... As Senator, could I refer you to our response to question F006 from the last estimates um, that should give you the information that you require? F006 only gives the, the, the status of the buildings. Oh, oh sorry. No, there is, there is an answer that lists companies. There, there's um, an answer. But, well, I don't have it either. But, but perhaps Senator Smith, because you can put questions on notice, of course, outside yeah, of the room right. too. So if, take if a look, and if you need there, more, we'll then specify those within the question. I'm not aware of all of that level of detail being provided, but we'll check the question and then we'll place on notice if it hasn't been answered sufficiently previously. And obviously, we'll be looking for uh, an answer which reflects the current point of time. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll take that on notice. That's okay. Um, Can you tell me, are there any skilled positions at ANI that remain vacant? Uh, yes, I can answer that. And no, there are no positions that are vacant. Okay. So, and you're not trying to fill any skilled roles at present? No, we're not. Okay. Um, do you have any concerns about the current availability of suitably skilled technical and engineering people available? I mean, I appreciate that you're not seeking to fill roles at the moment, but in the future, what's your view on the availability of skills um, going forward? Do you have any concerns there? No, I don't have any concerns. We've, we've always been able to attract and, and retain high calibre employees. Okay. And uh, just ask a question that I put to ASC before. Were you at ANI consulted in relation to any projections undertaken by government on the total number of workers who would be impacted by the decision, the AUKUS announcement on 16th of September? Uh, yes, we, um, we had a number of conversations with, uh, with both defence and finance in the lead up to the 16th of September announcement. Um, and we, we talked about the contractor and subcontractor workforce uh, at Osborne, as, as we've just discussed, Senator. Okay. Um, and are you aware of 
any workers either employed by you or elsewhere who are now without work as a result of the cancelled contract who may not be able to access the SSTP? Uh, Senator, the SSTP, my understanding is, is it was really targeted at Naval Group and Lockheed Martin, and so Mr Wiley's spoken to that. Um, A and I, uh, you know, we, we, I think I, I said we've we've had two resignations since the announcement, um, so it hasn't been a large impact on our uh, on our staff workforce, um, and our subcontractors have. Um, have been progressively demobilising from the site and moving up onto other works. It, it's, I think it's a positive that the construction sector is, is really quite busy. Um, trades are in high demand. So as people have come off our project, I think they have been readily redeployed elsewhere. Okay, Chair, um, Senator Ayres has some questions after Senator Patrick, I yeah, believe. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Senator Patrick. Um, Mr Seaton, uh, firstly, thank you for the schedule and for the great picture you uh, sent me of the uh, the, um, the shipyard. It seems like getting schedules out of uh, out of government officials working on projects is, is really hard, but uh, thank you for that. Um, in relation to ASC North, so we're talking about where the Collins full cycle docking work is done, Mr Wiley had, at the last estimates, talked about discussions he'd had with you in relation to upgrades. I'm just wondering, um, where are you up to with those discussions? Have we progressed that to a point where there's a project in the making? Yes, we're progressing um, those discussions with Mr Wiley and, and his team, um, and we are in the process of, of designing and, and scoping those uh, facility upgrades. Um, perhaps on those, can you just give us a top level view of what sort of things are happening? He talked about roofs being upgraded and uh, and so forth. If you, if you do that on notice, just to help the chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, and any schedule associated with that that work? Is it, is, I mean, is it work that's going to cover months or years? What's what's the sort of feel at the point at this point? I think it'll be progressively over years. What you've got, Senator, is a 30-year-old uh, facility yep. that's in need of, of just some um, uh, some upgrading, some refurbishment of existing facilities, uh, and, and really, you know, a general spit and polish, if you like. I think sure. that'll be done over time. Um, I think at the last estimates, we stated that there were no specific new facilities required for load. So it's really just doing up office blocks, replacing air conditioning units, as you say, new roof sheeting, new guttering, things like that. All, all, all where where I'm coming from is uh, also just in terms of terminating some of the contracts for the future submarine shipyard, whether or not there was scope to redeploy and avoid termination costs uh, for some of these entities, some of these people working, um, whether, whether or not there was scope to do that. Um, Senator, the, um, uh, the ability to bring forward other projects has been looked at very closely and we're working very closely with defence and finance, not just on that Osborne North site, but also on the Osborne South site, the common user facility, uh, to make sure that we're bringing forward whatever project work we can. All right. Just to uh, help the Chair, um, just, on, so just generally on notice, if you could give a sort of an overview of where you're up to about ASC North, improvements you're likely to have, you know, rough, rough costs, um, um, rough schedules. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Senator Ayres, to take yeah, us to Yeah, just really quickly following on from Senator Patrick's questions. Um, so the, the combat systems physical integration, I think you said that that was the only project at Osborne North that was going to still be on foot following the um, AUKUS announcement. Is that, is that um, I think you said it was practical completion at the end of 2021. Is that, is that all done? Yes, it is. It's being commissioned at the moment and I'd expect that to be handed over to A&I &I within a couple of weeks. And uh, in terms of A&I's 
um, engagement with the optimal path process. Can can you give the committee a, a sense of, you know, either of the two options are larger than the attack class submarine, one of them substantially larger. Um, what what are the timelines for, you know, that does at the very least in, engage a lot of civil construction work and, and maybe some other work that would have been di substantially different. What are, the, what are the kind of lead times that we're talking here for construction for a larger craft or is there no substantial difference? I think it's too early to say yet, uh, Senator. We're working with the task force to firstly define uh, what the infrastructure requirements are for a nuclear-powered submarine, taking into account nuclear safety and nuclear security, which are quite different from conventional submarine builds. I think once we've determined what, what the infrastructure requirements are, we can then look at what we can reuse from the existing yard and then what's a new build. Um, once we have that, we'll, we'll put a cost and schedule around it. But I, I think it's um, it's too early to, to speculate on how long it might take to build the yard. Well, we'll put aside those issues. One is, well, at least one of those options is larger, you know, in the order of 50% larger. That, that itself um, must have a substantial impact on the kind of infrastructure that A and I would be required to provide. Appreciate the, the issues that you know we won't traverse in detail, but but just in terms of scale. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Senator. Um, if if the submarine is substantially uh, longer or mm. larger diameter or heavier, then we need to look at firstly the the build methodology. Um, and, you know, the, the builder of the submarine may not follow the same methodology as, as Naval Group we're going to use for the attack class submarine. Um, so that goes to floor loadings and craneage and the size of the construction halls, the specialised equipment that you require within those halls. So that there is a lot of work to be done to... Um, to specialise. Yeah, in terms of the civil works, land, you know, Reclaiming land, at the very least. Um, yeah. These are they're very, they're, very they're, substantial. They're very um, substantial, very important, and and very important in terms of the timeliness of the project, Senator Ayres, which uh, which um, I know Defence is cognisant of, and the task force is cognisant of that. Um, if we are to um, uh, select uh, a model um, which has limited additional design changes or modifications to that need to be undertaken, then you know, a pressure in terms of making sure we get the construction off the ground quickly will be ensuring that we have delivery of the infrastructure on the site in a and I quickly. Um, now, fortunately, in terms of you know, land opportunities, um, you know, there are, uh, if additional land is required, possible avenues um, uh, associated with, uh, uh, with the Osborne site. Um, obviously, uh, there is early engagement that, uh, that the task force is undertaking um, to get awareness of, uh, of how the different models might um, be executed successfully at, uh, at Osborne. And, uh, and I would expect that for governments, um, whomever it may be after the next election, uh, that uh, early decisions will need to be taken as soon as the task force has concluded its work to enable Mr. Seaton to, uh, to get back on and ensure we have uh, a shipyard constructed to uh, to meet those design needs that you raise. Thank, thank you. That, that's all I have, Chair. Right. Thank you very much, Senator Ayres. If no other senators have questions for ANI, we will go to morning tea a few minutes early. Thank you very much to ANI for appearing today. The committee will now suspend for morning tea and will reconvene at 10.40. Um, and we'll begin the examination of outcomes one and two for the Department of Finance 
Uh, welcome to the finance officials in the room and next door, including the Secretary, Ms Rosemary Huxtable. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement at this time? Right, thank you, Chair, but no, thank you. Ms Huxtable, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, thank you, Chair. OK, I'm going to give the call to Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, Minister, yesterday we started a discussion around uh, the caretaker period and whether the government would observe the caretaker conventions and guidelines when they kick in. You said to the committee yesterday that the government would observe the caretaker guidelines. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Did the government observe the caretaker guidelines in April and May 2019? Um, uh, to my knowledge, Senator, but I'm not uh, going to pretend to be expert across um, uh, all circumstances and all situations. So to your knowledge, but there may have been occasions where they weren't observed. Is that your evidence? Well, I'm, I'm not um, privy to uh, every piece of advice that was provided uh, during the context of the campaign to every minister and uh, how that was handled, Senator. Okay. Well, as the Finance Minister, do you think authorising the spending of $40 million during the caretaker period observed the caretaker guidelines? I think that depends, Senator, on the advice that was provided and, uh, and the uh, um, circumstances involving that. There are certainly, I mean, there are certainly times where authorising expenditure is, uh, is necessary in the caretaker period. Okay. Um, and what, on what grounds would they be, would it be in line with the caretaker conventions to authorise expenditure? Um, well, again, Senator, I think that would depend on what the expenditure related to as to, uh, as to um, whether, uh, whether that was um, something that required um, consultation or not uh, more broadly. Um, now, yeah, my practice uh, through a couple of election campaigns is, uh, has been that my uh, departments have, uh, have advised me uh, where necessary in relation to, uh, to the application of uh, the caretaker uh, conventions. And uh, um, I would anticipate this will be the first uh, campaign that I go through uh, with, uh, with the Department of Finance as, uh, as, um, as my um, responsibility. And, uh, and I imagine that they will advise me on any decisions that do or don't need to be made. So you mentioned consultation as being one of the ways that you can authorise expenditure, that you consult with the, the opposition during that time. Are there other grounds that you're aware of where spending is can be authorised during that period? Um, uh, Senator, I, I don't believe that uh, every scenario entails uh, the uh, requirement for consultation there, uh, but, uh, but as I said, my practice has been to act uh, under advice from my uh, various departments during campaigns, and that's what I'll continue to do. Yeah. Um, so would spending $40 million um, on grants to targeted at marginal and targeted electorates be in accordance with observing the caretaker guidelines after the caretaker period kicks in. Well, now you're starting to ask me a hypothetical. It's not a um, hypothetical. Senator, it if, you, if, you, if, you, if you say if, if you want to go to something specific, yep. uh, then by all means, let's go okay. to the something specific rather than this little dance. Well, it was the sports um, grants that were approved after caretaker kicked in by the prime minister on the 11th of April. The um, approval was signed off after caretaker kicked in. There was no consultation with the opposition. And those grants primarily went to seats that you were trying to win or hold. I'm asking, uh, is that in accordance with the caretaker guidelines? Uh, well, Senator, as to your said, understanding uh, of them. Um, well, my understanding of them on any given uh, instance is informed by the advice that I receive 
uh, from uh, departments. Um, those, uh, uh, that decision, those grants don't sound like um, they were uh, a matter at that time that would have been under the advice of this department. Um, so No, they wouldn't, but I'm asking you as the finance minister so who has this. authority around, presumably, and a view around appropriate and efficient and effective use of taxpayer funds, whether that was an appropriate authorisation of $40 million worth of taxpayer funds. Well, Senator, uh, I know that, uh, that that matter has been subject of great exploration <laughs> in other committees. It's not something that I've uh, participated in, so I'm not going to provide uh, a judgment uh, sitting here without, uh, without the benefit of uh, seeing all of the context around, uh, around that decision at that time. And uh, uh, of course, uh, I'm not privy and to what advice was or was not provided by the relevant departments at that time. Well, I don't think there was any. That was the problem. But so I, do you think it was appropriate? If you, won't, if you won't say it wasn't appropriate, was it appropriate to spend $40 million after Caretaker kicked in well, on sports grants? Well, I, I think the identical answer applies, Senator. So you won't, that, you won't support it, I, but you won't say I, it was wrong. That I know that oh, these matters have been explored extensively elsewhere. Um, I don't have any of the, uh, the documentation, the advice or otherwise um, at my fingertips. Uh, I wasn't the responsible minister, uh, it wasn't this department, um, uh, so I'm not going to, uh, to jump to form any sort of uh, conclusion uh, without having that sort of information. Okay. As Minister for Finance, do you have any role in advising the Cabinet on the appropriate authorisation of expenditure within their portfolio departments? Is there any overarching role for you? Um, yes, Senator, in, uh, in a number of different ways. Um, um, so uh, uh, procurement guidelines, grant guidelines, those sorts of things are, uh, are uh, administered by uh, this department. Um, uh, individual departments uh, then have responsibility in terms of their adherence to uh, those different guidelines and the caretaker conventions, as, uh, as was asked uh, yesterday, uh, are uh, administered by uh, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, and then, of course, individual departments advise their ministers in relation to the application of the caretaker conventions. Okay. So are you going to tell your colleagues not to do what they did last time in 2019 and spend millions of dollars after caretaker kicks in? Is that something that falls within your responsibilities? Or is that something the Prime Minister should do? Uh, well, I, uh, I would expect that all of us will be reminded of the caretaker conventions, um, as, uh, as is um, the ordinary course of events. Uh, and with that, the expectation that we will all uh, work within those caretaker conventions, working according to the advice uh, provided by our different departments. So who reminds you? You said we are all reminded. Uh, I, my recollection is that there is a sort of standard communication that, uh, that is made at, um, at the appropriate point, but um, I don't know whether Ms Huxtable can recall or not. I mean, I'm sort of more a matter for PM&C. Yes, but it, it is a matter for PM&C, Senator. And uh, I know that the guidance on caretaker conventions, they update, yeah. and they've updated it uh, at the end of last year. Uh, we do a similar, we go through a similar process in the matters that we have direct responsibility for, uh, which is predominantly relating to the election costing processes. Uh, so we also have updated that and written to uh, the leaders uh, of the major parties uh, at at that time. What I don't know is whether uh, PM and C are also writing out, as we do on the costing guidelines, writing out to, uh, to individual uh, parties or parliamentarians in respect of the conventions, um, but they're easily accessible uh, on their website. I mean, my, um, so there's a, there's a process that goes with the conventions, the caretaker conventions for the public service, um, so that they are fully aware of the period we're in. I guess the questions I have, Minister, around how is it managed um, by the Prime Minister across the Cabinet uh, to, um, you know, ex to say what he expects to be followed. And I guess the question I'm asking now is, will, will you observe 
the caretaker guidelines um, and not authorise grant funding, not urgent, not unforeseen, not things that you might consult with the opposition over, but I want a commitment from the government that, that they're not going to do what they did in 2019 and after caretaker kicks in, sign off $40 million to fly into seats that you want to win or hold. That's the commitment I want. So, so Senator, Will you give us that? Well, so, Senator, whilst, uh, whilst not um, um, uh, accepting or wanting to comment on the, uh, on the um, uh, aspersion you made in the middle of your question there, um, What's yes, that? It that is, $40 million uh, it is, was it is spent. My that's expect. not. That's a fact. Senator well, Senator, it's in the ANAO. Senator Gallagher, allow the minister, to, Gallagher, allow the minister to respond so, to so, your so, question. So, Senator, so, Senator, I dealt with with my response in relation to those matters uh, in your previous questions. Um, in terms of the application of the caretaker uh, conventions in the next campaign, I expect all ministers uh, to work with their departments in terms of adherence to the advice around the application of those conventions, as I am confident the Prime Minister would expect everyone to. Would you authorise the spending of $40 million in grants after the caretaker kicks in that well, came across your desk? Well, Senator, um, again, that's a hypothetical, but what I would do, as I've said a few times now, uh, is, uh, is that I would be responsive to the advice uh, that my department would provide uh, in relation to any decisions that I have to make. Um, so I, you uh, I have done that uh, before, I can, uh, I can recall contacting Senator Carr during an election campaign once to discuss certain issues mm. with him. So, um, so um, uh, you know, I'm aware uh, of the conventions. Um, I don't profess to be an expert in the detail of the conventions, but I know that uh, the departments um, are generally quite diligent in terms of the advice they provide to ministers uh, around how we apply the conventions during a campaign. Are there any penalties for not following the caretaker guidelines in your experience as a minister of the last eight years or so? Um, like has anyone Senator, been look, punished for look, not following them? Um, not to my knowledge, Senator. No. Uh, that would really be a question for, uh, for PM&C. Um, and, uh, but and you'd know. You'd know. You're a well, senior minister. <laughs> you would know I, uh, if there um, was. Um, I, uh, as I said before, I don't profess to be across um, every other minister's uh, activities and decisions. So as we head into this period, I mean, you won't give me a commitment that it won't happen again. I think you're saying that you wouldn't do it if it crossed your desk in an around the, a roundabout way. But how can we trust that a government that did authorise $40 million worth of expenditure after the caretaker period had started and has made a bit of a signature move around rorting and, and trashing conventions actually do the right thing when it comes comes to the next caretaker and election period. What assurance can you give that this will not happen again? Well, Senator, in the interests of brevity, uh, I don't think anything that I could say would convince you right now, so. Um, well, no, I think if you said yes, I can guarantee that we will not authorise $40 million or indeed any amount to go into pork barrelling in the next campaign, I think if you said that on the record, people would have some more trust. Are you prepared to say it? Senator, as I've said, I expect no. and the Prime Minister will expect okay. everyone to adhere uh, by, the the caretaker conventions, oh. by the caretaker conventions oh. as advised and informed you know, by their departments in terms of the application of those conventions. Now, if you want to go, I mean, I made the invitation I'm not sure it was to you, Senator Gallagher. It might have been to, uh, to Senator Ayers or somebody else yesterday. If you want to go to local grants programs and community grants programs and yeah, so on. Yeah, I do. I can, I've had a lot more, I've had a lot more questions very good. about well, them. We can, we can do that. And along yeah. the way, I'll, I'll start with the seven and, and a half million dollar promise for the, the Casarina Pool in Solomon, and I can work my way through yeah, the sure. promises you're currently making. Yeah, sure. Um, before an election, without actually appropriating the money as a government, which is what you do, which is the very big difference that you refuse to accept. Okay, you seem so to think the that caretaker, we shouldn't budget for the what we spend. Uh, the we, the we Prime believe Minister we was the one that didn't follow the caretaker guidelines, so I have no faith that that will happen again. When we look at the next um, budget and election period, 
So we've got a similar set of circumstances where in 2019 you had a budget, I think on the 2nd of April, um, caretaker kicked in on the 11th of April, if I'm correct, in 2019. So it was a matter of just eight or nine days between the budget being announced and um, caretaker kicking in. Um, I'd like to understand the government's approach to this time and whether um, you're going to take the same approach. Will you be announcing uh, spending in the budget that is then very quickly approved to go into target and marginal seats, um, even on, on the eve of an election being called? Um, a little bit will of, you be doing that again? It will be a little surprise to you, Senator, to know that, uh, that we will announce what's in the budget uh, in the budget. Yes, fair enough. And will you then do what you did last time, which is announce funding, which in the budget for all appearances looks like it's for everybody to be shared on a merit-based process, and then over a couple of days spend hundreds of millions of dollars funnelling that money into Liberal target or marginal seats? That's what happened last time, and will you be doing that again? Well, Senator Ayres, we will announce any new programs, new policies or otherwise related to the budget in the budget. Uh, the budget will provide for the funding platform and the management of the nation's finances upon which we will seek our re-election. Uh, we're not going to hand down the budget and then between the budget and the election blow out the budget. Um, that's not the way we would approach these matters. We will make sure that, uh, that we have costed appropriately uh, our promises that we take to the people, uh, that that's reflected in terms of the budget uh, that we outline. Um, in the last campaign, yes, uh, we promised a range of urban infrastructure projects, uh, commuter car parks, just like your party was promising a range of urban infrastructure projects and commuter car parks. You seem to have this view that somehow we shouldn't have budgeted for them even though as the government, it's our responsibility no. to budget uh, for, uh, for these sorts of things. You seem to have the view that we shouldn't have said where we were going to build them and that we should have pretended somehow that everybody could be getting these projects rather than actually fronting up during the campaign and saying, this is where we intend to put them. You get them. If so, you miss out. Um, a fairly transparent process as well. Now, Senator, um, the government's view is that we should budget. We should budget fully for our expenses. Uh, and if we're making promises, uh, we should detail those promises uh, as, uh, as is appropriate. Okay. Well, let's take the commuter car park then, as you raise it, because it is a, 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 like a great example of the point I'm trying to make. In the Treasurer's speech, he says, tonight I announce we are increasing the urban congestion fund fourfold from one billion to four billion. It will include, uh, the fund will focus on immediate practical measures to cut tra travel time within our cities. It will include a $500 million commuter car park fund that will improve access to public transport hubs and take tens of thousands of cars off our roads. He does not say in that, in these electorates, which we have already decided, and they all happen to be targeted or marginal electorates, or indeed the Treasurer's own electorate, where he gave himself four car parks. You do not, you're not up front with either the Parliament or the Australian people about that. You say you have this fund, and then secretly you've already allocated it into all your targeted seats, which you don't announce before the bills pass the Parliament. And then on the eve of the election being called, the Prime Minister approves hundreds of millions of dollars to go into those seats. That's and not being upfront or transparent or accountable. And, and Senator, is it not the case that Mr Albanese announced a commuter car parks program of a quantum, sorry, Mr Shorten in the last election, although Mr Albanese did announce some of the projects, so I'll come to him, that Mr Shorten announced a commuter car parks program for the last election with a quantum of money he was saying would be spent on it. And With then, the subsequent to that, and then subsequent, announced. and no, no, and yes. then subsequent to that, drip-fed announcements of the different projects, including an announcement made by Mr. Albanese 
uh, of at least one of those projects. Yeah, before the election, not, and then we, it is, would have and, been and if still we'd during won, the election. we would have appropriated that money with full response. transparency and accountability. Order. You did not do that. So, you, so, so, the Treasurer did not say on election night, and four of these car parks are very happily coming into my electorate, no, the, by no, the way. No, no, so that's the treasurer, what you're no, the treasurer and the government did exactly so as the opposition was already that. doing. We established a fund, we established a fund, like the opposition had already announced, and then we proceeded to announce the projects that fund would support as the opposition had been and was continuing to do. You appropriated money in government, taxpayers' money, and you were not transparent or clear. On budget night, the Treasurer says we are doing this, so it will reduce um, congestion in, and take thousands of cars off our road. And then I wouldn't have a problem if he'd gone on to say, and here is where the 40-odd car parks are going. But he didn't say that. He announces a fund, he sits there, and then in the election campaign, all of that's pre actually prior to the election campaign being called, in the dark of night, the Prime Minister approves them all into Liberal targeted and marginal seats. So, Hundreds so, of millions of dollars and you are not transparent about it at all when so, that money was appropriated. So, so, Senator, the fundamental problem here is you're just applying a double standard. No, I'm not. No, 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 no you are. Senator you are yeah. applying a double standard. You seem to think it's OK as an opposition to announce an umbrella fund and then to support projects under that umbrella fund. But you seem to believe as a government that if we're announcing an umbrella fund, we should at the same time announce all of the recipients of support under that umbrella fund. So you're holding the government to a different standard to that which you hold yourself. Well, you, you're, you're the government. You have access to those funds and you appropriate that money through the parliament without telling people how you were going to spend it. The, la the situation for us is that we are telling people how we're going to spend it long before we're in a position to appropriate that money. But you have taken the money. Sure. You have not explained sure. where it's going. You're pretending it, it's, a, a, it's a genuine fund for, you know, ostensibly for places that actually need commuter car park and, and easing of urban congestion. And then you're putting it in places where, one, there's no assessment, two, they're not needed, and three, they haven't been built. Senator, Senator, Hundreds of millions of dollars. Senator, yes, we're the government. We produce budget papers as the government and we appropriate funds in accordance with those budgets as the government. Um, that's, and that's, our, that's our responsibility. If you, if you win the election, or just as Labor governments have done in the past, that is precisely what you will end up doing too. Now, in terms of the establishment of such funds and the allocation then of projects against it, that is commonplace for governments and oppositions, whatever their political persuasions, uh, to make those umbrella funding announcements and then to make different commitments about how those funds and will be allocated. But they now were determined I, now I, in government, not in an election campaign. You, yeah, well, you were making those decisions to pork barrel this, in government as official decisions of the cabinet. Se, se, Senator, I, I just I don't understand how well, it is how it is that you think the government announcing a localised investment commitment in one part of the country is pork barrelling. But the opposition, the Labor Party doing it, is not. I mean, you are holding to different standards, the two of us. Yeah. No, right now. I'm saying you should right be now, transparent when you establish these funds where they're going. You knew where they were going. You knew where they were going. So and you made the decision as government. No, no. They weren't election commitments. They were so, signed off in government. So, so Don't pretend they were election... Yes, you badged them as election commitments, but they were an act of government that authorised that expenditure. They, they, were, they were fully budgeted, yes. They were fully budgeted, because that's what our government seeks to do, to make okay. sure we have fully so budgeted and accounted we are going for to the promises more, we're so making. So there's nothing wrong. There is nothing wrong with what you did with the commuter car park fund. Well, is Sen that your evidence? And well, we would expect more of it, well, would we? Well, Senator, 
Um, if you want to tell me which funds are being used to, uh, to provide for the $7.5 million upgrade to the Casarina Pool in Solomon that, uh, that your party announced on the 3rd of February, very or the $7.5 million the for the new Sanctuary Point yep. District Library in Cedar Gilmore the that your party elected on the second, announced before. on the 2nd of February, yep. or I could keep going. Yeah. There's a lot We're of, making commitments. There's a lot, of, a, there's a lot of what you would describe as pork barrelling that seem to be what Mr Albanese and your team are out there announcing right at this moment. No, we are making local commitments up front and transparent, including the costing, that is very different <laughs> to what you did with the $660 million commuter car park fund. Oh. Very different. Well, and what your evidence is, is it's going to continue. So we will expect more of it well, in, the, in well, this upcoming election campaign. Well, well, Senator, I contend that we made Local announcements up front, including the costing. You I think they were your exact words. Up front. Local yeah. announcements up front, including the costing, before the election. No, people had didn't. people had your local announcements up front, including the costing, and our local announcements up front, including the costing, to compare, and the election was held. Well, why then? I mean, just to finish this off, why then, when the treasurer announced this commuter car park fund, did he not say where all the car parks were going to be, because you'd already made that decision. Why, why didn't Mr Shorten, when he announced the opposition's fund? On because, budget night. Because, because, On budget night, because when Mr you were Shorten wanted to be able to visit parliament. local communities and make those announcements in local communities. Okay. So and the government more wanted to be able to visit yeah. local communities and make those announcements okay. in local communities. Senator Gallagher, so before you move on to your next topic, can I just ask, I'm finding it very hard to discern questions and responses between Senator Gallagher and the Minister at the moment, because so if we can try and just avoid talking over the top of each other, that would make my job and for those listening at home a lot easier. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, some of the funds that have been uh, had received criticism in terms of the way decisions have been made and the way funding has been allocated, including disproportionately um, landing in coalition target and marginal seats, have been the Building Better Regions Fund, the Urban Congestion Fund, the Safer Communities Fund, and we've also got other funds that were established in the budget. Some of the advice I've got is that there's about two and a half or just $2.4 billion in unallocated expenditure in those uh, funds that the government has available to it. Is the government going to spend that $2.4 billion sorry. in election promises? Sorry, Senator, I, I'm not sure if in your question you initially outlined which funds or programs you were speaking about. OK, well, if... I've had advice, I've been following this through questions on notice and other advice, but for example, I'm told that there's $279 million unallocated in the Building Better Regions Fund, $848 million in the Urban Congestion Fund, $70 million in the Safe Community Funds, over a billion dollars in the Modern Manufacturing Initiative, and $114 million in Local Jobs COVID-19 Recovery Fund, which just in those five funds gives the government $2.4 billion unallocated. Is that your election so, war chest? Uh, well, no, uh, Senator, I certainly wouldn't describe it in that way. Um, I, I know that some of those funds, off the top of my head, certainly the Modern Manufacturing Initiative, I think the Building Better Regions Fund um, are in the middle of um, uh, of applications being assessed and determined, uh, that, uh, that they have been out uh, into the marketplace, if you, uh, if you like, with that term, um, uh, inviting applications. Those applications, I'm pretty sure, for those two have, uh, have been received uh, and are uh, undergoing um, those final decision-making processes. Uh, I'm certain that's the case for MMI. I think it's the case for BBRF. Um, uh, I'd have to take a look into uh, some of the others, obviously. Um, you know, each can most effectively be responded to by the relevant portfolio department. So they won't be used to fund your election promises? Those unallocated funds that exist in those? Well, I, I, as I said, I, I, my expectation is that 
Uh, many, most if not all, are in the uh, advanced stages of, uh, of being allocated in accordance with uh, the program and grant guidelines for, okay. uh, for each of those so, policy areas. Okay, so with Building Better Regions Fund, um, for example, I think it's round six that might have just closed. Um, I could be wrong, but will they be, essentially will the decisions be taken on that and announced in the election campaign? Um, uh, I wouldn't expect so, Senator. You wouldn't expect so. Um, as I said, I have my best to go to um, infrastructure and regional development in terms of uh, BBRF. I sometimes get um, confused between whether we're at round five or round six, and uh, and which yeah. um, um, and uh, and which stage different ones are at. But uh, but BBRF has a uh, a well established process. Um, my recollection, as I said, is that uh, is that. Um, they are at the point of a um, uh, uh, of a finalisation of a grant round and making decisions. Um, uh, I'm not part of uh, uh, of that process. It's administered by uh, by their department. Um, there may be some forward budgeting for future rounds of that uh, that program that uh, uh, that uh, that would continue. If so, that would be evident um, there in terms of the forward estimates. Okay. So you wouldn't expect that they would; those rounds would essentially become election commitments uh, for, in building better regions, and you're not sure for the other funds. Uh, Senator, if you want us to go through uh, each of them, I'll do my best. But as I said, kind of the actual status in terms of uh, whether they are inviting applications, receiving applications, um, assessing applications. Um, uh, about to announce the conclusion of, uh, of assessments, um, each agency will be best placed to respond to those better than, uh, than I suspect okay. we can. The reason I ask and the reason I'm following it, how much is in unallocated funds, and again, my advice is just in those five spending areas, it's $2.4 billion available to the government, is that in the last campaign, when you released your costings, um, you had a, a section which said the coalition has committed unallocated funds from within the following programs and then released a number of them, community development grants, community sports change rooms and swimming facilities fund, the environmental restoration fund, the indigenous advancement strategy, the urban congestion fund, the commuter car park fund and the roads of strategic importance, it goes on. So it looks to me like what the government has done is squirrelled away money into these funds, left it unallocated, and then used those funds appropriated through the parliament to pay for election commitments? Uh, well, Senator, it may, uh, it may not be the case that, uh, that in all of those instances um, funds were appropriated. Uh, it may well be the case that in some of those instances um, appropriation for um, uh, the next year had been undertaken in relation to, uh, to some of those funds, but the funds themselves may have had, uh, uh, um, may have had um, um, estimates stretching out over a number of years um, in terms of as we go through a campaign environment and, uh, and make commitments and seek to make sure we can pay for those commitments. If there's an opportunity to uh, uh, transparently draw down elsewhere um, to, uh, to ensure that we aren't worsening the budget bottom line, then that's the type of thing that, uh, that of course, uh, we always look to do to ensure that we uh, maintain the budget trajectory as much as possible. Okay. So if that's your evidence, then that $2.4 is sitting there as a war chest. I haven't even gone through the other well, funds. Like, you've got well, so many funds set. riddled through the budget now. Like, it's hard, it, it genuinely is hard to keep track because I think you've found it such a successful way to hide money and then allocate... Mm -hmm and so look like you're not um, adding cost on the budget. Well, so, we'll it's well, Senator, I, 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 don't, I don't accept that proposition. It's exactly um, but what if, you're doing. But if you want to abolish the modern manufacturing initiative, um, that's policy, obviously, that you could take forward. If you want to abolish the Building Better Regions Fund program, that's policy that, uh, uh, that you could take forward. Uh, you know, we, we believe there's um, a particular policy purpose and value served in these uh, these different initiatives at different times, and uh, and that's set out when uh, when we announce them. Uh, and I said I'm I'm certain in relation to MMI that uh, that there have been some uh, exceptional 
uh, applications received from around the country uh, that will enable uh, Australia's manufacturing industries to uh, to grow further uh, mm. off of uh, what is already now uh, more than uh, more than a million Australians employed mm. in manufacturing. Uh, there's been some strong growth in that sector, and we want to see that continue. Yeah. Um, and uh, an initiative like that is uh, is uh, providing a basis to help um, turbocharge that growth and to make it happen faster. And uh, and um, my understanding is that to the industry department is as I say in the advanced stages of. Um, assessing those applications and coming to a conclusion. Mm. Oh, look, and um, you know, I, I think the issue that I have with with the unallocated and how you use it is that people participate in these programs as they have, and the you know female change rooms and sw and um, program was a classic example um, where they apply. But it seems, and you know, there's guidelines and things like that, but in the heat of an election, the way that money is dispersed doesn't necessarily accord with the way people have participated in that program or understood that program to operate. You know, for example, people put in a lot of applications for female change rooms and then 40% of the fund went to Minister Porter's uh, seat and a seat you were trying to hold in Victoria. So that's the problem I have. You know, these funds are established with guidelines in a normal year, you know, but in a, and, and people apply for them and then in the caretaker or just on the eve of caretaker, they get distributed in a very political way. And Senator, um, and and your, you know, Mr Albanese has already announced close to $26 million worth of grants just across uh, sporting facilities in the electorates of Braddon and La Trobe, um, which would both be but we uh, don't marginal have an coalition seats fund that, that you are seeking to win at the next are election. people applying so, for. Like, um, the point is, these are funds that you've put in the well, budget. Well, Senator, the, the question you asked was, um, in our budget reconciliation we made before election day, we indicated that certain commitments we would make, we had made during the campaign, would be paid for from unallocated parts yeah, of elsewhere in the funds. budget. Hidden in the budget. So that was, again, quite transparent. Uh, we were saying before people voted, here is how we are going to pay for well, our different promises. It was a footnote. And so you didn't actually explain where it was all coming from. It was a footnote that here are all the funds that we are going to use to um, funnel money into our targeted and marginal seats. You know, a fund that was ostensibly apply able for anyone to apply for, you were taking decisions about where to put that money and it was overwhelmingly going into seats you needed to hold or win. And these are funds that people had applied for through government, with government guidelines and grant um, rules which ministers then made their own individual decisions on. And there's like audit report after audit report that, that says that's exactly what happened. And what your evidence today is, is that with this, you know, billions of dollars sitting in these funds, that that's going to be the same approach that you'll take. Is this why the Prime Minister doesn't want an anti-corruption commission? Senator, uh, we, went, uh, we went around that extensively at length yesterday and the government is very happy uh, to see a model of the Commonwealth Integrity Commission legislated and we invite you to support it and that legislation could pass through the parliament. Um, uh, in terms of localised grants, Senator, um, you know, you're already out there announcing them in Gilmore, in Ryan, in Braddon, in Lyons, in La Trobe, uh, in, uh, in Bowman, in Griffith, uh, in Macquarie. You know, these all appear to be seats that you either hold or want to win. Um, so uh, so uh, I'm not going to take lectures um, uh, from you in relation to local projects that are targeted in different ways because it's quite it's clear use that of it's quite funds. clear that it's the, the use 27 of separate discretionary grant announcements you've made um, since September last year totaling 211 million dollars, Senator. 211 yeah. million dollars of separate discretionary grant announcements just since September last well, year that Mr Albanese and the team have made? I don't walk away from the fact we are making commitments in local seats. I am questioning you as the government of the day that has 
billions of dollars squirrelled away for an election campaign war chest and through funds that are going to be determined based on seats, not necessarily on the guidelines or the merit of the program when it was established in government. And your evidence is yes, that is going to continue. No, well, Senator, my evidence is that, uh, is that uh, from my knowledge offhand, a number of the funds that you're asking about uh, have um, processes already underway that I would expect to conclude uh, fairly soon in relation to um, uh, the applicants that have been applications that have been made for those grants. Um, but uh, and will we continue to fully fund and fully budget for our policies? Yes, we will. So, and may we make local announcements just the same as you've made um, uh, 27 local announcements totaling $211 million okay. in the last few months? Yes, I expect we will make some local announcements. Out of these funds? which well, is what you well, did last well, time. Well, we will be clear in terms of where we're paying for them from no, out not. of the budget. Um, whether or not you are, I don't know. At present, I can't say where the um, $211 million of commitments that you've made in the last few months, where those 27 separate uh, programs will be uh, will be paid for from. Don't know if we you will can, be Senator. Up clear. We will be very clear with our costings. Right. They won't be like yours, which is a footnote saying, by the way, we're using all this money that we've squirrelled in the budget to actually um, spend in targeted marginal seats. That will not be what we're doing. So when, you're, um, when you reflect on this term in, um, or this period in government, and we've had the Urban Congestion Fund where 83% of the money, over $3 billion, went to target or coalition seats. The Commuter Car Park Fund, 85% went to coalition or target seats. Building Better Regions Fund, 90% of rounds one to five went to coalition or target seats. The community Development Grants, 70% went to coalition seats. Safer Communities, round three, 91% went to, to coalition or target seats. That's over $7 billion across those five funds, of which 82% went to coalition seats or target seats. So that's just going to continue, is it? Well, Senator, I can but note, I'm just scanning down the list here of the 27 announcements that you've made. I know you're trying to blame Labor. I know no, you're trying no, no, to blame I, Labor, I, no, but I'm you not are trying a minister to... in this government. Se 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 Senator, I'm not trying to blame. I'm just you are. highlighting the hypocrisy. You're trying to make every, everything that comes to this government, because you never take responsibility, no. is Labor's fault. You've no, been no. in government for almost Senator. a decade, Senator Gallagher, and it's Labor's fault. I think fault. you should listen to the minister's response. Se Senator, I'm not trying to lay any blame. I am just it's highlighting the, the hypocrisy in the questioning. It's to divert. You know, whether it was the hypocrisy from, and I've, I've found the figure now, from Mr Shorten's $300 million park and ride fund, which he announced as a fund, and then he went and separately announced each of the individual projects, which you criticised the government for, for doing. Yep. Or indeed, when you want to talk about local projects or whose seats are favoured, from what I can see, of the 27 projects that have been announced since September last year by Mr Albanese, so this is your they defense. are all either in Labor seats or in the coalition seats of Ryan, Braddon, Latrobe, Flynn, Bowman, Swan, Leichhardt. So Tell Minister, me which of those are not target seats for the Labor Party. Us so 100% so of what you're promising today. You will see us today. make commitments right across um, the electorates in the lead up to the election. But we're not talking about Labor commitments, which are being announced up front from opposition months ahead of an election. We're talking about the government's approach over nine years in government to spend billions of dollars. And the figure of those five funds that I, I read out, $6.9 billion has been spent across those five funds and 5.7 billion landed in coalition or target seats. So 82% of that funding, almost $7 billion. And that's just gonna continue. You see no problem with that at all. Sure. No distortion that 82% just found its way into government seats. Well, Senator, I know that from the analysis I've seen, uh, seen you release before, uh, there's usually some selectivity that goes to which grant programs you're looking at. So you certainly make sure you, oh, to, so that you include all, all of the regional involved. programs. So it's um, not all grant programs. You certainly make sure that you include all of the regional programs 
um, in any analysis you undertake. Uh, and then, of course, airbrush the fact that the coalition overwhelmingly holds the vast majority of electorates in regional okay, Australia. So that work doesn't um, work for the urban congestion um, fund, does it? At, uh, now, Senator, <laughs> Senator, as I said, I'm not going to take the lectures Commuter from you when 100% oh, okay. of your announcements in the last few months have all been Labor or target seats uh, of the Labor Party. Uh, I'm not going to take lectures on the, Labor, on the car parks program either when your park and ride program set up at the last election, a $300 million fund, uh, seem to operate almost identically to what the government did, uh, and yet you come in and apply a double standard. No, it's no double standard, and you signed off those projects in government as ministers with no assessment, no recommendations, and they all went to seats you wanted to win, using funds you'd appropriated through the budget with no transparency at all. Quite and unlike what Labor was doing, from opposition, I might say. But anyway, so your well, defence is Labor does it, or Labor's, Labor's promising things from opposition, therefore, in government, we can um, spend billions of no, dollars Sen just in seats that we hold. No, my, my se Senator, my contention is I'm not going to sit here and just accept a double standard or hypocrisy no uh, standard. From, uh, from you in your questioning. So as Finance Minister, you have no problem with that? the spending of $7 billion so, disproportionately so, favouring coalition seats. 82% go to coalition or target seats out of those five well, funds. It's 100% uh, on the Labor Party promises at present going to Labor or Labor oh. target seats. Nine years of rorting and it's going to continue. So the Safer Communities Fund. Yesterday there was um, an audit report and it said Funding decisions were not appropriately informed by departmental briefings and for the majority of the decisions, the basis for the decision was not clearly recorded. How is it that nine years into this government, this is still happening? And after audit report after audit report, which basically says finances grant guidelines are not being appropriately used, essentially. Senator, um, is there any consequence for not using, for not doing the right thing? Let's, let, let's fully unpack. The, the ANO made five recommendations, I understand it, uh, around the provision of clear information and assistance to grant applicants and, uh, and the nature of advice uh, being provided uh, to ministers. And, uh, and I'm advised that the Department of Home Affairs has accepted uh, all of those, uh, those recommendations in terms of the processes. Equally, the ANO findings uh, were clear that uh, all grants under the Safer Communities Fund uh, under the eight selection processes that were examined were found to be eligible for funding uh, and were authorised under the Commonwealth Grants Rules and Guidelines. Um, that uh, it found no instances of non-compliance with the mandatory reporting requirements in the guidelines uh, where ministers approved grants uh, and where grants were not recommended. It's, uh, it's very clear, I think, uh, uh, Senator, that uh, this is um, a highly successful program that, uh, that I think has um, supported more than 650 projects uh, across the country uh, in terms of improved uh, street safety, CCTV, lighting, security upgrades, particularly upgrades at, uh, at, um, uh, at sensitive locations uh, that may face issues of racial or religious intolerance uh, and is quite valued by those communities. So, again, it comes to um, you have a process, people apply, and then we have ministers come in. So it was, did you accept that Minister Dutton made some promises during the Braddon by-election? And then there was a process that started after that promise was made. So an election promise made in the Braddon by-election. Then the department sort of says, OK, well, how do we handle this? Do we have to have a process? It was then ranked not meritorious, and then it was selected for funding. Like, how does that happen? If all, if everything's okay, Senator. How does that uh, actually happen? Uh, I'm sure you would be uh, right up there uh, criticising the government if it didn't honour promises that it made. Okay, so because it made, because it was a promise, then. Regardless of that, regardless of how it fits into the the grant application process, it still gets funded. Why, why, why just not deliver on it through another 
appropriation rather than skew things to try and make it fit into another program. Well, Senator, where, uh, where the promise is and commitment is made to the Australian public, um, the government expects to deliver on that in, uh, in terms of uh, projects like that. Um, uh, the you know, means of delivery then becomes uh, a case of what is going to be the most effective and efficient means of, uh, of delivery. Uh, setting up a, a completely alternate process or structure may not necessarily be the most efficient or effective means of delivery. That's a judgment for, uh, for a relevant minister to make in, uh, in consultation with their department. But you've got a situation where you've got applicants who have put in applications through a competitive process, understand the, the rules of engagement, and then out of left field comes a commitment to do something else, then surely that impacts on the people who have applied through the competitive process because they miss out. Because this one comes in that's not meritorious, that wasn't involved in that process and gets funded. How is that Sen fair? Well, well Senator, there, there are finite funds. That's, uh, that's a fact in, uh, in relation to the application of, uh, of programs like this. Um, the government's continued to support and to invest in, uh, in safer communities, uh, providing opportunities in different funding rounds uh, for projects to be supported. Um, we've done so since 2016. Um, as I said, it's supported more than 650 different projects. Now, uh, now um, yes, you know, we also seek to make sure that if, uh, if particular commitments are made uh, as a result uh, of awareness of situations or issues in local communities, we get on and deliver on those uh, those commitments. So wouldn't it be, I mean, if, if you were going to be in accordance with the guidelines and um, arrangements for these funds, wouldn't it be more upfront to say, well, that we have this competitive process, except when ministers want to determine their own project, project. like at least tell people what you're doing. like. You know, for all the people that miss out because someone's come in over the top and made a promise during a by-election, it's not really a competitive or merit-based process then. Well, Sen Senator, delivering on a commitment made is, uh, is something you would expect government to do. Uh, it's something I would assume that, uh, that as, uh, as you make various promises that, uh, that I would hope and trust, uh, you would do if, uh, if elected. Um, uh, uh, obviously, there are then processes that, uh, that can apply and do apply to, uh, to different grant programs and, uh, and they uh, run their course within the funds that are available to them. And so then when the Assistant Minister visited a couple of um, applicants after the funding round had closed, then approved over a million dollars to five applicants, how is that in line? with a merit-based assessment that, like, are we, are we at the point now where all of this is completely acceptable in government, you know? Senator, the, the role of ministers and indeed local MPs in terms of their advocacy for uh, different uh, programs that MPs uh, will advocate support for based on the knowledge of, uh, of circumstances in different communities and different parts of the country, uh, and then for ministers in, uh, in considering that, uh, is, uh, is well known, is well advanced. Um, uh, it's been a part of, uh, of various programs and government decision making through Labor and Liberal governments uh, or Labor and Coalition governments for, uh, for a very long period of time. Um, I can only assume that, uh, that whilst they are skewed towards Labor held or Labor target seats, uh, that the type of commitments that, uh, that your party is making at present in, uh, in different communities around the country uh, are a function at least of um, the advocacy by local MPs, the advocacy by local candidates uh, that are convincing your shadow ministry team uh, of the merits of support for those programs in those local communities. Okay, so Minister Wood decides to award $1.3 million to five applicants despite advice from the department that the projects were unsuitable for funding after a merit-based assessment process. And the decision was made after the assistant minister had visited the applicants after the funding round had closed. And you have no problem with that. You think that's entirely acceptable? 
Senator, uh, without having um, all of the, uh, the facts and, uh, and the information about the different uh, cases, uh, I'm not going to judge, um, sit here and judge the merits of each different application. Well, I've given you the scenario. Um, you know, my, my understanding is in terms of um, some of those, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I gather there was um, one for uh, the North Victoria Buddhist Association's uh, temple uh, that, um, uh, that was part of that case and, uh, and I understand um, that, uh, that, um, uh, that the Assistant Minister visited uh, that site at the invitation of the local Labor MP. Um, uh, oh. and, uh, and provided, uh, uh, obviously, um, final support for security enhancements at that Buddhist temple uh, following uh, those representations and that advocacy. Senator Gallagher, um, you have had the call for close to an hour now and I have a few questions that I would like to ask about um, SME contracts. Can I... Are you happy to pass the call around or do you have much longer yeah, on this line no, of no, questioning? I can pass the call okay. Thank you very much, um, Senator Gallagher. I have... I'll just... Sorry, mark the time. Um, I have some questions about um, federal contracts being awarded to SMEs. I'll just have to get, get the right officials. Thanks, Ms Huxtable. to the officials. I know I've asked questions about this particular topic um, a couple of times at estimates now, um, but um, I'd like an update on what the most recent Commonwealth procurement data says about the share of contracts that we are providing to small and medium enterprises. Andrew Danks, First Assistant Secretary, Procurement and Insurance Division. Uh, Senator, our 2021 uh, Austender results were released a couple of months ago. Uh, against the targets that are in the Commonwealth Procurement Rules, uh, we have improved year on year from the 2019-20 results. Uh, the first target was to source 10% of all procurement contracts by value from SMEs. In 2019-20, 25.2% 20, uh, of contracts were awarded. Uh, in 2020-21, 27%. Um, that resulted in a $5 billion increase in contracts going to SMEs. Uh, the second target is to procure at least 35% by value of all contracts up to $20 million from SMEs. Uh, in 2019-20, uh, it was 40.5%. In 2020-21, it was 43.4%. Uh, so there's been a, a gradual increase year on year on the contracts that SMEs are being awarded by government. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, are you able to split those numbers out from medium businesses to small businesses? Uh, we, we can. The definition in our Commonwealth procurement rules for SMEs is for um, any company under 200 FTE, Australian and New Zealand yep. owned. But we do have some particular statistics on small businesses. Great. Um, that would be wonderful. Thank so you. So small businesses are those, I think, with less than 10 FTE, um, and they were estimated to be awarded 8% of contracts by value in 2021. Um, it's broadly consistent with 2019-20 to around $5.4 billion year on year. Uh, for contracts valued up to $200,000, um, there are a total of 62,602 contracts awarded, and by value, SMEs were awarded 51.4% uh, of those contracts. Okay. Um, are there any categories of contracts where SMEs comprise a significant share of the contracts being awarded? I'm just thinking like the, the types of contract, or the type of work rather, that the government might be contracting out for. Where are we? most often engaging with small and medium enterprises? Oh, I think small and medium enterprises centre are engaged across the whole breadth and scope of government um, contracts, uh, from, from cleaning contracts, from consultancies, contractors, um, that they're, they're involved in, in the whole scope. And I think as I kind of flagged earlier, the, the definition is for an Australian or New Zealand company with less than 200 um, FTE equivalents, so that they are reasonably sized com um, countries that, oh, sorry, companies, companies. Uh, that, um, do provide a whole, whole range of services to government. Yeah, so what, what we've talked about them being consultancy services, what, across what sorts of industries? Um, the whole breadth, so stationary supplies, um, 
accommodation providers, uh, consultants that we use for day-to-day -day to assist with government business, um, property services, there's a whole range of things. I don't have a particular list, Senator, but I could take on notice. I was about to say, Mr like. Danks, if you could take that on notice, because I would be very interested to know um, across how many different industries are we we're trying to um, spread this important work out. I mean, I, I think it's very good that we as a government have a firm commitment to trying to source more services from SMEs wherever possible, because small business is the backbone of our economy. Um, I saw in um, one of the budget measures a reference to dynamic sourcing for panels. Could you tell me what you mean by that? Um, dynamic sourcing for panels is a function of our Austender website and that allows um, for Commonwealth panels to be uploaded to this um, system so that we can uh, streamline the engagement with industry. Um, it provides a, a one-stop portal for um, suppliers to come to for agencies to access, to be able to access those panels. Um, the government has recently mandated dynamic sourcing for panels um, for all Commonwealth panels going forward. Yeah. Um, so over time it will provide um, a great, a richer source of data of the use of those panels across the Commonwealth, yeah. but it does also reduce the cost of administration for both government and suppliers. Yeah. So sorry, forgive me for asking the obvious question. Why, does, why is this necessarily dynamic? Is it because there's now an online portal that suppliers are inputting their information to? Is that, is that Look, why? The, the, the name of it was uh, well before time, my time, but, <laughs> but, but, but I think it's, it's fair to say, so it, it, it is quite um, intuitive, but we are investing in some upgrades to it at the moment to make it even more intuitive for both suppliers and agencies. Um, but it is, it, it is a bit of a revolutionary step where we can actually have uh, greater access to the data and greater access to agencies who are using the panels um, okay. Another way we do, we're assisting with this is some of our whole of Australian government panels. Um, we've recently um, finalised our management advisory services panel for phase one and phase two, and, and those services will be up on dynamic sourcing for panels. Yeah. So if I'm a small business and I want to be considered to do government work, do I go to this dynamic sourcing section of the Austender website and input my information, then it's there to be considered for government to use? Is that the idea? No, it's more in that example that uh, the small and medium enterprise would have to bid for a, a tender process for a panel, and if they were successful on that panel, um, they would then be input into the dynamic, dynamic sourcing for panels um, software so that other agencies can access them going forward. They still have to go through a tender process, though, to get onto dynamic sourcing for panels. A tender process or a selection process to get onto to the panel? It, it's still a tender process to get on a panel. Um, panel procurements are normally a bit more streamlined because obviously the, the scope of services that could be required across the life of the panel um, is uncertain um, over a period of time. Um, so it is normally a more streamlined tender process. Um, but certainly you have to go through that tender process, become a successful supplier, and then you get uploaded to the DS4P system. Okay, cool. Um, and just to loop back on my original topic being SMEs, do you know how many SMEs are on um, this new um, panel arrangement? So for the management advisory services, we, we tended it in three different phases, phase yep. one, two, and three. Um, phase one went live on the 12th of July, and on that panel we have, uh, I was trying to find my data here, so apologies, centers, 125 suppliers, um, of which 86 are small and medium enterprises, that's around 69% of the panel. Our phase two management advisory services panel went live yesterday. Um, we had 157 suppliers appointed to that panel, with 129, or 82%, oh, being great. small and medium enterprises. Wonderful. That's really good news. Thank you very much for that update, Mr Danks, and sorry, Mr Williamson, to get you up to the table and not ask you anything. Um, happy to give the call back Labor's way, Senator Ayres. <laughs> Minister, um, there was some... Um, there's a question on notice, I think, uh, 4293, that dealt with incentive payments for Australia Post executives, and I think it um, it uh, ran yesterday in the financial in the financial review. Um, what what both of those uh, both the, the response to the question on notice uh, and the financial review set out is that executives at Australia Post 
who are paid between three and four hundred thousand dollars uh, every year received a taxpayer funded bonus that averaged one hundred and sixty eight thousand um, dollars. Does, does the government consider that kind of bonus appropriate? Um, Senator, uh, and I understand that um, uh, Post has been addressing some of these issues themselves directly in, uh, in questioning. Yeah, I'll come um, to their answers in a moment. I, what, what I want to well, know I, is, well, I don't. Do, does, does, do you as the Finance Minister consider a $168,000 bonus for an already exorbitantly paid Australia Post executive appropriate? So uh, we have had uh, had some concerns about the way uh, government business enterprises uh, have applied some of their bonus policies in the past. Um, uh, that uh, that led to uh, um, a review that was undertaken in relation to uh, bonus uh, policy, uh, and has seen um, uh, Minister Morton and I uh, communicate in various ways with uh, with the various GBEs, reminding them of their. Um, obligations under the PGPA Act, um, uh, reminding them of uh, the uh, policy settings that exist in relation to remuneration. Uh, Mr Williamson may want to go through a little bit more of the detail around, uh, around that process and, uh, and what has applied, uh, but, uh, but um, we have um, identified concerns in, uh, in, in the broad uh, that, uh, that have take caused us to, uh, to bring that to the attention of the chairs of uh, all the relevant GBEs. Anything to add, Mr Williamson? Uh, so the performance bonus guidelines that the minister referred to were released on the 13th of August last year, Senator. Um, uh, they cover uh, basically all Commonwealth entities. As the minister indicated, there was follow-up correspondence to government business enterprises making them aware of the guidelines and the expectation that they <clears throat> take those into consideration when setting their remuneration structure. Um, <clears throat> the guidelines, uh, I think it's fair to say, I mean, promulgated by the APSC, but certainly have an expectation that performance bonuses uh, are only used uh, uh, in particular circumstances and there needs to be um, strong supporting reasons and remuneration structures within entities. Uh, and that's been relayed to government business enterprises in terms of uh, moving forward, uh, how they go about setting those. But ultimately, in the end, though, those remuneration arrangements are set by the accountable authorities with, within the respective GBEs. So, Minister, does a, does a $168,000 bonus for a person who's already paid and paid between three and four hundred thousand dollars a year, sit inside or outside the guidelines. Like, is that okay with you, um, uh, Senator? Uh, um, um, I'm reluctant to comment on an individual person's remuneration. Um, uh, that is a very significant bonus relative to um, um, that base rate. It's a very significant bonus in anybody's terms. Um, uh, what I'm not aware of is, uh, are of course, the terms that uh, were required to be met in relation to that bonus, um, what, uh, what commercial uh, outcomes or other outcomes for um, uh, the enterprise uh, were required before that bonus was paid. And so uh, I think to purely make a judgment call uh, or a value statement on it uh, without having all of the facts uh, would, uh, um, would be uh, to... Uh, to um, leap to judgment without uh, without all the information. So, it, so in your mind, it's conceivable, depending on the facts, that a one hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollar bonus might be appropriate. Senator, uh, Senator, um, it's conceivable. It's G well, given your answer. It's either it's well, either. I I've well, asked you to well, rule Senator, it out. You said, yeah, well, I'm not look, quite sure what you said. It was a, it was a lot of words. It, it, does that mean that it's conceivable that it could be? Possible for the employee of a government business enterprise to earn $168,000 in taxpayers' money as a bonus, Senator. Dependent upon just how much is uh, is at risk, uh, what the terms are to be met. Um, there are obviously um, commercial negotiations between 
um, between employees uh, and the management teams and the boards in the setting of these. Uh, the policy guidelines that, uh, that we set um, are focused very much on ensuring um, that there is value uh, for, uh, for government, for the enterprise, for taxpayers uh, in the performance of those enterprises. Uh, and that is ultimately uh, what is, uh, what is a, a key element here. Government business enterprises operate um, in um, a sometimes challenging environment where, uh, where uh, they have to compete. Uh, for skilled talent against the private sector. Uh, they compete uh, to uh, secure those commercial skills and other talent uh, with the constraints of government policy settings applied to them, with the additional transparency of processes like this uh, applied to them. Um, so uh, so uh, I am mindful that, uh, that in getting the best commercial performance of uh, GBEs, they need to get the best commercial performers, uh, but they have to do that against the types of parameters and, uh, and rules that we set. Chair, I think that's a Birmingham yes, isn't it? No. Se Senator, I know you're looking for me to Is that cast a so, so, particular so, judgment. So four minutes ago when you began, were, were you developing your, in your mind a yes or a no? It sounded very much like a yes to me, it. that it's conceivable for the Morrison government. Now remember, remember 18 months or so ago, the former Chief Executive of Australia Post got the boot, Mr Morrison bellowing on the floor of the parliament because she handed out some watches. You're now saying $168,000 bonus for somebody who is already being paid between three and $400,000 is conceivably okay. Your Senator, uh, as I indicated uh, in the first answer and the second answer, um, you're presenting one part of the facts, not all of the facts in your response. I would want to be informed of all of the facts in relation to, uh, in relation to how such arrangements were structured uh, before I decided to make um, comments. As I said, it sounds like a very um, large payment in anybody's terms and relative to the size uh, of the salary, I would expect there to be uh, some pretty significant performance requirements that would have to be met in, uh, in that regard. I understand that uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of post, uh, the uh, majority of their bonuses were paid uh, to people on salaries below public service SES level. Um, so that's to people managing distribution and retail networks, sales managers, uh, etc. So post clearly in terms of driving the performance outcomes of, uh, of their employees um, has uh, a widespread use of bonuses. They're matters that, uh, that post is best placed to address directly themselves. So Minister, um, earlier today that the Chair of Australia Post claimed that these bonuses were not bonuses. Are they bonuses? Well, Senator, there are different ways in which performance payments can be structured. What, 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 what else could they be called? Is, is there another? I, I mean, this morning you, you refused to distinguish between the decisions of government in caretaker periods and the commitments that political parties make in the lead up to elections. That, that would be another instance are, of verbal are you gonna, from, are you uh, from the obfuscate, opposition. Are you going to obfuscate your way through this question too? Are these bonuses or not? Senator, um, as I've said a couple of times, I don't have the contractual details between Australia Post and whomever the employee is that you're asking about. Um, Post to best place to answer those questions. Um, there are different ways in which performance payments are structured uh, in contractual terms. If you want Mr Williamson to talk about how the policy settings envisage some of those different structural arrangements uh, or the like, I'm sure he can do so. Well, what are they, bonuses or not? If they're not bonuses, what are they? Okay. Well, let's talk about how different performance payments are structured. I think well, that's well, what I, Senator Ayres is it, trying to ask. What, what I'm trying to ask... Uh, is the chair of Australia Post reckons that these aren't bonuses. 
I, I don't need a sort of long outline of how performance pay works, but they're bonuses, aren't they, Mr Williamson? Uh, Senator, so I, I'm not familiar with the evidence that the Chair gave this morning, but what I would say is in terms of Australia Post, they're reporting in their um, annual report. Uh, for their executive remuneration, they report base salary, short-term incentive, other benefits and allowances, superannuation, long service leave, other long-term benefits and allowances. So depending on what the um, payment's related to, it could be a short-term incentive, but there could be uh, a long-term retention bonuses, which are not uncommon in both uh, in the private sector to try to retain employment. Short-term so incentive is a bonus, isn't it? I can't comment on um, the, the chair's uh, um, evidence because I don't have the context, sorry. But that's how Australia Post report. But, but Senator, yes, I mean, a short-term incentive, um, which is paid against certain KPIs, I would shorthand that as a bonus. A long-term retention payment, I wouldn't necessarily shorthand that in the yeah, same $168, way. Yeah, $168,000 payment in, uh, over a 12-month period is a bonus, isn't it? Well, I don't know what that is comprised of, Senator, whether there are different elements to that amongst the definition we were just discussing. And you can't tell me whether you think that it's $168,000 is acceptable or not? I think that it is, uh, it is high, as I said, I think Senator, I know what most people um, think. But in terms of its acceptability, I would assess that against right. knowing the details, which you're unable to furnish me with and which I don't have to hand. Uh, certainly, Minister Fletcher and I both wrote to the Chair of Australia Post last year, uh, reminding them of the changes that have been made to the well, policy that settings impact, following the Morton Review. That didn't have much impact, did it? Well, these would have been contractual terms set before uh, that was, uh, was undertaken, I expect, Senator. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator S. Senator Waters, you can have the call. Uh, can I start with the standards, please? My EFO included a not-for-publication allocation of ongoing funding to provide support services for parliamentary staff and parliamentarians including through the continuation of the Safe and Respectful Workplaces Training Program and the dedicated 24-7 parliamentary support line. Um, can I ask for further information, please, about how much sure. has been provided and over what period, please? So, okay. so Senator, we can probably answer the budget elements of that question now if, uh, if you want. If you're intending to sort of go into the more operational elements, um, uh, that's more a matter for, for outcome three okay. um, I'll stick later with the today in terms of the support then. for parliamentarians and so on. So, Senator, I think um, apart from what's in the budget papers or in, oh, sorry, I didn't think I had uh, Ms Walsh here, but she's here. So she will assist you. Thank you. So Thanks, you're, you're talking about um, page need... 217 of my EFO. Ms. Walsh, do you need me to uh, go through the question again? That would be great. Thank yeah. you. So it was a not for publication allocation mm -hmm. that pertained to support services for parley staff and MPs, including the uh, Safe and Respectful Workplaces Training Program and the 24 7 parley support line. So I'm just interested in how much has been provided and over sure. what period. Uh, Claire Walsh, Deputy Secretary, Business Enabling Services. Sorry, um, Senator, I'm coming quickly to this. I was expecting these questions in outcome three, so I just want to clarify the actual question. Yes, so the, the budgetary the, amount... Oh. The, sorry, it's in there as not for publication. That's right. And the reasons for that is that there's some commercial elements associated with that expenditure. So um, if I take the example of the safe and respectful workplace training, as you know, we've been rolling that training out. Um, there's a chance we'll go to the market again <coughs> for that, or mm. it will be in some way adjusted in terms of the um, content or the offering uh, to pick up recommendations that are contained in the safe, um, the Jenkins review. So for that reason, because of the commercial sensitivity, it's not for publication. Okay, so how much has been expended to date? Um, Presumably you can tell me that. I'll, I'll have a look in my in my notes, and if I don't have that here, I can certainly make sure I have it when we get to outcome three to give Thank you. Thank you. And is there a? a um, I'm not sure I agree with the commercial things, but anyway, if if that is the case, is there not a, a sort of window or parameter of funding that you've uh, an envelope? 
So can I just clarify, you're asking about the, a particular expenditure, say the, the training program that is currently in the um, currently being offered, or are you talking about? I'm just one interested that might in be? as much as you can tell me about the not for publication bit, given that some expenditure has now occurred and presumably will continue to occur. Yeah. Is there any further details that you can provide at this stage about that expenditure line item, which was previously a not for publication in my EFO? Yeah. Sorry, Senator. I'm just looking for that. So if I can um, maybe. Uh, so if I can just go directly to the, um, the contract with PwC for the mm -hmm. full out of, rollout of the existing uh, program, that's uh, $1,153,561. One, Do you want one, me to say that? Yeah, 1151. $1,153,561.32. And that is a contract that includes everything, uh, all the sessions, the reporting, follow-up evaluation, uh, travel expenses, those sorts of, of things. Okay. Um, is there any funding allocated to support the Human Rights Commission to continue to support the work um, of the task force, the um, task force for implementing the recommendations? Or is that a separate line item? I'm just I'm interested now in the what funding has been given to the Human Rights Commission to continue the good work that they've begun? So I'm not sure that I, can I just clarify, mm. the Human Rights Commission um, doesn't Sex have- Sex Discrimination Commissioner, per se. So in relation to expenditure for the Human Rights Commission, uh, that's a question to direct to the Attorney General's department. Yes, I've just been there. Yeah, if it's in relation to um, implementation of the, mm. the Jenkins review, mm. then uh, I think that they're separate things in the sense that the Human Rights Commission doesn't necessarily have an ongoing role for the, to, to do that in terms of a piece of work that they might be contracted to do. Does that make sense? Uh, no. It does, but I don't think that's correct because no. they've just told me that there is an ongoing role for Commissioner Jenkins. So I'm interested in whether any of the not for, public, not for publication line item has support for Commissioner Jenkins and her team. So, or whether that is non-existent or in some other line item. So, so, yeah. so, so Senator Waters, um, uh, additional funding was provided to the IHRC for um, uh, Commissioner Jenkins to be able to undertake a, a surge capacity, yeah. if you like, in, yeah. uh, in terms of the um, conduct and completion of the set standard report. Mm. Um, that funding was reflected, uh, I think, in, uh, in last year's budget papers. Um, uh, the um, funding um, that has been initially provided for implementation of uh, those recommendations um, is as laid out um, in my EFO on, uh, on page 217. Um, uh, in terms of some of Commissioner Jenkins's ongoing roles where the leadership task force will consult with her, I'm sure, from time to time and, uh, and she will provide advice on different matters, um, much of that would be within the normal functioning of, uh, of AHRC uh, operations. Um, obviously, if there are particular uh, needs in relation to delivery of the set the standard recommendations that, uh, that the IHRC uh, has, re has regard to, they'll be considered in the normal budget context this mm. year, but, uh, but I'm not aware of what those particular um, additional requirements might be outside of uh, the ordinary support mm. and, uh, and administrative assistance the IHRC provides to each of the commissioners. Okay, so just for clarity, when there's ongoing consultation with Commissioner Jenkins, that will come out of the HRC's core budget. But if there is, at what stage that, that, would there I mean, be extra I mean, funding? I mean, if there's I mean, a specific that, I mean, ask, or if there, I mean, if, if there were extraordinary um, uh, additional engagements and activities, mm -hmm. uh, so. The, the rationale for providing additional budget assistance to the IHRC in last year's budget uh, was that you know, this was a significant piece of mm. work having to be undertaken in a relatively uh, compressed period of time, mm. that they would need to bring in um, additional staff to help with the widespread consultations that Commissioner Jenkins herself was seeking to undertake and the mm. IHRC were undertaking with the handling of all of those submissions, the conduct of the interviews and the final drafting and preparation of the report. Mm. That was all work, obviously, that the IHRC themselves had to undertake and required a surge capability. Um, uh, what is envisaged, I think, in most of the engagement that is ongoing from set the standard 
uh, is more likely that uh, we, Senator Waters, uh, as part of the leadership task force and potentially other arms of government in implementing the recommendations may well engage back with Commissioner Jenkins mm. around, um, like was the case on the statement of acknowledgement, feedback on the mm. text and so forth, mm. uh, but that's not analogous to the type mm. of elevated operational environment that, that she and the AHRC mm. had to operate in to, to deliver set the standard. Mm. Um, there's a significant budget provided to the AHRC for their ongoing operations and the support of, uh, of each of their commissioners in the first place. Okay, well, they're, they're on in a different committee tonight, so I'll be asking them if she's got enough resourcing to be able to continue to contribute and for us all to get the benefit of, mm. of her expertise. Yep. And if the answer there is no, then I would hope that the government actually provides additional resources so that we can continue to learn from and build on her recommendations with her ongoing input. But I'll, I'll take that up with them um, later tonight. Um, so is there any separate funding stream for implementation of set the standards recommendations? Will there be a separate line item in the upcoming budget or will that be rolled into some other line item? So we're working through now what the costing implications might be mm -hmm. of some of the recommendations. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that there's been a determination there will be a standard line item. I don't think so because there would be... Um, uh, there's different elements of it, including setting up a new entity. Mm. Uh, but just to reassure you, Senator, that uh, obviously we're working through all of the recommendations in there and providing mm. advice to government around okay. costings. But will that end, so, will and, that end and, up as a... Sorry, yeah, sorry. sorry I was just going to add also that, um, as you're aware from the PMNC um, uh, testimony yesterday, PMNC is leading on the implementation of the um, implementation work and we are providing support to them and advice to them where it's relevant to uh, the elements of the recommendations that relate to the Department of Finance's current responsibilities. Mm. So, so, I mean, dependent upon what's assessed at this point in time and, uh, and noting there are some parts of, uh, of the recommendations that um, uh, that Commissioner Jenkins outlined take effect from later this year or onwards and there'll be some design considerations that have to be worked through. But um, uh, I would envisage, just as in my EFO, if decisions need to be taken in a budgeting context, uh, noting that my EFO already provided $17.8 million over four years for implementation of, uh, uh, of responses to set the standards, so the government has already uh, applied a significant sum of uh, funds to uh, help with that in, uh, in different ways. Um, uh, but uh, if there's additional that, rather than the sort of separate line item that you've suggested, um, uh, Senator, it would be reflected more analogous to what was the case in my EFO, that there's a measure um, that the government determines to support, uh, which it did with that $17.8 million for implementation, uh, that is identified as a measure in, uh, in budget paper number two um, uh, for, uh, the, for then the different streams of implementation, which would then, in terms of sort of line item terms, entail separate um, line mm -hmm. items. Um, in this case, the $17.8 million involving support for the APSC, PM&C, finance in, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of pursuit of different pieces of work around the rec different recommendations. Thank you, Minister. So has that 17.4 million all been spent? And if so, will more be forthcoming? Um, or will seven, it be rolled over? 17.8, and, and no, it's, a, it's uh, budgeted over four years. Oh, I see, I see. So are we expecting an increase in the overall amount? Uh, that will depend, uh, Senator, in terms of um, uh, agencies' assessments around um, the needs related to implementation. Right. Um, are there any arrangements being made for survivors and staff, and former staff for that matter, and unions to contribute to the development of the Code of Conduct, which is another of the Jenkins recs? Uh, well, Senator, as you know, both chambers have now passed mm -hmm. um, the resolution recommended by Commissioner Jenkins to establish the uh, Joint Select Committee uh, for the development of the Code of Conduct. Um, and that's the process that Commissioner Jenkins recommended. Um, and within that process of uh, parliamentary committee operations, uh, the parliament is funded to, uh, to support committees to conduct hearings in different locations, to do them uh, in camera uh, or publicly, 
uh, and, uh, and to receive that sort of, uh, of feedback from anyone who wishes to participate. Okay, I, I think, think just we, the normal... Just we are well into outcome three territory here as well. Oh, okay, orders. well that was my second last question. On okay, that. thank, thank you. you. Um, so will any additional uh, measures or approach be considered or just feedback through the joint committee process in the normal manner from survivors and staff? Will there be a chance, for example, for them to see any draft code of conduct and have input on that? It Senator, seems appropriate I, I, in this I, case. Well, I, I would hope, Senator, that, that the committee will be conscious of, uh, of that. It was an express recommendation of Kate's that, that we use that process mm. to develop the codes of conduct. Um, by its nature, it's a consultative process, mm. um, given the way in which parliamentary committees work. It doesn't need to all be in public. I would stress um, that committees, as you all know, have the opportunity to undertake actions um, in camera. Um, uh, I don't think that uh, it would be appropriate for the government to seek to run a competing process around the development of those codes of conduct. We as the leadership task force, uh, the cross-party leadership task force, might want to discuss whether there are different things that we think um, are necessary mm. that we might recommend to that committee in mm. terms of uh, how it undertakes its work uh, and very open to have uh, those discussions, but uh, but I think Commissioner Jenkins was pretty clear in her recommendations that that basically said this should not be a government task; it should be a Parliament task, and yes. so um, that's what uh, the Parliament is uh, is funded and provided to do. Yes, hopefully there might be some budgetary consideration for supporting and facilitating staff, um, former staff, survivors to to contribute um, in a way that's additional to the normal manner in those committees. Um, can I ask now, before I move on to some other matters, if time permits, is what's the current status of development and review of the uh, harassment, bullying, DV and related policies for MOP staff? Where is that one at? Well and truly in outcome three, but... Um... Yes, thank you for your indulgence. I am afraid I do have to be in another committee for most of today, so that is my last question, which is possibly misplaced, and I do apologise for that. It you is hard to work to out where things belong. Uh, Senator Waters, uh, it is definitely an outcome three question, but in terms of, I know we've talked about the uh, work that uh, Department of Finance was doing in terms of updating the uh, two policies that you refer to. Mm -hmm. uh, that work continues, but we are now obviously contributing that to the, the work that uh, the Minister's just been describing in terms of the leadership task force uh, and the implementation of the, um, the uh, recommendations, uh, but those policies are, are well advanced okay. and What's have been well consulted. What's the time frame on their finalisation? Uh, I would need to come back to you on notice. It is something that's being uh, discussed actively in the broader context. All right, thank you. Um, can I move now to government contracts? What process is in place? And I think I'm in the right spot here, and apologies for the earlier questions not being so. Um, what process is in place to determine whether an applicant for a government contract or a tender has made a political donation in the past financial year? Is there any such process for checking whether people who want public money have made a political donation in that financial year? Um, Senator, I don't believe there's any rules in the Commonwealth Procurement Rules requiring a um, company to advise of any political donations. There are requirements for companies to disclose conflict of interest, and if a supplier considered that would raise to the issue of a conflict of interest, then they would um, provide it in their tender response. Okay, so I, I don't think that's, a, that's good enough, but if it is considered a conflict of interest, are you saying that the the person who's made the political donation is, and is now seeking public money through a grant or tender, they have to disclose of their own free will that they've made a donation? Is there no process that the department checks of their own accord whether applicants have donated to a political party? Well, the Commonwealth Procurement Framework is a devolved framework, so it's up to individual accountable authorities to put in processes in place to assure themselves that they're complying with Commonwealth Procurement Rules. Um, I think that's probably all I've got to say, sorry, Senator. Okay, so do any of the departments check, or do they all just wait for a donor who now wants a public tender to tell them that they're also a donor? You'd have to put that question to individual departments, and okay. well, we don't collect that level of data. Just to your department then? Uh, well, I speak on behalf of the procurement policy, as for how the Department of Finance undertakes its procurements, that would be a different area. Right. Well, we are, no, no, we've no. got 
Department are you suggesting, Finance Senator, here? That, a, that a company that has made a donation should be excluded from being able to win a contract? Well, in my opinion, yes, but that wasn't what I was asking the officials. And I, I'm interested in, is there a process for the department to check whether someone who's just applied for a grant or tender is also a political donor? Mm. Or are you relying on them, as, as was suggested, to say, yes, I have, and yes, this might be a conflict? That's not enough okay. protection in my mind. I mean, arguable, there's an argument that could be made, Senator, that, uh, that in terms of the procurement decisions and rules as they apply, uh, and, uh, and I would note that uh, around government contracts and procurement decisions, overwhelmingly they are signed off and determined by officials, not by ministers. Uh, and, uh, and there would be an argument that would be made that it would be inappropriate in terms of the assessment of the public servants uh, of the merits of those procurement decisions uh, for them to be giving any consideration to partisan um, elements of, uh, of any um, uh, tendering parties' activities. Well, we know that that's how it should be, but ministers are frequently involved well, well, in you're, you're, you're seemingly grants. suggesting that, 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 uh, that tenderers should provide um, such partisan information. No, I think the department should check, and I'm, and I'm seeking to establish whether the department does, and I, and I think the answer is no, and I, I hope I'm wrong. I, I think it's far better that, uh, that officials and departments, in making decisions uh, and assessments of tenders and contracts, uh, are doing so uh, free of any political consideration or interference. Where the minister has an involvement in the dispensation of public funds, as is routinely the case, and indeed just last night we heard that there's yet another rort that's been identified by the ANAO, this time by Minister Dutton, surely the public can expect that a department has a process to make sure that people who want public money, companies who want public money, haven't tried to seek a favour. And I'm, I'm incredulous that there's not a process for checking that enough. So I'm just again wanting to confirm that there's no proactive process by the Department of Finance or any other department to check on that. So, so Senator, in um, assessing procurements, we follow the procurement guidelines, and I speak on behalf of the department um, in this regard, you know, rather than the officers who are responsible for the whole government. Uh, procurement, I mean, they, those go specifically to the uh, acquiring of uh, goods and services. You know, the minister is correct. Predominantly, these are decisions taken uh, by officials, uh, and the procurement guidelines, you know, set out quite clearly uh, the types of considerations that should and should not be taken into account. Um, for example, at 4.4, sets out the criteria around achieving value for money. Um, that procurement should encourage competition, be non-discriminatory, use public resources in an efficient, effective, economical and ethical manner, facilitate accountable and transparent decision uh, making, uh, encourage appropriate engagement with risk uh, and, and the like. Um, the guidelines set out that price isn't the sole factor when assessing value for money, that it's also a consideration of quality, fitness, for purpose of the proposal uh, and the like. I mean, there is a wealth of information uh, in the procurement guidelines that our uh, officials follow uh, in terms of assessing what is in front of them, in terms of what the objective is of that procurement, uh, what the proposals are that have come forward, and then the process uh, of assessing those proposals. So we will be engaging with each procurement uh, on its merits uh, and coming uh, to review uh, at, at the appropriate um, official who is responsible for making those decisions. But you don't check whether any of the applicants have made a political donation in the preceding financial year? We would be focused on what is in front of us in terms of that procurement. Okay, so that's you know, I don't think that that matter would be relevant in terms of you know, whether uh, um, the goods and services that we are seeking to uh, procure uh, meet the criteria uh, Indeed, it should not be relevant, but the other in reality it is. It not be relevant in the decision-making oh. process. So, so, so do you keep a record? So, so, Senator, Senator that's, that's quite a slur um, uh, that, uh, that you're making there. Um, that, uh, that um, indeed, as Ms Huxtable has made clear, overwhelmingly procurement decisions and contractual decisions uh, made in relation to government procurements are handled by officials uh, and not uh, matters of decision uh, by ministers. 
uh, under no circumstances uh, should or would um, uh, donations uh, form part of the consideration uh, of, uh, of those decisions. And the suggestion that you've made uh, would in fact potentially run the risk that officials otherwise looking precisely at the type of considerations that should inform a decision may inadvertently have decisions skewed by virtue of awareness of factors that should not form part of the consideration of procurement decisions. I'm not seeking to impugn public servants. I would never do that. I'm seeking to make sure that ministers don't pick a winner based on who's just donated to them and tell the public servants which one to give the procurement tender to. Um, but I'm alarmed that there's no process in place to stop that. Uh, are there any records that are kept of contracts that have been issued that went to companies that donated? Uh, so the information around um, the outcome of processes is on Austender. Uh, so it is a very you know, transparent um, uh, you know, report that enables um, uh, anyone to see who has received uh, or who has been the subject of procurement by uh, the government. So that, that is the reporting uh, mechanism effectively. And I would just point out, and the officials are responsible for this, that in terms of the procurement uh, guidelines, and we have uh, international obligations in respect of procurement, the fundamental of the procurement framework is that it is non-discriminatory. Um, that it treats potential suppliers equitably uh, based on their abilities and doesn't discriminate against them based on their size, foreign affiliation or ownership, location uh, and the like. So that is sort of the fundamental um, that underpins the foundation on which the procurement framework is built. Yes, uh, I understand the that the words in black and white say what they need to say. My concern is that um, the reality of ministerial pressure um, is potentially leading to outcomes that are skewed and I'm wanting to know what protections are in place to stop that happening. So far there's not any and Austender, as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't um, match up successful tenderers with political donors. Someone would need to track that information against the uh, donations disclosure which we know is, is flawed and incomplete because of the volumes of dark money that are donated anyway. So there's not a lot of transparency here. Well the transparency is that uh the outcome of tender processes that are conducted under a non-discriminatory procurement framework are published and are available for everyone to see. Okay, if a political donation... And, and, and a part of that non-discriminatory framework, Senator, is not discriminating against, um, against entities uh, on the basis of their uh, political beliefs, views or values. If they are uh, the best entity to do the job, uh, I think about, for example, uh, in the social services portfolio, uh, there would be a number of NGOs who go through procurement processes, the delivery of government services, uh, who probably at times make statements that, uh, that the government may not necessarily uh, agree with or, uh, or welcome. Uh, nonetheless, um, you know, they are not decisions uh, for, uh, for ministers overwhelmingly, uh, and uh, the political views of those entities, whether they are donors uh, or simply public participants in debate uh, should not form part of the consideration of whether or not they best meet a particular tender process at a particular point in time. Okay, so why do, the big, four, why do the big four consultancies make such generous donations then to political parties if not to reap the benefits of government contracts and tenders? Mm. Is it just because they're being nice? So, Sen Senator, um, many entities make donations indeed to, yes, across politics, uh, on the basis that, uh, that they uh, support democratic process uh, and the ability of parties to, uh, to participate in that democratic process, just as uh, people choose to make donations to the Greens. And on that note, I think the committee will now break for lunch. Thank you very much, all. Thank you. Committee suspends. We were there yet. See you in a bit.
reconvene and continue with our examination of outcomes one and two for the Department of Finance. And Senator Gallagher, you have the call. Thank you very much, Chair. Ms. Huxville, on the um, it was on the eighth of February, there was an article that appeared in the Australian um, with the headline Labor COVID Policies, an extra $81 billion hit Simon Birmingham. And in that article, online and in the paper version, at the bottom of the table, it had down the bottom source finance department. I'm just wondering if you could explain to the committee what your involvement was in that um, article well, and the materials provided. Sen Senator, uh, uh, I can inform there that, uh, that the modelling was undertaken uh, within the government, not by the Department of Finance. Uh, my office did not um, inform the Australian that it was finance department modelling. Uh, upon seeing the graph um, that was presented, uh, noting the story text itself did not uh, reflect it as being a Department of Finance, but upon seeing the graphics uh, that were published, uh, my office contacted the Australian to make sure that I believe the online version was rectified. Okay, so can we step through that a bit? You said the modelling done. Can you say what what that entailed? It was done within government. What does that mean? Was it done in your office by your advisers? In part, Senator. Pardon? In, in part. part. And where else? Um, well, the, uh, uh, the team uh, across uh, across government, Senator, uh, obviously. Okay. Um, we are conscious of announcements that are made of potential government spending and seeking to, uh, to keep a track on um, what those, uh, those could be uh, and, uh, and noting the, uh, the numerous policy announcements um, or calls for additional spending made by the opposition throughout the COVID-19 pandemic exceeding uh, that estimated $81 billion. Okay, so your office, who else? The Treasurer's office? No, they would have provided some advice, Senator. Okay, the Prime Minister's office? I'm not so sure there, Senator. You're not sure? This is your drop to the Australian yeah, Union. I, sure. I, think, I think my team and the Treasurer's team are, um, uh, are the ones who would, uh, would bring the um, uh, understanding of the, uh, the costs and implications of the different policy uh, announcements that, uh, that you've made but not costed. Okay. And so did you provide this um, modelling to the Prime Minister's office? Uh, I'm sure, Senator, that, uh, that they were uh, aware of uh, the information that we were providing to, uh, to make sure Australians can understand um, the uh, profligate ways of the Labor Party. Okay, so you did provide it to the Prime Minister's office. Was it provided, or well, what other ministers were involved in this? Um, Senator, we would have engaged any other ministers as were necessary. Okay, so health? Health Minister involved? Uh, well, Senator, I don't think we needed uh, any assistance of, um, of the Health Minister when it comes to, uh, to matters such as, uh, um, uh, for example, the $300 cash payments that, uh, that you proposed. It's a pretty straightforward calculation uh, in terms of the uh, billions of dollars of unnecessary expenditure that would have incurred. So the rapid antigen tests, they didn't involve the Health Minister. They were some, another advisor, were they? Just working it out on their own? Uh, there are already uh, obviously costings associated with the uh, concessional supply of rapid antigen tests and, uh, and uh, those, uh, those costings that, uh, that have been undertaken provide a basis to uh, extrapolate that on a very conservative basis uh, in terms of what uh, Labor's very ill-defined policy on rapid antigen tests would look like. So ill-defined, uh, but you managed uh, to define it. Ill-defined, but you managed to define it. On a very conservative it. basis, Senator. Oh, uh, um, we, uh, what a um, joke. Uh, we assessed a, uh, a capped, um, time-limited uh, number that, uh, that you would be providing. Um, uh, you haven't actually, uh, and Mr Albanese hasn't made clear how many free rats uh, um, he says people would be entitled to so over what time frame or how they'd be provided. So you made it up? Well, unfortunately, Senator, uh, you've so announced a policy with no detail. So we put some oh, conservative... Oh, unfortunately, no detail. So you've filled in the blanks, have you? Um, if you're going to go out and there and make grand promises, magic grand promises, number. I mean, you've all been sort of running uh, Facebook you tiles and social minister. media posts that, in, that suggest no free rats for everyone. 
That's what you've been suggesting. Free oh, rates yeah. for everyone. Well, I don't see an asterisk on there anywhere that says there's any limit to the number uh, or an asterisk on there saying only if you go and get it uh, from a doctor through the Medicare system or whatever it is that your policy actually mm. is. So, okay. yes, Senator, if you're not going to cost your policies, okay. uh, your policies that, uh, that are clearly okay. ill thought through and not costed, uh, then we think the Australian people deserve okay. an opportunity to understand so what those costs may be. So this is the government's big scare campaign against Labor. You are now admitting you had no involvement from the Finance Department. It was cooked up in your office and Minister Frydenberg's office. It may have been given to the Prime Minister. You didn't have enough detail, so you made it up yourself, and that's how you came to this number. Well, Seriously? Well, Senator, we used every Seriously. ounce. Senator, we used every ounce of detail that the Labor Party the has provided on its policy. The finance minister, and this, this is how you're we spending order. your days. Is we it? Order. Used every ounce of this detail. This is how you're spending your days. Okay, I'm very order. happy that, uh, that you want to Senators. talk about the more yeah. than 81 billion dollars worth of, uh, up of promises to the Labor numbers. Party. Order. By a order. Order. Minister, who should order. be doing something else? Senators. Really? Senators, we are nine minutes into the afternoon session, and I did warn both of you this morning about speaking over one another. So if we could try and uh, go one by one in asking questions and responding to them, it would make my life much easier. Thank you very much. Se uh, Minister, I think you were responding to Senator Gallagher's latest question. So, so Senator Gallagher, if the Labor Party wants to actually detail costings for any of its uh, well, calls or policies... What, we will. I, I, <laughs> We will, I, but not I, through I, I'd your not even advisors. completed a sentence before you started uh, um, talking then, uh, then Senator. Um, you will, but you make these grand proclamations without detail, without costings, uh, if in the context of the fact that we do face an election this year, and it will be a choice for Australians between uh, our government in debt or what you are proposing. Uh, and so we think it is important that your policies face scrutiny, yeah, just as you seek to scrutinise the position of the well, government. I uh, it's going and to go I make no well apologies for, for the fact uh, that we will scrutinise your so-called policies and, uh, and when they are as ill-defined uh, as a policy like your free rat policy, uh, then of course we will have to put some parameters and assumptions around that as to what it would cost. Because you're not saying how many you'd give out, you're not saying by what means you'd give them out, you're not saying who would be eligible and you're not saying how much it would cost. Uh, so that is just a classic example of the way this Labor Party and this opposition is working at present, uh, where it is all spin and announcement, but absolutely no detail to any of these sorts of policies. Right. So um, the, the costings will be released in a, in a standard way that parties do it and you do it as well during the election campaign. So don't worry yourself on that. They all will be costed. They are all. We are utilising the parliamentary budget office, so just you can ease your concerns on that front. But let's let's so, so, just so will that policy, all, all will our policies, that policy all our policies we take to the election will be costed and they will be released. Don't worry about that. I'm worried about this, okay? And your little dodgy scare campaign that fell flat. I might add. And no surprises why. And let's talk about the, the how, how did you cost the free rapid antigen test? Because I saw you quoted it initially saying they cost 13 billion. Then I heard the treasurer refer to them as costing 10 billion. And then in this dodgy document, they've costed it 5 billion. So, uh, so there so, was some changing. Uh, so, so as I said, quite a conservative approach that was, uh, oh, was undertaken. Right. Not uh, three different a, costings. A conservative approach. <laughs> over a shorter period of time in, right. terms of, uh, in terms of what you might do. Because I note, Senator, okay. that uh, uh, I note that um, even around that time, I think it was Mr Butler who said that perhaps that policy won't be relevant by the time of the election. So perhaps it's a bit like the $300 payments that you announced, oh, Mr Albanese and announced, those, yeah, and then I he walked away they're from. They're $12 billion. Well, that's that's, a, that was your grand a, idea. Yeah, Twelve right. billion dollars you're so you going to pay people to do something the they've done for free. You costing. I see. Twelve billion dollars you're you going to pay people. This is how you spend your days. This is seriously what, what they've done for free. Instead of costing another party's policy, why didn't you get some free rats tests? So, Senator, why didn't you spend your time actually procuring the tests that Australians needed? 
Thanks. rather than sitting in your advisors in your office trying to dodge you up these numbers and run uh, so, another scare campaign. So, so Senator, I, I know you're very sensitive about any scrutiny to not at the all. ill thought out Labor policy not thought at all. bubbles. Not at all. It sounds like you're very sensitive. What I'm, I'm sensitive to I know is the, the Finance, Finance Minister, Minister of Australia putting rubbish in the Australian and then attributing it to the Finance Department. Yes, well, I'm very clear that we did not... Very clear that we did not seek to attribute, and I want to be very clear that obviously you know, we would not ask the department to undertake that type of work um, because that is not their function. Uh, but certainly, Senator, your policies deserve scrutiny. You're the shadow finance minister, mm -hmm. yet these policy announcements are made without any costs attached to them at the time, with very scant detail as to what they mean. Um, and indeed, then and you get backflip, you know, and you backflip on them on the journey this through. Is, this is this it's is to, the to, response. To, just this is you know, this is about trying to provide some scrutiny to an opposition oh. that won't provide <laughs> any detail to its own policies. That's already announced ones like the three hundred dollar bonus and walked back from them. So As frustrating I, that you just have to make stuff up. <laughs> Fairly good. So. Was that a question, Senator? So, Reyes? Minister, when when your yeah. office so appeared yeah. online at about 10.30 on the 8th of the 2nd. At what point did the government, did one of your advisers contact The Australian? Because it it's, was online, what? attributed to the, the Finance Department at 10.34. How long did it take for the costings unit, the Labor costings unit you run out of your office? How long did it take for them to work out the Finance Department uh, had been so, uh, nominated as the source of the figures? Uh, it was, uh, uh, well, I'm being advised um, within, I'm being advised within 20 minutes. So it appeared for 20 minutes. It was in the paper copy for forever, the next day. And, and Senator, at, at no time did my office represent it as modelling undertaken by the finance department. So how did it get there? Did you get an explanation? Did the Australians say, oh, we just well, put that on the bottom as, just well, in case? Well, as, as I would note, the text of the story also never suggested that um, in terms of the graphic designers or, or how that w occurred within the Australian. We brought that to their attention promptly. So they just dreamt that up, did they? That the finance department had been the source of these figures? That what we're no, as, as I said, Senator, the story itself never suggested that it was the department modelling. Um, so, uh, so I, in, in acknowledgement of the journalist in that regard, uh, I don't think they ever misinterpreted it either. Uh, but obviously, what was uh, what was printed that would have gone through sub-editing and uh, and other processes. Uh, that's a matter for the newspaper. But as soon as we identified it, we alerted them to the situation. And. Um was it on the material that left your office electronically? Presumably that, that, the, the, that the, costings... The, the, the graphic was not something done in my office, Senator. OK, so no table. There was no table that left your office with that on it? Nothing that we, nothing that we provided in any way uh, presented the information as being prepared by the Department of Finance. And to Ms Huxtable, this appeared in the paper version of the... Australian and was online for a period of time. Um, unclear. Um, did you feel? Did you take any action uh, in terms of inquiring how this could be the case, and also whether you needed to make a statement about the fact that you hadn't been involved? Yep. So uh, I spoke to the minister's office uh, the next morning. I didn't actually see it uh, that evening of the eighth. I saw it early the next morning uh, to make clear that uh, clearly that was wrongly attributed to the finance department. I think at that point there had already been action taken uh, by the minister's office to uh, have the attribution uh, corrected. Uh, certainly uh, I was ready to respond to any media inquiries that we might get in respect of the, the data, uh, given that you know, there was a period where it was, it was attributed to us. Uh, however, uh, in light of the fact that the correction occurred quite early uh, the next morning, um, I didn't consider it was necessary to put out a public statement. But it was in the paper version that got circulated widely, presumably, the next that that day. Sorry, the 9th of the second. How did you weigh that up? How did you 
decide that it didn't merit any further statement? So, from you? Certainly, Senator, if we'd got media inquiries in respect of the data, um, then you know we had a response uh, in respect to that, but we didn't get any media inquiries. Can I have all. that? Can I have the response that was repair, prepared? Uh, I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Why? Because I don't have it here. Well, I'm sure someone can get it. Like, this is pretty serious as we enter into a hotly contested election campaign. <coughs> the government has created its own internal costing unit with its own methodology, it seems. It's put it on the front page of The Australian in a massive attempt at a scare campaign about the alternate government's policies. On that article, on the front page, it has the finance department as the source of the costings, giving it authority. And I am wondering how on earth the finance department thinks it's appropriate that they say nothing about it. Because the attribution was changed in the but online it wasn't version on the and paper. it was changed very early. The paper version went out with finance on the front page as the source. So are you saying that because no one reads the paper version that you've made a decision that it was less harmful? Or is that the decision you took? Well, I think, I think Ms Huxtable's outlined uh, what decisions she took uh, in terms of being prepared to correct the record under any queries that occurred. Uh, and, uh, and of course, she would have done that here as well, but for the fact that I answered the question first. Um, uh, she's been very clear in that regard. I don't think the attribution was on the front page, incidentally, Senator. Um, well, the article was on the front page. The lead ran off the front page, Senator. Yeah. So COVID policies costed with the graphics to accompany it. OK, so is it because it wasn't on the front page that you decided that it was fine to leave finances as a source. Senator, I think and with respect, Ms Huxtable hasn't answered why she took that decision. Um, you know, so if you could. No, I think I have, Senator. I mean, the judgment I made is that because the attribution had been changed and it had been changed uh, very expeditiously, uh, we received no media inquiries in respect of the, the data. Uh, it was on that basis that I decided not to put out a public statement. Well, I would like to know and I can't, can't see any reason why we cannot be provided with the media comments that you prepared to respond to that. Considering we now know that you had nothing to do with this, well, why... Well, well, I took it on notice. Well, it's just avoiding scrutiny. It's, it's avoiding a difficulty. Ms. Taking Huxley, a question you don't on normally not play games. Scrutiny, Senator Gallagher. But I'm That's not, sure. not a fair I, representation. Well, it is important. You are... Down as the source of this, you took no action to to correct it. But, it, but it no was public correct. action to correct it. It was in the paper, and now you're saying to me I can't Sen have access to whatever no, media response was prepared I for it. Sen 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 Senator, that's not fair. The secretary uh, did contact my office first thing that morning. Um, no as it turns out, as you response. as you acknowledged, um, the uh, the story had gone online earlier and my office had already taken the steps to contact the Australian uh, and, um, uh, and advised the secretary of that at that time. No public statement to correct the record. Ms Huxtable, do you think it is important that the finance department is seen as apolitical? The finance department is apolitical, Senator. Yes, and it's important that it is seen as apolitical? Well, I believe I've been very clear on the record, including in this estimates, around what our role is in respect of the issues that you're raising. OK. So when we have a political hit in the government journals that attributes the information in a table graphic to the finance department, how can it be that there is no public response to that, in, particularly as we head into an election campaign? Senator, I think I've already answered that. My judgment was that because the attribution was changed and changed very early uh, that day, uh, and there was no inquiries coming to uh, the department, which I uh, drew from that, that uh, the, the media were very clear 
the, the Department of Finance was not the source of the material, as the attribution had been changed, uh, that I didn't think a public statement was warranted. That was the judgment I made at the time. And how do you know that the media all knew that it wasn't the Finance Department? Well, they certainly weren't coming us, uh, to us for comment or to us for information about the details uh, in the material. And we would normally expect that that would occur. So, at what point would it have crossed the line for you? The attribution was changed, Senator. That was a very important uh, but fact. The paper, like how, how can you say it was right. changed online after a period of time, but it remained in the paper version? Like, so how can you say it wasn't changed in there and there was nothing for the person reading, the ordinary person reading the paper, they wouldn't have had any idea that the finance department didn't cost those dodgy costings done in a back room of Minister Birmingham's office. Well, Senator, I mean, I've given you my, my thinking at the time. Um, I'll probably have nothing more to add to that. Can I please have the media um, response that you had prepared? I don't want to wait 30 days for it, which is what happens when people take it on notice. And considering the seriousness of this, that certainly I hold it really seriously, and Ms Huxwell, I think it would do um, you know, well for your defence if, you, if that was provided. I want to know what the Department of Finance was going to say, or m perhaps you can tell me what they were going to say. Well, well, Senator, Ms, Ms Huxtable's taken that on notice. So we um, kicked it down the no, can for, no, road Senator, for 30 Senator, days. Senator, That's what's um, happened. Senator, she's taken it on notice, but she doesn't have it here at present. I'm sure uh, if further information can be provided quickly, will she be. will do so. Senator. Okay. Well, will you, were you provided with what finance was, was going to say if they were approached by media? Did finance um, provide that to your office? Um, I wasn't provided. Uh, no, apparently it, uh, it wasn't shared with my office. Okay. And we were advised, though, that, uh, that that would be the case in terms of if there were queries that finance would make that expressly clear. And what was it essentially, Ms. Huxtable? What were you going to say if the if the if the media approached the Department of Finance? What were you going to say? Was it a short? We didn't have anything to do with well, this. I mean, I've been through that. I think here already, um, <coughs> Senator. I mean, the, the costing was not prepared in the Department of Finance, so that's what I would have said. Or you know, not was exactly that... those words, but along those lines. So the, you you were going to say these costings were not costed by the Department of Finance? We're not prepared by the Department not of Finance, prepared. that's correct. But, you know, there was smithing of that. Uh, I mean, as we didn't actually end up putting out a statement. Um, nor did you have a query to respond nor to. Nor did we have a query to respond to. Uh, but certainly we would have been putting out a statement along those lines. Uh, and no different to what I've said in, in this place previously in respect of uh, costing of opposition policies. Okay. And so you've taken it oh, oh, some I've time down the notice. track, get it um, on notice what was prepared. Um, are your, is your dodgy costing unit going to be continuing to put out tables like this? Senator, we will continue to scrutinise your announcements in the lead up to the election, just as I expect you will continue to scrutinise us. Okay, and how many people in this costing unit? How many are they and what are their yeah. skills, other than being Liberal staffers? Well, Senator, uh, um, staff in my office, like staff in your office, will, uh, will undertake roles to assist with the scrutiny of alternate policies, just as uh, they assist Dodging with the development of our own policies. Now, it sounds like everyone saw this for what it was, um, but... Provide more I mean, detail around your policies and their costings at the time of release, and, mm. uh, and you can avoid these sorts of circumstances. Senator. Thank, thank you very much for the advice. And um, as I said, we will be providing costings as we have in previous elections, and every other party does as well. So you can probably disband your little costings unit if you'd like, Mr. Birmingham, now that it's been completely discredited. Uh, Senator, no, uh, not as discredited, I think, as, uh, as well, policies yeah, like has. your abandoned three hundred dollar payments. It has. I mean, that this was so little, discredited that you walked away from the policy yourself. This little flat on its face has been uh, run by 
a handful of Liberal staffers. But, but what, 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 on what, earth what this would exposed go wrong? were the tens of billions of dollars <laughs> extra that a Labor government would have spent over the last two years, including in policies that you yourselves have since walked away from because they were so bad. Mm. Your policies, so, right. and you've backflipped on them. So, Oh, yes. In the space of 12 so, months, Senator. I mean, so I, I, three, I can't recall any occasions staffers, where an opposition has gone out and said, we're going to make a $300 staffers. payment, and then within 12 months you said, are, actually, no, we're not going Without credibility, to. like it has become a total joke. That, this, yeah, that policy this is, is indeed a total standard. joke, when Senator. Australians, Always was, actually. When Australians needed their government to be going out and fixing aged care and actually buying rapid antigen tests, you established a little costings unit of Liberal staffers to cost Labor campaigns uh, commitments which, which to you then won't splash cost on the, on the front page of the policies. Australian, Sharp which you then order. had to correct the, after the, trying to pretend they were Finance, they were costed by the finance the, the, department. The, the, what the, an the absolute yeah. shambles. The cost of policies actually matters, shambles. Senator, and, uh, and you should be up front How at the time you announce them. Order. This is like completely order. embarrassing. I'm, I haven't heard a senator ask a question for about a minute. Okay. So if a senator would I like have to more ask questions. a question. Um, thank you, Chair. Okay, Senator um, Gallagher, thank you. Okay. On the breakdown of the decisions taken but not yet announced, in the MIEFO we had... Um, $16 billion in decisions taken but not yet announced. That was an extraordinarily large amount and a huge increase on previous decisions taken not yet announced. What details can you provide me in particular? Um, what, can you break it into proportions? I know there's an element of not for publication. Can you tell me how much of the fifteen billion seven hundred and ninety five million how much of that is not for publication costs? Sorry, Senator, I just missed the last half of, uh, of your question there. I know it was it's about really, the um, what, line. Yeah, so of the decisions taken but not yet announced, in the MIEFO there was $16 billion that fell under that title and not for profit measures, so uh, not for publication, sorry. And so I'm asking what proportion of that $16 billion is not for publication? Um, so, uh, so, Senator, um, we don't generally prescribe specific break-up um, there because, uh, because obviously yeah, I don't the elements the that, are, that are not for publication. Is it half? Um, the Treasurer has, uh, has publicly acknowledged previously that it is around half. So is there a reason why you can't give us the number, the specific number? I don't want it, I don't want it broken down, but if it's around half, then it's presumably in the order of $8 billion that are for not for publication. Do you have an exact figure for that? Um, uh, well, as I was saying before, we don't normally prescribe the breakdown of, um, of uh, those two components of, uh, of that line, um, uh, in essence, because uh, of the commercial and other sensitivities around those that are in the not for publication category. So. Are you saying that if you said it was 7.98 billion, that there would be some way of identifying how much you've a you'd allocated to different programs? At, at different times in different budget cycles, depending on what's there and what's not there, yes, it could be, Senator. But when it's this big, and we know that there is a number of programs identified as not for pu publication, I think the government's already done that. What is the ration? Yeah. What's the so, reason? So, so as the, I mean, the, the treasurer has already indicated in that regard that it, uh, it is around half. So the best I'm going to get out of that is it's around eight eight billion. Is that yeah, as that, that, is that, 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 would, as be, that would be right. accurate with okay. uh, with what the treasurer has said? Okay. Um, now, from my estimation, there's been a number about $5 billion in new funding announcements made since my EFO. Um, 
or you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, because there's been there has been other payments like the advance to finance minister and things like that. But um, the hunt, if I go through it by program, whether you can tell me whether these are coming out of the decisions taken but not yet announced line, or whether it's actually additional money. It's the Tackling Indigenous Smoking Program, 187.8 million. Does that come out of decisions taken but not yet announced? Um. I need to just check the name of that program against. Um, it was announced on the 28th of December, and my my notes say it's tackling Indigenous smoking program 187.8 million. Unless anybody else can uh, can help us on that one, it um, might be easier if it, you tell me what has been spent out of the decisions taken but not um, yet announced. It's, if, it's, if, you, it, if that's if Ms. Patterson has that in her brief, because I have a number of projects, but um, you know, if you can tell me between my EFO and now what has mm. come out of that in terms of announcements. Uh, Senator, there, there is quite a large number um, yep. that are being published in portfolio additional estimates. It is a list that goes for several pages, so I'm not sure if you want us to go through that line in by line finances or whether. Ones? No, no, Across in every, the everyone's yeah. additional right. estimates. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as to the best. Yeah, or just, pr or just. I mean, we can, we can quickly run through them. Yeah. Yep. But it just might take a while. Or, um, or just copy me the bit of the brief you can give me. That's fine. I don't mind. Hold, so, hold, go. Sorry. You why, don't, why, don't, why don't you slot. try yep. okay. doing the, the um, headline points? Uh, Kat yeah, Patterson, head. Deputy Secretary, Budget and Financial <laughs> Thank Reporting. Um, okay, so uh, decisions taken but not announced um, since the MAIFO, which have been published in the portfolio additional estimate statements. Um, I'll go through by portfolio is probably the easiest way to yep. do that. Thank so um, agriculture, water and environment. Uh, we have supporting Australia's Antarctic research and resupply vessel. Um, Great Barrier Reef package. Yep. Biodiversity recovery package, koala conservation and protection. Yep. National recycling campaign, additional funding. Mm -hmm. Plant a tree for the Jubilee program. Yep. Establish pest and weed management. Yep. Then moving to health portfolio. Cancer genomics laboratory establishment. Fighting cancer McGrath Foundation breast care nurses. Approved medical deputising services and organ match delivery of best practice in organ allocation. Yep. Then uh, Department of Home Affairs, uh, Commonwealth Countering Violent Extremism, Extremism Initiatives and High Risk Terrorist Offenders Regime Implementation. And that one will appear in the portfolio additional estimate statements for a number of agencies, not just yeah. Home Affairs, that one. Across government, yeah. Yeah. Um, industry, science, energy and resources portfolio. Enhancing the digital cap capability of NOPTA and NOPSEMA. If I've got those pronunciations yep. right. Yep. Uh, science Capability National Measurement Institute. Uh, Marinus Link, additional support. Moving to the infrastructure portfolio. Extending the commercial broadcasting tax transitional support payments. Infrastructure investment. 
media sector reforms, national commemorative uh, statues, but that is from a uh, previous round um, of uh, Dibitja, not from the Maifo one, but just for um, yeah. accuracy. Um, national Australia infrastructure facility, increased appropriation. Then the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander statues in the Parliamentary Triangle, uh, Australia's Future Leaders Program, and that was also from a prior round, uh, Dibichna, 2020-21 Maifo. Yep. Uh, Digital Economy Regulation, National Disaster Resilience and Support Emergency Response Fund. Development of future support for improved outcomes of Indigenous Australians in the Northern Territory. The Ngura uh, Cultural Precinct. There's the Dawson and Oars versus Commonwealth Community Development Program Class Action. That was also a prior round to Bichina, not from uh, the most recent Maifo. And then getting towards the end, social services, portfolio, strong and resilient community grants expansion, building the long-term viability of the financial counselling sector, national debt helpline, treasury portfolio is the Western Australia Children's Hospice, and finally, Department of Veterans Affairs, 50th anniversary of the end of Australian involvement in the Vietnam War, Tasmanian Veteran Wellbeing Centre, and the Veteran Wellbeing Grant Program. Senator, there's a shorter list that summarises the, the measures that are published as NFP, if you want. Um, they are obviously all already published as NFP yes. in the budget papers, but if it's helpful for you to have that summarised, we can yep. go through what is it say, a shorter list than, uh, than the one um, Ms Patterson oh, just yes. read. Yep, yep. Thank you. Okay. Find that list. Yes, <laughs> okay. So, um, MAIFA measures that are full or partial, not for publication. So uh, under cross-portfolio, Commonwealth Parliamentary Workplaces, independent review and ongoing support measures. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want me to give you the page numbers in MAIFO just for cross-checking? I think I've got all the, um, the, the measures that were not for publication. Okay. Yeah, yep. So I'm just ticking them. Ticking them go. off? Yeah. Okay. Um, COVID-19 response package, additional aviation support continued. Yep. Uh, under finance, COVID response package, centres for national resilience. Yep. Under foreign affairs and trade, Australian infrastructure financing facility for the Pacific projects and the export finance facility. Under health, there's the COVID-19 response package, yep. vaccines and treatment purchases. Guaranteeing Medicare and access to medicines, uh, PBS new and amended listings. Um, and improving access to medicines, new strategic agreements with Medicines Australia and the Generic and Biosimilar Medicines Association. Uh, noting both of those are receipt only NFPs. Yep. Um, home affairs, uh, permissions capability, digital passenger declaration, uh, industry science, energy and resources portfolio, uh, former British nuclear testing site at Maralinga, maintenance, Northern Endeavour Decommission, additional funding, satellite-based augmentation system, additional funding, which is a receipt, and Snowy Hydro Limited Hunter Power Project. Okay, thank then you. Uh, infrastructure, transport, regional development and communications, uh, infrastructure investment, National Collecting Institutions, Preserving Australia's Cultural Heritage, WSA Co Limited Equity Injection, 
social services portfolio, just one there, continuation of funding for the fathering project and the home interaction program for parents and youngsters. And the final from Treasury is SME recovery loan scheme extension. Yeah. Thank you for that. Are you able to tell me um, in that first lot of the decisions taken um, what that long list you gave me? Yeah. How much that adds up to? Do you have that? Yes, I do. Uh, so that long list of things that were then published in uh, Portfolio Additional Estimate yep. Statement is 926.7 million, noting that there are some NFPs in that list. So obviously... In, in the decisions taken? Yes. Because there's a bit of a crossover. Yep. yep. Ah, oh, okay, so they've come out of actually, the... Yeah, actually come not out. announced at all that are still NFP, NFP. that yep. have yep. essentially moved from what you might describe as one column to the other. Yes. Okay. All right. So all of that was just 926 Point million. Point seven. Yep. Point seven million. Okay. Um, so where there's... Oh, a couple of those are crossed off. So where there's um, uh, there's been other announcements by, from government, so the say the eight hundred dollar payments to aged care workers, well that that doesn't appear in these because the decision was taken after my EFO on that, and so it will be reconciled in the budget. budget. Yep. That's, yeah, that, that's right. And, uh, okay, so that's um, new. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's been a set of of things announced, which are essentially new funding, new measures like the yeah. 800 since my EFO, um, and then there's also been obviously other things that have been announced following the closing of the books. So you end up sort of three. Okay. Of so do you have a list of the new measures, sort of that sit outside decisions taken and? In, um, and not for, not for publication in my EFO no. to where we are today. Yes. Right. So we've got the eight hundred dollars. Yep. So it's two hundred and ten million. I so understand. new measures since my EFO that have a negative impact. Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, this would yeah. be as of the pays cut off. So yes. as of the pays cut-off. As of yes. the pays Pace. cut-off date. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Well, yep. it would have been early February. I mean, we wouldn't yep. give you an yep. exact yep. date. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. Pays being the portfolio, portfolio additional, additional estimates. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. No, I've got it. I'm with you. Um, do you... It's a page and a half. Do you want me to read them? Yes, or table it. But I'll, read, I'll, I'll go first. Thing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, new measures... Um, hold on. I'm just going to make sure I've got the right list. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so new measures since my EFO as published in Portfolio Additional Estimate Statements. Um, the uh, Department of Defence, there is one for Defence Mental Health. Mm -hmm. uh, Department of Education, Skills and Employment. Uh, increase the AgMove participation participant cap, mm -hmm. uh, health portfolio, COVID response package, COVID vaccine program, COVID-19 response package, improving access to critical medical supplies, COVID yep. response package, strengthening primary care, COVID response package, vaccines and treatment purchases, guaranteeing Medicare extension to MBS emergency bushfire item, and a mental health item, Department of Home Affairs, uh, visa application charge for refunds for student and working holiday maker visa holders. Oh, yeah. Uh, backpacker and student campaign, visa application charge refund settings campaign, Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, 
has won the diesel exhaust fluid security. Um, Department of Infrastructure has CASA supplementation. Prime Minister and Cabinet has Indo-Pacific Clean Energy Supply Chain Forum. COVID-19 response package, pandemic leave disaster payment extension. And Treasury small business debt helpline and new access for business owners program. And do you have a total figure for that? Yes, it's uh, 2.3 billion over four years to 2024-25. Thank you very much, Ms. Patterson. Um, the additional money for the ABC and SBS was that was announced on the 7th of February. Is that because it might fall out of this or because it's a future payment, not a retrospective payment in terms of the, the cuts to indexation? Um, so, uh, so the um, arrangements around um, the indexation freeze um, as it relates to the ABC were um, a freeze that applied for the previous triennial funding agreement. Yeah. Um, uh, the decision that had been taken was that that would be a freeze for the previous triennial funding agreement. The budget, as handed down last year, had reflected previous the, that previous decision. Okay. Which was for that triennial funding agreement. The budget forward estimates had um, obviously reflected that as a time limited decision. Um, and the government in considering then the negotiations with the ABC for the future triennial funding agreement agreed that the indexation would continue as was reflected in the budget papers as handed down last year. So there's not, okay. a, there's not a variation in, uh, in okay. that sense. So, you, so the announcement on the 7th of February was really to announce the decision you took in the last budget or confirm um, the decision you take. Yeah, so the, the forward estimates you know, are based upon assumptions um, that reflect decisions as they stand. And the decision that had been taken a number of years back um, around the ABC freeze was a decision for that triennial funding mm. period. It's a slightly unique yeah. Know, yeah. Uh, matter to the national broadcasters in terms of the way they are funded. Yeah. Um, so uh, they operate on those trainial funding agreements, but for budgeting purposes, the government obviously keeps projecting out across the forward estimates. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so um, what finance had uh, had presented in the budget papers for the forward estimates reflected for the period of that freeze the freeze, and given it was only a freeze decision that had been taken for that triennial funding, the budget papers reflected a resumption a of their previous okay. arrangements. Yep. So, so that dis your decision to um, stop the indexation poor, well, so it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision. The conscious decision was to, to cap or freeze the indexation for a three year period. And because there wasn't another decision or announcement from government to continue that freeze, it reverts back to being indexed. That's that's accurate, Senator, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so that decision was was made or just happened, I don't know if it was a conscious so, decision, I'm probably yeah. was, in the budget but not announced. Nobody picked so, up on so, it. So, did so they? the budget essentially reflects those those yeah. forward estimates. Yeah. The government you know, at the relevant time frame in considering the discussions with the ABC about their next triennial funding agreement had to confront you know, the decision that had been made. Would we make that decision again or not? Um, had we decided uh, to, uh, to freeze indexation for the next triennial funding period, then that actually would have been reflected in the budget papers um, uh, as a savings measure at that okay. point. So 
It might be me, and this isn't my portfolio area. Did I just miss something, or nobody said anything at the time, including the ABC? Wouldn't they have known that the forward I, estimates were looking pretty good for them? Well, and for a, I mean, arguably in that context, Senator, for a number of years, mm. that uh, that as we approached the last year of the triennial funding agreement, there are by that point several years of forward estimates that have been published continuously since then. So, um, uh, so yes, I, I am confident, Senator, had the government made a decision to um, continue the indexation freeze, uh, that, uh, that there would have been plenty of powers of complaint from um, um, you and the ABC well, and others. And a lot of Australians who rely on the ABC who are worried about the freeze and cuts to the ABC. Okay. It, it was... Um, um, a, a serious matter in terms of consideration, um, you know, noting that the ABC has a more guaranteed uh, revenue stream than uh, other broadcasters or media organisations in Australia. Uh, but obviously the government made the decisions that, uh, that the communications minister uh, has announced and, uh, and which were already fully provided for in the way in which the budget forward estimates are reflected and accounted for. Okay, so when the government made the announcement, why didn't wasn't the announcement made as part of the budget? Why did it wait till the seventh of February? Like, it, Minister Fletcher went out and announced that the indexation freeze uh, is over for the purposes of the triennial funding agreement. So, um, so Senator, that. That's reflective of that unique arrangement in terms of the national broadcasters operating under those triennial funding arrangements, um, that there are normal points and it's, it's more a matter that communications could speak on with expertise than me, um, but there are sort of normal points at which the Department of Communications, I expect on behalf of the government, sort of settles with the national broadcasters. These are the terms of, uh, of the triennial funding arrangement uh, going forward. So um, that's, uh, that's done um, to give the national broadcasters that sort of rolling three-year certainty, noting that, uh, that um, for other agencies, although the forward estimates provide a projection, decisions within, um, uh, within that okay. time frame can impact upon those projections. All right. So, so essentially the money was made available in the budget. The government didn't say anything but was negotiating the triennial funding agreement with the ABC. Once that's concluded, you're in a position to confirm. Is that, yeah, well the, is that the, I mean, right? I mean, in, essentially the money was provided in each from, from whichever budget it was that the, um, that the uh, 20... 23 year first came into the forward estimates, um, uh, the funds would have been reflected from that um, inclusion of the 22, 23 and then subsequent years into the forward estimates profile. Okay, so so in terms of any additional money, it's no, it, there is no additional money over what has been factored into the forwards for that, for the ABC? Um, around the indexation question. Um, what's in the forwards is an accurate reflection of the indexation. Um, and as I said before, had we, had we taken another decision to freeze indexation, uh, then, um, then it would have been reflected as a savings measure. OK. All right. Yeah, I'm finishing up. I can oh, see Senator you. Sullivan wants to call. On the... Um, can I just ask a couple more on this and then I'll finish. On the... Um, infrastructure investment under the decisions that have now been announced. Do you have any more detail on that or do I have to go to infrastructure to ask, which I think I'm not even sure they're on now, I think. Um, yeah, I think they were on yesterday and that's still on today for comms. Um, let me just check, I might not have... I don't think we have a lot more detail Delvin. other than what okay. Ms Patterson read out. So it might Do we have the money the that's attached just under that global the infrastructure investment? So the, you gave me the 926.7. Yeah, so for infrastructure, the infrastructure investment um, decision that was published in PAYS is NFP. 
So oh. it's not part of that night. Okay. 26.7, so it's on that list, right. but yeah. So at, at the end of all that, we've got 15.7 billion in decisions taken, but not yet announced, which is a huge amount. With the in, all of the decisions that have been taken, it's just under a billion. So we, is it correct to say there's still f sort of 15 billion sitting there? Well, no, no, noting, Senator, the NFP component, which we've discussed, um, and uh, and then there are. Um, okay, so there's seven billion. If we take out the roughly eight billion, we're down to nine left. For, so it's 16. So we're down. Take out half of that. We're at eight. Take out the billion that you've announced through your decisions. So we're down to seven. And so seven billion still sitting there. Um, so, uh, so Senator, um, uh, there are some subsequent announcements that have been made since that cut-off date uh, yeah. for the portfolio additional estimate statements. Okay, in the last fortnight. Uh, um, yes, uh, that's right. Uh, which includes some um, uh, significant uh, programs. Um, just on the weekend, the uh, the announcement uh, out of the uh, infrastructure investment uh, program uh, for the North South Corridor, uh, River Torrens to Anzac Highway. Okay. Project that, in South Australia. Yeah, that was 2.26 billion. Um, Is that right? Of which, over, of which over the forwards, that's a 754 million dollar commitment. Um, okay. The, oh, uh, right. So it extends for a longer period of time. Um, yeah. The okay. uh, the uh, support uh, for the new university uh, research initiatives um, under the uh, Australia's Economic Accelerator uh, program, which is part of the 2.2 billion dollar. University Research Commercialisation Package, um, uh, which over the forwards for that component is, uh, is a little over $500 million. Um, uh, the, uh, the support for um, the uh, workforce mobility component of that uh, University Research Commercialisation Package, which is a smidge under $300 million. Um, uh, support um, uh, announced as, uh, as part of uh, support for export markets around extension of the export market development grants at uh, $80 million. Um, uh, they're probably the, uh, the main okay. elements of... Uh, All right, uh, so that's about been. another one and a half billion. So we're sort of sitting there at, at about five and a half billion of decisions taken but not yet announced that that, is it intended to, to announce that between now and the budget, or...? Uh, so, uh, so, Senator, we're... Um, um, it's a lot of money. Uh, where, the, ...where the government determines to do so, but I think you can see from um, what we've both outlined in terms of those that are NFP um, and the various programs that have been announced to date, be they infrastructure commitments, um, uh, uh, you know, which... Yeah, that dial can change very quickly and suddenly when you have a um, seven to eight hundred million dollar uh, infrastructure commitment, uh, or similarly in terms of the university uh, research commercialisation package and so on. Um, uh, that you know, these are um, policies that have been uh, developed by government. Government, of course, uh, is working through the process around finalising or announcing aspects of, uh, of those policies, uh, but um, we've made sure in terms of trying to ensure that my IFO was as accurate a reflection of the, uh, of the budget position as possible, that uh, um, those um, policy decisions being made were accounted for. Mm. But there's only, what, six weeks till budget day and there's still five and a half billion of decisions that you've already taken but you haven't yet announced, waiting to be announced at the right time. If I'm excluding the not for publication and the money that you've announced, that's what's left and the expectation is you're going to announce that over the next six weeks. Well, Senator, uh, um, where decisions um, are finalised, uh, an agreement made for the public announcement and those public announcements occur uh, just, as, uh, just as we've outlined. If, uh, uh, if there are any areas where of course it becomes uh, possible to not proceed with the decision um, uh, because uh, because circumstances have changed, uh, government uh, considers that too. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks thank you for the much, time. Senator, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, I believe you have some questions. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think it's for the same officials. Uh, just wanting to ask about um, the estimated budget costs of COVID-19 measures. So, uh, specifically, can you please outline to me um, the measures contained in the mid-year update, both in terms of the health and economic supports? Okay, uh, thank you, Senator. Um, so in the 21-22 MAIFO, uh, the government committed $25.3 billion in direct economic and health support. Of this, uh, $22.3 million was for direct economic support and $2.9 billion was for COVID health response measures. Thank you. And so does this include the estimated cost of COVID-19 measures in the 21-22 mid-year update that are not for publication? No, it does not. So, um, okay, so those, are, those measures are on top? Oh, uh, yep, and sorry, I, I just need to correct the record. Um, the M's and the B's were round the wrong way. <laughs> so oh, yes. um, the 22.3 billion for yep. direct economic support um, and the uh, two point and 2.9. Yeah, and 22.9 billion. Yeah. Sorry. For the, yep. the health. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So what was that figure? Sorry. 22.3 and 2.9. Okay. And they don't add up to 25.3 due to rounding. Um, so apologies on that. Um, yeah. So on the NFP. So no, that funding does not include our NFP. Um, okay. So that's on top. So that is on top. Yes. Okay. Are you able to just uh, break that down, maybe with just some of the key headline type measures, uh, programs? Uh, yes, so um, as, as set out in the um, MAIFO publication, obviously the two kind of largest economic response measures are provided funding for the um, national uh, COVID-19 disaster payments and the COVID-19 business supports. Um, there was also funding provided to address workforce shortages, uh, support for job seekers, um, including boosting apprenticeship outcomes. Um, in addition, there was some funding to uh, continue support for both the aviation and childcare sectors, which are captured um, in that funding um, in my EFO. On the health side, um, in terms of uh, uh, me measures in the my EFO, um, the Key ones were obviously were uh, 1.1 billion for the distribution and uptake of COVID-19 vaccines. So that's for the kind of supporting delivery around the vaccines, not the vaccine purchases themselves, which are NFP. Right. Um, and uh, further billion dollars to support uh, hospitals, um, including for the extension of the national partnership agreement with the states and territories for COVID-19. Um, and obviously some additional supports around primary care, et cetera, as part of the broader health, okay. health support. So since the pandemic began, what's the total then that's been spent on both health and economic measures? Uh, so the figures um, as reported in the um, MAIFO publication, page four, um, it's a total commitment of a 337 billion in direct economic and um, health support. Can you break those, that down? Have you got? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, 314 billion for um, direct economic support, and 23 billion for um, COVID uh, response measures to support the health system. And I assume uh, that not for publication measures are excluded from those totals. Uh, yes, Senator. Okay. Yep. Minister, what have been the key? outcomes of the government's COVID-19 response in terms of Australia's relative performance uh, internationally com by comparison? Um, Senator, um, uh, a very strong economic performance um, uh, on the uh, budget side. Australia remains one of only nine countries to have a AAA credit rating reinforced by each of the international ratings agencies, uh, a couple of which have in fact uh, taken Australia off of the negative watch list in the last 12 months, uh, which um, seems counterintuitive uh, to some at a time when, uh, when we face such significant budget pressures and challenges, uh, but it's a demonstration of the confidence that they have around the strength of the Australian economy and how that strength plays into the medium-term fiscal strategy um, uh, around budget repair. 
um, uh, the, uh, the economic responses uh, we've delivered have also uh, put Australia's unemployment rate down to 4.2 per cent uh, at, the, uh, at the last um, unemployment figures that were released. Um, uh, one of the strongest employment outcomes around the world uh, with, uh, with a 1.1 million job bounce back from, uh, from uh, the COVID period um, and, uh, and uh, unemployment, of course, forecast uh, now by the Reserve Bank uh, to push below the 4% uh, level um, as, uh, as part of that response. It's also seen uh, very strong levels of participation, especially women's workforce participation, which, uh, which the government uh, strongly, uh, strongly welcomes, um, and, uh, and it really is in those that jobs metric that, in particular, we uh, we you know, assess the most important outcomes because you know, that's what impacts the abilities of Australian families in terms of meeting cost of living and other pressures, um, and it's also uh, what delivers the most sustainable improvements to the budget bottom line uh, by uh, reducing. Uh, anticipated social services expenditure and, uh, and increasing the number of taxpayers contributing across the economy. And in terms of the, the health outcomes, if by comparison of other countries? On the whole, Australia um, uh, continues to have um, uh, lower average uh, levels of fatality, um, higher uh, levels of vaccination than many comparable nations, um, uh, and they have all contributed to uh, stronger economic outcomes. Um, and some of the most important policy measures during the time were, of course, date back to uh, the closure of Australia's international borders, which provided uh, time for Australia to be able uh, to uh, keep um, the worst effects of COVID uh, at bay for a long period of time, uh, notwithstanding challenges and outbreaks that occurred in some cities. Uh, we still avoided um, those worst effects from uh, uh, the early variants of COVID-19 uh, even from the Delta variant, uh, which provided time for the world to uh, develop the different vaccines and for the rollout of those vaccines to occur. Uh, and whilst the last couple of months have been challenging with uh, uh, labour market disruptions and uh, disruptions from uh, many Australians having to isolate, uh, and of course uh, the tragic loss of life of those who uh, have succumbed to COVID, um, we are now dealing with, uh, with the Omicron variant uh, which is forecast to be or shown to be around 70 per cent less likely to result uh, in serious illness than earlier variants. Um, and Australians have shown a strong willingness to embrace now the booster program uh, with, uh, with many millions of booster doses delivered to. The, the economic measures and the health measures are intrinsically linked in terms of the outcomes that we've achieved and you've outlined the, both the health and the economic um, outcomes that have been achieved. Uh, how, how important has that been? I mean, you know, for example, uh, if, if someone's required to stay at home because they've tested positive or maybe they've been a close contact, uh, having that support uh, for their family, uh, how important has that been to actually achieving those health outcomes? There's a, quite a disparity between the amount that we've spent on economic measures versus health measures, but are they intrinsically linked together? To uh, get they, those are, they, they are. A link together, Senator. Um, one of the areas that we've seen um, uh, spending pressure in uh, in recent months has been in relation to the um, uh, to the uh, uh, COVID um, with the name of the payment that I'm trying to recall. So the pandemic, pandemic, disaster, the pandemic leave disaster leave payment. Thank yeah. you. Uh, with the pandemic disaster leave payment, um, which is uh, is there to provide financial assistance to Australians who have to isolate as part of uh, close contact arrangements. Um, and, uh, and that's been a very important um, uh, measure to provide people with the uh, financial ability where they need to, to not go to work, to follow those health orders for isolation and, uh, and is uh, one example of how those economic measures uh, can help to provide stronger economic outcomes by maintaining um, uh, the capacity of, uh, of households and businesses in terms of financial support, but also enable them to, uh, to do the right thing in responding to public health advice. And notwithstanding the, the quite large uh, and significant budget costs of the COVID-19 health economic and economic response that you've outlined, how important has budget restraint been and how important uh, is it going forward? 
Uh, Senator, um, uh, saying no uh, is an important part of, uh, of managing um, uh, the budget as well, uh, even with the extraordinary measures we've undertaken through COVID-19. Uh, there have been many calls for additional spending. Uh, the exchange that Senator Gallagher and I had before uh, really related to, uh, to some of those sorts of calls that, uh, that uh, when we established JobKeeper as a program, uh, the opposition called for eligibility criteria that uh, would have brought a further two million potential participants into the JobKeeper program and added substantially to its costs uh, when we sought to step down that program in terms of the amount that was being paid uh, or the eligibility criteria around it. Uh, the opposition called for us to um, uh, continue uh, with elevated payments and with broader eligib eligibility criteria. Uh, but ultimately, as, uh, as was demonstrated from the strength of the Australian economy, the strength of the jobs market, uh, it was the right call to step it down at the time that we did, uh, and it would have been wasteful um, and reckless to, uh, to continue um, uh, the program in the ways that the opposition called for us to do so. Uh, just as, uh, for example, the uh, $300 uh, cash payments for people uh, to get vaccinated was proven to be a, a foolish and wasteful policy idea uh, that, uh, that would have seen billions of dollars wasted paying people to do something that they rolled out and turned out to do um, uh, for free um, uh, for the right reasons, uh, recognising the public health benefits of vaccination. Okay, you've just actually answered my next question. Thank you, Chair. That was my final question. Thank you very much, Senator O'Sullivan. Um, Senator Ayres. Thanks very much. Uh, just a couple of quick things before I move to a, one issue. Um, Ms Huxtable, um, th that uh, discussion about ABC funding that, that we just had, it, it, I'm just curious, is the indexation rate the same for all of these organisations? I seem to remember that there was a different indexation rate applied to the ABC. Is it is it the same as or is it is it the same indexation rate as was or the same the same type of indexation rate as was applied before, or is there some difference? Uh, the officer can uh, Thank answer you. the question, I believe. Oh, Libor Pavetsky, first Assistant Secretary, Budget and Financial Reporting. Thanks, Mr. Pelecki. So the short answer is yes, it's the same indexation. Uh, it is, uh, I can give you the indexation rates so that uh, ABC's operational funding is indexed by 1% in 22, 23, 1.7 in 23, 24, and 1.9 in 24, 25. So this is consistent with uh, the indexation as released by the Treasury. So it's a, it's, a con, it's a consistent indexation rate across organisations? Yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So that, that's for the ABC, it, uh, it's wage cost index six. six. Right, OK, yeah. thank you. Yes. Yeah. I had an argument over the weekend about somebody who said it was the non-farm deflator or something. That I, well, there are different uh, indexation uh, rates yes. that apply across a range of programs. There yes. Many are based off the WSCI indices, so it is an area where it can become quite complex. Yes. yes. I'm sure well, we could have a fascinating discussion about wage cost <laughs> index 6 if uh, yeah, No, if well, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure we could, but um, I hope this is the only time today that your answers caused me to lose an argument. Um, uh, Ms. Huxtable, I just wanted to remind you as well that it, um, can, you can confirm that the usual staff tables will be available. Oh, yes. They will at through. the start of outcome 3. So. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, we had a, a discussion earlier today about, um, with ANI and ASC, um, about um, essentially about the impact of the government's decision in submarines in relation to those two organisations. And I just wanted, um, Secretary, to ask you some questions about what kind of oversight finance has of defence industry programs. Um, if we could just. There'll presumably be some sure. people come up to the front. Um, there's actually the the work that we do in respect of defence crosses two areas of the department. So the budget and financial reporting group, uh, which Ms. Patterson is the deputy for, 
uh, has a very important role in, uh, in scrutinising uh, the sort of cost, the defence costing process, the uh, defence investment uh, program, uh, and the like. Um, Ms. Patterson sits on the defence investment committee, uh, so there's a lot of work that goes on on that side of the department. And then, uh, Mr. Williamson's side uh, of the department manages the uh, shareholder engagement with ANI and ASC and then similarly works back into defence uh, around uh, particularly the shipbuilding programs. So depending on your questions. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. When these are very large and very complex uh, undertakings, um, the uh, illustrative, I suppose, is the, is uh, what's happened in the um, Hunter class frigate program. So, as as I recall it, initially $35 billion and turned out costs now $45 billion. Um, what's, what's finance's understanding of the reason for that cost escalation? Um, so, Senator, I think it's, it's worth just dwelling a little bit on these costs because there is a degree of complexity that sits behind them. Um, as you say, uh, there is the outturning process and then there is a parameter updating process that occurs at every budget, so the costs will vary. I'm just trying to find the right... Uh, and and I also accept that some of these programs, cost is not the only risk, of course, that has been managed. Um. And, and so, uh, sorry, just on the, on the costs, uh, question. Um, the, I mean, the, the latest uh, published cost in respect to the future frigate program was uh, released in September. Uh, it's a budget 21-22 cost. It was actually released as part of the AUKUS announcement, and that figure is 44.1 uh, uh, billion. But that is effectively the. Uh, outturned and, and parameter adjusted cost equivalent to you know numbers that previously have been published for example in the full structure plan in the 1920 May FO it was 45.6 billion dollars that's the same number which has now become 44.1 due to the effect of parameters and the like so in simple terms um, as the timeline blows out, the turned out cost increases? Well, not ne not necessarily. So uh, I think at the time that, and you know, defence are best place to answer a lot of these questions, but from mm. our perspective and our um, observance of these costs, at this time that the Naval Shipbuilding Plan um, was announced, there was an announcement that the future frigate program was estimated to cost greater than $35 billion. So that was a greater than figure. Um, the first time, I believe, that the actual published uh, cost uh, was released was in the 2024 structure plan, which is the 45.6 billion that I referenced earlier. But that same figure is now 44.1 billion. So that is the effect of um, parameters that uh, has an impact on the outturning calculations effectively. Yep, and refinement of understanding of what those costs are as you go through the development stage to second part. Yes, well, that's what I wanted to come to. It, it's so, so I think I understand the, the first point, but, but secondly, these are uh, complex projects with, with many, many components and supply chain challenges and all sorts of things. How, how, do, you, how do you maintain control? I mean, these are eye-watering amounts of money. Um, how do you maintain control over defence's processes here? So I think that, um, I mean, really defence is best place to talk about the details of their program. So, you know, I wouldn't want to uh, step into, into their space um, in that regard. But, you know, certainly in terms of the work uh, that we do with a and and ASC and looking back into defence, um, we do stay uh, so sort of well connected to the naval shipbuilding um, programs, um, we have um, Mr. W Mr. Williamson, um, you know, has a close relationship with Defence in, in respect of how those programs are tracking. Uh, I mean, our role, I guess, is one of um, 
you know, a, a kind of partner, uh, I guess. Um, Oh, I mean, I'd just add, Senator, that I think uh, uh, Ms Patterson and I sort of attend many different forums that Defence are host. Uh, as the Secretary mentioned, the Defence Investment Committee, which Ms Patterson sets, sits on, and I attend you know, naval shipbuilding meetings as well. So the um, Secretary's point is we've got a, a number of interfaces with Defence around these matters, and that's how we sort of, I guess, um, work with them to understand uh, the various projects that they're undertaking, you know, I mean... Well, I mean, the Minister was talking about um, the importance of saying no before. Uh, it seems like this is a long way away from the kind of engagement that, that has an impact on controlling costs. Uh, so, can so you give me an I, example of where finance's engagement with one of these programs is, has um, reduced cost? So, Senator, the, the Defence Integrated Investment Program mm. operates as um, um, a budget analogous to the way in which the um, Infrastructure Investment Program uh, administered by the Department of Infrastructure operates in the sense that there is a projected envelope um, uh, established by government consistent with our commitment to the minimum 2% of GDP investment in defence um, and that within that envelope um, uh, defence operates its budget. Now finance has a number of then engagement points as that occurs in terms of prioritisation of that budget decisions that are made uh, within that um, uh, within that defence integrated investment program uh, budget line. Um, and, uh, and certainly um, uh, the type of collaboration that you heard from officials there to, to seek to engage with defence around um, uh, lessons that are learned from the various reviews that have been undertaken um, over the years uh, to, uh, to um, get the maximum efficiency there. But as I said yesterday, Senator Ayres, when we were having um, an exchange uh, about these sorts of programs. Nobody should pretend that any of them, regardless of who's in government, come without risk and uncertainty. Um, you know, that's been the experience dating back through the Collins class and, uh, and of course, um, in subsequent programs um, under all governments. Uh, I think it is important that we do highlight the successes that have been achieved by Australia's uh, shipbuilding industries to drive confidence in them uh, for, the, uh, for the projects that are being undertaken and to attract the best talent and workforces in those sectors. That's not the expense of, uh, of honestly reflecting challenges that are faced, um, but the challenges are um, uh, real and consistent uh, and of course it's a constant process of understanding lessons from past programs such as some of the arrangements under the, under the AWDs for example that have informed how future programs are structured? Yeah, yeah, well, as I said at the outset, uh, cost is one of the risks. Um, you know, capability risks are inherent in these projects. Um, delivery risks are inherent. Um, you know, if the um, submarines that the government has promised to deliver on time don't get delivered on time, uh, th there are significant issues that go beyond cost considerations. Uh, that are engaged there. Um, but this program uh, has had an almost 30 per cent increase in turned out costs. And I'm trying to understand what is the downward pressure that, for, like, is it really just a matter of defence coming up with the costs uh, and, you know, engaging with finance? Where, where is the point where finance has a downward impact on costs or a defence essentially left to run these? To, 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 you know, like these, does, does the Department of Finance have any control over these cost buyouts? So, 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 Senator, I don't accept the characterisation around the costs in, uh, in the census and such. We'll talk you through before um, the broad estimates around the Naval Shipbuilding Plan, then the precise figure that was attached in the 2024 structure plan um, and the relationship of that with the, with the most recent published update, which actually shows it to 
slightly lower, but I wouldn't um, go out and chest beat about that by any means than, uh, than what was in the uh, uh, 2024 structure plan. Um, uh, uh, in terms of finances engagement with defence, I'm happy for officials to, to continue you know, the discussion there. Defence is ultimately responsible for its budget and for the program delivery. As we went through with PM and C yesterday, there are a, a number of checkpoints in terms of defence's um, uh, reporting back, be it at cabinet level through the, uh, um, uh, the Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance Committee, uh, albeit um, at officials level through the different structures that exist underneath that. Um, and, uh, and I'm certainly happy for the Secretary and officials to talk to those different points of engagement where defence will test um, both its status and, uh, and some issues with, uh, with agencies like finance to um, help provide some external input into uh, their work to, to minimise those risks. So, so just on... on uh the um, Hunter class, the first was sort of turned out cost related. You know, what 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 are the two drivers here that you, you said again? If I, Ms Huxtable, you, you were the first, I think? Yes. Uh, so I think I took you through the way that those numbers evolved, mm. but the foundation uh, number was a, it was a number greater than 35. Yeah. So the actual, the, the first number that was the published number was the 2024 structure plan, which announced an investment of 45.6 billion, which is an outturned price and exchange uh, number, uh, which, which is consistent with the acquisition uh, cost estimate, which was established in 2018 as part of the second pass decision. Mm. Yep. And, and so from that point on, there hasn't been uh, any cha change. change. I mean, there have been changes, as Ms Patterson said, related to uh, the construction schedule being fine-tuned, um, the updating of inflation and foreign exchange rate assumptions. As you can see, that number's gone slightly down, but as the Minister said, that number will move around at every budget update date uh, and will be reflected yes. uh, in the estimates just because of the effect of the forex assumptions and uh, inflation. Uh, it, can I just address the other question that I think you had around our level of engagement? And I would Thank want you. to say that following the first principles uh, review, the role of the finance department uh, at the table with defence, scrutinising defence investment, uh, is a very you know, strong and real one. Uh, I sat on the investment, defence investment committee when I was the deputy, uh, the role that Ms Patterson is now in, uh, she sits on it. What that means is that finance uh, is, uh, is getting vis visibility of every capability proposal that comes uh, through, uh, and also the uh, decisions that are being taken about um, sort of trade-offs, you know, within the IIP envelope. Because, that, as the minister said, we are dealing here with a, um, a sort of bound um, budget. So defence is a little bit different to many other areas where they come forward for new money. You know, that they have a, a bound budget that's factored into the forward estimates and, and then there has to be assessments made around capability and trade-offs as part of that. So um, Ms Patterson and her um, supporting staff are very much engaged in the sort of capability assessment uh, work and considering cost estimates at that point. Um, I would say that the work that we're doing on the naval shipbuilding side especially is really around uh, the, the kind of interface with our GBEs, the construction schedules, ensuring that there's no impediments um, to you know, work progressing as planned. And as part of that, I also have uh, a regular meeting with the Defence uh, Secretary. We have a one-on-one -on -one just with our immediate officials uh, on naval shipbuilding, um, which occurs very regularly. So I do feel like we are you know, very integrated. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're a we are a relatively small department that have the resources available to us um, to support defence. We seek to do that in a very uh, collaborative, partnership-based way. That's reciprocated by them, um, and, and they manage their programs. It's quite a different explanation to what the Defence Minister gave on Sky the other day uh, when he was challenged about this, this particular project. He said, oh, it's, it's a contingency cost. The overruns are contingencies built into the original contract. He said, um, 
No, I think again, Tom, there are two things here. One is that there is a contingency, big contingencies built into these contracts. Is that, is that right? I mean, in terms of what comprises um, these numbers, I, you, you really need to go to defence in that regard. But, but as a general principle, I mean, I accept the explanation that you've given in terms of the way that finances these overruns. What's Minister Dutton talking about? Well, Senator, as, uh, as Ms Saxon said, I think that's um, more a question for Mr Dutton uh, and or Defence in terms of the choice of language he's, uh, he's used. I mean, you even here have uh, sought to um, draw comparison uh, to current pricing with earlier broader non-specific estimates that, uh, that were, uh, were made. Provisions yeah, that's not a contingency right though, term. is it? That's not the way out. It, well, uh, obviously later, more detailed um, um, estimates of the project cost that are set do encompass at that stage then the different provisions, design decisions and uh, yes. of course contingencies as, as part of that. I suspect he was just saying what he needed to say to get to the end of the interview. Um, there are other stories about a budget blowout in the flying cost of the MRH-90 helicopters which have been cancelled. Uh, very significant expenditure items. What, what was finance's role there with the expenditure and the um, budget and the cancellation decision for that program? So we clearly support our minister uh, in NSC and provide you know, briefings to him as matters come before uh, the government. I, you know, I think if you've got detailed questions on, um, on that particular proposal, Defence will be best placed to respond uh, to those questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Secretary Minister. Senator and Waters, colleagues. you have the call. Thanks very much, Chair. Hello again, folks. Uh, some questions, first of all, about the waiver of the overpayment to Mr Chris Jose. I understand that in December of last year, the Ombudsman finalised an investigation report that was critical of the Department's decision in 2020 to waive the $41,000 debt owed by Mr Chris Jose after he was paid for both his role with ACMA and the National Competition Council simultaneously. So, so, sorry, Senator, Senator, Senator Mike, there's a lot of shuffling of cheap seats and chairs and papers as people get into position um, for the change of witnesses. So. Now that it's quiet, it might be better to proceed from there where everybody will be able to hear. Apologies, Senator. That's fine. I'll start again. So in December, the Ombudsman finalised an investigation report that was critical of the Department's decision to waive the $41,000 debt owed uh, by Mr Chris Jose after he was paid for both his ACMA and National Competition Council roles simultaneously, despite internal advice that the waiver would be unlawful and inconsistent with the way robo-debt uh, debts were treated. So, firstly, has the Department of Finance received the Ombudsman's report? Uh, Senator, uh, the Department was provided with a copy of a report relating to a published in public interest disclosure investigation in December. Uh, the Department received a copy that was redacted, though. I see. We did not receive the full report. Okay. W will that report be published? either in full form or reducted form at some point? The investigation was undertaken by the Ombudsman and it's the Ombudsman's report, so that's a matter for the Ombudsman. Okay. Um, has the Department of Finance asked that it remain confidential? No. Okay. Uh, what justification was given for granting the waiver? So, um, you'll appreciate uh, Senator, I've got to be a little bit careful here because it's a public interest disclosure investigation undertaken by the Ombudsman. Um, in providing that report to the Department of Finance, uh, we get a redacted version that allows us to see any information that relates to the Department of Finance and recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's explicitly in the cover letter, it says, you know, I ask this report not be disseminated to anyone. 
who does not have a need to know. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to talk about it in the broad rather than going to the specifics of it. Um, the, the Ombudsman's report that uh, uh, had one recommendation for the Department of Finance, mm -hmm. and that related to ensuring that the documentation of decisions, whether they be positive or negative, are appropriately recorded um, and easily, easily accessible. Uh, the Ombudsman's report did not contain a finding around the uh, administration of the uh, the debt waiver decision uh, or any issues around that. It was uh, a decision that was taken by an appropriate delegate within the department uh, following the procedures that we have. Okay, what was the uh, level of that delegate? Um... Uh, the delegate was a senior executive. Okay. Uh, did that person act of their own accord or seek any further instruction from their seniors? Uh, I mean, that person's, uh, um, as a delegate, is, is there to make the decision, but uh, they made uh, uh, the necessary inquiries with uh, both internally and with external parties related to this particular matter. Okay, so pardon my ignorance of internal uh, ministerial processes, but would the delegate have checked with the minister? No. Okay. So, uh, in relating to debt waivers, um, let me just excuse me here. So, <clears throat> under Section 63 of the PGPA Act, the Minister may, on behalf of the Commonwealth, auth authorise the waiver of an amount owing to the Commonwealth. Under Section 107 of the PGPA Act, the Finance Minister has delegated the power to decisions on waiver requests for amounts up to $100,000 to the Finance Secretary. And then under one, section 109 of the PGPA Act, the Finance Secretary has delegated that power to making decisions on waiver requests to specified officers subject to financial limits based on their position. So there's a delegation hierarchy okay. that comes through the PGPA Act that, uh, um, that the Minister has firstly delegated in the Secretary uh, and the person who made this decision uh, uh, was an appropriate delegate under those terms. Okay, so it wasn't the secretary in this case? No. Okay. Did the delegate receive advice about the legality of the waiver? Uh, so the waiving of debts is, uh, as I said, comes from section 63 of the PGPA Act. Um, and the delegate in exercising the delegation uh, undertook discussions, consultations, etc., with uh, relevant parties on this particular matter, um, noting that the request for a debt waiver comes from an external party. Yes, thank you. But did the delegate consider the legality of the waiver? Did, did, was advice yes. sought as to the legality of the waiver? So I, I, I wasn't the delegate, but on the information that I have, yes, they did. And they were entitled to make that decision. Okay. And, and I should stress that the Ombudsman report uh, that we've seen uh, does not suggest that they didn't have um, the authority to make that decision. Is that because it doesn't go to that matter at all? Or does it actively suggest there's not a problem? Uh, I might have to check with Mr Danks, but my, uh, my recollection is that it, it broadly covers that matter. And if, if there had been an issue, the Ombudsman would have raised it, I would have thought. Okay, so the Ombudsman's report is silent on that point, and you've therefore taken it as a, a green light? Um, I, 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 I would have to take that on notice. I don't have the report okay. with me. Happy so for you to do so. I, I think it's not unreasonable to assume, though, that if the Ombudsman hasn't raised such a question, the Ombudsman, therefore, has not identified a... So we would have assumed concern. that that was the case. For example, there certainly would have been a strong finding recommendation, and as I, I said to you uh, earlier, there was one recommendation in yes, the report. Yes, about that documenting the related, decisions properly. Uh, related yep. to finance. And just for clarity, I'm happy to... The report recommended that finance review its processes for documentation of waiver decisions mm. to ensure both positive and negative decisions are properly documented. That okay, was the so only recommendation in the report Yes, thank you for, for pointing that out now several times. So just on that point, does that imply that there have been many of these such decisions that, in fact, haven't been documented? No. 
It wasn't that the decision wasn't documented. It was about the, I guess, the fullness of the documentation, if I can put it that way, like the completeness of it. Um, but, But the decision was documented. Okay, so they're all documented, but sometimes it's a bit shoddy and the ombudsman said, no. do uh, better. Well, well I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that, Senator. I, I think, um, as far as, as I understand, in terms of the processes there, um, there's been a, a historical approach in relation to the documentation of rejections um, versus the documentation of approvals. Unsurprisingly, people seeking a debt waiver are usually more aggrieved when they are rejected and, uh, and so being able to clearly provide in that regard the rationale for rejections mm. um, is, uh, is an area more likely to be contested. It is, in the main, less likely that somebody who's applied for a debt waiver is going to be aggrieved if it has been approved. Um, sure, but it's still expenditure of public funds, hence it, I think it, the Ombudsman's it is, made the right call it's, here, it's not, it's not without that's the full process in the decision, as, uh, as Mr Williamson's gone through. Um, however, how that is then documented in terms of statements of reasons and those sorts of elements, I think, is yes, uh, that's correct. where I understand the Ombudsman recommendation Thank is, uh, is going to, to generate a, a greater equivalence between um, uh, those two processes. Thank you. That's nice and clear now. Um, so just coming back to what was the justification given for the waiver in this instance, please? Uh, I would, I'll take that on notice, Senator, because I, I would need to take advice on what I can, um, uh, what information I, I can release around that. So I'll take that on notice. Okay, thank you. Is there a policy around uh, consistency of the approach to uh, waivers? What, why yes. was the robo debts treated so differently to this? It's so, obviously a different context, but it's the same con- concept. So if it's okay, I'll take that in two parts. The, the Department of Finance has internal procedures that support the consideration of debt waiver requests. And so they are followed by the delegates. Uh, And that was one of the things we did in terms of responding to the Ombudsman's recommendations. We've updated those internal procedures to address the point the Minister made around ensuring both positive and negative decisions are are fully documented. Um, In terms of the other matter you raise, uh, that's um, uh, the income compliance program was dealt with under social security law. Social security law has its own provisions uh, and the ability for debts to be waived or set aside. Um, so that's a, a different legislative place. Thank you. I, I do appreciate that. Is there any sort of attempt at philosoph- well it's clearly not an attempt at philosophical consistency I'm interested in why there isn't oh, well, see, see, senator I think I think that goes to the you know, setting of the legislation um, across different areas um, um, you know, mr. Williamson is with any um, official across the APS. His yes, job I don't is, hold Mr. Williamson is, is responsible to, for robo debt. Is to I do hold this government responsible. Is to implement the law as it applies um, and to do so fairly um, under those terms, or if not Mr. Williamson, then the officials in, in the case you've been asking about who were, who were delegated to make those decisions. Okay. Um, has any further actions, other than the ones you've already outlined about changing your documentation processes, have any further actions been taken in response to the Ombudsman's report? Yes, so there's, we've done three things. Yep. Uh, there was um, a, an email communication to all delegates within the department, mm-hmm. reminding of them of their responsibilities in this area. It was also discussed at a relevant section meeting, so that's a team. So it's been done in writing and verbally. Mm-hmm. And then the third part was to update our internal procedures to better reflect the need to record the reasons for the decision. Okay. And you've taken on notice what were the reasons for the decision in this particular instance. Yes. Thank you. Um, and last question on this topic. Has any audit been undertaken to ensure that no other government appointed members have been overpaid? Uh, I'm not aware of any audits on that particular topic. Okay. Minister, any other? Have you done an audit considering this one was oh. an overpayment? Have you checked to see whether there's any others? 
Uh, well, Senator agencies um, um, are responsible and, uh, and do at times, uh, of course, face audit arrangements in, uh, in relation to um, their expenses, including payments. Um, so uh, so uh, I would uh, expect uh, that agencies where they've identified any systemic failures um, work to address those systemic failures. Okay, but has your department done an audit to make sure that there's not been any other overpayments that your department has presided over? Um, uh, not, to, not to my knowledge, Senator, in terms of, uh, in terms of that. Uh, no, I'm not aware of a specific audit. Um, my understanding would be when we have people likely to fill positions of the kind that you're talking about, um, as part of that process, we would undertake due diligence to understand any other positions that they might hold at the time and take appropriate action. Okay, so you'll do a case-by-case -case assessment going forwards? As opposed to an audit, and, 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 is that and what, and is that what you mean? And, yes, I mean I think, as I said, with those positions that might be in our portfolio that we are responsible for, we would seek to understand the candidates' um, other positions that they hold. As I said, to undertake appropriate due diligence, yes. and if we believe there was an issue, we would follow that issue through. Okay, and um, Minister, are you suggesting that if other departments have presided over overpayments, that that's their problem? and not a role for your department to audit? Well, each, each agency is responsible for its own payment systems and, uh, and the integrity and compliance of those, uh, those payment systems. Um, each agency is also subject to audit processes. Uh, the Department of Finance is not an audit agency. Um, and that's what we have uh, the processes of the ANAO for in, uh, in terms of uh, working with agencies on, uh, on different aspects of compliance. Okay. All right, can I move now to um, government advertising? The ANAO report into Australian government advertising since the last, since the last election is due to be tabled uh, this week, I believe. Has the department seen a copy of that report? So I think I'm, I'm being advised that I may, have, I may have received an embargoed copy, but I haven't actually seen it. So I, it probably depends on how it's received is, is defined. I have, I've received it today, but I haven't seen it because okay. I've been here. Okay. Um, is there any different approach exercised in the lead up to an election? than in normal non-election periods to make sure that government advertising is properly limited to government campaigns and not proxy partisan promotions? Or is it the same process no matter what the election cycle is? Uh, Sally Harris, Assistant Secretary, Governance Division. It's the same process. Um, all departments are to follow the um, Australian government guidelines on advertising. Okay. Um, how many government ad campaigns have been endorsed so far in this financial year? Uh, so campaigns launched uh, in the financial year 2021, there have been 15 campaigns. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to do the list current then? financial year, yep. Yep. Uh, in the current financial year? Yes, please. Um, Oh yes, sorry. 14 campaigns have launched in the 21-22 financial year. Okay. So 14, not 15. So. Sorry, 15, four, four was, 15 was 2021 and 14 yes, sorry. was current. Sorry, yeah. that's right. So are, there right. Any, are you aware or would you be aware of any future government ad campaigns that will come in in this current financial year or do you just find out when they happen? Oh, so I guess um, the way we talk about campaigns is that there's often campaigns or communication ideas that are being uh, thought of or considered by government, but until they launch, uh, it's obviously a matter yeah. for government okay. when and if. So it looks like they'll be slightly more this year um, than last year. Um, okay, well, I'll ask questions of that in subsequent estimates. Can I come specifically to the positive energy campaign, which is a government, am uh, government campaign spruiking its alleged emissions reduction policies, um, which just had its funding boosted from an initial 10 million to 27.2 million, my figures are correct. 
Um, questions were asked of Desir yesterday about the ad itself, but I've got some questions regarding finance's role in coordinating and overseeing um, this campaign. Did the communication advice branch provide any advice relating to the framework for information and advertising campaigns for this positive energy campaign? Uh, so, Senator, we, uh, in the uh, Department of Finance, we do provide advice to uh, the SDCC, uh, which is a subcommittee of Cabinet. Mm -hmm. And sorry, what does that stand for? Uh, the Service Delivery and Communication Committee. That's right. That right. Okay. And so, did you provide advice to that SDCC on this particular positive energy campaign? Uh, yes, we did. Okay. And when was that? Uh, I don't have in front of me when uh, that meeting was. I'd need to take that on notice. Okay, thank you. Um, Please do so. Was the ad campaign subject to certification and endorsement under the guidelines on information and advertising campaigns? Yes, it was. Okay. And what was the public purpose benefit for the public energy ad campaign? Um, because to an outsider, it looks like Liberal polling said the public thinks that the government's climate policy is terrible, um, and so a PR campaign was hastily developed as opposed to a decent climate policy. I, I, well, I don't that's know. My, I, I, that's my rhetoric. Okay, well, well, what was the public interest justification? Uh, what was the public purpose benefit it, for it, the campaign? It's, it's your commentary, um, uh, Senator Waters, and I, and I don't accept your commentary mm. in, uh, in regard to um, the, uh, the significant investment in uh, low emissions technologies, in, uh, in um, uh, emissions reduction and, uh, and of course the scale of emissions reduction being achieved to date. Um, but you've focused your question a little more, so um, uh, without the commentary we can attempt to address the question. So Ms Harris, what was the public purpose benefit? Look, I, I, I can give you a broad what the aim was. It was to increase awareness of the government's emission reduction policies and the action that has take, been taken to date. But any more than that, okay. um, you'd need to direct to is, the industry department. Okay, is that normally the level of detail of public purpose? Can you just assert that awareness of the government's policy is in fact public purpose? It's not really my area, but that doesn't seem this is just that a overwhelmingly uh, <laughs> public purpose to me, it's, 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 other than the, uh, personal promotion. Uh, the, the guidelines on information and advertising campaigns, which were introduced in 2008, uh, reference that governments may legitimately use public funds to explain government policies, programs or services. Um, and so um, that is precisely what, uh, what this uh, campaign seeks to do in terms mm. of the explanation of, uh, of government policies and programs and, uh, and in raising awareness of those and noting the significant role that many Australians are playing in terms of their contribution to, uh, to the complementary mm. uh, reduction in, uh, in emissions. Okay, when did that particular campaign start? Uh, so the emissions, the phase one launched on the 19th of September 2021. Okay, and when did the um, boost from 10 to 27.2 million occur? Is that a MyEFO decision? I don't know when the decision was, but I know that the phase two campaign uh, was in December 2021. Okay, so it started just before Glasgow and then it ramped up post Glasgow. Um, to what extent does the certification process assess the truthfulness of claims made in the campaign? Uh, so um, the role is uh, for entities to um, uh, comply with the five principles of the guidelines um, and uh, the secretary or the CEO of that organisation um, certifies um, through various documentation that the department uh, prepares for that CEO that it, has, that it has complied. Sorry, I'm not quite following you. you just, they just say it's true and you have to certify that it is. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I hope there, that's there, what it is. Sorry, there's also um, an independent communications committee which um, assesses campaigns and they do that early on in the process and they look at principles one to four of the guidelines. Mm. I'm not sure if you want me to go through what the principles are. Uh, no, I'm sure I can look them up, but I'm just after the, the process. So. You said the CEO just asserts that it is true. They don't just assert. There's documentation provided. Um, 
quite often uh, statements made in uh, advertisements are verified by uh, policy experts or a legal team. Um, so that, that documentation happen? is provided to the CEO or the secretary before they uh, sign that off. Okay. Is that what happened in this instance with the positive energy campaign? Uh, in terms of the specific uh, information that was provided, you would need to ask the department, but broadly I, I would think that that would have, is what would have happened. Last question, Senator Waters. Um, Chair, I've got about three and then I am okay. I'm done. Thank okay. you very much. Um, so the Ad claims that the government's emissions reductions uh, initiatives are, quote, world leading, um, and yet they were widely condemned in the lead up to Glasgow and Australia ranked last out of 60 places in the 2021 Climate Change Performance Index. Um, the ad also claims that the government's long-term emissions reductions plan is a plan to achieve net zero, but modelling shows that it won't actually achieve net zero. Um, so again, I just come back to the question about the, the truthfulness of the claims and how the veracity or, or otherwise of claims made is, is, is assessed. So who, who has the final tick off saying that this is true when many, many experts and government modelling itself shows that it's not. Senator, I think you're starting to, to enter into uh, wanting to debate um, policy issues uh, with, uh, with Ms Harris. Um, the, uh, yeah, the fact is, Senator, that for uh, example, the Snowy 2.0 uh, project, which I think is, uh, is one highlighted in the campaign, is, uh, is the largest uh, energy story project of its type in the Southern Hemisphere. It is very clearly uh, a world leading project in that regard. Uh, Senator, um, I appreciate that uh, you know, particularly around events such as the, uh, the Glasgow conference, there are all sorts of, uh, of overhyped um, um, statements, ratings, commentaries, analysis uh, undertaken by organisations with their own different uh, vested interests. Uh, but, uh, but as the government's outlined, our uh, plan for uh, net zero, the scale of investment uh, attached to that, uh, $21 billion of uh, Commonwealth investment in low emissions technologies over the decade to 2030, uh, securing more than $84 billion uh, of public and private sector investment together um, uh, is achieving uh, a transformation across, uh, across our uh, energy and broader climate mix. All right. Well, Ms Harris, are you able to, on notice, provide me with that information that you mentioned before about the process for the veracity of um, claims made in government ads, and that um, you mentioned a two-stage process with the independent uh, committee as well. Can you give me as much as you can on that, and in particular as it relates to this campaign, to the best of your ability, please? Um, so, so just to clarify, I can talk generally, but yeah. um, specifically it would be if, if it's about the emissions campaign, that is best directed to the industry department. Yes, which is okay. There's no sort of independence about the process. It's the department. So that it is the responsibility of the accountable authority. So we provide the guidance. We uh, we manage the independent communications committee process, uh, but the agency themselves are responsible for ensuring their compliance with the guidance. And the accountable authority, by okay. the secretary, signs that that I see. off. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I'll take it up with them, but I'm still interested in your procedural um, advice. Uh, just coming to the evaluation of these ad campaigns, what's the time frame for the evaluation of this specific ad campaign? I don't have the timelines, but generally campaigns um, are um, assessed um, at completion and there is often tracking research through, but um, I don't know the timeline specifically for the emissions campaign. Okay. Um, is there any sort of test of good value for public money? In terms of research? In the evaluation? Um, so we have a panel arrangement um, and uh, so we have uh, uh, five research suppliers that work on government advertising um, and they've gone through um, a rigorous process including assessment um, of value for money. Do they do that after the campaign's concluded or before it begins? Uh, so each department would negotiate um, a, an arrangement with them ahead of uh, uh, the campaign commencing, um, but they have been selected uh, to be part of our panel uh, based on a range of things, including value for money. Okay, sorry, is the panel the evaluation panel or the panel that ticks off at the start? So, so uh, 
there is a research agency um, that is uh, working on this campaign. Um, and so the department would have negotiated up front uh, the contractual arrangements and uh, the costings. I don't, I don't know what that is. You would, again, need to um, check with the industry department. Thank you. Yes, I will. And sorry, just one point of clarification. How does anybody evaluate whether it's a good spend of public money? What is that process and when can we expect that to occur? Hopefully you don't outsource that to a separate agency. Well, I suppose there's a, there's a range of things that they would um, assess and it depends on what type of so campaign it is, what the department would assess, whether it has been effective or not. Okay, and that's not you, that's the department Correct. that have done the ad themselves. That's right. They look at whether they've been a good spend of public money and there's no role for, for DOF in that. There's no role for DOF in that, no. Okay, all right, thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Waters. Senator Ayres to take us to afternoon tea. Thank you, Chair. I have a few questions about government advertising too, so not so fast, I'm afraid. Um, uh, could you list uh, all of the current programs or the, the current government advertising campaigns that are in train at the moment? Ms Harris, thank you. So, um, yeah. so there's 10 campaigns that are currently in market. Yes. Um, the Australian Signals Directorate, Act Now, uh, Stay Secure. Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, National Recycling Campaign, Department of Defence, Defence Force Recruiting, Department of Education, Skills and Employment, Job Trainer Phase 2, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Smart Traveller, Department of Health, COVID-19 Vaccines, Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications, Online Safety, Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, Emissions Reduction, Department of Social Services, Care and Support, and also, uh, sorry, Care and Support Workforce, and also they have Disability Gateway, and that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, and can you tell me what the current total value is of those campaigns? So the, so the figure that we, um, I know we've been through this before, so yes. but the figure that we have is the, the most recent reportable figure, so it's 45 days That's right. previous, because it takes time for all the invoices to come through and things to settle. So we will have figures for the financial year up to 45 days ago. That's right. Uh, and we can provide those figures, but we don't have a more recent figure than that. Okay, now, whether so we can provide that right now or whether we can provide it on notice, I'm not sure. Are you in a position to provide that 45-day figure? But the, I, I, as I understand it, the, the campaign advertising report for 2021 um, says there's was, there was $145 million spent on government advertising in that financial year. That's I think even my... Year. Yes. Rough math says that the 45-day report would give us the, the six months, effectively, from July to no, the right. end of December. Is that right? So we can give you right. campaign expenditure from July to November 2021. Thank you. And that is 99.1 million. It's worth just noting in there, because this only happens every five years, but the 2021 census is in that figure, and that is 23.5 million of that 99.1. Thank you. Um, have all of the new campaigns been reviewed by the ICC? Uh, there was one exemption provided. Thank you. And that was just for the month of January for this year for uh, the COVID-19 campaign, uh, COVID campaign. Yes. And what was the basis for that exemption? Um, it was granted by the Special Minister of State on the basis of urgency. It was to do with the emerging Omicron variant and changes yes. to testing requirements. And, and do you have expenditure figures for the Remade in Australia campaign? Uh, I can tell... Uh, no, actually, I don't, sorry. Um, 
They, they were uh, in estimates yesterday. I know there was some questioning there around expenditure, but I don't have those, those figures. Okay, and so th those July, November figures, um, 20, so 99.1 million, um, 23.5, you can sort of subtract from that because it's um, the census. Otherwise you'd reach the conclusion that, you know, on that trajectory government advertising was likely to be sitting at about $200 million for the full year. A absent, a a if yeah. the, the only thing that interferes with that is the is the there is a, a, a lump there of the ABS campaign of twenty three point five. And different campaigns obviously do have different peaks in uh, in that regard, Senator, and uh, um, uh, and particularly with some of the. Uh, health campaigns, uh, especially the government has been operating over the last couple of years, um, they have especially aligned with uh, with moments such as the need to drive uh, vaccination uptake or uh, or provide awareness in that regard. So, um, I can well, speak well, for those yeah, different peaks. Yes, we've we've talked about that campaign. Thank you. But July to November, ninety nine point one million dollars. Um, that's a significant uplift from the previous 12 months, $145 million, isn't it? Uh, well, if we... If, we if, if, it, if, if it runs if, out at the same if, rate over the next sure, six months... But if, if, if we wanted to take... It wouldn't be anything like the Morrison government to accelerate government advertising in the lead-up to an election. But if we wanted... There'd, there'd be no evidence of that ever happening before. If we wanted, Senator, to take your... Uh, um, uh, your um, crude method of extrapolation and, uh, and removed uh, the census from, uh, from yes. that, uh, then you'd be running pretty much on track uh, with the previous 12 months. Um, uh, so it depends how you look at that. Obviously there are also um, certain campaigns that would, uh, would cease uh, at some point during this financial year. And so does, does finance have figures then um, to estimate um on the basis of the programs that you understand are being undertaken. I think when you were talking to Senator Waters, um, we almost got to uh, advertising campaigns decided but not yet announced as one of the things that you'd have to consider. But um, on the basis of the campaigns that you understand are running at the levels that you understand that they're running at, have you got a figure for what the next six months is going to look like, or the next few months? No, no sir. It's not something you would normally we do? have that, no. Uh, and the, the reason for that is that because, because we're responsible for supporting agencies through the process uh, of developing their campaigns and getting them in market uh, and supporting a value for money outcome through that process, but we're not responsible for the campaigns for uh, their budget allocations in respect of those campaigns. What we can do is, uh, after the campaign, we can report on the spending, and that's what we do. And we have sought to do that up to the nearest possible date we can uh, for this committee. I, I would say that we now report um, uh, more than we have in the past in respect of that, pre that 45 days. There was a time when we only reported on a financial year or a calendar year. So have, we have sought to be as helpful as we can be, but that's the information that we have. And preparations for the caretaker period, um, are any of those campaigns required to stop? So, Senator, when the election uh, is called, basically all campaign advertising ceases uh, and then there is a process of determining in consultation with the opposition uh, which campaigns may be reinstated. So that's a process that we, uh, we uh, support and, and PMC is also involved uh, in that process. Okay. I th thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, I know it was a, a long um, set of questions. I don't have any further questions on that, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Ayres. Am I right in saying that neither senators have questions for outcomes one and two for Department of Finance? Are we going to a break now? 
Uh, yes, at 3.45 we are due to go to a break and the Future and Fund is due uh, to... Future Fund, are they patching in remotely or are they here? Ah, OK. Yeah. okay. Um, I have some more questions but I am happy to keep the program moving and I'll put some on notice, which I probably won't get back this time in the election, but anyway. Appreciate that, Senator Gallagher, very well. In that case, um, thank you very much to departmental officials who were here for outcomes one and two this morning and this afternoon. Um, we will continue with the Future Fund Management Agency at four o'clock after our break and the committee will now suspend for afternoon tea. Thank you. Reconvene um, with our examination of the Future Fund. I welcome Dr Raphael Arndt, Chief Executive Officer of the Future Fund Management Agency and other officers of the agency. Um, Dr Arndt, in the interest of time, if you wish to make an opening statement, I might ask that that be tabled. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and we have Senator McKim remotely, who has uh, some thanks. questions. Can I just check that you can hear me OK? We can hear you perfectly well, Senator McKim. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon to you, um, Dr Arndt. Can I um, start by raising the issue uh, that was revealed in a response that the fund made to an FOI request that was put in by the Australian Centre for International Justice and Justice for Myanmar in November last year. Um, your response to that request revealed that at that time you were invested in a Chinese state-owned company um, selling weapons to the junta in Myanmar. Were you aware at that time that you were invested in companies that were arming the Myanmar dictatorship? Um, so I assume, Senator, that you're referring to AVIC as the company? That's correct. Yeah. So I think I've explained previously, we own, um, or our job is to set the exposure for the fund, and so we invest in um, the Emerging Market Equities Index and there's approximately 1,400 stocks now in that index, and the AVIC position came about as a result of it being included in that equities index by the index provider, MSCI. Thanks, Dr. Arndt. I'm, um, I'm aware of that. Thank you. Um, you had or have, I'm not sure which, about a $5 million stake in AVIC. Um, I just want to ask you again, were you aware that AVIC has been arming the Myanmar military? Um, well, as I've explained previously, we don't look at the individual companies that we hold, that we take through these type of index positions. We rely on our investment managers to do that. So uh, we wouldn't have had that information at the time, no. All right. Are you still invested in AVIC? In AVIC? Uh, no, we're not. So um, just to explain, so um, governments around the world have um, sanctions on investing in various companies. And in um, August of 2021, the US Treasury um, announced that there would be investment sanctions for US persons investing in one AVIC subsidiary being um, AVIC Shenyang Aviation Company Limited, which is one of the companies that we had an investment in. And the way that our process works is that our investment managers are required to comply with sanctions, including from the US government, and proceeded to divest that position. Under the sanction that was issued, they had until June of this year to do that. But as, and I believe the response to the FOI request was October 2021. In November of 2021, that position was fully divested. So you, actually, I'll come to a minute. Let's just be clear about what you've divested from. You've divested from AVIC, is that correct? Well, there were several AVIC entities in that list, in that FOI disclosure that you've referred that's right, to. That's right. And one of them was sanctioned by the US Treasury, but 
Our process is to also look at other closely related companies. So yes, we have divested from all of those positions. So you're divested from uh, AVIC and all AVIC subsidiaries, correct. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Have you divested from other companies that have got links to the brutal junta in Myanmar? Uh, so we've divested from companies that have been sanctioned by um, regulatory agencies. Um, so in this particular case, the reason that AVIC was sanctioned, I believe, was to do with its Chinese military activities, not, not because of any activity it had in Myanmar. And so our process is to exclude. We've previously discussed companies that make tobacco that um, create various types of controversial weapons um, that Australia's um, signed a treaty to ban, um, and obviously companies that are sanctioned. And so in, in this particular case, they're the top companies we've divested. All right, so you've said your investment decision or that investment decision, that is to divest from AVIC and all subsidiaries of AVIC, was based on the decisions of, is that right? Sorry, I didn't quite get the last part of your question, Senator. Were, were, were your de, was your decision to divest from AVIC and its, and its subsidiaries, was that decision based on the decision of a foreign government? Well, it was based on the sanction being applied by the US Treasury, which our investment managers are active and regulated in the US. So, so the sanction applies to US persons. The Future Fund, of course, is not a US person, but our investment managers are, so they are required by law to divest that position. So that's um, so it's a policy of the Future Fund that's been enacted here, is that right? Well, our pol we do have a policy um, that our investment managers need to comply with all applicable laws. All right, so you're Australia's sovereign wealth fund I mean that Australians should be making decisions about how the money is invested, Australians' money is invested. Why are we leaving it to governments? Well, our investment managers are, are US-based and regulated in this case, so they need to comply with the laws of the country in which they operate. Are there any other countries' um, sanctioned decisions that you're abiding by in terms of your investment, or is it only the US? Well, it depends where the investment managers are domiciled and um, operate. Um, but in general, there are sanctions from around a dozen countries that we need to monitor and ensure that um, our managers are meeting their obligations. The obligation is actually on our manager, not us, because we invest through investment managers. All right, could you, on notice, provide a list of those countries, please? Sure. Thanks. Um, so you're saying um, it was a sanction issued by the US Treasury in August. Are you aware that, in fact, um, the United States sanctioned uh, ABIC for the first time in November 2020? Uh, as far US as investors had to get out, and the US investors had to get out by uh, January of last year? Um, as far as I'm aware, the AVIC companies in which we had invested, so there's a large number of AVIC companies, a head company and a whole range of subsidiaries. We don't invest in all of them, nor have we ever. The AVIC entities that we invested in came as a result of them being included in the Emerging Market Equities Index, so that was only about half a dozen at the time. And as far as I'm aware in our sanctions, checking process would confirm, I think, uh, only one of those entities um, was actually sanctioned, and it was sanctioned in August of 2021. There may be other entities that were sanctioned earlier, but we didn't own them. Were you invested in the parent company of AVIC at any stage? Uh, I'd have to take that on notice. All right, well, um, uh, as part of that taking on notice, can you please make a response to it's Executive Order 13959, issued on the 12th of November 2020, which sanctioned AVIC, that is investment in AVIC, as in the parent company AVIC, 
and um, whether uh, any of your um, investment managers were were in breach um, or, or your investments were in breach of um, that order, please. Sure. You take that on notice as yeah. well? Sure. All right, thanks. So, um, are you suggesting that you haven't divested from AFIC uh, through any embarrassment uh, at being caught out by um, freedom of information requests or because of any uh, conflict with Australia's um, strategic geopolitical aims? Well, I've explained before, we held the position because we held an index investment. Uh, that was the, the decision that we made and we divested because the US Treasury issued a sanction against the company. So in terms of our policy about what companies we will or won't hold, our exclusions policy, that has not changed for some time. All right, but you've got a Australian government ministers out beating the drums of war pretty loudly at the moment. Um, no problem with investing in um, Chinese CCP-owned companies. All fine, using Australia's money. There's no problem there, Dr Hunt, from your point of view. Well, I've explained our process, Senator. I'm not sure what else I can add to yeah, that. I'm talking about outcomes here, Dr Hunt, not processes. And, Senator, you're starting to try to draw Dr Hunt into, um, into the realm of providing opinions. Um, the Future Fund operates uh, within its act and its legal arrangements there. Uh, it operates, of course, um, uh, within the terms as, uh, as specified um, under, the, uh, under the directions provided, provided to the Future Fund as well. Uh, and as Dr Arndt has, uh, has advised, there are a range of other steps the Future Fund undertake uh, to ensure that, uh, that they are cognisant of uh, and do not invest in, uh, in areas that um, um, they set exclusion policies around, such as certain weapons-related activities, um, um, certain nuclear weapons-related uh, activities, um, uh, tobacco-related products, uh, and of course also uh, the further impacts of their adherence uh, to um, uh, requirements uh, through the different investment vehicles they operate uh, with um, uh, adherence to the requirements of, uh, of sanctions regimes. Um, uh, in places uh, where those investment vehicles are domiciled or have operations. All right. All right. Thanks, um, Minister. But um, the point remains, doesn't it, that even though um, uh, the future fund policies do relate to you know some types of weapons, they don't extend far enough to cover weapons that are sold to a brutal military dictatorship in Myanmar that is massacring citizens and brutally repressing um, Rohingya people in Myanmar, including slaughtering women and children. I mean, it, it doesn't cover that, does it? Well, Senator, as, uh, as Dr Arndt's made clear, and, uh, and I've gone through this uh, at multiple estimates, the Future Fund invests through um, listed indexes. Um, now, uh, now, some of the protections that exist in relation to the operation of those listed indexes uh, are by virtue of the fact that uh, they then have to adhere uh, to certain regimes, in, uh, including sanctions regimes, for example, um, uh, that exist through other countries. Um, that's certainly ensured in, in this case in relation to the companies that were um, brought to question, Avic and its subsidiaries, that the Future Fund um, uh, has divested that. Uh, whilst I know you've asked about potential earlier um, uh, issues with that, uh, the advice that I have is that, uh, is that the Future Fund uh, divested from that company and all of its subsidiaries um, during November last year, which, uh, which was undertaken um, well in advance of the uh, June 2022 deadline. Uh, thanks, Minister. Um, Dr Rutt, can you state unequivocally that Future Fund is not invested in any weapons manufacturers who are acting contrary to any US government sanctions? Um, part of our process is to ensure that we're not investing in companies over which there are sanctions restricting investment. Obviously, there are other types of sanctions which don't restrict investment in a company, 
but might restrict commercial dealings with that company or certain types of commercial dealings with that company. Those sanctions um, do not apply to investment decisions. And um, it's probably worth pointing out that um, investing in equity market indices, such as the emerging market one, is a very, very common standard practice in the investment management industry and almost every super fund and any retail investor that was investing in an exchange traded fund that tracked the index would have exactly the same expo exposures as the ones that I'm talking about. Right, thanks. Can you state unequivocally that you're not invested in any way? Manufacturers who are acting contrary to Australia's national interests? We don't look at that question. Our process, as I've explained many times, is to invest in the index um, and to exclude a limited number of companies from that portfolio for the reasons I've explained and to ensure that our investment managers are applying applicable sanctions. In other words, sanctions that apply to restrict investment in those companies. So you can't unequivocally guarantee that Australia's sovereign wealth fund money owned by Australians is not invested into weapons manufacturers who are acting against Australia's national interests. You can't make that guarantee. Well, you said, you said, Senator, you're trying to... I mean, we're through the, we're through the looking glass here, aren't we, Minister? No, you said, you said, Senator, uh, I know you're trying to... Alice in Wonderland stuff, isn't it? Senator, I know you're trying to get some um, cheap headlines in, uh, in certain publications, but you're also, in the framing of your question, you're trying to force Dr Arndt to, um, to frame a response um, in ways according to the words that, that you want. Uh, Dr Arndt has, uh, has outlined in terms of the policy approaches uh, of the Future Fund, uh, those policy approaches in terms of how uh, they manage risk and manage the different points of, uh, of their exposure. Um, uh, they, uh, they do that in accordance with the various types and frameworks that, uh, that apply in Australian law, in the international markets in, uh, in which they operate, in accordance with the additional policies that, uh, that they have put in place. Um, they also do that in a way uh, that has delivered uh, very strong uh, returns uh, for Australians and for Australian taxpayers that, uh, that will yield benefits uh, for a long time to come uh, thanks to the uh, the operations of, uh, of Dr Arndt and his team. All right, thanks. So if the Future Fund's been invested in the China military industrial complex for years and doesn't have any processes in place um, to find out about that until the US government um, lists certain companies in the Chinese military industrial complex, lists them for sanctions, um, how do we know that the Future Fund's not invested right now, for example, in the Russian military industrial complex and helping arm the Russian government as they make threats to Ukraine? How do we know that we're not invested there? Well, Senator, countries uh, um, uh, with sanctions regimes have, uh, have various sanctions that have been in place uh, against uh, Russia for a considerable period of time. Australia has certain sanctions in place uh, against Russia. Uh, I would, uh, would imagine that, as Dr Arndt has explained, uh, the uh, operations of the Future Fund, where they invest through certain uh, listed indexes, um, that, uh, that uh, throughout uh, the time of ensuring compliance by those indexes with the policies of the Future Fund uh, and with the requirements of the markets in which they operate, including the US, uh, that they will have had to, uh, at different junctures, potentially uh, divest um, Russian interests in accordance with the type of sanctions in place. Senator McKim, um, you've had the call for 20 minutes now, and I do have a couple of other senators here who would like to ask questions of the Future Fund. So could you please be as economical as possible in finishing up your questions? I will. Um, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, um, Dr Arndt, could I ask you to take on notice, please, whether um, you can provide any details um, or assurances around whether the Future Fund has invested, invested Australians' hard-earned public money in um, any companies that are in the Russian military industrial complex, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, the FOI that we were talking about earlier showed you've got, an, uh, or at least that you had at the time, um, an $18 million stake in the Indian defence firm Bharat Electronics, um, who sell surveillance equipment to the Junta 
in Myanmar. Do, do you still hold that investment? Uh, we haven't divested um, that particular company yet. So, so it's it. okay to hold um, an investment in, in an Indian company facilitating um, brutal massacres of Rohingya people, but it's not okay to hold an investment in a Chinese company facilitating those massacres. Is that right? Well, I think I've explained our process. Um, there are no sanctions applied to that particular company by any um, developed market regulator that we're aware of. Okay, the minister just mentioned um, Australian government um, processes. So since 1990, the Australian government has had in place an arms embargo under which it is prohibited to, and I'll quote, directly or indirectly, and I'll just draw your attention to the indirectly part of that, it is prohibited to directly or indirectly supply, sell or transfer arms or related material to Myanmar. How is the Future Fund's investment in any weapons manufacturing companies that are selling arms to the junta in Myanmar consistent with that arms embargo from the Australian government? Senator, I really do think Dr. Arndt has uh, has traversed this ground quite extensively. Well, Minister, terms, I'll put the question to you. Then. In terms, in terms How's of that consistent? in terms, Senator of the um, of the investment profile in indexes from which then exclusion uh, policies apply uh, where uh, where relevant and uh, and where determined. Um, uh, you continually come at the questions from a attitude and, uh, and perspective From an uh, of, perspective, of looking at uh, the equation of if the Future Fund were determining each of the individual entities itself that it is investing in and undertaking all of the elements of, uh, of due diligence across each of those individual entities each and every time that it places uh, an investment. Now, for the Future Fund to be able to maintain uh, the breadth of investment portfolio that it does with the exposure to developing markets and other parts of the world that it does, it would not be practical for it to operate its investment portfolio in a cost-effective way in the manner in which the presumption underpinning your question applies. Um, so right, thanks, the, the cost-effective way um, for the Future Fund to get the best possible returns for Australian taxpayers, which it does very, very successfully, is for it to invest in listed indexes as part of its suite of different investments. Um, and of course, then within those listed indexes, as Dr Arndt has explained, there are the exclusion policies that apply uh, built off of a range of different policy settings that the fund implements. The best way that the future fund, and in fact, you minister could serve the Australian taxpayers is to uh, ensure that the future fund doesn't uh, invest in weapons manufacturers and fossil fuel companies. That would be the best way that you could serve. Yeah. We've got a last bracket of questions here. As quickly as possible, doesn't please, Senator whole... McKim. Th uh, thank you, Chair. Doesn't this whole um, scandal demonstrate that, in fact, the Australian public has a right to know exactly where the future fund has invested their money? Wouldn't you agree, Minister? Future Fund uh, makes public uh, its investment activities, Senator. The Future Fund does not make public all the companies that it is invested into, does it, Minister? Senator, um, to go back to the basics of, uh, of seeking to explain aspects of this, um, the investment across different listed indexes and the like uh, are dynamic investments, Senator. Um, so, uh, so. Uh, the funds managers who operate those investment vehicles uh, would have dynamic changes to those investments that are occurring. Uh, the Future Fund uh, makes public um, where its direct investment undertakings occur. Um, and of course, uh, it's from that that, uh, that the type of scrutiny that, uh, that we are discussing right here uh, is undertaken. All right, Minister, will Schedule 2 of the Investment Funds Legislation Bill that you've got currently before the parliament, if that was enacted, um, how would anyone have ever found out that the Future Fund was invested in a Chinese state-owned company that was selling arms to the Myanmar junta? How would we have ever found that out if the legislation you've got in the parliament, which exempts the core activity of the Future Fund, that is 
their investments from the FOI Act. Senator, the Future Fund. We have fund... to find out where the money was invested if, if, if that went through. Senator, the Future Fund is, uh, is accountable to the Parliament uh, and through the Parliament, the public, in a range of different ways in terms of the release of information and would still be so uh, under those legislative changes if enacted. No, they wouldn't. But just to summarise, Minister, if this bill goes through... Uh, I think you're debating, if, Senator, not questioning. No, I'm, I'm putting this to you, Minister. Um, I'm putting this to you and asking you to respond to this. If your bill goes through unamended, there's no way that the public could find out that the Future Fund is invested in a Chinese state-owned company selling arms to a brutal military dictatorship in Myanmar, arms that are being used uh, in, in my view, an attempted genocide against the Rohingya people. And even though, even though the Future Fund's divestment from that company coincided with the release of an FOI, it allegedly or purportedly wasn't done because of the FOI. But actually, if that bill went through, we wouldn't know about it anyway. And somehow this is all in accordance with international best governance practice. Have I, have I got that right? Because I reckon we're well through the looking glass here, Minister. Senator, um, the short answer to what your eventual question was is, is no, um, but, uh, but as Dr Arndt has, uh, has made clear, um, the Future Fund's divestment of those holdings uh, was undertaken consistent with the policy settings they have, working through their fund managers and the legal requirements uh, that are there around such divestments. Uh, in, uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of the uh, public disclosure by the Future Fund uh, of its activities, uh, the Future Fund, under those legislative changes which have been mooted all the way back to when, uh, when Lindsay Tanner was the Finance Minister, um, uh, under those legislative changes the Future Fund would still be fronting up here um, uh, to uh, answer questions from you and others, Senator, uh, would still be expected to disclose through these proceedings as well as through uh, the other public pro processes that are there uh, in relation to the Fund's activities. Uh, it is a narrow scope that that legislation seeks to undertake, but I don't want to debate the legislation here, and uh, that's, uh, that's what the Chamber is for, Senator. Thank you. And this is my last um, two questions, Chair, and thank you for your indulgence. Um, Minister, firstly to you, why don't you require the fund to regularly publish in exactly where it has invested the $250 billion worth of Australians' money that it has invested? Why don't you think that it would be a good thing for Australians to understand how $250 billion of their money was invested by the fund, and why won't you simply require the fund, as the Greens have got an amendment to the legislation proposed, to publish their investments in full every six months? Why not? Senator, the fund does make public um, the, uh, the nature of its portfolio and, uh, and investments, um, and I answered of course, some of the challenges when you want to seek uh, um, um, a certain granularity of detail, given the dynamic nature of uh, some of those vehicles that the fund invests in. But the fund does make public um, the nature of its investment profiles. Well, my last question is to Dr Arndt. Dr Arndt, do you believe that um, the um, disclosure regime that the currently operates under is in line with international best practice. And if you do, um, would you please provide on notice um, which other um, sovereign wealth funds around the world um, have um, uh, governance uh, regimes uh, like, and transparency regimes like the Future Fund and who, and who basically are not required to publish the details of their investments and who are um, exempt in terms of their investments from provisions of um, Freedom of Information Acts or similar around. Yeah, I'm happy to take that on notice. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator McKim. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. On a similar topic, uh, 
Just let me begin by thanking you, Dr. Arndt, for giving me some time in December last year to canvass some of these uh, issues with you, so I'm appreciative of that. Um, since the publication of the story in The Guardian and the ABC and other news um, outlets, uh, what governance changes have you embarked upon in the Future Fund to avoid, to avoid a scenario like this happening again? Uh, so maybe you can explain what you mean by a scenario like this, Senator? So I think it's fair to say that uh, over the last 12 months, uh, matters concerning the military coup in Myanmar have received very, very wide coverage in the Australian media. I would have thought that your risk management approach would have sought to protect the Australian Government and the Future Fund from any adverse publicity around any possible investments uh, in, regard, uh, in Myanmar uh, by the military regime or others. So I was curious to know, was your radar on or off? No, thank you, Senator. So um, I think I've explained here before that um, the board's view is, in general, exclusion. So we've been talking about companies where either will own or won't own uh, is not is not the preferred practice because companies themselves change their activities and their plans, um, and we think it wouldn't be consistent with our long-term investment mandate to have wholesale exclusion policies. So we haven't changed our policy. Obviously, if governments around the world that we need to comply with their rules change their sanctions regime, mm -hmm. then we would respond as we had with AVIC. However, we do have a very active engagement um, program with our investment managers and asking them to speak to companies we invest in. And indeed, in Australia, we engage with companies directly, um, or at least larger companies where we have holdings. And so on a number of occasions, we've raised um, the issues in Myanmar with either our investment managers or companies that we invest in and ask them um, what their view is or to justify their approach. Um, and while I can't say any one conversation we've had or whether or not the Future Fund has been important in those conversations, certainly there's quite a few companies now around the world that have announced that they're going to withdraw from their commercial activities in Myanmar. So I'm right to assume that the Future Fund, in regards to Myanmar, is engaging a higher level of inquiry, both with companies that you might invest with in Australia, but also with those people that might manage the uh, investment indexes. Yes, that's correct. Great. Um, if we sort of take a broader look, this wouldn't be a problem unique to Australia's Sovereign Wealth Fund. Are you able to share with us any approaches uh, that other sovereign wealth funds might have been um, utilising in regards to not just the Myanmar matter, but you know, similar matters? Well, in general, at, at the general level, we talk about having an ESG policy and, and this would fall into that. And we do have pretty active dialogue with sovereign funds and pension funds around the world in terms of how they apply their ESG policies. And I would say that our approach is um, uh, um, pretty similar to that adopted by most other similar funds in the world, more active in some cases. Um, and, um, um, you know, it's a moving face, like the world is complex and, and the type of issues we deal with um, vary over time. So I haven't personally had discussions with other sovereign funds about the Myanmar issue specifically, but I'm sure our ESG team will have done that. So, from your um, uh, evidence to Senator McKim, am I right to take out of that that the only um, we only the Future Fund only divests on sanction decisions taken by the United States government? No, that's not correct. So, as as I was explaining to Senator McKim, we look at sanctions which apply broadly around the world. Um, we. Our obviously our investment managers operate in certain jurisdictions and they're regulated, so they have to comply with sanctions. They're the one that own and buy and sell positions on our behalf. And so they will have um, a range of different regimes that they have to follow. Our job is to monitor their compliance with those sanctions. And um, I took on notice, I below from Senator McKinn, a question about coming back with exactly which jurisdictions that we do that for. So in regards to Myanmar, is there a active reporting mechanism uh, between the fund and its board about any matters that you might discover 
uh, in regards to future fund investments that are related to Myanmar and the military regime? Um, we, we've discussed with the board the particular issue and um, the board's been interested to understand how we integrate um, this particular ESG issue into our investment approach. Uh, the particular issue being Myanmar or the particular issue being sort of, um, sort of geopolitical considerations? Well, well, in general, our approach to ESG issues is that when companies engage in activities that are likely to be controversial or in the long term um, risky, and risky could mean a change in future regulation mm. or, or mm -hmm. societal support, then our approach is we should take that into account in making investment decisions or we should ask our investment managers to do that. And so we've had the conversation in that context. So was the Myanmar matter on the future fund radar before these, um, before the FOI request? Well, there's a, a large number of um, ESG issues um, going on in the world. Um, we have detailed discussions with our ESG team, including at the board level, several times a year in terms of tracking um, current issues but I can't, um, I'm not sure exactly when you mean. Um, well, the military coup happened on the February 1st last year. I'm keen to know at what point did the Future Fund put the Myanmar matter uh, on its radar? Um, well, I'm sure our investment managers would have started to track that issue immediately. So I've explained the governance arrangement that we have it with our investment managers. Our investment managers are required to understand these things and track them. Our job's to supervise the managers and make sure that they're applying the policies and processes that they have and that we've, we've hired add, them for. I'd add to that that I would have expected investment managers to report back to you um, matters of sensitivity to your ESG group. And they do but I'd, um, I couldn't tell you exactly when that conversation started. Perhaps you could take that on notice sure. and let me know. At page 16 of your annual report of 2021, the second paragraph under the joint up investment approach uh, subheading, the second paragraph starts, our top down people look at the global economy, financial markets and political risk and think about how this will impact the portfolio. Do you think that the government might have suffered any embarrassment as a result of the revelations that were revealed in these newspaper reports as a result of the FOI? I think that's a matter for the government. Yeah, I think that's asking for an opinion there, Senator Smith. Um, I, look, Senator Smith, um, uh, we would uh, wish that all of these matters were always easily um, uh, foreseeable uh, and able to be managed simply, um, but uh, the reality is that the investment uh, framework that the Future Fund operates in uh, does entail complex investment uh, in a diverse range of listed trusts, as Dr Arndt has, uh, has outlined. Um, there's a dynamic nature, as I said before, in response to Senator McKim, uh, to those listed trusts. Uh, the Future Fund uh, seeks to identify where exclusions are necessary to those trusts, does so against a range of criteria. Um, I have no doubt that uh, um, that uh, issues such as this one uh, provide for the continued uh, work of their ESG team uh, in terms of identifying um, how they can best respond uh, to these circumstances and where possible uh, prevent them in the future and of course that the uh, fund managers they work with um, you know, would face um, pressure from um, all of their different uh, investors who, uh, who would variously wish to be in a position to maximise their exposure uh, to growing companies in developing world environments, uh, but to minimise their exposure to uh, areas of potential reputational damage or uh, companies that, uh, that are um, uh, at odds with their ESG policies. Based on the Minister's evidence, how do you measure reputational damage? That's a, obviously a non-quantitative non area. Um, so we, we do, um, as you say, have an obligation to protect the government's reputation in financial markets in the mandate. We take that seriously. The board has policies around how we think about those things and we have active debates at the board and we do track media um, mentions and other reporting 
on us and, and debate with the board that. But these things are a delicate balance because um, in order to generate the investment returns that we're required to get um, in terms of the investment mandate, we, um, we need to take risk, we need to take investment risk, but um, sometimes you need to take reputational risk too in the sense that there's a very wide range of views in Australian society and so it's very common that some people will have strong views on decisions we make and we just need to make the best decisions we can within our framework. In this particular case I would just emphasise again that the positions were held through an index position mm. that's a commonly held very wide ranging strategy which I think most super funds and most retail investors that invest in exchange traded funds would have and I dare say the vast majority of them would have had the very same positions that we had. I think Australian citizens would have a, would regard the future fund as a more of a public entity than as a private entity. Superannuation fund I would categorise as a private entity. But I think that's exactly the point. You know, the Future Fund has uh, done remarkably well, enjoyed such high levels of confidence from um, Australian governments and from Australian uh, citizens. And a situation like this, unfortunately, uh, does damage uh, the reputation of the Future Fund and, by extension, uh, the government. And this deci these decisions have upset uh, large numbers of Australian citizens who are concerned about what has happened in, uh, in Myanmar. It'll be interesting to see where we get to in the next 12 months. But thank you very much and thank you again for your time in uh, December. Thank you. Dr. Hunt. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much, Senator Smith. Senator Gallagher, I understand you have just a couple of questions and we'll then go to Senator Renning. Oh, yes. OK, thank you. Um, my questions are to the Minister for Finance. Minister, there's been another Cabinet leak, it appears, to um, Channel 10. They're reporting that the Prime Minister is getting ready, ready to sack one of his ministers, but the Member of Parliament doesn't even know they're about to be done. Sorry. Is the Prime Minister going to sack Mr Tudge? Yeah, Senator Patterson, I'm, I'll let you give your point of order, but I'm anticipating that it might be about the fact that this doesn't really have anything to do with the future fund. Uh, you must be clairvoyant, Chair. Um, that's where I was going. But it has something to do with the government, and we have the leader of the government in the Senate sitting here, and there are media outlets reporting that a minister is about to be sacked and he doesn't know about it. And I'm asking if the Prime Minister is about to sack Mr Tudge. Senator, we have an agency sitting at the table here administering $204 billion of funds on behalf of Australian taxpayers. Uh, and your priority uh, as the Shadow Finance Minister is to come in here and want to pursue uh, political or partisan questions about a media story that hasn't even aired yet. Um, I'm not going to comment on those. If you have questions on the future fund, that's what Dr Arndt and I are here to respond to. So you're not to. aware? You're, you've not been in part of any discussions about the sacking of Mr Tudge? I think uh, Australian taxpayers um, uh, deserve an opposition. Have a dysfunctional uh, government. Senator Gallagher, Senator Gallagher, I'm going to... Senator Gallagher, Australian... I'm going to... It's dysfunctional and you're having leak after leak. Senator Gallagher, we are here to be talking about the future fund at the moment. So you I won't would ask confirm. That if you focus those questions that you might have to the future fund. Otherwise, I am going to give the call to Senator Rennie because he does have questions for the future fund. So you do know, and you won't say. Have some relevance to the future. <laughs> 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 it's a fair effort, yeah. Senator Farrell. Yeah. But, um. <laughs> that, that was a very creative point of order, <laughs> Senator <laughs> Farrell. Look, if, if the minister's too frightened to answer, oh. Senator oh. Ayres, we'll Senator Ayres, that is incredibly have got rhetorical. No further questions for the future fund and uh, and the Department of Finance. And then we can either happily go home well, we've had or understand Senator all day, Rennick has questions. But this has uh, just but, uh, arisen, Mr uh, but, Birmingham. But Se Senator, Senator Gallagher, uh, so your you contempt know, and disinterest for the finances of the country and for the operations of an agency well, um, investing more than $200 billion dollars on behalf of, uh, of Australians is clear. Um, uh, if, if, if political games are your it's priorities, that's your oh, business. But right now, you're wasting the your time of everyone. Senators, no, Senators order legal. for the third time today. Can we not speak all over the top of each other? I'm going to give the call to Senator Rennick to ask some questions about the Future Fund. Senator Rennick, you have the call. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is for the Minister. 
Uh, do you think the Future Fund is an appropriate name for the fund, given that its purpose is to fund the gold-plated pension schemes of about 130,000 white-collar bureaucrats, excluding the other 25 million Australians from it? Um, well, Senator, um, um, the Future Fund um, uh, is not responsible for uh, any of the policy settings around the pension schemes um, uh, that exist, um, uh, the various uh, old defined benefit schemes, which in most places have been closed to new entrants uh, that, uh, that exist. Um, it's not the Future Fund's job in terms of the management of any of those schemes. Uh, the Future Fund's um, earnings um, um, in future are, uh, are yes, earmarked um, by, uh, by governments to help uh, with meeting some of the liabilities from those schemes. Uh, but the Future Fund's job as set is, uh, is the administration and investment of the funds under their guardianship. Okay, no worries. In terms of ethics, should the Future Fund invest in companies that have a significant criminal record such as Pfizer? Um, well, I'll let Dr Arndt uh, address that so far as, uh, so far as uh, he can. Uh, he's already um, um, put quite a lot on the public record this afternoon in relation to uh, the uh, uh, the governance practices of the Future Fund around their investments um, and, uh, and how those investment streams operate. Um, uh, I would uh, note that, uh, that Pfizer is, uh, is a very large global company. I'm not going to run commentary uh, around, uh, around um, the different aspects of, uh, of Pfizer's operations, but, uh, but clearly there are um, significant parts of their operations that uh, have um, provided major breakthroughs in, uh, in medical science to the benefit of, uh, of um, not just um, those in receipt of those, uh, those medical breakthroughs and scientific breakthroughs, but also um, uh, to the benefit of investors in that company. Yep, could be happy with that. Okay. Do you think that uh, it's appropriate that the chair of the Future Fund uh, also is the chair of Nine Fairfax Media? a company that received significant advertising dollars from the government to promote the vaccines uh, sold by a company of which the Future Fund is invested in? Uh, well, I certainly don't, uh, Senator, uh, think that um, there is any uh, relationship uh, between uh, the Chair's role and his duties as Chair of the Future Fund uh, and government procurement decisions uh, in relation to uh, the vaccines that have been made available to deal with COVID-19. I reject any linkage in that whatsoever. Uh, reject the idea there's any linkage between uh, advertising campaigns that might be run in relation to vaccines uh, and, uh, and the chair of the Future Fund's role. Uh, there is uh, no basis upon which to uh, suggest any of that. The Future Fund uh, Board of Guardians do, of course, have um, policies in place for managing uh, potential conflicts of interest. Uh, to, uh, to secure uh, a board of guardians with appropriate uh, business investment skills. Uh, those, uh, those skills uh, also mean those individuals do have a number of potential areas for, uh, for conflict that each of them would manage um, and, uh, and manage to the utmost of probity and standards. And I'll let Dr Arndt speak to uh, those conflict of interest management practices. No, that's OK. I'll, I'll take that as the answer. Thanks, uh, Minister. And last question. When will uh, the government start drawing down on the future fund to pay for defined benefit liabilities, uh, you know, defined benefits of public servants, um, rather than let it accumulate? We, we made the decision to defer that drawdown period uh, until 2026, uh, Senator Rennick. So I was just double checking. I had 27 in mind, but it's 2026. Um, uh, uh, so we made that decision to provide for a longer period of time for the Future Fund to uh, build uh, its capital base uh, during that time. Um, uh, I would note that uh, there have been some changes to the budget reporting arrangements in relation to the Future Fund uh, that kicked in at, uh, at this time when the Future Fund was, uh, when it was originally envisaged that, uh, uh, that um, Future Fund um, um, earnings would be used for, uh, for those defined liability schemes, um, uh, defined benefit schemes, I should say. Um, but um, uh, the decision has been made to uh, extend that period of time, allowing the Future Fund to grow further. So, what, so what, but what was the reason for that? 
Uh, Senator, I think the, uh, the rationale uh, was um, on the basis that, uh, that the um, uh, investment market and environment at present, uh, the opportunities that, uh, that exist there um, uh, for the future fund to better meet uh, the long-term needs of meeting those uh, defined benefit schemes uh, would be better realised through that extra period of time. Um, we may be able to go through some of the analysis, although I don't know that we have the relevant officials with us anymore. Uh, for yeah, we, prob we probably do. Look, if that's you, okay. If you you, don't, you do don't need that, to go for the analysis. I'll just put in a quick. So, when do you think that the li that the actual liability itself will peak? Because I know when it was started originally in 2004, it was meant to peak in 2020, and the forward estimates have it still blowing out enormously. Um, so I think there was, is there an update table or graph in my yeah. IFO to... So uh, I think Ms Carroll's come to the table and she can yep. um, advise on the target asset level. Uh, Tracy yeah. Carroll, Acting Deputy Secretary, Governments and Resource Management. Um, uh, so in the uh, long-term cost reports, there's information that was released through those. They were um, released last year that gives information in relation to the peak of... Um, the superannuation liabilities, and I'll just sorry find my brief sure. in relation to that. You can take it on notice if you want. Uh, okay, so the. Um, Secretary, Department of Finance, and apologies to the committee that I can't uh, be there. Just while oh, sorry for that's the that's one of our officers who uh, has just been on the phone uh, because oh. he couldn't attend today, but he possibly yes. knows the answer to the sure. question. Oh, okay. which may yeah. be his intervention. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for the um, for the civilian schemes. The uh, unfunded liability grows to a peak of uh, an estimated peak of 182.9 billion in 2034. Mm. Uh, before declining to 60.8 billion by 2060, which is the life of the um, long-term cost report. Um, and then uh, for the military schemes, um, the liability for the military schemes is projected to grow to 477.3 billion by 2060. So that again, 477 <coughs> billion? Uh, yes. For 2060? Yep. Uh, and so that's prim primarily a result of the ADF cover component of the military schemes remaining open to new members, um, but uh, information questions in relation to the long-term cost of the military schemes would be best directed to defence. Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Rennick, uh, and thank you to the Future Fund for appearing today and for answering questions relevant to the Future Fund. Um, if no other Labor Senators have questions for the Future Fund, we might move swiftly on to Outcome 3, which I'm guessing is what you are here for today. I am, yes, this is, yeah. of course, not quite, almost. That's okay. Thank you very much to the officials at the table for outcome three. Uh, Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Ms Huxtable, do you wish to make any sort of statement at this point in time? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to give the call to okay. Senator Ayres. If I can just check firstly oh, that... Sorry. Just what I was gesturing to. Thank Senator you. Ayres. I have one oh, job, sorry, and that's to organise the... Apologies. Okay. We'll, we'll wait for that. 
Thank you, um, Ms. Huxtable. I think uh, 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 thank you. Can I just ask, as uh, as people are pouring over those, um, on the thirty first of January, um, Ms. Rochelle Miller appeared on seven thirty. Uh, the interview did canvass her allegations against Minister Tudge or former Minister Tudge. But it was also revealed that Ms Miller had made a new complaint or submitted a new complaint to finance. <clears throat> and I think the report said in which she made a number of allegations about her treatment from bullying to sexual assault by others in Parliament House over the course of her 10 year career. Um, Ms, Ms Huxtable, can you confirm that there is a new complaint that's been submitted to finance? Was anybody here in a position to confirm that that's the case? Uh, Senator, oh, I think oh, I said Ms. my Walsh. name previously, Claire Walsh. Um, uh, I think uh, Ms Miller has made a confirmation um, that she has engaged again with the department, but I'm not in a position to speak to any detail, obviously, in relation to that, because for the reasons we've canvassed many times before, um, I'm not going to, to speak to individual matters, um, particularly where there's uh, potential privacy issues involved. Um, you, you can't tell me how many members of parliament or senators this applies, this, the, uh, uh, that this complaint relates to? No, I can't, Senator. Or staff? No, Senator. It's un unknown at the moment. No, well, Senator, uh, as Ms Walsh just explained, um, Obviously, uh, individuals may choose to make certain information public, um, but the Department of Finance, uh, in accordance with very long-standing practice, respects the confidentiality of those individuals uh, and, uh, and doesn't make details of uh, their engagement with the Department public. So it could be one or none or many parliamentarians or, or staffers? You're not not in a position to say at this stage. I'll come to the process. Can, can you tell me how many separate allegations there are? Senator, I can't speak to the material that the department has in relation to any So just, could you explain to me as well, how, how is finance handling these allegations? So in the broad, yes. I'm not going to speak specifically to an individual um, matter, but in the broad, uh, if it was a, uh, well, it depends on what it was, it depends on what the complaint was, but, but if it was a, uh, in relation to a bullying harassment type matter, then there's obviously a policy framework that we operate within. Uh, and we work with the person who has, uh, you know, en engaged with us to determine the approach uh, that they wish to take. You know, it's, uh, it's not um, something that we would do without engaging closely with anyone that comes to us uh, with a concern. But we have you know, particular procedures and policies in place that we follow. Similarly, if it was not related to bullying harassment and was related to expenses or some other matter that's within the purview of finance, we have policies and procedures that we would follow. It's really satisfactory that you, you can't tell me whether this has been referred to an external investigator. Has there been a direction to interview witnesses? Um, Senator, um, and I mean, matters, I, 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 the, the matters sorry, have sorry, been traversed. Sorry, Minister, I should say, I, I mean, I, I respect there are issues of confidentiality and process here. I, I accept mm. that. But, but uh, it's, th these are very serious allegations on the face of it. Uh, and um, I'd like to know what 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 is to have some assurance for this committee that there is a proper process being undertaken and what the scale of that undertaking is. So, so Senator, um, I would provide the assurance that in terms of the work Ms Walsh and her team do, uh, that uh, that where issues are raised uh, by MOPSAC staff, they do respond um, thoroughly, comprehensively, and also independently. I stress as I've done 
multiple times that uh, neither I nor the Special Minister of State, Mr Morton, uh, get any more details about these individual cases than you do, Senator Ayres, or anybody else, that uh, the Department holds that information in confidence respecting the privacy of individuals who make a complaint, uh, uh, those who participate in the complaints process, um, and of course uh, those against whom allegations are made. Um, as is well known and again has been um, well traversed um, uh, in terms of procedural elements, um, the Jenkins review and prior to that the Foster review last year have established some significant changes that are occurring. And so um, were these practices uh, or complaints to occur in the workplace now in a contemporary way between current staff the new Parliamentary Workplace Support Service would handle those um, and the procedures there. There would still be an element of confidentiality of respect as to how that is handled, but there are also new practices applied to that in terms of um, accountability for members of parliament and their officers uh, and in terms yeah, okay, of the, but, but the way reports are there. No, no, Senator, uh, just the Jenkins report will extend the scope of the PWSS further uh, and the work is being undertaken to implement that. Finally, outside of those broad issues in relation to uh, the matters of, uh, of Minister uh, Tudge um, and, uh, and what has been uh, alleged, Ms Walsh has addressed um, what she can on the public record there in relation to where Ms Miller has made information public, as we traversed yesterday at some length, uh, a separate independent process uh, involving Dr Vivian Tom was established um, uh, by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, and obviously that was traversed extensively yesterday too. Yes, well I was asking about the subsequent allegations that Ms Miller made but you, you were reluctant to answer questions that Senator Gallagher put to you before about the result of Ms Tom's uh, investigation. Senator Gallagher's right, isn't it? that the Prime Minister is going to remove Mr Tudge permanently. Is that the case? Well, Senator, um, ministerial appointments uh, and indeed ministerial terminations are, uh, are matters for the Prime Minister who advises, uh, as I discussed with Senator Gallagher yesterday, who advises the Governor-General in relation to uh, um, those he wishes to appoint to the ministry. So, so even if, if Ms Miller has uh, said publicly that she has made a complaint, you're, you're not in a position, you tell me, to confirm that a complaint has been investigated? Uh, that's right, Senator. That's correct. And often, I mean, in every case, when um, someone comes to us with a concern, a complaint, whatever the nature is, that they do that on the understanding that we will deal with it in a confidential way. Um, Minister, I was provided with um, a photograph of some social media posted by your colleague, Senator Hughes, yesterday in an engagement with um, Ms Miller, um, I, think, uh, I think on Twitter, but I'm not sure. Senator Hughes says, Wow, you have some serious issues, exclamation mark. Honey, lots of therapy, full stop. Stop making unfounded accusations, then hiding behind false legal premises. But insulting women who you don't agree with, you will fit right in with your new green mates. I note silence about Chairman Dan as well. Do you, do you agree that's an acceptable way for someone in the parliament to engage with somebody who's made a complaint? Uh, Senator Ayres, I, uh, I don't know what that was commenting on precisely. Um, it it but, doesn't matter but, though, does it? But, 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 I mean, just, sorry, I'll sorry. let you go, sorry. Yeah, I don't know what that was commenting on precisely, uh, but that is not the way that I would encourage uh, colleagues to handle 
uh, engagement with, uh, with people outside of this building who ha may have made complaints about activities inside of this building. It's certainly not uh, the tone or approach that I've sought to apply throughout a period of time in this job where there have been quite a lot of sensitive issues to, uh, to handle uh, and I would encourage people to handle them with sensitivity even when they feel there may be provocation um, in, uh, in relation to, uh, to those matters. Apparently she also posted after that, I also stand with Tudji. What's going on in the culture of this show? Uh, Senator, as, uh, as, uh, as I just said, um, yeah, I would encourage individuals uh, across the parliament to handle engagement on these sensitive matters with respect, even, even when they may feel that there is provocation or otherwise in relation to, uh, to the matters uh, that are there. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the other observations, um, uh, look, there matters for Senator Hughes. I think Senator Farrell has some questions for the department and the minister, Chair. Thank you, Senator, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to um, ask some questions. I refer to um, um, a, um, a response to questions on notice um, that um, <clears throat> as of the 31st of October 2021, there were 2,131 individuals on the uh, Members of Parliament staff payroll system, which was slightly down from the previous figure of uh, 2,161 on the 25th of June, 2021. Can you tell us, disappeared. Um, No, look, <laughs> look, you go and have your cup of coffee and you have your cup of coffee and... Um, look, I'm happy for anybody who knows the answer to this. If it's you, Minister, um, how many individuals are currently on the MOPS payroll system? I'll look to my right. So, David Silva, um, FAS uh, of MAPS. It will actually depend on a point in time, so we can run a report any day to say this When is was the last time you ran a report? Uh, I, uh, we probably ran a report last week. Yep. Um, but and I can was, find out the... What the, was the figure? I can find out the Could number you, yep. um, as it was. It will, it will change every yep. payroll based on the number of new employees who start, non ongoings, casuals, etc. So it generally goes up and down, but I would say it would generally go between probably 2,100 and 2,200. Um, yep. Over a twelve over a twelve month period, roughly. Yeah. Okay. But if, but yeah. if you want, I can um, find out uh, the last time a report was run and give you the figure at, as at that date. Yeah. No, I get I get that. It's a bit like a news poll. It's only accurate <laughs> at that point in time, isn't it? Doesn't say Payroll anything. Payroll numbers are hopefully <laughs> even more accurate than news polls, Senator <laughs> Farrell. <laughs> We don't do a sample, it's, it's actually you'd, every yeah. employee. <laughs> I, know, I know why you'd be hoping for that, Senator Birmingham, uh, Minister, I should say. <clears throat> uh, but in a footnote on pages 12 and 51 of uh, Set the Standard, Commissioner Jenkins' review into the parliamentary, parliamentary workplaces, it says, based on information provided by the Department of Finance, there were 2,000 222 MOPS Act employees working in the CPWs, either as electorate staff or as personal staff to ministers and office holders as of the 1st of June 2021. That figure <coughs> um, on 25 June, according to our question on notice, there was 2,161. Now, you've said the figures roughly go from 2,100 to 2,200. It's not uncommon towards the end of a financial year for a number of casual staff to be engaged for periods of time, particularly where there is budget available to do that. And so 
Um, there's generally sort of ups and downs, but as I said, in, in any given payroll, it averages between 2100 to 2200. Yes, but this has gone the other way. Um, so 1st of June, the figures were 2222, but the Quan on 25 June was 2161. That's actually gone the other way. So increasing the number of casuals as you get towards the end of the financial year can't be the explanation. No, to... I was just making a general comment oh, yeah. that there will be ups and downs based on uh, what parliamentarians choose to do in terms of engaging staff. There'll be staff who are on, who are on non ongoing contracts for periods of time. Those, <coughs> those will end. And so the numbers of MOP staff on any given week or any given payroll will oscillate up and down. No, no, I, look, I understand that. I was just... But your explanation that um, the numbers get ramped up the closer to the end of the financial year... Sometimes that happens. It just depends on... So yeah. I, it, it really just does depend on each individual parliamentarian making decisions about the employment of MOP staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the footnote to the Jenkins Review goes on to say that additionally, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet informed the review of 34 personal staff employed in official establishments at the Lodge or Kirribilli House as at the 30 July um, 2021. For the reason this report uses a total figure of 2,256 MOPSAC employees, which again is higher than that figure that you described at the ceiling. Who are the 34 personal staff that I've just referred to there employed by? That would actually be a matter for the Department of PMNC to comment on, but my understanding is would, it would largely be staff who are either working in the Lodge or Kirribilli House, but it would really be a matter... But who, of who's their employer? I couldn't comment. I, 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 um, in, in terms of the, the, it would be the Commonwealth, but whether, but they would. They're be, not employed as MOPS. They are employed as MOPS Act employees. They are still engaged under the MOPS Act. Yeah. Um, but I would need to um, confirm under what provision they are engaged. How quickly could you do that for us? Do you have anybody can. listening who might know the answer to that? Question. We'll see if we can, we'll see if we can do as that. As quickly as we can. All right, thank you. Um, are these included in the total figures um, of government staff on the staffing table? I don't believe so because that's um, so. Those staff that you've referred to yep. are paid through a separate HR process. Uh, the HR process that we that we sort of manage will be under Part Three and Four of the MOPS Act. So no, they wouldn't be reflected in that, is my understanding, but I will confirm that, but I, I don't think so. So the figures, <coughs> let's have a look at there. Have you seen this document that we were presented with today, Mr. De Silva? Uh, that shows, yes. yeah, you got it there. So page, um, doesn't have a page number, but it's the page after page nine. Um, so that figure of um, 1st of Feb 2022, in fact, um, if the numbers are still the same and haven't changed since 31 July, um, would be roughly five. 504. Is that, is that correct? Am I... I don't quite understand what you're asking. Well, so the, the table that you've just referred yeah. to is the number of personal yeah. employees. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these are not personal employees? No, not, the table, if you're looking at that table, yeah. yes, yes. that's the number of personal employees yes. that are engaged. Yeah. And these are not personal employees? Who are not personal employees? The, the 30, we've just oh, been the talking. 34. I'll need to confirm the status of, um, of what they are. Right, As so I you... said, those staff are a matter for the Department of PMNC, not finance. Right. So I'll most likely have to refer that question off to that department. Yeah, yeah. But you were going to see if you could find... I'll see if I can who... find a general, a general comment based on what's previously been 
said, but if we can't, yeah. we'll have to refer yeah. it off to so, ANC. But you're saying they are not personal staff? I'm saying I don't have the answer to that, given that those employees are a matter for PMC. Yeah, all right. All right. So not, not, not in the manner in which personal staff have um, historically been counted, assessed and reported, mm. Senator Farrell. Um, uh, I've certainly been present for some questioning of PMNC in relation to um, um, staff who help with the management of Kira Billy in the Lodge. Um, um, not, not a level of detail that I can, uh, can necessarily <coughs> jump in and, uh, and attempt to answer questions on behalf of PMNC there, but, uh, but PMNC certainly administer the arrangements in relation to um, those, uh, those residences and, uh, and the staff who were, who were employed uh, around them. Yeah, look, look, I suppose the, the key word here in the Jenkins review, and perhaps Mr Jenkins didn't quite capture, um, you know, the correct description of these people, but she describes them as personal staff. Um, which leads me to, to why I ask those, those questions. Now, perhaps they're not personal staff. I noticed you're looking over this way, Mr De Silva. Do you no, think no, somebody else more just, no, I was just reading what, No, no, I was just reading the, um, the actual text of what she wrote, and she did say personal staff. Um, as I said, um, those staff are engaged under the MOPS Act by, uh, for official, um, you know, for Kirribilli yeah. House and <coughs> for yeah. the Lodge. Yeah, look, I, I suppose my question fundamentally is, you know, why, are, if, if they are indeed personal staff and it's possible that um, that's, that's not the correct description of them, I accept that, <coughs> um, but if they are indeed personal staff, why don't they appear on that um, chart, I suppose? As I said, I... happy to take yep. it. Um, no, okay. yeah, and but, to confirm the exact status yeah, but, but of... But I yeah. think the other yes. point to make, um, Senator, is that in the time that I've been in this role, this, um, this table has not materially changed, apart from, I think we might have added a, a page uh, to, to pull out variances. Uh, I mean, the risk is if we, if we reflect other staff, then there will obviously be a, a you know, a point of a sort of apples to oranges type comparison right. when we've, you know, basically been providing it in this way. But we will confirm that they're definitely not included here. No. And they're not paid, <coughs> and they're not paid under the finance HR. Look, I'm, I'm not asserting that they should be, don't get me mm. wrong, but I'm just trying to find out, you know, given the description of um, that um, Commissioner Jenkins has used, personal staff of the government, employed under the MOPS Act, my query is, and this is further to uh, Mr Huxtable's point, is um, if they're not included in that table, why not? You know, why, you know, it, it, it may be that in the, in the past they haven't been included. I suppose my question is, if not, why not? And uh, should they have always been included in that calculation? That's, that's fundamentally my question and there may be a very simple answer. The first question you have as to whether they're personal staff or not. Yeah. If that characterisation is correct. Yeah. yeah. I suspect the if not why not question we may need to come back on notice because yeah. we will have to consult with Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, but yes. we will do that, of course. Yes. So this reports on staff that we are responsible for from an HR point of view. Yep. Those staff are the responsibility of PMC. No, look, yeah. you've made that very yeah. clear, Mr De Silver. I, I haven't misunderstood anything right. that you've said so far, but I also hope you haven't misunderstood anything no, no, no. I, I have said. But do you get the drift of my questions? Yeah. Uh, and it stems from the information that's come out of the Jenkins sure. report uh, that has raised questions about, you know, what, who, who is appropriately classified as and in personal what staff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Senator Smith has some very good questions that she'd like to ask. Um, uh, Ms Walsh, just noticing on the document that you've provided for us, um, these indicate there's an additional 10 staff have been added to the government ranks since October across the offices of Cabinet Ministers. Is there a reason for this increase? 
Mr. Senator, the reason for any increase would be a question for the, the Prime Minister. Um, as you know, it's the Prime Minister's decision on terms of allocation of staff. Um, what we're doing is just reporting the numbers that are then passed through to us to do the relevant you know, responsibilities that we have. But I, I, couldn't, I can't answer the question as to why um, allocations of staff happen. OK. Perhaps that's something um, Minister Birmingham can make a contribution on. Um, uh, well, Senator, uh, uh, the uh, allocation of staff is, uh, is made uh, by the Prime Minister. Um, uh, it uh, occurs in response to the different portfolio pressures uh, that, uh, that different ministers uh, may have at, uh, at points in time. Um, you can see that there's certain variances to different categories that, uh, that have occurred uh, during, that, uh, during that window. Um, I note that, uh, that under the arrangements we have in place, uh, the staff entitlement for uh, the opposition is, uh, is tied to being a proportion of, um, uh, of the number of staff uh, that the government um, has uh, to, uh, to keep a sense of equity in those arrangements, Senator. Um, Minister Taylor has an additional three staff added to his office, all of them at senior ranks. Was there a particular reason for that, Minister Birmingham? Uh, yes. Um, um, as, uh, as you uh, would recall, uh, Senator Smith, uh, Minister Taylor um, acquired significant additional portfolio responsibilities during this reporting period. Um, uh, Minister Taylor uh, was already the, I'm just trying to find the right line there. Um, um, uh, Minister Taylor was already the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, um, but uh, um, uh, in between times, uh, Minister Taylor has also picked up responsibility in relation to the industry portfolio. And Minister Birmingham, were you given additional staff as well? Uh, no, I think uh, I think my numbers are static from uh, from previous time, if I recall. In fact, you lost a staff member. Oh, there we <laughs> go. Your total allocations. <laughs> there we go. I'm. Um, <laughs> I think it was an allocation. Oh, yes. Okay. I, anyway. Thank you. They were just my questions to clarify. Thanks, Senator Farrell. Smith. Senator Farrell. Um, I got the team to just uh, check. Doing good? As of today. I, I should say I lost an allocation, yes, not, that's uh, true. <laughs> uh, not an individual, lest anybody think I'd forgotten that, uh, that somebody who was actually in the team had left. I should have been clear. Um, um, as of today, there's 2,021 mob staff currently on the payroll. 2,021. Right, okay. Um, Senator Farrell, yeah? Labor has had the call for about half an hour, and I just mm. have a very quick couple of questions that I would oh, like well, to please, ask. Please ask your question. Thank you very though. much, yeah. Senator Farrell. I thought, given that you just sat down with a cup of tea and a biscuit, might be an opportune time. Um, just following the Minister's lead. Oh, no, actually, it's just got water. <laughs> I, 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 I did sneak a chocolate biscuit, though, we're done, so. Um, a bit of sustenance. I would like to table a copy of the constitution of the company Warringah Independent Limited, which is the campaign vehicle for the member for Warringah. Um, and if that could be provided, a copy of that be provided to the officials, that would be appreciated. Because um, in the company's objects within that constitution um, on the last page, or the page that I had tagged, um, in particular clause B, it states that one of the objectives of the company um, is to manage the electoral office and support for elected representatives at a local, state and federal government. Could you give me your view on how an outside organisation might be purporting to exert control over the functions of a federal MP and whether or not that's appropriate? Sorry, Senator, I might need to ask the question again. There's a... <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, the, um, the campaign vehicle for the member for Warringah has within its constitution objectives that include managing the electoral office. How does that... Is, is that really consistent with the MAPS Act to have some sort of outside entity, particularly a campaign entity managing staff within an electorate office? 
I don't think we can really comment on that. I can comment on what are the requirements under the PBR framework for electorate officers, but I can't really comment on okay. that. Okay. What are the requirements, Mr De Silva? Uh, in terms of an electoral office, uh, it would be a resource that's determined uh, by the minister for uh, for each for each parliamentarian. Uh, it would it would set out uh, where that electorate office is, what resources would be provided within that uh, that electorate office. Uh, the MOPS Act um, uh, uh, would then uh, uh, through a um, to sort of determination uh, uh, would set out the, the number of staff that would go to an electoral office, say four. Uh, that's in a very broad sense. So I can't really comment on the question that you've posed. Relevant to whether or not it's appropriate that some sort of external entity is asserting to manage electorate office staff. Under the MOPS Act, a parliamentarian is responsible for the employment Indeed. of, of electorate office staff. Um, beyond that, I can't really comment uh, on something that I haven't seen. OK. OK. Um, I might leave that with you and I have tabled the documents, so if I have any questions on notice to put, um, I certainly will. Sure. But thank you very much for your insights. That was all I had. I think, in, I mean, obviously, Oh, Minister. On, on notice, and I've just received what uh, what you've circulated um, um, at uh, at a um, at an overarching level, uh, Senator. I'd uh, I'd um, stress that uh, that um, whilst um, members and senators uh, uh, are entitled to uh, use um, their electoral offices and uh, um, and efforts uh, to support their own re-election mm. uh, as part of their engagement with the community. Um, uh, it would seem um, unusual to me to have uh, a separate entity um, that had any role in the management of those electoral offices. Indeed. That, it it uh, was the word manage I was interested in specifically. Yeah. I, I think the, the obligations in relation to the management of electoral offices fall uh, squarely uh, on the shoulders of members of parliament uh, to be responsible uh, for that management. Uh, we all have to sign off on the um, expenditure arrangements within those offices. Uh, we all have certain responsibilities in relation to the uh, appointment and management of staff uh, in those offices. Uh, and um, uh, obviously uh, officials can provide any further advice as, as they've indicated insofar as uh, um, uh, insofar as uh, the operation of the framework applies relative to such a suggestion. It wouldn't be appropriate for me, for example, to have the State Director of the Tasmanian Division of the Liberal Party um, set up a desk in my office and manage my staff without um, me, me being there or in any form of consultation with me, I would have thought. I think people would see that as, uh, as inappropriate and, uh, and I think that would be uh, inappropriate relative to, uh, to how the expectations are set. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, officials. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Yes. Okay. I have some uh, questions, Minister Birmingham, about the story that just went to air on Channel 10 about Minister Tudge and Ms Miller. Uh, the yes, story. Senator. Yep. Well, I, one. I have, I've been sitting here the whole time, but uh, away you go. Okay. Well, perhaps if we start where I last. Um, asked you, is the Prime Minister going to sack M Mr Tudge, as has just been reported on Channel 10? Um, Senator, uh, ministerial appointments uh, um, in all of their forms are matters for the Prime Minister. I don't pretend to speak on his behalf uh, in, uh, in relation to such decisions. Well, there's been a leak from the Cabinet which has provided this information to Channel 10. So are you aware of it in your role as a senior minister, are you aware that Minister Tudge is reportedly about to be sacked? Uh, well, I don't, uh, con I don't comment on cabinet deliberations, Senator, uh, but I am not aware uh, of uh, any intended ministerial changes that the Prime Minister uh, may be going to make. They are matters for the Prime Minister. Okay, so um, is the story that's reported in Channel 10 that Minister Tudge is going to be sacked because of a technical breach of the ministerial standards. Is that story correct? Senator, I understand that the Prime Minister's office has, uh, has provided 
uh, a response to the Network 10 story. Okay. Uh, that response says that the matter is still in process and is being undertaken without prejudice to ensure it is dealt with fairly. In relation to the release of the report, I direct you to the evidence given by PMNC Deputy Secretary Stephanie Foster on Monday in estimates where she said it was her intention to release the report. The Prime Minister supports her view and approach. Um, so, uh, Senator, um, you were here and indeed the uh, yeah. Inquisitor for, uh, for much of up. Ms Foster's yeah. uh, evidence yesterday, yep. um, based on uh, based on that statement from the Prime Minister's office, uh, I would um, expect that uh, that all aspects of what Ms Foster said yesterday still stand. Yeah, I mean that's why I'm coming to follow up because we did have quite a long session on this uh, yesterday, and I was given information around the process, and then this appears in the media. Um, with quite a bit of detail attached to it uh, that con well, contradicts evidence given yesterday about the process that was being followed. So is this an unauthorised leak from someone within the government? That's essentially well, what I can take from the Prime Minister's response and your response. Nobody knows well, where this came from. Well, Senator, uh, I can't speak for uh, the journalist in question's sources or the accuracy of the story. Uh, I'm advised that, uh, that the story did not say that it came from Cabinet, contrary to uh, the way you um, uh, framed the initial question, Senator. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, as per the response that the Prime Minister's office has issued, uh, the status of those inquiries uh, as provided to this committee by um, Ms Foster yesterday uh, remains. Well, if it didn't come from Cabinet and the Prime Minister's office has ruled out being involved, how could Channel 10 have information that goes to the heart of what Ms Tom's uh, investigation found and also that the investigation finds that there was a technical breach of the ministerial standards. It is quite detailed. How many people in the government know what's going on? No. Senator, uh, I don't know the accuracy of the Channel 10 report. I can't speak for uh, the journalist in question sources. Uh, as, uh, as was canvassed yesterday, uh, I have not seen Dr Tom's report. Um, and Dr Tom's report is subject to the processes uh, that uh, Ms Foster outlined yesterday. So it must be a leak that's um, designed to, again, attack the Prime Minister's credibility at the moment. This is another serious leak. Well, Senator, you're making assumptions about uh, the uh, accuracy uh, sources or otherwise uh, of, uh, of such information. Um, I'm not going to draw any such assumptions. Uh, as I've indicated, uh, the Prime Minister's office has issued a statement uh, standing by the information provided yesterday and that that remains the current state uh, of that matter in terms of the finalisation uh, and, uh, and provision of the Tom report uh, to uh, uh, Ms Miller and Mr Tudge. Does the Prime Minister have uh, full confidence in Mr Tudge? Uh, Senator, uh, Mr Tudge has been stood aside uh, as a minister uh, and so stood aside doesn't. pending conclusion uh, of the Tom review. Have you been involved in any discussions where the Prime Minister has canvassed sacking Mr Tudge? Uh, Senator, I'm not going to go into any of my conversations with, uh, with the Prime Minister. Has the Prime Minister uh, that, told you uh, he's that, going to sack Mr uh, Tudge? Senator, I'm not going to go into any of my conversations uh, with the Prime Minister. Uh, I refer you to my earlier answer in which I said that I am not aware uh, of any intended changes to the Ministry uh, that the Prime Minister uh, may or may not make. Uh, they are matters for the Prime Minister. So you have no discussion with the Prime Minister about the future of Mr Tudge? No, I think I've uh, addressed, uh, addressed that, uh, Senator. Uh, well, in the, status of in the, the way you, you address issues, which is a lot of words, but can you tell me directly, have you had a discussion with the Prime Minister about the future of Mr Tudge? Senator, as I said before, I'm not going to go to my discussions with the Prime Minister, uh, but as I said earlier, uh, I am not aware uh, of any intended changes to the Ministry. Uh, they are matters for the Prime Minister that would be announced by the Prime Minister uh, if he was intending to do so. 
but his office has clarified these matters uh, in response to the Network 10 story. Uh, and what they have done is point very clearly to the accuracy of the evidence provided to this committee yesterday around the status of the Tom report. Well, someone has leaked to Channel 10. So who is, who is it? Is it you? What, who, which minister has leaked this information? Because it has a detailed outline of the findings of the Tom investigation. And the evidence we heard yesterday was that it was hand delivered to the Prime Minister's office because of the sensitivity. And now we have details of its findings appearing on the news. Like who has had access to it and who has leaked it? Senator, you're drawing assumptions and conclusions about uh, the accuracy of what's been reported. Uh, I'm not going to draw those assumptions or conclusions. As was made very clear yesterday, uh, the report itself has been finalised. Uh, there is a process being undertaken at present uh, to engage with the participants in that review uh, to ensure uh, that they uh, are comfortable uh, with the basis upon which their views have been reflected and those views being provided to Ms Miller and Mr Tudge in the final report. Uh, if they come back with the need for uh, variations in terms of the evidence or information they have provided, Ms Foster indicated that she would work through that. Uh, it is the intention to provide a copy of the final report to um, uh, Ms Miller and Mr Tudge. Um, that, uh, of course, uh, the report is concluded. Uh, the findings and conclusions within it uh, will be provided to the participants. We hope to provide as comprehensive a document as possible, uh, but are mindful of the privacy and interests of those who have voluntarily chosen to participate in that process. The findings and conclusions of this report have been broadcast to a national TV audience this afternoon. Well, that's, that, that's, that's, you are uh, in here having... Well, is the story wrong? Sen Sen Senator, neither of us have seen the report, unless you're going to volunteer information to me no, about I whether you seen, have. No, I haven't seen it. Of course I haven't so, seen So neither of us have seen the report. Um, you're the one who's drawing Well, tell uh, me the story is wrong, then. It, Sen it, it is very detailed. Senator, as I said, neither of us have seen the report. Uh, the Prime Minister's office have issued a statement making clear the status of that report. Uh, which is entirely consistent uh, with the information Ms Foster provided yesterday. So the dysfunction of this government now means, based on the evidence we got yesterday, that neither Mr Tudge nor Ms Miller have seen this report as yet, because it's going through another process, and yet somebody has gone out of their way to, to leak the story ahead of time and say that Mr Tudge is going to be sacked by the Prime Minister for promoting Ms Miller to senior advisor whilst in a relationship, which is a breach of the ministerial standards. That's what's happened now. Like somebody has leaked this so that Ms Miller hasn't had the opportunity to see anything that's come back. And that's the state of the government now. I, I can't work out if it's someone trying to damage the prime minister or damage Mr Tudge or damage Ms Miller or just damage the lot of you. Senator, you can spend your time trying to run political uh, hypothesis or commentary if you want. Um, I've clarified the facts uh, in terms of uh, the status of the, uh, of the review uh, and the status in relation to uh, the ministry. Uh, now, ultimately, Senator, these matters will be finalised as quickly as possible, as Ms Foster indicated yesterday. Uh, the government is working through proper process there with those who have participated in that review. So I ask you again, is the story true? Senator, uh, I've well, been you seeing... Are, you are getting updates from the Prime Minister's office, because sure. you, you're uh, sure. reading them for, and, to me. And, is the story true? And, and Senator, um, I understand that I mean, you characterise the story as coming from within Cabinet. I understand that is well, not what the story said. Well, um, who knows? Who has well, sorry, access sorry, to sorry, it? Sorry, sorry. You, you apparently watched it. I've been sitting here the whole time. No, I'm asking you. So, and presumably you have got a hotline to the Prime Minister's office right at this point in time. If it's not a Cabinet Minister, then it's someone in the Prime Minister's office because we were told that that document that you haven't seen, and presumably not many other, any other minister has seen, was hand-delivered to a senior advisor in the Prime Minister's office. So it didn't come on email, it was a hand delivery. 
So if it's not a cabinet leak, it's a leak from the Prime Minister's office, a oh, leak from a Prime Minister who, who we know leaks, Senator, as we found out yesterday. Senator, Se Se Senator uh, I appreciate that you want to try to inflame this in all manner of different ways through a whole lot of different conjecture on your part. The facts of the matter are uh, this report Senator Ayres, order. The Minister is responding to Senator Gallagher's question. This report, independently commissioned from Dr Tom, uh, has been undertaken, seeking to engage those willing to participate in the review. Uh, it's reached its conclusion, been presented. And now it's been leaked. Ms Foster, well, Senator, again. You just diminish your answering these questions. Senator Ayres. Senator Ayres. I think you might want to take a look from what I understand quite carefully about what was or wasn't reported as to whether it actually does contain any quotes, any direct attribution, any direct information from the report. I understand there are a lot of assertions that are being made. I would caution against reliance upon assertions or assumptions. Uh, the government is going to continue to follow fair process in this regard. Uh, it is in the midst of that with the participants in that inquiry. Uh, we, uh, as Ms Foster uh, indicated, uh, they have until uh, tomorrow under, uh, under the timeline that she outlined to provide comment back about what they are happy to have shared with uh, Ms Miller and Mr Tudge. Um, and if there is then a period of work that is required, uh, Ms Foster will go through that before sharing the report with um, uh, Ms Miller and Mr Tudge, uh, which is, uh, as the Prime Minister's statement uh, from his office makes clear, he supports as an approach. You talk about a fair process, that the government's going through a fair process, but do you accept that it's only the government that could have leaked this information? Senator, uh, again, I have been sitting here. Is that a fair here, process? Uh, I have been sitting here well, whilst where else the story would it come has aired. Where else I, would it Senator Gallagher, if Senator, you listen Senator, very carefully, the minister might answer your question. Senator, I've been sitting here whilst the story is. Uh, I am not aware in detail of exactly what was said in that story uh, as to whether indeed it contains any direct quotes, uh, any direct information about the review. As we've already canvassed, uh, I also am not aware of the findings of that review. Uh, so in terms of whether this story is accurate or not, let alone where it has come from, I mean, they really are matters uh, that, uh, that you can pursue if you want with the, with the journalist and the media, uh, but I'm not in a position to be able to comment uh, on the accuracy of a story that I haven't even seen. So, so Channel 10 just dreamed this story up, did they? It seems to have a lot of detail Minister relating to those representing matters. Channel 10, well, no, Senator he's saying Gallagher. that I am, I am putting to you that the only place this story could have come from was within government, based on the evidence we got yesterday. Do you accept that? No, Sen Senator, no, I'm not going to accept any conclusions you want to draw from a story that I haven't seen from unknown sources uh, um, about content that I cannot verify its accuracy or not. So when uh, yesterday in evidence we found out that there were, it's about $80,000 that has been spent on two reports into um, Mr Tudge's conduct, uh, the first of those being an a, um, investigation run by the Finance Department through Spark Helmore. Why weren't the matters that um, Ms Tom has uncovered, according to these, these news, news reports, uncovered by the original finance-funded investigation? Well, Senator, the, uh, the finance investigation um, uh, was uh, obviously undertaken by finance in accordance mm. with the terms for which they investigate um, complaints. Uh, finance is not responsible uh, for investigation of or upholding of uh, the ministerial standards. Um, uh, so, so they didn't look at the ministerial standards as part of that? That's that in terms of uh, the work of finance in handling MOPS Act matters. Uh, that has not uh, been a responsibility of finance in relation to the ministerial standards, not, not ever, not under any government. Mm. And I'm interested in your answer there because the report on the TV says that there was a technical breach of the ministerial standards. So you, you've made well, that well, sen well, Senator, uh, I'm simply, in, term, in terms of ground, uh, there's obviously um, 
both the scope of complaint that was made by Ms Miller and the issues raised publicly by her, uh, of which um, whilst not privy to what she had discussed with finance previously, my understanding from what has been asserted and reported publicly is that the scope of complaint changed, but also uh, the review commissioned by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, had the authority uh, to assess that, that varied scope of complaint against wider implications, including the ministerial standards. Minister, will Mr Tudge have his job next week? Uh, Senator, as I've said multiple times, uh, the decisions around ministerial appointments are matters for the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Tudge stood down for the duration of this inquiry, uh, which has not yet finalised in terms of uh, the Prime Minister's uh, ability to see that uh, Ms Miller and Mr Tudge have the report provided to them and his ability, obviously, then to discuss that appropriately with Mr Tudge. Considering the, um, the sensitivities of the matters that have been dealt with under the Dr Tom report and the seeming leaking of that information on Channel 10, which you can't tell me that that story is incorrect, Senator will there be an investigation into how this matter has reached 10 News at 5? Um, and broadcast across the country without Ms Miller in particular being given access to the report or, or Mr Tudge? Senator, as, uh, as Ms Foster uh, indicated, um, they, uh, her team has been in regular contact with Ms Miller's representatives and team uh, throughout the different uh, junctures of this uh, investigation. Um, I don't think uh, the type of uh, leaping to conclusions or speculation that, uh, that you're engaging in uh, at present off the back of a media report uh, is helpful. Uh, the government wants to make sure that, uh, that the process, according to uh, the fair arrangements that, uh, that um, Dr Tom has sought to oversee uh, and that Ms Foster is seeking to conclude, uh, are concluded and, uh, and that that report is uh, provided uh, to both Ms Miller and Mr Touch. But the Senator fair process has has not been observed, has it? Like, I, I understand the goodwill that was, um, you know, the evidence in yesterday about fair process and natural justice and time for people to raise concerns, but that's not what hap has happened, is it? Like, details of that report have been released oh, to the media it's and it's been reported. So the fair process time has disappeared because of the dysfunction of this government. Well, Senator, I, I don't accept that. I don't think that simply so concluding, just concluding it around the accuracy or otherwise of, uh, of what is reported uh, is useful or helpful in, uh, in these matters. Um, what I would urge people to do is to uh, respect that process that, uh, that is oh. in place. Senator Gallagher, respect the process. Senator Gallagher, we have 12 minutes I, left before dinner. Yep. Um, and I will finish. Okay, the time. and then oh, I, do, I do want to finish yeah. up with maps before we get oh, to dinner. Questions. Um, you want people to respect the process. I think someone needs to speak to the staff of the Prime Minister's office because that's clearly where it has come from. Well, Senator, um, Senator, I don't think softening the ground. To, I don't think seeking to, to slur not any particular. What, not, not caring who, who gets damaged in the process. I mean, this is a pattern with this government and with that office in particular, Senator, and particularly is there a around Senator women. Gallagher? Okay. No, it is. To, it what, what, there was what backgrounding to, and undermining of Ms Higgins, of Ms Tame, and now. It's being backgrounded and put out about Miss Miller. There is a history of this pathological backgrounding against women who make complaints about men in, in this building. That is what's happening. It was softening up the ground and it has backfired. Well, Senator, uh, um, I can't um, speak, as I've said before, for the accuracy of the reporting. Um, you've ascribed multiple different motivations for, uh, for it during, uh, during the commentary that you've run uh, in here with those motivations and observations changing. Uh, I, uh, I don't uh, see or believe that there would be any rationale for um, the point that you've just made. Uh, but, uh, but Senator, Well, it's come from somewhere, hasn't it? Um, well, I cannot speak to the accuracy uh, of the report, <laughs> a particular report that I haven't even had the opportunity to see myself Senator. Um, well, I'm happy to resume after dinner once you've had the opportunity to have right. a look at the report, if that's convenient, if that allows you time to get further information. Mm -hmm. 
Senator, uh, I would, uh, would expect, as per the statement issued by the Prime Minister's office, that we will want to still conclude the process around um, the Tom report and making sure that that can be properly shared uh, with both Ms Miller and Mr Tudge. Well, it's been shared nationally on TV at prime time. That's the problem. So, Minister, you've refused to tell us the report's wrong. You've refused to say the Prime Minister has confidence in Mr Tudge. And you've refused to say whether Mr Tudge will have his job next week. Like, what is going on? Senator and wouldn't it have been easier if the Prime Minister had just listened to Ms Miller when she first approached him around issues with, with Minister Tudge, instead of this year and a half, two reports, almost $100,000, and now leaking to the media um, against Ms Miller by, by the looks of it. Wouldn't it have been easier Sen if he'd just responded when he was first approached? Sen Sen Senator, uh, on the same day that further new allegations were made last year, the Prime Minister put in place arrangements uh, for the independent inquiry conducted by Dr Vivian Tom. Uh, Mr Tudge stood aside at that point in time on that day and has been stood aside ever since uh, whilst the process uh, reaches its conclusion. Uh, we want to ensure that is concluded uh, and that Ms Miller uh, and Mr Tudge receive uh, the findings uh, of Dr Tom, uh, which I'm sure, regardless of whatever it is uh, Network 10 has reported, uh, will be more substantive uh, than, uh, than, than is in those reports, if Indeed. they are even accurate, Senator. Okay. And has the Prime Minister's office advised you whether they are taking any steps now to one, find out where this story came from, but two, for Ms Miller and Mr Tudge to be provided a copy of the report? <laughs> well, Senator... Um, uh, now that it has been leaked. Se Senator, the, the process for providing that copy of the report is underway. Um, there is that point of fairness uh, to <laughs> other participants in that review process uh, that Ms Foster went through extensively yesterday, uh, that before providing uh, to either Ms Miller or to Mr Tudge uh, the reports of others who have participated uh, in that inquiry. Uh, it is only fair that uh, they have an opportunity uh, to, uh, to see uh, how their comments have been reflected uh, and, uh, and how their privacy will be handled in relation to the provision of, uh, of that report. Uh, as, as Ms Foster made very clear yesterday, uh, the findings, the substance of the report will not change from that process. It is only about respect for the individuals who participated in it. Mm. And I support that approach, except the landscape has changed, hasn't it? Because today this has happened. Well, so what, there's no changes to that plan either. Well, so people just have to wait. Well, Senator, it, uh, it would clearly not be fair on those individuals to um, now, because of whatever it is Network 10 has reported, uh, simply say we're going to provide uh, the full report, um, knowing that, of course, once provided, it may become uh, a public document or it may have other uh, implications, including potential legal implications. Mm. So uh, we're not going to um, respond to a news report in a way that undermines uh, uh, any further uh, the rights of those who've participated in such a review process. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. We have five more minutes before dinner break. Um, Labor senators have five minutes worth of questions for maps, and then we'll I've finish got up. Some, I've got some quick questions. Um, They'd better be quick. Minister, uh, Mr Joyce um, is, um, has been approved to build a new ministerial office in Armidale really? three months prior to the election. What's the budget? Can, can anybody tell me how much is going to be spent on this ministerial office? The last one that he built renovated in Armidale cost uh, $670,000. What's, what's the budget for this exercise? Senator, I'm not sure. I'll ask uh, my colleague, uh, Mr De Silva, if he has those to hand. If not, Thanks, we'll take Ms. that on Marshall. notice and provide it to you. So I don't have that information on hand. I would go back to the standard kind of principle. We don't comment on individual public care and uh, expenses, but happy to take it Yeah, this is Yeah, this is an electoral office. It's not... But this is a decision to part of the convention at, at two minutes to midnight build a new ministerial office for Mr Joyce in Armidale 
The last one cost $670,000. No light to shed on this. Did you sign off on this, Minister? You approved this new office? Um, I'd have to take it on notice, Senator, as to, uh, as to uh, at what point uh, the request there came through. Um, but, uh, but, Senator, uh, it was pretty rare. unusual. Pretty, pretty unusual to do it. Senator, so adjacent to a federal election, to isn't it? But, uh, but, Senator, you would be aware that, uh, that in terms of uh, capital works expenditure uh, on the uh, on the offices of uh, members of parliament, including office holders, um, are, um, uh, are handled in a consistent way across all parties, um, and uh, and uh, that uh, that the reporting of those is uh, is equally handled consistently. What on earth does that mean? What, what, why, just before a federal election, is the Commonwealth spending, let's assume it's the same amount of money as last time, last time it was $670,000 on this vanity project for Mr Joyce? Well, Senator, um, officials have agreed to take on notice what okay. information can be provided in, uh, in relation to that. Uh, I don't. Um, automatically accept the assertions you're making um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of approvals processes around it. As I said, I'll have to take that on notice. I can't remember uh, if it uh, crossed my desk or Mr. Morton's desk in relation to to anything. We're taking it face value that uh, that the statement you're making in relation to any accommodation arrangements for ministerial staff in the Deputy Prime Minister's office um, is taking place. But if there's further information, we'll provide that. Well, well, while we're on ministerial offices, can you tell One me why question, um, Senator is. Mr Morton... I've got two questions, actually. Okay. Why, why Mr Morton has now apparently established a ministerial office in Sydney? He's, I was only faintly aware of Mr Morton before. He's a Western Australian, isn't he? That's correct, Senator. Well, what's he doing with a ministerial office in Sydney? What's that all about? Um, well, it's not uncommon, and don't if you want me to you know, blow up convention uh, in terms of uh, in terms of discussing, but it's not uncommon for um, ministers and shadow ministers um, around uh, around the country to have staff who may be based uh, in alternate locations, Senator. Particularly um, during COVID nineteen, I would have thought, um, Minister. No. Even there's certainly been an increase in such uh, such requests for alternate work bases during uh, COVID-19. Senator Chandler, you're right, um, but uh, in terms of uh, Mr Morton and having um, uh, staff based in Sydney, uh, that would not be unusual in terms of, uh, of any number of, uh, of ministers uh, over a period of time. Senator Ayres, I have a staff member based in Melbourne. Um, I did say I had two more. Okay, one more, one more Senator Ayres. Make um, it quick. You, Minister, you'll have had an opportunity um, since you've been asked in the Senate about these issues a number of times uh, to review uh, Mr Christensen's uh, expenditure of public money on far-right anti-vax conspiracy theory material that directs people to his Nation First website. Um, what it, why is Mr Christensen still in the Liberal National Party and have you spoken to him about this and what are you doing about public money being spent on this far-right propaganda? Uh, Senator, to, uh, to unpack those, um, the Leader of the National Party has spoken to Mr Christensen about um, uh, the government's disagreement uh, with some of the views he has expressed impact. and materials he has uh, distributed. Uh, I disagree wholeheartedly uh, with, uh, with much of that, uh, Senator Ayres, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and condemn the use of uh, such um, means of, uh, or condemn the distribution of such opinions uh, and using such means to do so. That said, Senator Ayres, um, it, is, uh, it is not for uh, me or the Special Minister of State uh, to seek to, um, uh, to, seek to um, uh, police um, what individual members of parliament um, disseminate uh, by way of uh, political or public information, no matter how much I might disagree with 
much of it from the far left or the far right, um, uh, or indeed how much I might disagree with some of the assertions made uh, by even many of those uh, on your side who might occupy slightly more centrist positions than, uh, than those on the far left or the far right. Um, there is Nobody's freedom. Nobody's asking to police it. They're asking for Senator leadership. Senator Ayres, I thought that was your last question. To, to, Senator, I just condemned uh, much of the content yes, of the news, as I have done previously. Uh, Mr Joyce has raised those matters with Mr Christensen, uh, but he is a duly elected member of parliament uh, who is, uh, is able to utilise uh, those, uh, those entitlements. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Ms Huxtable, I understand you have some information to provide to the committee before we break for dinner? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. Uh, so earlier today, uh, Senator Gallagher asked questions uh, around an article in The Australian on the 9th of February, and I said that I would undertake to, uh, to find the draft uh, response that was mm -hmm. prepared in the event of media. Uh, which I now have, so if I could just read that into the yes, record. Thank you. Uh, the table and graph attributed to the Department of Finance in the article uh, Labor COVID Policies and Extra 81 Billion Hit, uh, Colin Finance Minister, uh, published in The Australian on 9 February 2022, were not prepared or supplied by the Department of Finance. The Australian has corrected the attribution. Thank you for that, Ms. Huxtable. Um, Labor Senators, I'm just look, quickly looking for guidance from you as to whether you wish to continue or you need to continue with MAPS after dinner or we're happy to. Thank you very much, Senator Farrell. So um, we will finish with outcome three now. Thank you very much to the officials for coming along. We will break for dinner and when we reconvene at 7.30 p.m. it will be with Ibia. Committee will now suspend. Thank you. Senator oh, Farrell. Don't, yes. <laughs> we are going to raise that issue. Very good. Um, and I welcome Ms Anwen Godwin, Chief Executive Officer of the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority and other officers. Ms Godwin, I understand you wish to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Chair. Anwen Godwin, Chief Executive Officer of the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority. Uh, so thank you, Chair and committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to provide the committee with my annual statement as CEO of the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority and to reflect on the work of the last year. 2021 had two important governance milestones for IPIA. They started with the tabling of the ANAO's performance audit on IPIA's administration of parliamentary expenses and they ended with IPIA's submission to the independent legislative reviews of the 2017 IPIA and Parliamentary Business Resources Act. Acts, plural. Uh, we welcomed both as important opportunities. The performance audit to reflect on how we undertake our legislative responsibilities and the legislative review on what we do. While we await the government's response to the legislative review recommendations, IPIA has well progressed the ANAO recommendations. In IPIA's view, the principles-based approach of parliamentary work expenses has proven to be flexible and adaptable. It has catered for bushfires, the pandemic, an election and floods. We base this assessment on results from IPIA's annual independent client survey and our own monitoring of media and press coverage of travel-related issues. I want to thank parliamentarians and their staff for participating in our annual client survey and letting us know where we can improve. For example, as a result of the client feedback, one of our projects this financial year is the upgrade of our website facilities. The survey shows that client satisfaction with the advice line service is above 90%. I believe IPIA's strong culture of assistance and the regular use of the advice line by parliamentarians and their staff to seek and receive travel related advice are important factors in the acceptance of the framework. From the start, IPIA adopted an education first approach for travel related expenses. This included included developing IPIA Ed, an online training tool capturing the processes and decision making for claiming travel expenses and aligning it to the principles based framework and also providing education material to the public. Building on this education focus with new parliamentarians and staff as they commence their parliamentary careers has led to increased understanding and capability in the administration and management of travel related expenses. IPIA believes that this is critical to the ongoing success of its administration of the PBR framework and will continue to do this and be a focus during an election year. At previous estimates, 
I have spoken of some of the areas of particular focus for our assurance function. These include travel associated with sporting and cultural events and travel to what might be called desirable destinations. Much of our assurance activity takes place unnoticed and in the background. We engage regularly with parliamentarians when conducting assurance reviews, and I also want to acknowledge the overwhelming majority of that engagement is characterised by cooperation and a sense of mutual purpose. We have been encouraged by the preparedness of parliamentarians to assist us in our examination of their use of work resources. In turn, this has enhanced IPIA's cap capacity to help parliamentarians meet their obligations required of them by the PBR legislation. There is one highlight event during the year that I particularly want to mention. That is, IPIA hosting an international forum for parliamentary colleagues in partnership with the UK and New Zealand. The forum was an opportunity to explore how different countries approached integrity, trust and transparency while maintaining business as usual client service. This foray into a virtual community of international best practice was a new and challenging experience for many Ippians, and I wish to publicly acknowledge their commitment and their success. Thank you, Ippians, and it remains an honour to be your CEO. Thank you, Chair. I'm available for questions. Thank you very much, Ms Godwin. Tonight is the first time I think I've heard you refer to employees as Ippians. Yes. Uh, I quite <laughs> like that. <laughs> they are Ippians, and they actually very proud of it. So of it's a lovely, lovely turn that of phrase. That is good to hear. Thank um, you. Senator Farrell, you have the call. Um, Ms uh, Huxtable did uh, warn me off from asking any questions in relation to PEMS that are more in her bailiwick than yours. So if you think I'm straying into questions uh, that are more appropriately uh, in uh, her bailiwick, then don't hesitate to um, to pull me up. But in the absence of that, um, I'd like to say that in the um, IPIA annual report of last year, page seven, the chair, Ms Gillian Segal, said, the implementation, of the, the implementation of the PEMS modules relevant to IPIA is still some time away and is dependent on the Department of Finance ensuring that the build and post implementation work successfully incorporates IPIA's needs. Now, the last time we were here, uh, you're also expressing some concern. First question is, uh, are you confident that IPIA's needs will be met by 30 June when the uh, project is due to be complete? Uh, thank you, Senator. And I uh, would keep in mind uh, your, your comments regarding uh, where this sits with regard to the Department of Finance. Um, as we've reiterated at every estimate, the Department of Finance is the project leader for this particular project, and IPIA is just one of a number of clients um, involved in that project. Uh, I also, um, I brought the annual report with me because I can reiterate that the Chair has, since our very beginning in our very first annual report, has stressed the importance of the PEMS project and how it is a foundation for IPIA as we go forward, not only in terms of our efficiency and effectiveness, but in our ability to add value-added service to, to parliamentarians. Um, and as my opening statement just said, that's been an important part of IPIA's culture and the way we approach things. Um, in response to your um, specific question, I think at the last estimates I noted that um, uh, I was positive that we would we be able to deliver a product um, by the 30th of June 2022 or the 1st of July 2021, 2022, which is the go live date. And I still remain positive that there will be a product that will be delivered. Um, how that, uh, whether it fulfills all of our requirements at the first phase is, um, is something that we're continuing to work with the Department of Finance with. And I do note that it is an IT project and IT projects are rarely um, able to deliver everything on the first go. So I think we need to look at this project in that, yes, in that light. It's a massive project, and as we've spoken before, it's a very complex project as well. Yes, but it's also way over budget and uh, way behind, isn't it? Uh, that's probably a question that you would then need Fair to enough. talk to Department of Finance. All right. Um, um, so... You've said there'll, there'll be a product there by the 30th of June. Um, I'm just a bit not 
a bit unclear as to whether or not you think that product will ultimately meet your needs or will there still be things that you know of now which you're just not going to get uh, come 30 June? So um, I think we need to look at that project for the IPIA side of that project, Senator, in um, uh, two parts. There are a number of phases that, that have been included as milestones in this project. And uh, certainly there are the, the travel modules um, that we currently have been working on and, and those upfront modules about how you put in claims. Um, there is certainly that product, I think, is, is well advanced and will be delivered. Um, uh, I'm not saying that there won't be further enhancements down the track, but that's, as I said before, is all IT projects will have further enhancements down the, the, down the track. Um, so I, I don't have any qualms about um, that component of it. I'm not sure that all the back end arrangements will be in place. However, um, that was already been anticipated and as you will recall, there was um, some funding that was extended to IPIA and that will cover us as we go through those, that sort of ongoing back end approaches to things and, and I think they'll come in. contribution to PEMS? Uh, so we had made a five, a million dollar contribution last time around. We continue to make contributions in terms of in-kind, um, our but staff. But there's been no further financial contributions? We have made no further financial contributions. All right. Um, now, last time you mentioned that PEMS had had an impact on staff turnover, mm. um, something that's also uh, mentioned in the annual report. And you say... Um, Strategic workforce planning, job redesign, capability and capacity mm -hmm. recruitment is delayed while immediate and operational needs are met. Uh, in turn, this hampers our ability to recruit to ongoing position positions. <clears throat> are you still having issues with staff turnover and that you refer to uh, there in the report? I think that they are ongoing issues, Senator. Uh, and as I mentioned last year and in the annual report, one of the issues has been that we have only recruited uh, well, the majority of staff that we've been recruiting in those particular areas has been on non-ongoing contracts or non-ongoing arrangements. The so just, just stopping you there, is that because that's what you've chosen to select or that's all you can get people to apply for? Uh, that's an interesting question. It's probably a mix of both. The, the reason that we've gone for non-ongoing positions is that we uh, aren't necessarily sure about what capabilities we're going to need as we go forward. Plus, um, uh, we are aware that we are expected, benefits are expected to be realised that will mean that there will be a reduction in staff for IPIA. And um, so we need to have some contingencies about how we, we move staff at the end. Hence us employing people on short term or relatively short term non ongoing contracts. Mm. That means, and I think I've said this before as well, IPIA really does invest in out staff and we do um, some excellent training, if I might say so, in terms of what it means to be a public servant. Those staff do get snaffled by other agencies and, uh, you know, we bring on quite a lot of APS2s and APS3 staff, so uh, a good training ground. Those staff move on to permanent position, to ongoing positions within the APS. So we're just in a bit of a flux state with regard to a constant um, or a more consistent uh, staffing profile which uh, will, will work its way through and it's just something that we've had to manage. Uh, I have to say that recruitment of particular skill sets is, is an issue across the public service, particularly in Canberra at the moment. You'll see regular articles in the newspapers about those skill sets. Um, data uh, schools and HR schools in particular have been difficult for agencies to maintain. Mm, all right. Um, thank you for answering those questions. Now, I have a couple of questions about the new travel service provider, CTM, that commenced on the 1st of January. Um, <clears throat> staff have reported that there have been some teething problems. Can you please give us an update on what issues have arisen with the new provider? Certainly, Senator. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview and then I'm going to actually hand to um, Ms Grant, who is the branch manager for that area. She's much more across the day-to-day -day operational detail for there. Um, but you are correct that we have a new uh, travel provider that came on board um, 
they did, started their transition at the end of December and they came fully on board as of 1, ju one January. Um, and I, again, it's a big project and I am not surprised that there are a few teething issues with that handover. The previous <coughs> provider had been in that role since 1st of January 2013. So that Just stopping you there, been. did any of the staff who worked for FCM um, come over? Look, I, Senator, don't I know. don't personally know about that. Right. Uh, the, the contractual yep. arrangements okay. that are put in place by those particular uh, organisations. But as I said, FCM, who was the previous provider, had been in place since 1 January 2013. So um, they've been on board for a long time. We are required to go out to market and test the market on a regular basis and all the extensions for the first contract had been exhausted, hence us going out mm. to market. Yeah, I think you explained that to us last time. Yeah. Didn't you? Yep. So look, I'll, I'll hand over with particular details yep. to um, Ms Grant. Stina Grant, uh, Branch Manager, Travel, Education and Advice. Um, thank you for your question, Senator. There have been a couple of My bumps pleasure. In, the, in the process, uh, mainly around travel provider numbers and the transition of travel provider numbers. So. Uh, every parliamentarian and staff member is allocated a travel provider number and that's how we allocate flights against the individual. The previous provider had been in place for a really long time and knew a lot of people by name and voice. Um, and as the new providers come in, um, those arrangements are still being implemented. So they're relying on people to give a travel provider number when they ring up and book their flight. Uh, but we have worked with the travel, the new travel provider, CTM, and they've put in place some new arrangements so that they can identify people by name and other um, means rather than just the travel provider number. So we're hoping that that issue would now be addressed, Senator. So how's that, those teething problems, how has that evidenced itself? What sort of problems have people been having that you're aware of? Uh, so we haven't had a lot of issues raised with us, but a couple of calls have come through to our inquiries line. Um, uh, concerned that the travel provider was asking them for a travel profile number and they weren't sure what that was. And so we can provide the travel profile number at any time uh, to parliamentarians and staff, and we can provide the travel profile numbers for the whole office, and we've done that for many offices now so that they have them on hand. Uh, I think it was just a bit of initial confusion. I don't think, I don't have the exact number of calls that we received about it. It wasn't a huge number, um, but that's why I'm aware that th that's, that's the issue that I am aware of. Right, yeah. okay. Um, has all the data uh, been transferred over to CTM? So all of the travel profile numbers yep. uh, uh, were transferred from, so FCM and CTM under the contract are required to go through a transition period. Um, and that's covered by the contractual arrangement. Zipia doesn't hold the data, FCM holds the data and now CTM holds the data. So yes, uh, a lot of that data has been transitioned across. Uh, we're still in the transition phase, so there's probably still some more data to move across, um, but that should be completed by the end of uh, this month or next month. If, you know, we're very close to having that process completed. Yeah. Are you satisfied that CTM are familiar with all of the rules regarding parliamentary travel and um, the requirements associated with it? Uh, so CTM is not able to provide advice uh, under the PVR on travel. Um, if, you, if a parliamentarian or staff member would like advice on whether a piece of travel meets the legislative requirements, then that advice must come from IPIA, it can't come from CTM. Uh, CTM is just a travel booking service, so um, it's, it's really only there for you to book the travel. Uh, there are requirements, of course, under the contract, but they don't, that, that's a little bit different to whether you could or couldn't travel, for example. Okay, I get you. Um, so travel's been fairly limited because of uh, COVID. Um, the expectation, I think, is that it'll start to sort of increase, particularly, I suppose, around election time. Um, are you confident that CTM are ramp capable of ramping up for an increased um, volume? Uh, I have no reason to think that they wouldn't be. All of the processes, so for this sitting period, flights are flowing through to IPIA and uh, everything is looking fine. I think Anwen mentioned she wasn't sure whether any staff had moved across from S FCM to CTM, but I'm aware of at least one staff member um, that has moved across. Uh, so I'm confident that the corporate knowledge is there and I know that um, uh, that we are working, my teams are working very closely with CTM, that they have weekly meetings 
um, and uh, close contact points. So whenever an issue or confusion or questions arise, uh, they're addressed very quickly. So I think the information sharing is working well. FCM has been fantastic in their handover and transition out uh, arrangements and CTM are extremely excited to have the contract and really looking forward to working with parliamentarians and their staff. So How long is that contract for? That contract is for three, uh, so it is, the contract has three one-year extensions and it is for, no I can't see it on the January 2022 to Three years. Oh, two years with two, three one Two year. years and then three, three one year. One year. Extensions. extensions, if you're happy with them. Yeah, okay, I get you. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now, I want to ask a couple of questions about election preparation. Um, what sort of preparations are you putting in place for the uh, election? Um, again, I'll start us off and then I'll hand over to uh, Ms Grant, head of the, the branch that looks after those sorts of things. Um, we have did a review of internal review. Sorry, it sounds review sounds much bigger than it was. We did a lessons learnt assessment of um, the previous election, what things worked and what things didn't uh, work as well. Uh, and we've um, embedded that into the processes we've got set up. Uh, clearly, we could anticipate that there would be an election. We just didn't know exactly when it would be. Uh, part of this, the things that we're replicating for this election are we've got a dedicated processing team for the major and the minor parties. Um, we are engaging with the key stakeholders, such as travel providers and partner ages early, to discuss travel requirements. And we are also issuing guidance to parliamentarians and their staff. So they're the three things that we took out as, as big um, learnings for us, and we've already put those uh, issues in place. We are also aware that we need to have some surge capacity, so we have um, been actively recruiting and training people as early as possible, and we are confident that we have the number of staff that we need to have on board to be able to take us through an election, and also that they are already very well progressed with their training and their understanding, so we should have um, some good capability and capacity there. So they're the big picture issues, and I'm happy to hand over. Just before we hand oh. over, um, how many extra people have you employed for that surge capacity? Well, there's, I'd have to look at Mr Frost for that one for the exact number. Um, <coughs> pretty, pretty best of Christine. Yeah. Okay. Answers about her range. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I guess we've engaged staff uh, not for one particular activity. Um, we'll put our most experienced staff on election travel and running those teams. Uh, but we have engaged an additional, I think, four. Uh, junior staff, um, but they're doing a range of activities. So, you know, they'll process travel and they will uh, maybe do PEMS testing and a range of other things as well. So there aren't staff that I've engaged specifically just for the election, uh, but we have certainly made sure that we have enough staff overall to cover all of the work that we have coming up, including the election. Does that? Yeah. All right, thank you. And um, um, do you have any expectation as to what you might expect um, by way of extra uh, travel and so forth during the election? Have you got some, have you done some, what do they call it, you know, pre-planning um, uh, yes around and no. that? <laughs> yes and um, no. Yeah. Uh, we just, it's a little bit uh, difficult to plan at the stage because of COVID and we're just not quite sure how that's all going to pan out um, and how that will work. But I think the most important thing to understand is that um, election travel is not something that is specifically identified under the PBR Act. It is just <coughs> under the general framework, so the, the dominant purpose, et cetera, all the principles still, still apply. Yep. So, yep. Uh, yeah, but I think the COVID aspects are making it a little bit more difficult to be specific in our planning. But again, Christina, um, if you have some, something further that you can assist Senator Farrell with. Yeah, so I guess when we look at uh, travel during previous election periods, the amount of travel isn't necessarily vastly bigger, but the specific nature of the travel and uh, the way that the travel takes place is a little bit different. Yeah. And that's why we've set up teams a little bit differently, um, so that we have specific teams dedicated to the major parties. Yeah. Um, and in that way, we can support the way that that party is travelling during the election period, which yeah. might be a little bit different to normal. Yeah. Have there been any issues, um, obviously with COVID, 
state governments have made decisions to, you know, close borders sort of unexpectedly. Has that created some problems with how you've been processing claims, or have um, you? Um... So overall, uh, the amount of travel being undertaken is, you know, much lower yeah. um, than yeah. normal. Yeah. Um, but it has meant that our um, focus has been uh, diverted onto, you know, providing advice on travel during. Uh, claiming travel during quarantine periods or having to travel earlier so that people are quarantined in time for sittings. Yep. Uh, but what we have found is that particularly the parliamentary business resources framework has been flexible enough because it operates on a principles-based framework rather than a set of rules um, and has supported those arrangements really well. So that has not been... You haven't had any problems in that A regard. major challenge, yeah, not, no. not insofar as that framework. Uh, in regards to staff, it is a little bit different because obviously they're working under the MOPS Act and the MOPS EA. Um, and, and those arrangements are a bit more specific and a bit more rules-based, so they, maybe there has been a few more challenges in that space, but none that we haven't been able to work through with yeah. our colleagues. And in not finance. that many staff have been travelling in any event. A lot of I staff have, have not. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. That uh, completes my questions. Cheryl, um, Senator Smith, did you have any questions for Ipia? No other senators have questions for Ipia. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Ms Godwin, and other officers for coming along this evening. Um, and we will call on the Australian Electoral Commission. Thank you. Yes, I believe so. I think they're just wandering in now. I did briefly see the Commissioner when I walked past down the corridor. The, yeah, these were our last witnesses for tonight, so... Yes, well, I, I think there's an argument that this close to an election. We should be able to... No. I now welcome the Electoral Commissioner, Mr Tom Rogers, and officers from the Australian Electoral Commission. Mr Rogers, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, I don't, thank you, Senator. OK, very good. Uh, I'm looking at Labor Senators. Senator Farrell, you have some questions for the Electoral Commission? I do, thank you, Very Chair. good. I will give the call to you. And welcome. Um, the election is almost upon us. Apparently um, so, Senator. Last time we met, there were still a few potential options for the election, but it now does appear as if um, May is shaping up as the, um, the month of the election. <coughs> um, does that assist you in booking polling places and uh, securing staff? Mm. Uh, thanks, Senator. Look, um, you know, effectively, every week that we get is useful for us. Uh, um, but we're ready you know, to go whenever the, that election is called. But there's always last minute things to do. We've been involved in checking polling places and uh, you know, booking polling places, uh, looking after staff, making sure we've got the other logistics in train. So we're, we're ready to go. But obviously every day that we get is useful for us, particularly as we build up to delivering what will be the most complex election in our history. Well, that's probably an understatement. Uh, at this stage, um, <clears throat> have you looked at securing larger venues than you might normally so that um, you can still get the volume of electors through while maintaining social distancing? Hmm. We are very, very conscious of that, Senator. Um, not only in terms of the size of the venues and the number of the venues, but also how we're conducting the polling uh, to make sure that we're doing it in a safe and secure way. 
So uh, we've been working with health officials from around Australia, uh, with the Chief uh, Health Officer from the Commonwealth, um, the Deputy and the National Election Manager have also addressed the AHPPC uh, at least once. Mm. Um, we're working with all of the health officers from every state and territory. We will be also implementing uh, whatever state health order is in place in the individual state uh, in those polling places to make sure that voting can continue in a safe and secure way. Um, we're very conscious uh, this will be the largest workforce we've ever had. I think something like 105,000 people, uh, many of them, not many, but a large number of those will also be devoted to keeping polling places clean, sanitising in between voters. Um, you know, we've been using a simple figure uh, Senator, to, to, to demonstrate this. I think in 2019 we used um, 100,000 pencils. Uh, at this election we're estimating about 4.5 million pencils Ooh. so that we can keep things clean. Um, you know, some pencils walk out the door, we'll be sanitising the ones we can. Um, so what does that mean, that every voter will get a new pencil? Is that... every, every voter will receive a no, it can't be right. No, no, no every voter right. will see, no. receive a clean pencil. Yeah. Um, but we've got to make sure that there's a system in place to sanitise. We'll be collecting them as people leave. We'll be sanitising those, recycling them. But because that's a process, we have to have enough pencils for people to uh, to <coughs> use. Um, you know, I, I also you know, happen to know that we're using something like 34,000 bottles of surface cleaner, 63,000 litres of hand sanitizer. Um, and a huge number of uh, other bits of equipment that you'd expect to see in an event like that. Now, in some ways those figures sound fairly small, but actually it's a significant event just to get that equipment, the largest workforce we've ever had, and then to make sure that we can offer uh, polling in a safe and secure way. We are confident we can do that, that in-person voting will be a safe and secure event, um, and we're confident with what we've done. Yeah. Um... I think there's roughly 17 million voters, and um, let's say there's five million pens. That's about three and a half times that each pencil is going to be used. Is that about the figure? Um, just if you remember, Senator, that every polling place we'll have to collect, sanitise, circulate, make sure they're there. Many pencils walk out the door. Um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> be flippant about right, this, but we, would, we would prefer people yeah. didn't take our pencils and souvenir yeah. them and yeah. uh, a whole range of other things, but we are... Yeah. Yeah. People are able <coughs> to bring their own writing implement. Um, I'll remember that. Uh, yes. that. Senator, if you don't mind, also enables me to deal with a conspiracy theory that's been running, that, um, you know, that the AEC erases ballots and a range of other things, which of course we don't. Um, but if people wish to bring a pen, they're welcome to. People frequently ask why we use pencils um, rather than pens, and there's a whole range of reasons, probably not relevant for this evening, but people will find that there are sufficient pencils for them to cast a vote in a safe and secure way, and that they will be clean and sanitised accordingly. If, if you bring your own product, um, it doesn't have to be a pencil, does it? It can, no, it can be a pen as well. It can be a pen, yeah. Yeah, all right. You mentioned... Sorry. Oh, yes, sorry, Senator. Uh, Pope. Jeff Pope, Deputy Electoral Commissioner. Senator, I was just going to remind the committee that the Act was actually changed last year for the first time in over 100 years to allow electors to bring their own pen or pencil or whatever they prefer. So this will be the first election where that's occurred. Really? Mm. When, you can't, when, when you are allowed to bring your own pencil? Yes. I didn't know that. I mm. thought it had always been something that was permitted. Will you, will you publicise that more broadly than just... Mm. Um, we... We are doing so, Senator, and in fact, um, we have put on a, a YouTube channel called AEC TV, which I encourage people to look at, a <laughs> series of something like 40 short form videos, two or three minutes, where we're dealing with a range of issues, either providing information about commonly misunderstood processes or dealing with conspiracy theories um, like uh, the AEC is going to erase the votes or, or things like that. And we're, we're putting those bits of information out there as much as we can. We will also be writing to every household in Australia, uh, explaining the voting process when the writ's issued. So there'll be a very, very large public awareness campaign about the event. Um, we're also, in as many forums as we, we can talk about, talk about the processes that we have in place to make sure people understand that the Australian vote is one of the most secure and transparent in the world. We should be very proud of it. Um, and that um, we, we are confident of being able to conduct a good uh, election. 
Mm, all right. Um, now I want to talk about uh, queuing because um, mm. that got a bit of a that issue got a bit of a run when the government's crazy um, voter ID uh, laws were being discussed. Um, Very rhetorical, uh, Senator Farrell. I beg your pardon. Very rhetorical of you, Senator Farrell. I'm full of uh, rhetoric. rhetoric. Yeah, I've full noticed. of rhetoric. Um, uh, how long should people expect to queue at this um, at this election? Mm. I noticed in the past you've said about 15 minutes is the extent of people's patience. Mm. Several yeah. answers to that question, Senator. One of those is sadly um, for some Australians, 15 minutes is at the outer level of their uh, <laughs> tolerance, and uh, and I understand that Australians don't have a love affair with queuing, and our aim is to make that as smooth as possible. Uh, I, I would point out that unlike a lot of other uh, electoral systems, we don't know where people are going to turn up to vote. We have to predict where citizens vote. Many other overseas voting systems, your name is on the door at one spot. You, you must vote in that booth. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's very different. So we have to we predict. We do pretty well. Uh, I think our assessment was in the 2019 election, and I'll correct my evidence if I'm wrong, but we got 75% of people through in 15 minutes or under, which, which is an amazing result. And if you look at what occurs overseas, and again, I don't want to criticise any jurisdiction, but um, a couple of the elections we saw over the last couple of years, some people were waiting, allegedly, for up to 10 hours to vote. Uh, it's an extraordinary figure. And we do very well internationally. Is that, are you talking the a COVID election or? Uh, uh, pre, well, pre in, well, in fact, Senator, there are overseas jurisdictions even without COVID that, that hit that uh, mark. So with COVID, it becomes even more complex, of course, because if people are wearing masks, um, even if you go to the coffee shop and put an order in for a coffee when you're wearing a mask, it can be misunderstood. We're doing a very detailed piece of work of marking somebody off the roll. Uh, one of the things that we are doing <coughs> when we speak publicly about this is reminding people that we do very well internationally, uh, that the people in the polling place are not permanent AEC employees. They're effectively members of the community. Uh, your mother, father, brother, sister, and in many cases, your grandmother and your grandfather. And we're asking for people to be patient and treat those individuals with respect. We think queuing will be managed well. I think I've managed, uh, mentioned here previously, Senator, that since the 2016 election, we've been working with a Victorian university, Deakin University, uh, to assist us manage queues, uh, to understand queue behaviour, how we can ensure that people have a pleasant experience in the polling place, um, a positive experience at least, and that's something we continue to do. We're working with Deakin University right now. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I will tell people that I think that the process will be smooth, safe, uh, and relatively swift. Yep. Now, will there be any police presence organised by you at um, polling booths? Um, Senator, I'm, I'm conscious I'm giving you very lengthy answers to these very no, simple questions. No. But, no. I think the electorate want to hear it. Uh, we're really conscious of uh, the environment in which this election's being delivered and the international environment. And we want to make sure that uh, as I said before, the election is a positive experience. We're very conscious of the security of the vote and the security of voters. So um, over the last two weeks, uh, we, the Deputy and I have met with the uh, Federal Police Commissioner twice. Um, last week, we addressed all the police commissioners uh, online uh, and we are coordinating our efforts with them and I have also mentioned previously that this will be the first election at which we have a proper command and control centre. It will also be the first election where we have uh, an AFP officer permanently located in that command and control centre during the election. And that will assist us respond very swiftly to any incidents that might occur. We're very conscious of that. And we uh, think we're doing about as much as we can do to make sure that we are responsive to that. Now, were we to have a police presence at the polls, that would be a fundamentally different election from the one that Australians are used to. Uh, and we're taking risk advice uh, from uh, security agencies and we're uh, implementing that advice. And again, we're confident with the measures that we've got in place, it will be a safe and secure event. I'm sure if that was a yes or a no answer. It was more no than yes. 
I take it, it. It's a no with a context, <coughs> Senator, about why that might be. Yeah, OK. Um, now, you sort of touched on this in your um, explanation as to discussions with the, the states, but um, you've previously said you were hoping for a uniform approach across the country, if that's possible. Um, and, you know, you were talking with the states about that, um, particularly to reduce um, training costs. Mm. Um, how far have you got with that uniformity? Uh, well, there's, there's two issues there, Senator. One is the uni uniformity of the federal election and the way that we're conducting that, you know, within the states. There will be differences potentially at this election given each state has its own COVID health orders and we, we're apply we are complying with those COVID measures. The bigger picture that you are talking about there is uh, uniformity of approach with the state electoral commissions in particular with uh, training and a range of other issues. Uh, I sit as part of a body called the Electoral Council of Australia and New Zealand, which is all the commissioners of the states in New Zealand. We work on a range of projects and we do try and standardise where we, where we can. Um, there's always a project on foot where we're trying to look at something like that, either common equipment or more common training. Um, it's in our great federation, Senator, sometimes not <coughs> as easy as it sounds, and we're working as much as we can uh, towards that. In the long term, uh, I would think it would be far more efficient if we had a common curriculum uh, with all the state electoral commissions, or at least partially common. I, I think that is on the long term work priority for the, the electoral council. We'll get there at a point in time. Yeah, but I suppose really what I'm saying. Um, in the more immediate, um, well, you know, three months basically, mm. um, are you going to get the states to adopt? Right. Yeah, we, we have a uniform <coughs> training approach, Senator. Sorry, internally, absolutely. We've done more work, I think, on training over the last five years than pretty much any other area of our development. We have a better training, better procedures, and common training and procedures around Australia. Uh, you will find a little difference if you were being trained as a temporary member of staff in Queensland from if you were in Adelaide, uh, and that's something we're very proud of. Um, and in fact, the deputy might just care to uh, enlighten us a bit more on that. Senator, in addition to the national training we've been undertaking, which has continued virtually during, during COVID, um, we have national standard operating procedures, national policies, and we undertake rehearsals nationally to practice and rehearse the implementation of the training and the standard operating procedures. So absolutely, we're driving a centrally led, nationally consistent election across all of the states. As the Commissioner said, the only thing that may impact on some elements of our operational delivery is compliance with each state and territory yeah, health order. That's really the nub of what I'm trying to get mm. to there. Have, have you? manage to achieve that or will, will we find on election day that there'll be differences from state to state depending on well, you know, what? Well, Senator, look, from our staff, uh, from our staff perspective, I'm absolutely confident through the training, the procedures, the rehearsals, there'll be national consistency. Right. However, right. we're going to have nearly 8,000 polling places, so we've got 8,000 officers in charge. They have nationally consistent training, there's only one there is only one source of training for those staff, uh, and they will all go through that training process. Different modules depend on what their role will be within polling places. However, uh, how some people interpret that training yeah, no, and I'm not, apply I'm not really getting to that point. I'm, I'm really getting to, um, will the states impose on, yeah. on this election different, different rules to, um, Depending on which state uh, you're in, and uh, you know if you have if you have trained your staff in a nationally consistent mm. way, but mm. South Australia says, well, look, we don't, you know, you're not going to be able to do that, do it that way. Um, Senator, well, I, I understand the question. So we, that's why one of the reasons we're working so closely with health yep. and security yep. officials in each of those states. Um, I think <laughs> it will be my statement at the moment would be broadly consistent. When you turn up to a polling place at the moment, you're going to see the sorts of things that you would see if you went to a venue in one of the states. There'll be masks, social distancing, QR codes, the range of other measures. So that bit will be broadly consistent. Uh, of course, what I can't predict is if something occurs and one of the states decides to 
implement something that we've then got to adapt as part of our model. Uh, at this stage, I'm expecting it will be broadly consistent around Australia, um, and we're confident of that. OK. You mentioned masks, so um, voters will have to wear a mask? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And what about your staff? Yes. They'll also be... Yeah, yeah. Will you be supplying those masks? Yes, we will. Uh, and we believe we've secured adequate stocks of uh, PPE to be able to do that. But, uh, just to be clear, we're not going to be providing voters uh, with masks. That's a slightly different thing. Our expectation is that people would turn up with masks for that. And if you turn up without a mask, what's going to happen to you? Uh, well, um, we will have a supply, but we are also telling people before they come in one of Australia's largest public awareness campaigns what the requirements are. And given we've been living with the virus for two years and people need a, a mask for a whole range of things, we think that's not an unreasonable uh, approach. Um, Senator Farrell, Senator O'Sullivan just has a follow-up question on this matter. Would he like to ask it? Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence, Senator. So, uh, what about, so in Western Australia, right now, you can't even go to a drive through bottle shop without having a vac uh, vaccination certificate. Uh, what if, uh, what if a state wants to require people to have a vaccination without going to a polling booth? Yep. Uh, good question. Thanks, Senator. Uh, so what we have said is there is no requirement for you to be vaccinated uh, to attend a, a polling place. So we have mandated that uh, our staff, the temporary staff, if you wish to work for us, you'll need to be vaccinated. So that's something we've mandated for our staff, but we're not doing that uh, for citizens. Um, I know that the health orders are varying and we'll have to take account of that, but we are working our way to, through talking to each of the state health authorities. We're confident we'll have a solution in place. Um, if there is some sort of blanket order, and I won't, please let me not pick on Western Australia, let us say a state uh, did a particular thing, we'll work around that at that point in time. We're looking at a range of different scenarios. But to be very clear, uh, because this is also a, um, a bit of misinformation that's been popping on our Twitter feed over the last few days, we will not be mandating vaccination status for anyone voting. Uh, that, uh, okay, and can a state, can a state jurisdiction impose that? I'd have to weigh that, Senator. Uh, state, I hope they wouldn't. Well, I would, I would dearly hope they wouldn't as well, um, because that would be interfering with the, you know, with the voting process. And again, that's one of the reasons why we're spending so much time working with state and Commonwealth health officials. Uh, and security officials, and we've got a good relationship with them. So I'm hoping that wouldn't be the case. Uh, if it is, we'll have advance notice in any case because of our relationships, and we'll be working through a solution uh, for that. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator O'Farrell, I will... Uh, Senator Farrell, I've put you Senator O'Farrell, more than just tonight, my apologies. Um, Senator Farrell, I do want to pass the call around because I recognise that, particularly given our proximity to an election, there's a lot of interest in the AEC this evening. Would you like to take the call back for a couple of minutes or are you happy for me to move it on to other Look, senators I, I and I just had a few more questions on this topic and if I can Go for complete the, let's those. Do that then. Great. They, um, Thank you. The Commissioner has been giving a very thorough explanation and I think the um, electorate would appreciate that. Um, just a quick question on uh, contingency plans. If um, an early voting centre or a counting centre is declared a COVID hotspot, um, will you still be able to retrieve the ballots and count them? Uh, yes, we're very confident with that, Senator. And I will just ask the National Election Manager to opine very briefly on that. Um, Kath Gleeson, uh, Acting National Election Manager. Uh, Senator, the question was, if an early voting centre was to close, could we... No, no, the no, question if was, if, um, well, potentially close, um, if an early voting centre or a counting centre is declared a COVID hotspot, will you still be able to retrieve the ballots and count them? Of course. Uh, so the short answer to that, Senator, is yes. So um, as the Commissioner has indicated, we're working extremely closely with the various jurisdictions. Uh, hotspot uh, uh, constructs differ in the various jurisdictions but some of the engagement we've had goes to the nub of those very issues and there's contingency plans in place should we need to uh, 
suspend polling, for instance, that we would retrieve votes, take them to the count centres uh, in the division and arrange for counting of those votes. So, absolutely. I might also point out, Senator, that um, very helpfully we've been allocated a pandemic advisor. You might just talk about that briefly. Yes. So we've been supported by a pandemic advisor, Dr Kath Kelleher, at the Department of Health. Uh, Dr. No. Uh, Dr. Catherine Kelleher at the Department of Health. She's been extremely helpful um, giving us advice on implementation uh, of various measures. And uh, her, her advice has been extremely useful in, um, in also engaging with the chief health officers and their officials in their various jurisdictions. All right, thank you. Um, anything else you want to tell us on that? No, Senator. No? Um, <laughs> we could be here all night. <laughs> other, other than on, on that she's topic very confident that we are going to be delivering a very safe uh, and secure election and that people should feel safe to walk into polling places and vote. Absolutely. That's what yeah, you meant to say. There was something else yes. that had to be said. Um, now, Commissioner, when uh, we last met, you mentioned uh, that you'd had uh, a couple of hundred thousands expressions of interest of staff. Mm -hmm. Um, this follows the last estimate session where you estimated there'd be around 100,000 uh, polling staff engaged. How does the level of interest compare with previous elections? Mm. Good question, Sam. Yes, uh, Senator, I'd be um, happy to take that. We've been really impressed. Um, our uh, polling staff are a dedicated bunch. Um, we have a pretty healthy register of interest and uh, we've been engaging with them throughout the electoral cycle. Uh, we have more expressions of interest than positions, which is a good place to be. And we are certainly working on the assumption that um, there may be furloughing of staff required. So we've built in a buffer um, of positions uh, so we know that we'll have enough on the day. We are still actively um, advertising uh, through our social media channels for people to register their interest to work with us. Uh, so we're, we're always working to, to build those um, expressions of interest so we have a really healthy pool to draw from. But I'm confident we'll have, um, we'll have all the people we need. I know you know this, Senator, but the, the management of that, the recruitment, the training, the selection and the character clearing of a proportion of those is a hugely complex process. And it's not necessarily stable. People pop on and then they fall off for various reasons and then, you know, even close to the day something happens, they can't come and we're expecting with COVID that will be more the case. So um, the more people we can get, the easier it will be for us to manage that uh, quite lumpy process as we work towards the polling day. Has the uh, Omicron outbreak uh, changed the number of staff you think that you'll need on the polling booth? Uh, so, um, Senator, We've been, uh, we have a dedicated unit, our COVID variance response unit, who have been doing progressive modelling based on the variant uh, that we're dealing with at the time. Omicron has certainly shifted the landscape uh, slightly and we're building in higher rates of furloughing into, um, into our staffing models. So the short answer is yes, we're, we're making sure we have a greater buffer of, of staff um, for polling locations and counting as well. All right, and my last question on this uh, topic is, um, I think, in the past, um, Commissioner, you've indicated this is going to be Australia's most expensive mm. election and you're talking a figure of around $400 million to conduct the election. Um, the, um, the government actually doesn't have to hold an election for the House of Representatives until much later in the year. Um, I won't go through the formula that you go through, but it could be as late as uh, September, October. Uh, but of course, there has to be a Senate election uh, and the writs returned by the 30th of, um, 30th of June. Um, if the government was to split the election, which is an option that the Prime Minister does have, how much extra would that add to the cost of elections this year? Would that simply double the cost or would there be mm. some other calculation? Uh, I, I'm very nervous about even talking about that. Um, Senator, lest I contribute to the debate on that issue, but um, there would be, if that were the case, it wouldn't just be a doubling or a halving. There are a number of things we'd have to look at uh, about how we did that. But, you know, I'm presuming that some of the elements of that would be exactly the same. We'd still need to write um, to every household. We still need to contract those polling places. We'd, 
um, still have the supply chain issues that we've got, so it would it wouldn't be half the cost, you know, spread over that period of time. Thank you. Senator Farrell. Uh, Senator Mirabella, you have the call. Okay. Excuse me. May I compliment you on your tie? Thank you, Senator. I've been mulling what to call it, and I think I'll call it AEC Imperial. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you, speak to you, uh, and ask you a few questions um, relating to reports arising from the member for Warringah's donation disclosures, including the member's appearance on a Radio National breakfast show this morning. Um, are you aware of these reports? Uh, I'm broadly aware. Broadly. For, for the record, I didn't listen to the Radio okay. National report this morning. I'm aware of the sort of broad reporting that's uh, okay. Um And to provide context for, for the committee, the interview concerned the compliance review of a company called Warringah Independent Limited, uh, which I believe is a company limited by guarantee, which is uh, um, an entity to be donated to uh, for, the, for the purpose of spending money by the, the member for Warringah. Um, and specifically relating to a $100,000 donation to it by one John Kinghorn, uh, apparently ostensibly split uh, to reduce the possibility of scrutiny. While, of course, every member of parliament is responsible for the donations they receive, would it also be correct to say that a disclosure entity's financial controller, this is a company, uh, an officer of the company, and in this case one Damien Hodgkinson, uh, would also have some distinct responsibility for disclosures of that entity? Um, so, uh, Senator, just given this was raised you know, today and I think it was today, not yesterday, that it emerged. Well, it's, yeah, yep. it's been going for a couple of days. Yep. Uh, I'm not uh, aware of that level of detail. I'm aware in the broad. Uh, in terms of the question you're asking about the duties of the registered officer, um, I might just ask uh, Ms Reid to step forward for a moment. And, and I might just preface the remarks. I just might talk in the broad rather than the specific that's fine. for a moment. Yeah, that's fine. Joanne Reid, Assistant Commissioner, Disclosure, Assurance and Engagement Branch. Uh, so the financial controller does have liability under the Electoral Act for lodging the return and making okay. accurate disclosures in the return. OK, well, it's very clear then. Um, now, uh, I see that Mr Hodgkinson, uh, who the member for Warringah asserted today, no, no longer works with her from an accounting point of view, um, was the listed financial controller for the 20... 18, 19 return. Under the Act as it was then, was this individual therefore responsible for the failure to disclose the donation in question? And I think you've already answered that question, so I'll just keep moving. I also note that subsequent to recent reforms by the government, uh, we've seen Mr Holmes at Court's Climate 200 entity now register as a significant third party and a number of the voices uh, campaigns now registered with the AEC as associated entities, is that correct? Yes, uh, and there's been um, a fair bit of uh, reporting on this, Senator, over the last uh, few months. Um, so I might just start off, I'm broadly aware of the voices of, voices for and a range of other movements. Um, we have uh, our team have contacted pretty much all of those entities uh, and we're observing exactly what uh, they're doing. Um, we've reached out and told them what their uh, obligations may be and they're assessing those obligations. In some cases, they've then registered as either associated entities or significant third parties. I think we're in contact with others at the moment that are going down that path. Um, and then some other entities have, uh, of those entities have said that they are not their own self-assessment is that they do not fall into the, to that category, and that may well be the case. Um, and we are continuing to observe uh, their activities. At, at this stage, uh, we haven't seen, or I haven't seen any breach of the Electoral Act, uh, unless Ms Reid has no, a different That's view. correct, Commissioner. 
From the AC's Transparency Register, uh, I can see that Mr Hodgkinson remains the listed financial controller for a number of Voices candidates, uh, donor companies, including Allegra Spenders, Wentworth Independence Limited, Monique Ryan's Kuyong Independent Limited, and Kim Rubenstein's Kim for Canberra Limited. Mr Hodgkinson is a busy man. From the same AEC, AEC register, he's also listed as the financial controller for Climate 200. And, and he's also a director of Climate 200, according to their website. Commissioner, other than those entities that I've just mentioned, and other than Australia's existing political parties, are you aware of any other existing entities that share a financial controller, either Mr Hodgkinson or anybody else? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator, just given the large number of entities. I think yeah. there's over 200 entities uh, at the moment registered, um, something like 64 political parties in addition. So I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I can take that on notice. Please do. Yeah. Okay. Um, so <laughs> given all these connections that we can now see, sharing the same financial controller, so that's one individual, across multiple candidates, multiple fundraising vehicles and associated third parties entities, uh, it looks and sounds a, a bit like a political party or to put it another way, an elaborate attempt to not look like a political party. Would you agree that collectively that would be the appearance? Mm. I, I'd really have to think my way through that, Senator, with the information you've given me this evening. I mean, there is no law, uh, let me reframe that, I don't think there's an identified breach of the Electoral Act from someone being a financial controller of multiple parties. It's not, it's not part of the scheme of the Act. Um, whether or not, as you're indicating, in that specific case, it would indicate that it, it looks and feels like a political party, I'd have to think about that okay. and, and, come, and come back to you. I wasn't going to go there. Um, all right, I'd like to move on to some questions about the recent reforms that I referred to earlier. Um, resulting from the government's electoral legislation amendment uh, 20, 2021. There was a Sydney Morning Herald article on the 3rd of February, a couple of weeks ago, not even, which revealed that Climate 200, which as I've already pointed out, is now uh, registered as a third party entity, received $304,000 in anonymous donations from an entity called Climate Outcomes Foundation. At the time of receiving these funds, Climate 200 uh, was a donor, as distinct from a, a significant third party. So I, it's prior to the amendments. Is that correct? Uh, that's probably correct, Senator. Again, I, you know, I don't have the information in front of me. What I would point out, as, as you are indicating in the broad, there's been a significant number of changes to the, that part of the Electoral Act. It's been a very fertile area for Parliament over the last couple of years, um, and it is complex. So it always worries me talking ex tempore about this issue, lest I say something that may reflect the previous Act rather than the current. Um, but we're very aware of those changes and um, I'm broadly aware of the Climate Outcome uh, Foundation. I think uh, from memory, as you've pointed out, they had, uh, they're on record as donating to Climate 200. I think yes. also they sought deregistration from ASIC or something. Well, comes to that. Yes. Yeah, but, okay. yeah. You're yep. stealing my thunder. All right, so as I said, prior to the recent amendments, uh, is it correct that the Climate Outcomes Foundation entity had no obligations to disclose its sources of income or funds, so long as it did not specify how it intended Climate 200 to use those funds, or, or alternatively, the intended ultimate recipient of those funds? So at that time? At that time, I think you're correct, Senator. Yeah. Right. Does this also mean Climate Outcomes Foundation would not have had to comply with foreign donation laws for funds given to Climate 200 at that time? Um, to, to be accurate, I would phrase it as they had no obligation at that time. Right. OK. Uh, again, if I'm wrong with that, Ms Reid, or even my Chief Legal Officer might correct me, but I think I'm accurate with that. All right. Is it possible that any of the Voices candidates backed by Climate 200 could have received foreign donations in this way at that time and we wouldn't know about it. I'm not saying it happened, I'm saying, is it possible? Um, Senator, we're in the realms of the hypothetical here with that one, and I think um, I would prefer not to comment because I, I don't have the information in front of me. 
Um, again, I try not to talk in hypotheticals here because it, it also means that we enter into the realm of commenting on a, a current political issue. Um, and so I, I, what I'd say is that I'm broadly aware of the issue. Um, they did not Climate Outcomes Foundation, I think that's the name of the, uh, did not have an obligation at that point. All right. Well, Climate 200 is now uh, registered as a significant third party and the government's recent reforms mean that the Climate Outcomes Foundation entity could now be deemed as an associated entity of a significant third party. Would you agree? Yes, I think that's correct. Okay. So, considering this Climate Outcomes Foundation entity appears to have the sole purpose of providing funds to Climate 200, can you confirm that they would now be required to register with the AEC as well as to adhere to foreign donation and laws and transparency standards if their dominant purpose is to funnel money? Yes or no? Um, well, we're now heading into territory that I'm not quite uh, aware of what their dominant purpose is. Uh, but if it were? Right. Again, it's a hypothetical, Senator. I'm yep. sorry it's not helpful for you, but um, I, because I don't know what their dominant purpose is, I do know that they are likely to have an obligation under the Act. Um, Ms Reid, I don't know whether you can... Yes, that's correct. As the Act stands for the definition of an associated entity, okay. um, if that was their dominant purpose. If that were the dominant purpose. All right. Do you think it's completely coincidental then, Commissioner, that the Climate Outcomes Foundation uh, cancelled their ABN at the start of this month? That's on the 4th of February, shortly after the government's reforms passed in December last year. Uh, I have drawn no inference from okay. that. All right. Well, considering everything I've just related, you've got one or two people, uh, registered entities under ASIC, yeah. with company officers, controlling various entities, channelling money ultimately to political candidates. Would you agree? that these entities and these arrangements were in all likelihood a deliberate mechanism, and I'm not saying illegal, but a deliberate mechanism to obscure the source of political donations? No, I wouldn't say that, Senator, but I'm not saying yes or no. It's just because you're presenting a piece of information this evening that I'm not going to opine on without looking at the detail of that right. um, in far more detail before making some sort of public comment on it. All right. Thank you. I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Mirabella. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks. Hello. I'm going to ask my questions in two chunks because I've got to run to another committee before nine, so forgive me. Um, I'll start off uh, with previously on a similar theme. We've previously spoken about oversight of associated entities like Kuyong 200, and you've advised that there are no options to interrogate data outside the audit process. In 2020-21, the Kuyong 200 Club associated entity uh, return, which I've uh, got a copy of here if you need, declares income of $1,095,387, but provides literally no detail at all about the source of that income, none whatsoever. Is that consistent with the disclosure rules? Um, so, Senator, let me start out by saying, uh, again, this is going to sound remarkably unhelpful, but there are 200 associated entities, there are over 60 political parties, so the detail of that particular one I don't have. Uh, to hand. Would I, I know you could, I tabled? you could give it to me, which would be great, but there's, yes. it is such a, as in you don't need to, Senator, but it, oh. it's such a complex area um, that I'm, I worry about talking about these things ex tempore without actually having some time to examine the yes. issue. Um, I might ask uh, perhaps um, our Chief Legal Officer to step forward for a moment uh, as we talk in the broad about those obligations. Thank you. So my first question was, is that consistent with disclosure? And, you know, potentially all donations could be below the disclosure threshold, but how would you know without, without the detail? So. Yeah, Andrew Johnson, Chief Legal Officer. That's exactly right, Senator, yeah. in, in, in knowing that detail. OK, so it's not, it's not knowable. OK. Um, is the total absence of information enough to trigger a compliance investigation? Um, I think we've said to this committee previously, Senator, that we have a range of criteria that we use to select entities for those compliance reviews. I think at the moment we've got about 30 on foot mm -hmm. uh, and we've deliberately, for obvious reasons, not published the selection criteria for those okay. the entities. But, Senator, 
we could have a discussion and sort of work it out, but one of the issues, one of the factors, and I've said this previously, it's the one I'm happy to talk about, is materiality. So the size of the uh, transactions is something that we're attracted to um, as we try and use our scarce resources to do those compliance Yes, reviews. and would you consider the um, just shy of 1.1 million to be a material amount? Um, well, I, you know, that depends on one's interpretation, Senator, and again, I just, because I'm deliberately avoiding talking about the exact criteria uh, for those compliance reviews, yes. materiality is a, is a factor, is and we examine materiality. Okay. Um, how can the public find out where the money to Kuyong 200 has come from? Uh, if you're talking about donations below the threshold, and as you've said, these are uh, anonymous donations, then it's not possible, unless the Chief Legal Officer is going to correct me on it. Uh, no, to, to add to the Electoral Commissioner, this, this is level, I think we've talked about this in previous mm. estimates, this is the level of how far the Electoral Act goes back through the process, and then what resources we have to, to, to follow through gifts to donors, to mm. associated entities, to candidates or mm. parties. Um, so the Electoral Act doesn't go beyond that associated entity. Okay. So is there any way for the public to find out where that money to Kuyong 200 came from? Not through the Electoral Act. And Senator, I've, you know, to declare I've never looked at the Kuyong, whether they've got a website, whether they talk about the purposes of their foundation or the source of their money, I, I'm not sure. Maybe there's a website where they do that, but not through the Electoral Act. It's not possible. Mm. Mm. Except if you did a compliance investigation. And look which, may, which may well occur, as she knows. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, the National Party return doesn't include a donation from Philip Morris, the tobacco company, but the Philip Morris donor return states that the company donated 55000 to the National Party. Um, and in fact, the donation was to Laneway Assets Proprietary Limited, who then passed the money on to the National Party. So donors themselves uh, clearly consider that the donation to the fundraising body is a donation to the party. Um, given that discrepancy, is the AEC exploring ways to make the disclosure data more transparent regarding the relationship between fundraising bodies and political parties? Mm. Um, I might ask Ms Reid to come up, but I might just perhaps talk generally about that for a minute. It's, it's not completely unusual for there be, to be a discrepancy between a donor return and the body to which that donor return uh, applies can just be a misunderstanding in some cases, and all parties have had this, and I mean all parties mm. across the board. It can be that um, because of the party structure where some parties have state branches and other entities that there's a confusion about which entity received the donation. Um, sometimes there can be a thing called donation splitting which can cause some confusion. Mm. Uh, and when we do the initial checks, when people submit returns, we quite often pick those things up, we clear it and we clarify those matters. Sometimes it can be difficult to track back. Mm. Um, Having said that, and I'll ask Ms Reid to talk on that in a moment, I did want to point out that at the start of 2019, we put the transparency register online, um, and that is the most searchable database of information regarding uh, all sorts of returns that we've ever had. Now, of course, Senator, what people would say is, well, I, you know, I don't like the, the, the Act and, and what the Act stands for. But what I'm saying is the way that we are within that Act, the way that we're providing that information is already uh, searchable and transparent within the bounds of the Electoral Act. Yes. So having said that, I might just ask Ms Reid to talk about Thanks, very quickly about... Thanks, Commissioner. You stole donors. most of my thunder, I think. As the Commissioner said, uh, when the returns come in, we do a discrepancy analysis mm -hmm. between all the returns. So our system will match donors named and donors um, from donor and political party returns. Mm -hmm. So there's a big process our team undergoes where we correspond with both sides if there's mm -hmm. a discrepancy to try and work out who has it right or wrong, and amendments mm -hmm. are lodged if necessary. As the Commissioner said, sometimes there can be differing views where under the Electoral Act it may not be a gift, but for whatever reason the donor wants to declare it as a gift if it's attending one of those fundraising events where they paid a ticket for something. So that can occur and be a reason why there remains discrepancies on the record. Okay, so my question was, are you looking at ways to make it more transparent and you're saying you've got internal processes where you yes. do a comparison and then you know seek to correct any inaccuracies correct okay um is there any thought being given to more guidance um being provided to parties and entities about how to record donations mm. we have a very active education campaign with parties and candidates we continue to do that we reach out we particularly reach out at election time 
Um, as you know, Senator, quite often uh, some of the issues uh, with compliance with the Act are caused by new candidates uh, who, you know, they don't have some of the resources that some of the major parties have. And so we try and spend as much time as we possibly can to make sure that people understand their obligations. Um, we've got a lot of material online uh, about exactly that. We have a number of handbooks. We provide briefings uh, to parties and candidates, and we continue to do that. And we're happy to enhance that at any time. It's in our interest as well to make sure that people understand what their obligations are. So we're already doing a lot. Uh, and always happy to review that, as we do on a regular basis, and okay. provide more information. Thank you. I've got lots more questions, but I'm going to ask to get the call a bit later, whilst I go to the other committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Waters. Um, looking in the direction of Labor Senator, the Senator Ayres. Yeah, Ayres has some questions. And then Thanks very right. much. I'm just Smith. struggling to find my glasses, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to see you, Mr Rogers. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I think at the last estimates, we did follow the Eden uh, Monero and Groom by-elections, and I think there was a discussion, I think, with Senator Farrell about you anticipating a higher number of postal votes mm. in future uh, future elections. Um, is that do you do you think that the the current uh, COVID case numbers are going to make that that you know presumably going to strengthen that trend? Mm. Uh, Senator, we do. Uh, I think the discussion we had was about the kind of the flip in the numbers yeah. that we saw with Groom and Eden Monaro, that previously there'd been this big increase in pre-poll, postals had been largely static. And then at Groom and Eden Monaro, we saw that reverse pre-poll went up a little bit and postal went up quite significantly. We're also seeing that in other electoral jurisdictions, not just in Australia, but globally. And we're looking at that and we're doing some modelling. So we think that there will be uh, an increase in postal votes at this election as a result of the um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. If you would indulge me, Senator, I would like to just yes, say slightly more on that. Yes, um, which is that uh, you know we'll have extended polling hours at pre-poll centres uh, for the full period of pre-poll. There'll be more availability of pre-poll within that period than there's ever been previously. We're working with health authorities around Australia to make sure that's a safe and secure environment. What I, what I would say to people is that postal voting is not the prime means of voting at the election. Yeah. And I'd urge people, if they can, to vote uh, either on the day as they're supposed to, or if they can't, there are other options. Option one, pre-poll. Option two, postal. Uh, there are a whole range of reasons for that. Um, the, the Australian election is supposed to be an in-person voting experience, so it's a community event, it's transparent. We're, we're running it in accordance with health orders so it will be safe and secure and people should feel safe to do that. So within the limits of those health orders, we're urging people um, to make sure they're adhering to their obligations by turning out to vote. And it's the, only those exceptions then uh, where postal voting occurs. The, the other fact uh, is that the more votes there are in envelopes, Senator, at the other end, it's going to make it difficult to achieve a yeah. result um, clearly on the night, particularly and potentially for some time afterwards. And, Everyone understands the reason for that. The community is sometimes confused by that. Why would that take so long? And it, it leads to some of the conspiracy theories that we've seen overseas. So we have designed a polling process in line with health authorities around Australia to be as safe as it can. And we're urging people to think about those um, options. No, thank you, um, Commissioner. I'm, I'm, I agree with you. There's something um, democratic about people doing something together. Um, not, notwithstanding that, um, I think you said at the last estimates that um, you hoped that in this election that you'd be able to get a better data feed from Australia Post to sort of manage. Mm. Um, has there been success in discussions with Australia Post about that and sort of and and the other aspects of, you know, ensuring that there's a reliable postal mm. service for the um, for the election. Um, and um, but it might be easier to answer these all at once. Is there have there been any discussions about prioritising um, postal votes above other um, above other posts to make sure that votes get in on time? It's a great question, Senator. And the short answer is yes. And I, again, I might ask your indulgence because course, I think it's important to the community uh, to understand that. I've met with the head of Australia Post twice uh, over the last few months, um, and we've uh, at a lower level. Our teams are working very closely together 
At this stage, it looks like we will be getting that data feed from Australia Post, as I understand it, into our command and control centre. That will really help us. Uh, Australia Post have been uh, very responsive to talking to us. As you know, it's not just us who wants to use Australia Post at election time, but political parties and there's a range of other uh, uh, entities that want to do that. They have assured us that they will be affording a priority to electoral mail. And uh, this is the bit, I might be putting words in their mouth, but I think they even restrict the number of commercial contracts they take during that period so they can yes. focus uh, on you know, the postal vote process. So uh, all of that's a positive, Senator, that we're very confident uh, we'll have a better data feed, we've got a better relationship with Australia Post than we've ever had before, which is great. And so it will sound odd when I say the next thing, which is, um, again, I'm, I'm conscious of the voting process, we've got pre-poll voting, we've got voting on the day, and I'd urge people to consider those options as part of their voting plan, uh, but I'm very confident with the work that we're doing with Australia Post. Uh, and the other thing, Senator, that you know is the vast majority of postal votes are returned to the AEC after polling day, yeah. uh, which creates you know, some, some issues with how quickly those results can be determined, particularly if there's a large number of close seats. So, um, information campaign that led up to the ballot to encourage people to vote on the day. Or, or pre-poll, if that's what... Or pre-poll, um, but I take it from your comments so far that you are concerned about... Um, you know, the count taking longer than the community would expect the count to take. That's correct. So I'm, I'm concerned about that bit, Senator. I'm also concerned about the nature of the Australian vote. As you said, it's supposed to be a community event. It's also supposed to be transparent. Uh, and we saw some of the conspiracy theories overseas, what happens when there was a large number of postal votes. And we're seeing some echoes of that already on our social media feed uh, with people worried about the postal vote. Now, it's a good process, it's solid. But again, I'm conscious of the nature of the Australian vote, and that's why I'm making these slightly quirky comments about how we would see that play out. No, I don't think it's quirky at all. Is there, is there, um, is there any doubt in your mind that you'll have a Senate vote counted by the time the new Senate takes effect? Um, oh, I'm not up this oh. time around. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about my colleagues, Commissioner. Uh, it, it's very nice of you to do that, uh, Senator. That's what people say. Mm. Yeah. Uh, look, Senator, we are very. <laughs> Sorry, Minister. Uh, we are very, very confident. Yeah. Uh, that we have uh, everything in place to be able to deal with that. I, I'm not sure, Senator, that uh, the community understands just how enormous that project is to uh, ensure that we've adequate, uh, accurately captured all the preferences. And just on that, at the last event, and again, I'll clean this evidence up in a minute, but. I think we had to process 15 million or so Senate ballot, ballot papers, but within that, in all of those counting centres, we had to capture 105 million preferences. Uh, it's in a very short period. It's under intense pressure and scrutiny. Uh, and the scrutiny is good, by the way. Again, having scrutineers there makes that a you know, public place. It is a mammoth project. Uh, it's why we say that the election really is one of Australia's largest peacetime logistic events. As ballot papers returned from everywhere all over the world back to those count centres to be processed, captured, for us to be able to return the writs uh, in time. Well, just on, back on postal voting, I, I didn't follow this perhaps as closely as I should have. Um, I saw there was some real controversy about what the New South Wales Electoral Commission did in terms of issuing postal votes uh, you know, automatically. Mm. Um, only in English um, uh, into at least one of the electorates where there's a very high proportion of non-English speaking background voters. Mm. Um, you got any reflections on mm. the lessons that have been learnt by the AEC from you know observing that process? Um, again, Senator, I'm sorry, this is a, it's going to be a slight... It does, it does, sorry, I might just supplement it. I mean, it, it, it is an encouragement to people, isn't it, to not turn up on the day? Yes. Yeah. So, that, as I understand it, I'll deal with a couple of those issues because, again, these are important messages. But um, as I understand it, their legislation was changed at the last, not the last minute, but late change to enable them to force issue ballot papers. And um, again, I, for the record, may I put on the record that our colleagues in the state and territory electoral commissions do an excellent job, and we work very closely with them. Uh, and the New South Wales. 
uh, electoral commissioner in particular does a great job as well. So let me yeah. put that on the record. Um, we don't have that ability, even if we wanted to, legislatively to do that. There is no ability for us under the legislation to force issue ballot papers um, as part of that. Uh, uh, sorry, we, we can issue ballot papers. Uh, to issue postal votes. As to part universally of issue them. Yes. yes. Yeah. The second issue, though, you've raised is an interesting one, and I did see some um, some coverage about the issue of uh, support for culturally and linguistically diverse communities and, and ballot papers. So to be very clear, we only print in Australia the ballot paper in English, and it would be impossible for us not to print the ballot papers in English. But we do provide a lot of support uh, in language around that. So, for example, we translate much of our um, material into something like 33 different non-Indigenous languages, something like 18 Indigenous languages. We have separate Indigenous uh, YouTube videos and Facebook pages. We work with uh, called media and also on that material uh, that we're sending out to uh, citizens, the, 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 the Householder Guide, which we send to every house in Australia, there'll be QR codes that take you directly to a series of images that tell you how to fill out a ballot paper and also where translation services are available for you as well. So there's a huge push for us to make sure we reach into that uh, group. Now, having said that, uh, out of interest, over the last few elections, um, the vast... The, there's a, a top ten list, Senator, of where most informality occurs. Mm. And up until 2019, uh, that top ten list was mostly in Western Sydney. Just That's the way it was. At the last election, I think the first time we've had two Victorian seats that entered into that top ten list. And we look at that. Uh, as part of what we're doing, and we try and provide additional support into those areas uh, to make sure that people are supported by those in-language in uh, resources. So uh, that's a long um, answer, but it's important, I think, for people to know that we really take it, we go the extra mile to make sure people are supported and can access the vote in a way that suits them. Yeah, it seems to me those issues are different if you do a universal posting out of, of postal votes that does... That does um, create an onus, I think, to grapple with those language issues. Um, any prospect of the uh, of the pre-poll period being extended? What would it take? Yep. Uh, so, as you're aware, there's a contingency bill that yes. uh, uh, gives the me, the commissioner, some powers to extend that postal vote period. It does require uh, a Commonwealth health order to be in place yes. for that to be activated. If that's not in place, it can't be activated. And from memory, I think I also have to liaise with the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister. Um, so uh, it's a you know, fairly high bar. We are doing modelling about that. But what we are doing, Senator, for the first time in our history is for the two-week period that is allowed, we'll be having extended hours uh, with many of those centres to enable people to get out at times that suit them. And again, that's part of that bit about telling people there are a number of options for them uh, at, at election time. OK, thanks, Commissioner. I think Senator Smith had some questions, Chair. Uh, yes, absolutely. Actually, only one or two just following on okay. um, from Senator Ayres. I, I think you've pretty much covered it. Um, but just in terms of the, the early voting question, mm. I mean, I appreciate that there's certain thresholds you'd have to meet for that to be changed. But what sort of circumstances would lead you to consider an extension of the, of the 12 days, mm. or which would require it? Um, Conscious I'm going to give another long answer here, Senator, but I, in essence, we are monitoring uh, the situation nationally. We're looking at uh, COVID data nationally. I think, as um, the National Election Manager mentioned before, we have established a COVID variance response unit, which is the internal team that are helping us put together our response to all of these issues. So we're looking at the data nationally to see caseload, vaccination rates, and a whole range of other things. So I don't want to talk about a particular state because then that becomes a headline and I'm not referring to any state in particular, but were something to occur in a particular state where there was a much higher caseload or some sort of issue like that and there was a Commonwealth health order in place, mm. we would look at those options at that point. Now, of course, if there is no Commonwealth health order, that power is moot because I just don't have it. There's nothing I could do. But within that two-week period that is there, we will. that's why we're offering those extended hours, including weekends, so that people can pop in and vote in a safe way. Can I, can I just add, Senator, in addition to the Commissioner's evidence, 
My understanding is that the contingency measures bill that was passed was not intended to give a blanket authority to extend all pre-poll all around Australia. There is a geographical element to that where the Commissioner's got to believe on reasonable grounds that it is a requirement. So it could be a requirement for a particular division or multiple divisions or a particular state. Uh, but I think unless there is a widespread new variant um, affecting all of Australia, it's sort of unlikely that it's going to meet the threshold. Right, so we could have a situation where a certain state had a longer pre-poll period where the rest had 12 days. Potentially. Potentially. But, but potentially, but we will be, as I said, working with the Leader of the Opposition, the Prime Minister, we'll be taking advice from health authorities, um, both Commonwealth and state, before we make that quite significant decision. Okay, so at this stage you're not anticipating that that pre-poll period would need to be extended or...? That's correct. Um, you've said previously that while you saw an increase in postal voting at the Eden Monero and Groom by-elections, you didn't see an equivalent increase in pre-poll voting? A, a little increase. So, and I was, ref I was reflecting back to the quite significant increases that had occurred in 2013, 16 and 19 federal elections where pre-poll voting had gone you know, through the roof. Um, now, I think from memory, the combined pre-poll and postal vote at the 2019 election was almost 40 per cent of the electorate. And I think of that 40 per cent, someone might correct me here, we were about 30 per cent pre-poll. Uh, in some, I forget the highest seat, Senator, where pre-poll was, we probably got that. 50%. It was almost 50 per cent pre-poll. So it's a huge increase. Then when Groom and Eden Monaro occurred, um, there was a little increase in pre-poll, but a rapid increase in postal. Now, Obviously, Groom and Ed Monaro occurred in, in the middle of the sort of early mm. part of the pandemic, and I think that might have influenced voter behaviour there as well. Right. So, what are you expecting in the upcoming election? Then, are you expecting trends more similar to 2019 or more similar to what we saw in the by-elections? Mm. Uh, Senator, we are modelling a range of different options. It's so difficult to predict that at the moment, mm. um, given where we are, given where we could be, uh, and when the election is, we're still potentially potentially a couple of months away. Obviously. Just for the record, we have no insight as to when that election might be. So there could be a vastly different set of circumstances in place then from now. We are preparing for a range of different scenarios uh, to ensure that we're able to cope with whatever occurs. Would you suspect the by-elections, though, would be a better indication or because they were during a peak? I think they were during the peak. Mm. And also Australians are now much more used to the sort of situation that existed at that point. It was a very novel situation at that point. I've got some data here, Senator, if you'd like it. Mm, absolutely, thank you. Um, so the Ian Monero by-election saw an increase in pre-poll from 36%, which was a uh, rate for the 2019 election, to 43% in the by-election. And then Groom saw an increase from 25%, which was a pre-poll rate in 2019, to 29% in the by-election. Not, not particularly consistent between those two seats, mm. is it? No, yeah. no. And, and there are different voting habits and behaviours in, in different geographical areas. Okay, thank you. I think Senator Farrell has a few more questions. Um, I was going to take a chunk here, if that's all right, um, and then I'll come back to Senator Farrell. I'm sorry, I missed that. I'll take the call and then I'll give oh, it back to you, if that's sure. all right, Senator Farrell. I'm just no trying worries. to share it around a little more, um, given the interest in this topic. Um, thank you very much, Mr Rogers. I have a couple of questions um, about the compliance review that the AEC conducted on Warringah Independent Limited, um, which I think my colleague Senator Mirabella briefly touched on um, earlier. Um, so my understanding is that that review um, examined, amongst other things, um, this $100,000 donation from um, the Kinghorn Family Trust, the, or sorry, J.A. Kinghorn and Company for the trust that wasn't disclosed. Is that correct? Um, so, uh, given, given the newness of this information in the sort of public domain, let me um, talk briefly about my That'd understanding. Be great. Yep, Thank great. you. Uh, as I understand it, uh, there was a $100,000 donation disclosed by the Warringah Independents. And um, I think uh, what occurred during a compliance review is that uh, the compliance team became aware that that $100,000, instead of being 
from several different individuals, which was what had been originally uh, put in the return, actually came as one cheque from one mm. foundation. And so the compliance review team formed the view that that was a single donation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, that was then uh, declared as a single donation and the donor then had an obligation to submit a return. I think that donor, I think you mentioned his name, Mr Kinghorn, mm -hmm. uh, then submitted a donor return for that $100,000 amount, I think in February, uh, I'm not sure, at a point last yeah. year, put it. And how was that $100,000 donation made to Warringah Independent Limited? Through, a, as I understand it, through a cheque. And that was signed by Mr Kinghorn? I'm not sure of the exact details of who signed that cheque. I'd have to take that on, on uh, notice, Senator, and come back to you on that. OK. Um, and so, as we've previously discussed, um, this Warringah Independent is the campaign support body um, for the member for Warringah. Um, I have a media release that she um, gave yesterday um, saying that all amounts received were disclosed in accordance with the requirements in November 2019. Is, is that an accurate assessment? I know that we're talking about two slightly different things here, one being the disclosures that have been undertaken by Warringah Independent, or three different things really, aren't we? What, what's been disclosed by Warringah Independent? What has been disclosed by anyone who might have donated to Warringah Independent? consistent with the conversation we were having earlier, and then what the member for Warringah might have disclosed on her candidate disclosure. So given that statement in Ms Stegall's media release, is it fair to say that everything has been disclosed as it should have been? So I don't have the benefit of having seen that media release, Senator, and I'm very conscious of that as I'm mm -hmm. um, uh, talking. I can table it if you like, no, Mr I'm Rogers. OK, okay. I'll come to that in the fullness of time, okay. Senator, with uh, other uh, information. So uh, my understanding, based on you know, a, a quick discussion today with my team, is that the compliance review team, as frequently happens, uh, made a finding about a particular that donation. It has since been declared. It has since been declared, sorry, and the donor has completed a donor return. So from our perspective, uh, unless you've got some additional information, the, the act has been satisfied because a declaration has been made um, mm. and uh, people are now aware of where that money came from. Sorry, you said that the donor has completed a return. When Do you know when Mr Kinghorn might have completed that return? I may, Senator, if you give me one moment. Thank you very much, Mr Rogers. Uh, excellent staff are looking that up at the moment. OK. I, I would like to hopefully know the answer to that question um, before we get to the end of this session. Um, Commissioner, can, can you confirm that Ms Stegall lodged a candidate return which listed every donation above the threshold except this $100,000 mm -hmm. donation? I, I, I can't, only because I don't have that level of detail in front of me, but I can take that one on notice, Senator. I'd have to go through that and look at that in, in okay. uh, little detail. Um, and again, and potentially you may have to take this one on notice as well, um, Mr Rogers, has Ms Degel made any attempt to update her candidate return given the Again, error? that I'm not aware of, given this is only just emerged, but I'll take that on notice and have a look at it. Thank you very much. Um, this Warringah Independent um, body, should they have lodged a 2020-2021 return with the Electoral Commission? Um, that I just have to check. I might get Ms Reid to come up. I think she's nodding yes, but I'll... She Nods loves, aren't very she good loves coming to the up. table anyway, so, <laughs> so I'll just uh, ask her to do that for a moment. Thank so, you, Ms. Reid. <laughs> no problem. So, uh, Warringah Independence, under the new legislation, has registered as an associated entity with the reforms that came in late last year. Mm -hmm. They are required to lodge a 2021 return. Uh, that return has been lodged, and we're just looking into some matters with that return before we publish it. OK. Um, sorry, I'm just working through my questions here. Um, so it, 
it's your understanding that they will lodge a return that they haven't done. I think so. I think what Ms. Reid said is they've lodged. Yeah. It is currently with us. And as we frequently do when returns come in, we spend some time going through those returns to make sure that we're satisfied that they're accurate. Yes. And that's a process that we're going through at the moment. And then it yeah. will be published on the Transparency Register. Okay. Uh, I mean, that was similar to the work that we were discussing earlier on about making sure that... It's accurate. Um, exactly, donation. exactly. Yeah. And look, in a situation where, um, as has been canvassed in the media, there are obviously some questions that are being asked around this $100,000 donation that was made. Um, I think it would be good to check that everything is above board. <laughs> is it usual to see a donation come in in the form of a cheque that is then subsequently split up into smaller donations when they're declared? Look, maybe I might, um, Senator, take a slightly different uh, tack to answer that, and Ms Reid can correct me, but uh, nothing is unusual, Senator, when it comes to... Um, funding and disclosure, there are a whole range of ways in which people um, donate, make donations, record those donations um, from cheque through to you know, bank deposits and a range of other issues. Um, and, and also, may I say, it's not necessarily unusual for our compliance team to find uh, technical issues with uh, those submissions and all parties uh, across the board are given a chance to amend their returns if we, the compliance team finds something's wrong, something is wrong. Uh, because the, the very basis of the Act, Senator, is that uh, it's about achieving disclosure. So once disclosure has been achieved, and even if that's after return has mm -hmm. been put in, we think that the purposes of the Act has been met, mm -hmm. and so we afford the opportunity to parties across the board to make uh, amendments to those mm -hmm. returns after the compliance review mm -hmm. process. The end goal being that everyone just does the right thing, right? And then citizens can then look at that and make their own view of who donated that money and the purpose for that money. Yeah. And uh, I think the the important part that you just said was that ensuring that everyone is given a chance to amend their returns. And so if, um, I mean, any of us or um, anybody that might be donating to a political party became aware that there were errors in any of the returns that they had made, um, you would think that the first thing that they would do is ensure that everything had been undertaken appropriately and above board and, and made any updates to their returns as that might be necessary. Well, Senator, I mean, we love it, of course, when people are accurate on their returns. Uh, that makes us very happy. Yes, uh, and makes your job easier, I'm sure. Makes the job easier. But also, also ensures that... Um, citizens have a better view. Absolutely. Of that and we're we being do, transparent but with our We do adopt with all parties and candidates an educative approach, and that's what we've done right from the outset of the beginnings of this scheme, you know, way back lost in the mist of time, whenever that was. Uh, and so we always afford an opportunity to people to um, correct those returns, unless, of course, um, there are, in those very, very rare cases, that it is uh, either a deliberate attempt um, or it's a very material issue or, or indeed, there is a repeat pattern of behaviour uh, where mm. that occurs. And I, may I be very clear, I'm not saying that about this particular case, mm. just for the record, Indeed. but that's kind of the basis upon which we work. Okay. Um, and just one last question for me. How many pencils did you say you were going to obtain for the for election day? 4.5 million, million, Senator Farrell. What are we going to do with them after election day? Well, they become very blunt for a start, Senator, yeah. after <laughs> people have been furiously voting. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, look, we... I don't know if anyone's furiously voted. Well, we'd, probably, we'd, you'd be very surprised, Senator. Um, look, we, we do a range of things with the equipment. For example, with some of the cardboard equipment we use, we donate some of that to the schools uh, in which the voting occurs because some of those schools like using that equipment to actually run their own elections. Yes, yeah. I did that when I was at school. Great. And, in fact, it gives me an opportunity, Senator, to also make a, a comment about our cardboard equipment, if I might, because um, for this election, for the first time in history, it is unmarked cardboard equipment. Now, if you remember when you walk into the polling place, normally it's a, a covered white, white and with purple, purple. stripes, yes. So we have the first time we've decided to go completely unmarked cardboard which is far more recyclable. Mm. And not only that, it means we can share it more easily with other entities, including, we hope, state and territory electoral commissions. Oh, of course. So we're, we're hoping it represents better value for the taxpayer and better for the environment. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been a big project for us, and we're, we're very pleased with it. Reused. 
It is reused for electoral purposes. Uh, it won't be used between elections, Senator, because it degrades uh, in yeah. storage. And that's why Over we share it period. with schools and we recycle yeah. it and mm -hmm. do a range of things. But Senator, I might just add, we do, we do donate some materials, not just to schools, but also to disadvantaged communities, mm. indigenous communities, and we also sent some material into the Pacific Islands to some of our electoral body um, partners. So, for example, uh, Deputy might correct me here, but one of the things we did, we had medical kits, mm. first, not medical, first aid kits mm. in, in the polling places, and there's a shelf life for those. So mm. instead of them disposing of them, we shared those with a number of communities that mm. could actually use them, and mm. we try and get as much value out of this stuff as possible. Mm. Um, the bigger question of 4. Point, you know, 5 million pencils, um, well, um, maybe some of them might end up with a medal of several campaigns. We'll and, uh, They're only short. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Yeah. They're not long pencils, I do remember that. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Waters, you caught my eye more yeah. quickly. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a number of topics here that I want to try to cover really quickly because it's very late for all of us. Um, so starting off with the uh, significant third parties, how many organisations have registered as significant third parties since those changes to the Act uh, last year lowered the threshold for being considered a significant third party? Allow me to grab Miss Reid again to step forward. She may have that information. I think she should just stay at the table. <laughs> and, and again, as I say, she's so keen to stay here as well, Senator, so let's do that. If she does not have the precise information, Senator, we might have to take some that's of that on fine. notice and then we'll provide it If you've got it to hand, you. that's great. Sure. Significant third party. Obviously the new name for what was political campaigner. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Sir. I believe we have 10 that ten. have registered. Okay. Um, could you provide them on notice, just the names of those, if you're allowed to do that? Yes, they should be on our website. On your website. Um, okay, great. Sorry, Senator Waters, I, I just have to interrupt you for one minute. Um, I got overexcited thinking about the pencils um, and didn't get to update the committee that we are pushing through our tea break oh, uh, right. in an oh, effort God. to try and finish That's as correct. quickly as possible. So, um, sorry, Senator Waters, please continue. Thanks, Chair. Um, has the AEC made any additional, uh, sorry, made any assessment of the, of the additional costs in administering the expanded range of third parties that are now required to disclose? Uh, Hmm. Senator, we, uh, I mean, obviously the funding and disclosure area uh, does an enormous amount of work. The, we have received supplemental funding over the last couple of years for that, but I might just perhaps provide more information than you're asking for uh, at the moment. At the moment, it's a team of about 15 people uh, who are responsible for this entire process, including all the compliance reviews and other work that we do. Now, we are growing that team. Uh, and we hope to hit eventually between 25 to 30 people. But, uh, Senator, we've been struck with the same issues that everyone else has been struck with during the mm. pandemic of getting appropriately skilled staff for tracking them, retaining them, and, and we're working through that process at the moment. We're aware that there is a volume of work required here. Uh, the compliance reviews are complex and mm. chew through resources. The other work we do is difficult. Um, Minister, I'm not asking for additional resources. Just for the record, I'm just talking through. I noted the very wise uh, um, efficiencies around uh, printing before uh, Commissioner. So well, perfect. So Senator, we, we always assess what we're doing, but we have received, to be fair, some supplemental funding that's assisting us with that. Um, and we're confident that we can uh, make the inroads that we need okay. to make to administer the scheme. Okay. Is any additional support being provided to new third parties to understand their obligations? Uh, again, we are already providing an enormous amount of educated material to everybody. Uh, and I'm actually pretty proud of the work we do in that space. And if, and if I might say, Senator, if people would like additional support, uh, we're happy to provide that as well. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. Um, can I move now uh, back briefly to pandemic voting? We just yeah. had a bill brushed through the Senate last week, and it may well have passed the House today. I haven't had a chance to, um, to check. Uh, that allows voters who are required to isolate after the cutoff for postal votes to vote by phone. Um, is this something that the AEC has advocated for? Uh, Senator, we are very conscious there's a, um, a very limited category of people. Yes, I understand it will be small. And we think that that is an appropriate response to that uh, okay. category. So did, you, uh, did you ask for it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. But can I, can I just, uh, can I also say that that, that solution is absolutely designed as an emergency measure yes. for a very small number of people. I want to be on the record with that as well, that 
If people think that's going to become an alternative channel for voting and they just phone up and that's going to be great, it's not. The other thing I can guarantee you, Senator, is it will be a lumpy experience for those that have to use it. We've never done that before. Mm. Uh, it's a new measure that we're putting in place. It is mm. absolutely designed to cater for that very narrow group. Uh, there will be a number... Now, I don't know what the shape of the bill is at the moment, what amendments have been put mm. in, but it'll be very restricted. Uh, and, again, if it will only be for a group of people who are absolutely subject to a health order. I would ask people to think about the environment during the voting period and to plan their vote. Mm. Uh, and that means they've got two weeks of pre-poll and other mm. ways of voting. That mm. telephone voting method is brand new. It's something we're doing for this pandemic. It will not be smooth. I, I give you a guilt edge guarantee because it's an emergency measure. Yes. Uh, so I urge people to think about that. Yes. Yes. No, you've made that clear. Uh, what safeguards will be in place? I understand it's going to be a two-step process, which so I found reassuring. I'm not sure whether you're aware, Senator, but we have a model already in place that we use for blind and low vision voting. And at each election, maybe two or 3,000 people use that. Mm -hmm. And we, exactly as you've said, Senator, there's a two-step process where we give people a code, they then ring back with that code so it's anonymised. Yes. Uh, and then, again, to make sure it's safe on the other end, we always have two people recording the vote, so there can't be an accusation that one person has done something okay. with the vote. And it'll be something along those lines. We're working with a range of other agencies to assist us with that. In fact, uh, Mr Pope uh, met today with a range of other agencies to assist us uh, putting together that solution. OK, thank you. That sounds like you'll manage it to the best of your ability. Um, coming to the Senate count audit, in December last year, the Assurance of Senate Count Act got royal assent and that set up a process for auditing the Senate ballots. What work has the AC done to implement those changes and prepare for the audit of the upcoming election? Uh, we're well advanced on that, Senator. Uh, we, we're aware of what the requirements are. We're putting in place a range of measures. We're working with uh, other providers as well, and we're very confident that that will be exactly as the legislation demands. OK. Um, the software audit was deferred to 2023. What's the status of the AEC request for tender for scanning solutions? The software audit. I'm um, just trying to understand the question there, Senator. Is it the, is it the procurement of services to actually audit the software or is it procurement of the scanning services for the Senate, the Senate election after this election? Uh, I think it's the latter, but I'll take both. Right. <laughs> well, uh, the, we have a contract uh, for the scanning of the Senate solution, which we've got in place at the moment. Yes. Uh, and we just have to go through a procurement process as we do every few years as that contract That's comes right. about. And there. obviously don't want to do it at the moment, Senator, as we're in the middle of the election. Yes. So after the election, um, we'll be looking at that process. There is, that's right, there is an option for us to extend uh, the existing contract for uh, the scanning provider for 2025 mm -hmm. election. However, we've not yet made a decision, made a decision as to whether we will do that or whether we'll go to market after this election. Okay. We're just working through that right now. That sounds fair enough. And can I have the answer to the first? Uh, software audit. That's... Um, Senator, can I clarify the question? It was around the audit of the software used for the Senate scanning. Yes. So uh, it's uh, primarily about the time that is needed to undertake that audit appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a priority for the AEC to do that after, um, after the uh, upcoming federal election and have it done by 2023. OK, well, the terms of reference um, for the tender for the scanning solutions amended to take account of the audit requirement. Senator, we haven't gone to tender. So, but they will, yet. they will absolutely encompass those when we, when and if we go to tender yes. for that. Yep. Sorry, Senator, just to be clear, it's actually one of the reasons why we've had to delay any decision around going to market for a new provider mm -hmm. is because we've had to wait for the legislation to be passed through Parliament, consider the implications of that legislation and update our statement of requirements. So we're just doing, continuing to do that work now. Yes, obviously so, you've only had, what, not, not quite two months yet. Yes, yeah. but the, the answer to your question is yes. The statement of requirements, if we go to market and don't exercise the option, the statement of requirements will absolutely reflect the most recent legislative amendments for Senate assurance. OK, I might ask some more things on notice about the subtleties of that technology. 
Um, just on the changes, the multitude of changes that we've had to the Act, there's been 10 government bills proposing changes to the Act since September 2021, uh, which is quite the flurry. Uh, the interaction of those changes have got clear implications for you. Uh, were you consulted on all of those changes? Senator, there's a normal process in place for governments of all hues to liaise with affected departments, and that process was followed. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a so yes, you were consulted. Yeah, on and all we changes. are. Okay. Yeah, there's, and a, there's always a flurry of bills, particularly towards the latter part of electoral cycles. I think, Senator. Pretty big flurry, anyway. Big flurry, um, but we're, we're there. <laughs> Will the impact of the various changes have budget implications for the AEC? And have you requested additional funding to cover that? The if so. Budget process is actually part of the consultation process uh, for those bills, and we've been consulted uh, where oh, we I need see. to about about funding. Okay. For those and issues. So have you gotten more as a result? to deal um, with those changes? We think we're adequately funded at the moment. Uh, Senator, I'm just, I'm very cautious of... First agency I've heard say that. Well, Good I'm just you. cautious <laughs> of saying that. We've got the minister at the table and, it, you know, not many agencies. I would have thought it's the perfect time, but whatever. <laughs> well, but I'm trying to be a good corporate citizen, Senator, at the same time, and I'm aware of the, um, the fact that it's not just us, there are a whole range of other uh, agencies, but we have undergone a range of issues, including the funding review over the last few years, uh, which was a process undertaken with the Department of Finance through an independent uh, accounting firm, and the Deputy Commissioner was part of that team, and you might just talk about that for a moment. Yes, Senator. Look, our funding situation is, uh, is certainly adequate at this stage for the election. With respect to those bills, where there were identified financial implications, we received uh, funding to meet those implications. Okay. Um, so, and it was sufficient? Yes, there may well be a couple where we've been unable to identify the full cost and mm. we've put a marker there that we may well need to come back mm. after the election and reconcile the full cost because sometimes it's a little difficult to predict. So the yes. telephone voting one is a classic example yes. where that will determine uh, that will be determined largely by the volume of people mm. that call. Mm. Which you can't predict, Which obviously. is difficult to yeah. predict. And I, I don't want to be flippant about it, Senator, but if the minister did wake up one morning and was in a very generous mood and he threw us some extra resources, that would not go astray, but I, we, are, we are OK at the moment for the election. So. Well, you took your opportunity no. there. And I, I, and, and I think, Senator, the, the, the key point, is, uh, as the Commissioner and his team have acknowledged there, is that with each of those bills there is an assessment undertaken. Yes, that assessment has time. looked at cost yes, implications yes, and the AEC resourced accordingly. Uh, um, um, to reflect those policy decisions the government's taken and that the legislation, once it's passed, become an obligation for the AEC. Okay, thank you. I've only got two more um, lines of questioning that are nice and short. Um, just on remote voting, um, we've talked previously about the impediments to enrolment that already exist for regional communities, particularly in, say, the Northern Territory. Um, and I presume, um, well, is the AEC aware of how those barriers are being exacerbated by the pandemic, uh, in particular, um, by making it impossible for mobile voting to occur, especially in areas that have been declared by a security zone, so East Arnhem, um, West Arnhem, a whole range of other Western Daly Central Desert areas. Um, what are you doing in relation to that? Mm. Have you got any proposed uh, We're very solutions? aware of that, Senator. Just let me throw that on the table to start with. Uh, as you know, our remote area mobile polling teams cover an enormous uh, area at election time. I think at the mm. last election they covered something like 3.2 million square kilometres or something like that, and we went into communities as uh, one point with a community as small as 20 registered voters you know, to try and get the vote out. Mm. We're very proud of the offering we do up there, and we will indeed have the remote area mobile polling teams again uh, in location. So we're also working with health authorities in those remote areas and indeed land councils and others to make sure that we understand what those restrictions are uh, and to make sure that we can develop solutions that uh, meet the community needs. I'm also conscious that when those services are delivered, we might be in a very different situation from where we are now because we're talking potentially a couple of months away. We are working on a range of solutions, even for those communities where there are biosecurity orders in place mm -hmm. uh, to prevent uh, the sort of uh, remote area mobile team visits that we normally do. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr Gleeson might expand on that uh, a little more. Yes, so um, the Commissioner is uh, correct. We're engaging very closely with health authorities, uh, have had excellent um, support from the health authorities on this particular um, matter, and uh, engagement with land councils on, uh, where possible, getting, uh, I suppose, uh, generating confidence in our COVID safe measures in a way that 
uh, will enable us access even if there is a biosecurity oh, measure see. potentially in place. So that engagement has been uh, extremely positive uh, so far. Mm. Um, so we, we're really confident that we'll be able to provide a strong service as we always have to those communities and a slightly expanded service relative to, to previous events. Okay. Thank you, that's, that's positive news. Um, will you be seeking to extend the voter enrolment process right up until polling day so that voters in remote communities are able to participate? Um, that, uh, and this is something that we became aware of, I think. Uh, One of the flurry, of we things. had an inquiry into it. Yeah. Uh, so we won't be doing that, Senator, because it wouldn't be possible under the Electoral Act for us mm. to accept enrolments up to the day of uh, mm. voting, on the day of voting, and then for people to vote. So uh, one of the things we need to do is to make sure the role is complete, as complete as possible. And I'm happy to um, share with you some of the many things we're doing in that regard. Uh, I'm happy to do that tonight. I'm happy to take it on notice. But we are really focused on that issue at the moment. Um, okay. I think so you're trying we to have, get it done within the statutory time frame with a, with a sort yeah. of search so I think focus at the moment on that now. We have something like 48 partnerships in place around Australia with um, mostly Indigenous organisations to help us deliver services into the community and also to tell us what the community wants and needs. Mm. It's been a really successful model. Now, don't get me wrong, the level of Indigenous, estimated level of Indigenous enrolment isn't the same in some areas as the non-Indigenous role, and we're trying to match that gap. Mm. We've been hugely successful over the last few years. Mm. The rate of growth in the Indigenous role has outstripped the growth in the non-Indigenous role uh, to a greater extent than it's ever done previously. Now, it's not at the level we'd like it, but there's all these green shoots occurring. Good. We think this partnership model that we are pursuing is making a difference, will continue to make a difference. And in fact, we'd like to have more partnerships in place, but the pandemic has made that slightly yes. difficult, but we're working as, as hard as we can yes. to make sure that everyone understands their, their uh, responsibility to enrol. And I might just point out that before the last election, uh, we also sent, as a sort of a last you know, gasp thing to encourage people, we sent out something like 400,000 SMSs mm -hmm. around Australia to people who we thought were unenrolled, including to Indigenous Australians. And that did have an impact as well. Mm -hmm. We'll be doing the same thing at this event. I think we've done the same thing for uh, state events to help uh, state electoral commissions. Now, Senator, let's be real, it doesn't, everyone we send the text to doesn't then check their enrolment, but many people do. Yeah. So we're trying That's as many things as we can to try and make sure that people have the right to exercise the franchise. Excellent. And I will accept your offer of a bit more information yeah, on those happy to about provide. your other strategies, but I agree that's sounding really positive and um, commend you for the uh, you know, necessary additional efforts in that regard. Um, the Electoral Ledge uh, Amendment Foreign Influences and Offences Bill proposed banning foreign entities from directly incurring electoral expenditure and it increases penalties for misleading voters in relation to the casting of their vote. That was another one that just passed the Senate last week and may well have passed the House today. Has the AEC noticed an increase in misleading election materials and did you request an increase in the penalties as a way of deterring that behaviour? Um, so, sorry, Senator, as I understand the question, if you're talking about misinformation and disinformation, I, I probably would like to spend a couple of minutes I've talking about I've got a few separate questions on the misinformation as such. This is just in relation to um, the misleading as to the process of voting that that particular bill captures. Yeah, look, uh, I think probably we might bleed into some of your other questions here, Senator, but yes, we have seen an increase in, in misinformation. Now, part of this will be a subjective judgment, but if I might, I mentioned at the start tonight that we've seen on our social media pages uh, a number of, um, I'm using the term conspiracy theories, uh, about a range of things. We've seen one that's emerged uh, since the weekend about uh, postal voting. And in fact, um, if I can use that as an example, uh, we deployed, fir first step was we deployed some of our educative videos that I've uh, mentioned before. Apparently they're really good. I they are I very good, and I yet, encourage I people to, to do it. We've got a range of things, including explaining to people why don't import conspiracy theories from overseas, and a specific yeah. thing about this is the Australian election, not uh, the US election. But the postal voting one uh, was so concerning um, because of the importance of Forgive everything. Forgive me, what was the conspiracy uh, the, theory um, around postal voting? Someone said, and it gets repeated, that uh, the postal voting process isn't secure and this individual said, look, I've got no evidence, but I think it's sort of, there's something wrong, that something will happen to your vote. Oh, 
Ah, uh, the Stalin election notion, mm. right? So we were so concerned with that that we actually went to Twitter today and we pointed out to Twitter that we think that was a breach of their terms of service and they agreed and within three mm. hours they removed that information. Mm. It's also an example of, uh, I, know, I know Twitter and others get rightly criticised, but it's a shout out to them for being very responsive to remove something that was dangerous. And it's a result of the relationship building we've been doing with the social media companies over mm. a number of years. There are other conspiracies right now. Um, one that uh, doesn't seem to go away is that somehow we are mandating that voters be vaccinated and that this will deny uh, people uh, the vote. The, the one about pencils, which we mentioned before, that somehow we're erasing uh, the votes. We continue to deploy our videos to tell people that that's not the case. We are seeing an increase and we think that is in line with some of the stuff we've seen overseas, mm. which is why uh, our social media team are amongst the most assertive in the Commonwealth mm. because we think if we don't mm. deal with that information, who will? Yes, and we're trying and to protect people Australia. won't trust it unless it's coming from you. I mean, they That's might right. still not trust it, but they certainly won't trust it coming from any of us. So we're hoping they trust... Now, we're, we're being assertive and we're involved in a grand experiment here because, frankly, um, it's never been done before by Commonwealth Department. Uh, not everyone welcomes our input, Senator, as you know, because uh, Australians have the right to believe that the earth is flat and say that, and sometimes they tell us that. So we are doing as much as we can to protect Australia's uh, electoral processes. I'm very proud of the work of our social media team who are doing mm. a great job. But we are seeing an increase. Mm. Now, whether that's related simply to the increased usage of social media, you know, I'm not sure, but it, it's there. It's probably so, both, isn't it? Mm, so, uh, so anything that, any tool we get where we mm. can uh, uh, use those tools and legislation is welcomed by the AEC mm. and we'll be using that, particularly that bit that you've said, which is about the process of voting. Mm. There's a broader issue where people think the AEC has a role, in, in my terminology, uh, truth in advertising by political parties. Yes. Uh, I understand you haven't been given that power yet, although we're working on that. Uh, well, Senator... Um, be careful uh, what you wish for, Senator. I, oh, uh, no, bring it on. Look, there are... My, my pulse is just racing there a bit, Senator, as you said that, but I, I think um, there are many, many issues with that. Uh, as you know, an election is a contest of ideas, and at election time, one person's truth is another person's uh, lie. And we're very, very conscious that being involved in that process, getting between political parties, could lead mm. to the neutrality of the Electoral Commission being damaged, because if we take a stand on a particular thing... No, I don't think anyone's proposing you be the arbiter of... Oh, in that case, I think somebody else should do that. a number of different great. models. Yeah. But we are digressing a little. What I, but it's all very interesting, but I'm particularly interested in uh, the impact of that new, uh, I think, law, assuming it's passed today, um, which is about the increased penalties for misleading people as to how like, the validity of the voting yeah. process and, and whether or not when they cast their vote they do it in a way that will be lawful or not lawful. Um, did you... Uh, so there's increased penalties for that. Was that a request by the AEC to increase penalties? Uh, we've been consulted uh, through that process. Um, but uh, I, the, the exact detail of that, Senator, I'd have, to, I'd have to take on notice. We don't normally sort of comment on that legislative process, but we're broadly aware of what occurred. And in, may I say anything that deals with the rise of misinformation, disinformation? Yeah, you would welcome. Oh, I absolutely yeah. welcome. OK. Um, just sticking with that, Bill, and then I think I'm Chair, finished, Chair. Chair. Uh, we have oh. been pretty generous Yes, this is my last question. I was just saying, Senator Farrell, if you've been hanging off my every you word, you would have heard you me say no, you didn't say my it was last, last question. question. Well, it is. I've heard it here first. Uh, is sticking with that bill, is the AEC aware of any foreign entities purchasing electoral ads in Australia? I'm not aware of any foreign entity that's purchasing electoral ads at the moment. That doesn't, I'd just be very clear, Senator, that doesn't mean that's not occurring. It's just I, as the Electoral Commissioner, am not aware of that. Mm. Great, and I'm done. Thank, Thank you very you much, patience. Senator Waters. Senator Farrell. Thanks, Chair. Um, now, I'd like to um, ask some questions uh, regarding party registration requirements. And, uh, of course, you'll be aware that um, <clears throat> last year we increased the uh, number of members a party was required to have to 1,500 unless you have a representative in Parliament. Um, recently, uh, Commissioner, I'm sure you're aware, um, the country Liberal Party Senator, Senator McMahon quit that party. Very sensible decision, I have to say. Um, so the CLP no longer has uh, parliamentary representation in the federal parliament. Has the AEC contacted the CLP about whether it meets the membership requirements? 
Uh, thanks, Senator. We have contacted the CLP uh, and have discussed that with them, but I'm, given that's a matter on foot, I'm loath to go through any more detail than that, Senator, other than to say that we have contacted them. Look, I have another couple of questions about it, and you let me know whether or not you're happy to answer them. Um, media reports have suggested that the rules don't apply to associated parties, and my understanding is that the CLP is not a branch of the Liberal or the National parties, but have their own independent party. Does that mean they have to show 1,500 members? Mm. Again, I think given this matter is being looked at at the moment, I'm very nervous about actually making any further comment on that, Senator. All right. If the CLP does have to show 1,500 members, how long will that process take and will it be completed by the May election? So, to be very helpful, Senator, maybe I might talk about a process rather than the process that you're asking about. No, we're happy to do that. We can if in, interpolate to... Um, so, know, if... Uh, again, I'm not talking about the specifics of no. that issue because, again, that's a matter on foot and there'll be a number of things we have to do, but even if... Um, even if that a party was required to demonstrate they had 1,500 members, we would have to do membership testing. Uh, as a step one, that takes a significant period of... Well, I think step one is to issue a notice for a party Sorry, to provide. and they then have a... It has a legislative time frame. A legislative time frame, sorry, thank you for uh, correcting months. me. Yes. Of, of something like two months. two months to produce that list of members. Mm -hmm. Then we have to do the membership testing. That takes some time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we have to review that process uh, and then make a determination at the end of that. So we are months rather than weeks away from that process. All right. So if that process is not completed by the election and um, there's no final determination, does that mean that the, um, the uh, CLP will appear above the line on the Senate ballot paper, even though they may not meet party registration requirements? Again, because we're now talking about a specific, I'd prefer not to discuss that, Senator. All right. All right. Thank you. Now, I want to talk about um, some fundraising that the Liberal Party has uh, been doing in relation to um, <coughs> former United Kingdom uh, Prime Minister Theresa May. Um, she's been appearing uh, at a Liberal Party fundraiser as a guest uh, speaker, although I read in the uh, Australian today it wasn't too successful. They didn't get very many people to it. But I do understand that uh, Ms May is obviously a UK citizen um, and she charges up to $115,000... Sorry, £115,000 for her speaking engagements and uh, both the Victorian and the New South Wales branches of the Liberal Party are um, reportedly charging anywhere between a thousand, which seemed to be the Victorian one according to the Australian Today, and three thousand dollars a ticket, which must be the uh, must be the Sydney one. They must be more wealthy in Sydney for these sort of fundraisers, <coughs> Commissioner. Are state branches of political parties covered by the ban on foreign political donations? Uh, thank you for the... You don't have to talk about it in terms of this particular one. Well, I, I'm going to find... You can treat it in the same way... I'm going to find are. it very hard to separate this particular thing f f from the uh, actual. <laughs> so um, let, me, let me say this, though. Senator, I am aware of it after you very helpfully... <laughs> Send you a letter. Uh, sent me a letter yep. uh, pointing out that issue late on, uh, on Friday. That matter is currently being examined. I can say that our team have contacted the party uh, and have started a process... Contacted the Liberal Party? ...have started a process of looking at that matter, but I'm, I'm not prepared to make any further comment this evening on that, <coughs> given that matter is being examined at the moment. Look, I'll ask you this question in the um, generality rather than the specific. Again, you may choose not to answer it in the, for the reasons I, you've just outlined. I think I can almost predict that that will be the case, Senator, because I see where you're heading with this, but... Oh, I don't jump to any conclusions, particularly not this late at night uh, and so close to the election. Um, is a gift in kind, such as a discounted service, considered a gift under the donations framework? Mm. 
It's a, if I might say, it's a highly complex area of the law for a start, and each case turns on the individual uh, merits of the case. Mm. Who knows most about it at the table? Uh, well, we have several experts right here, but I'm, I'm going to prevent them from speaking, Senator, oh, because I'm very okay. concerned that that is going to tie into the specific case. And again, because it's being looked at, I don't want to cloud that issue as we work through. But I can tell you, Senator, in response to your very helpful letter, we have started a process. We've contacted the party and we're examining that. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the prompt way in which you've uh, dealt with it. Um, all right, I won't ask the other questions. I think I'm going to get a similar um, response. Now, I think uh, Senator Ayres sure, had a absolutely. question. Just a couple. Um, Commissioner, last year the, uh, the Commission found that Mr Lamming had breached authorisation laws um, by failing to authorise Facebook pages 35 pages, remarkably, um, all pretending to be community group pages that contain political material critical of the Labor Party. I understand the Commission has now lodged um, proceedings in the Federal Court about one of those um, one of those sites. I expect that you can't comment on the case, but. Can, can you tell us what stage the matter's up to? Mm. I might start, and then the Deputy Commissioner might add, and I'm very conscious that we'll have to be careful. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to We, we are so. well advanced, uh, and yes. I mean very well advanced on that process. Uh, and as a result of uh, very hard work by our team, but the Deputy Commissioner might want to add to that. Well, I'm just not sure how much I can add to that, Senator. Um, well, what, what, what can you tell me about what stage it's up to? Uh, the Commissioner says very, very well advanced. Its application's been lodged. Yes. Um, no, no hearing at this stage. A hearing date's been set. Not yet. No, we're, but we think we're in the final stages. I think a hearing date, just to be accurate, Senator. I think a hearing in March. Uh, a preliminary hearing has been established for early March. But no sense of how long evidence might take to be adduced in front of the court. So it's a preliminary hearing date, and those matters are yet to be determined. Is that yes, right? Senator. Um, is this the first time the Commission has taken court action in relation to authorisations? With a civil penalty? Yes, Senator. Under the, under the new... Under the new provisions, With the new yes. civil penalty regime, yes, that is. And what's the maximum penalty? Hmm. Might get the Chief Legal Officer to pop up, Senator, if you don't Thank mind. Thank you. It's good that he gets to have a go, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so it's 120 penalty units uh, for a breach, um, which then you know, it goes to court and you determine how many breaches, if, if the court agrees that there's been breaches. And I think we calculated that a previous estimate about 24, 26,000 thereabouts. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Senator Smith has questions, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, I'd like to talk about mobile polling in aged care mm. homes. Um, I understand you'll be providing mobile polling in some aged care homes, but residents of others will need to vote by postal vote or attend a polling place. Given so many aged care homes are locked down and there's a staffing crisis, how do you intend to facilitate mobile polling within them? So, th thanks, Senator. As you know, at each election we have a large number of teams who go around to particularly aged care homes and provide in-person voting services at those homes. We certainly don't want to turn this into a super spreader event. So we're working with state health authorities and indeed those aged care homes about how they would, excuse me, prefer to be given the vote. Um, and we've, they've started to write back to us. Some have said that they, they, they can't accept mobile polling. Others have said uh, that they would still like that and they think we can do it in a way that's you know safe uh, for the residents. At all times, the safety of those residents is utmost in our minds, and in fact, the safety of our own teams. Where we can't get into those homes, we are adopting a model that we used during the two by-elections, where we're working closely with the aged care homes to make sure the residents of the aged care homes, if they can, are registered as general postal voters. 
for those that are not uh, infirm and they can still leave, they might still care to leave and vote uh, in person. But we will make sure that we're working very, very closely with each of those aged care homes to make sure that no one misses out on the vote. Commissioner, we know across the country we have aged care homes which are so overwhelmed that residents are missing out on food and water, they're not getting the medical care that they need. Have you encountered any aged care facilities that have said they just aren't in a position to assist with mobile polling? I might ask the National Election Manager to pop up, but I would say that there's almost definitely aged care homes that have said their preference is not to receive mobile polling uh, at this stage. And Senator, I know you'll understand when I say this, I'm not making a comment on the initial part of your question, but just for whatever reason, the aged care home will say to us, we would prefer not to have mobile polling. Uh, yes, that's uh, correct. The, um, the engagement with uh, uh, residential aged care facilities has been, uh, is your preference, uh, would you be able to support um, our teams attending? And we outline the risk mitigations we have in place, which is a, a range of PPE, our temporary staff being vaccinated, other mitigating measures to make it a safe experience, uh, only visiting one um, establishment per day. Um, and having our teams trained in COVID safe measures. Uh, and then we offer, um, put it to the establishment essentially for them to make a judgment on whether they're comfortable with our teams um, attending uh, or not. And, and then the, they fi the final layer, of course, if, whether there's a health order in place that prevents that from occurring in any case. So there's a range of things we consider. Correct. And uh, the, so we have a, a current footprint of the, um, a number that we will we'll be attending, but of course we'll need to liaise with those establishments uh, on election announcement to confirm that they're still willing for us to attend. Right. And how, how would that look different to say at the 2019 election? I mean, beyond COVID, we've got a, well, COVID has amplified a crisis in aged care. So in terms of the, the the facilities that you reached out to at the last election compared to now, what sort of trends are you seeing in terms of which facilities are able to help um, facilitate or incorporate mobile polling on site? So uh, there will be fewer facilities willing to have people attend to undertake polling um, due to the pandemic. Uh, but we're still confident that our service will be able to uh, ensure that electors are able to cast their vote. In addition to the, uh, the strategies that the Commissioner has outlined, we will have support cells dedicated in all of our state offices around the country to be in contact with facilities that have opted not to have mobile polling teams so that we're offering service on the phone, support to, um, to ensure electors are comfortable casting their postal vote. And in the instance that an aged care home is locked down at the last minute after you've already arranged for a mobile polling visit um, to take place and that isn't able to happen, what happens then? So we have, uh, I guess you'd call them business continuity measures that we would, uh, we would make arrangements with the establishment to uh, urgently get postal voting material to them to support electors having their say. Uh, the, the timing of mobile polling means that it, it will be, um, we will know that before the postal vote cutoff, so we'll be able to make arrangements locally to get postal votes in as a matter of urgency and support um, right. the facility to do that. And look, some residents are likely to need assistance casting a postal vote, so how confident are you that residents of aged care homes who need to complete a postal vote will be able to do so? And I'm particularly concerned, I mean, we've been hearing reports of facilities being short-staffed. We know that in some instances, instances families aren't able to visit because of lockdowns or other issues. So what happens to these residents where that help isn't necessarily available? I might answer to start with, and Dr uh, Gleeson can correct my uh, evidence, but it's one of the reasons why we have a very close liaison with those aged care homes so that they understand the importance of the act of voting uh, and we'll be spending time with them before the event to make sure that they do understand that residents will need that support. We'll be providing whatever support and materials we possibly can to ensure that the residents of those uh, aged care homes can exercise the franchise. Are you concerned about aged care residents missing out? Look, Senator, we're always concerned if anyone misses out. It's one of the reasons we go the extra mile into uh, disadvantaged communities, into aged care homes and a whole range of other uh, measures that we take to make sure that people are supported. Of course, I wish it wasn't a pandemic and we could get in there and do what we normally do, but we are trying to come up with a solution that's a best fit for the situation. I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to work with health authorities and those aged care homes to produce a solution that works. Um, 
go to some questions. Uh, Senator Waters, I think, covered most of our questions on issues relating to remote polling. Um, I just want to take you to, uh, in looking at the electoral roll, I know that there are over 17 million people on the electoral roll, and that's a good achievement. The AEC should be congratulated for that. I'm interested, percentage-wise, how that compares to the enrolment rate for the past election, the mm. 2019 election. So we ticked over to over 17 million electors in December of last year, and that's the first time in Australia's history uh, that we've managed to do that. And it, it's a huge effort by the AEC, and really is something, it's kind of a modern democratic miracle. We never thought we would get to the sort of level of uh, completeness of the electoral roll that we have. So at the moment, in, in December of last year, 17 million voters equaled about 96.2% completeness of the electoral roll. The, the last election, we just hit, uh, at the close of rolls period, 97% uh, completeness. So a lower number, but you know, greater proportion. But a, a couple of things on that. First of all, the biggest spur to people completing their enrolment is the announcement of the election. So there's always a huge rush uh, of, of people enrolling at that last minute. So we, we're very confident that that will increase. Uh, secondly, we've put on the roll an additional 600,000 citizens between 2019 and where we are at the moment. So it's this huge effort of, of a great increase in the number of citizens on the roll. We're hoping that increases again. We are chasing that 600,000. We're urging people to check their enrolment, make sure they're enrolled. We'll be doing, uh, particularly when the election is announced, we do a series of public awareness campaigns. The first one of those is to make sure that you're enrolled. And again, we're, we're confident that the role will be even better shaped by the time the election occurs. I understand you've started contacting around half a million people who are potentially yes. unenrolled. Yes. Is that because you're aiming to, to match that rate of the 2019 election? We are so. really pushing to get that done. And it makes us very happy when people enrol. It makes us very sad when they don't. So that's something we're looking at. We, and we really will be running a large scale campaign centre right the way up to the election for people to check their enrolment details. Oh, yeah. It's been a while since I've done statistics, so can you tell me how many more people would you need to enrol to match that rate of 97%? Senator, likewise, a little while since I've uh, done that, but I think um, we might have to take that on notice so I don't make yeah, an I error. I don't trust my statistics, yeah. Senator. Senator, I can say, um, would you like a little bit of data? Yes, Mr Pope. Um, so in, in 2016, uh, sorry, in 2019, we had 16.4 million enrolled for the 2019 election out of an eligible population of 16.9 million. So that was an enrolment rate of 97%. We currently have, as the Commissioner said, an enrolment rate of just over 17 million, 17 million and 32,000, which at the end of December represents 96.9 3% of the eligible population, given the population growth. So we, to get to the 2019 level, we do need an extra 0.7%. And do you know how many? I'm trying to do that math <laughs> as I'm talking. And um, is it if you 70,000 or 700,000? No, it can't be 700,000. No, it'll, it'll be it'll be 70,000. Ish. I think we're going to check that figure. <laughs> We've got a finance minister at the table. Can you do that? <laughs> well, I wouldn't trust his figures. <laughs> I, uh, um, he can't I, I, I was just observing in terms of that that doesn't sound like very many to reach when you think about people's motivations in that early week or two of an election campaign. Yeah. Yes, so I think we might we might just confirm yeah, that figure be for very you, Senator. Keen to get rid of this government. Uh, well, Senator, I wouldn't comment on that, sure. but we, as you know, Senator, as we've discussed before, electoral administration officials love landslides. We don't care for which side. It just <laughs> makes our job easier. Oh, well, yeah. So um, it's a process, the more people on the roll. So, hey. I'm sure we'll all be working towards that goal in our own way. Um, <laughs> Commissioner, a news.com.au article from February 5th says that fewer young people are enrolled to vote now than they were at the 2019 election. What's the current youth enrolment rate? I'll get the deputy or uh, the national election manager to give you the figures, but I might just go back on what I said last time. Uh, we find that youth enrolment really does bump up in those last couple of weeks before the close of rolls. It acts as a real spur for young people to enrol. 
uh, even though it's not quite at the same level it was at in 2019, it really is at a high level historically. We're very pleased with the amount of youth enrolment. Of course, we'd love it to be, you know, great. It's a whole range of things uh, about youth enrolment. Interestingly, one of the bits of research internationally shows that if young people enrol for their first election, they are more likely to become lifelong voters. So it's important for young people to get on the roll. We do a number of reach outs into the community to engage with young Australians and we'll be continuing to do that in the lead up to the close of roles. But the actual... So the uh, youth enrolment rate at the end of December was 84.4 per cent, Senator. Uh, youth enrolment at the 2019 federal election, so after the close of role, was the highest it had ever been at 88.8 per cent. And we're confident, given what the Commissioner has outlined, um, that the, uh, that youth tend to, we, we know the data tells us you tend to enrol at that close of roles when, um, when it's more prevalent and more front of mind. We're confident that we can, we can meet that target. Senator, can I just perhaps also contextualise that the 2019 federal election youth enrolment rate benefited from the enrolment that occurred from the same-sex marriage survey, mm. where we saw a significant increase in younger Australians enrolling to vote for that particular event mm -hmm. and that particular issue. Uh, and we're hoping to you know, retain or attract back those people if they've slid off the roll, obviously. Okay. Um, uh, perhaps, Dr Gleeson, are you able to provide a breakdown of the enrolment rate for each age group between 18 and 24? So for 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds? Uh, we could, and we'd take that on notice. That'd be great. So could you do that in terms of the current youth enrolment rate and also um, I'm, I'm sure you have at hand Comparing those figures for 2019. Certainly, yeah, certainly. And can you, uh, you've mentioned that your part of your engagement strategy on enrolling young people is around sort of that targeting close to the election, but can you just talk me through any other strategies you're undertaking to help boost the youth enrolment rate? Mm. We, uh, I mean, we target a youth cohort th specifically through some of our mainstream advertising and also social media work. In fact, it's one of the reasons we're on social media to remain engaged with young Australians. Uh, and also to make sure that people like me don't use social media, you know, because it needs to be in the language that young people understand. So we do that. Uh, we have specific uh, campaigns that we run. We partner with youth organisations as well, and we're continually looking for partners that we can use. Uh, we use, uh, as I mentioned, mainstream media um, activities. We also try and use champions where we can as well, who might be relevant for the particular audience. That's very important. Um, and you might care to add to that as well. And the only other thing I might mention is that we've also slightly adjusted the internal um, business rules for our FDEU, Federal Direct Enrolment Update process, uh, now that we have access to very reliable data on um, people turning 18. So we've, we've made some slight adjustments that should see that youth enrolment rate increase also. So are any additional resources going into this? Uh, additional, uh, well, we're pretty comfortable with the approach we've got, Senator. We, we think we're tapping the market pretty well. Uh, and we've got a very comprehensive and, and, in fact, quite sophisticated approach, particularly during that period in the lead up to the rolls, uh, where you know we're effective. And I think the results at 2019 demonstrate that the approach that we're taking is working, and we're going to continue to do that. But, um, Mr. Pope mentioned that the the enrolment sparked by the, the same enrolment sex, drive, yeah. Yeah, sparked by the, the same-sex marriage vote. Uh, but also our methods have increased, our methods have improved, including our use of social media amongst other tools as well. So we are very confident. We have a community engagement team as well that are very good in this space, yeah. uh, because it's, you know it can be a mistake, Senator, to just lump youth together because there are some specific issues mm. with called youth, Indigenous youth, and we do try and look at all of those categories to make sure that we are encouraging people to enrol. Do you collect data on on that as well in terms of the enrolment rate across those different? We we do, but I just point out their estimates because we don't ask people about mm. their status on the roll, about whether they're Indigenous and non-Indigenous. We use a number of other data sources to help us assess what it looks like. So anything we provide, we, we, it's good, but it's an estimate. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the Indigenous enrolment rate, can you tell me what the current rate is? Yes, uh, Senator, or well, the estimated rate. Um, for 2021 was 79.3 per cent, which was an increase of 1.3 per cent from 2020. And how much money has been allocated for an Indigenous enrol to vote campaign for this coming election? I'll have to take that on notice, Senator, because there's actually many strands to that. We've got our, we've got our 
community international engagement team, our Indigenous engagement people, we've got partnerships and we've also got our overarching uh, partnership with NITV, for instance, uh, Indigenous Radio, and then our overarching um, uh, advertising campaign for the election. So I'd, I'd have to take that on notice and do my best to try and draw those threads together. There's a, obviously a, a considerable gap between the Indigenous mm. enrolment rate and the enrolment rate of the broader population. I know your target for the broader population is 97%. Do you have a target specifically in terms of the Indigenous enrolment rate of a point you'd like to reach for this election? Uh, well, you know, broadly, not for this election. We'd love it if the estimated mm. rate of Indigenous enrolment was exactly the same as the general rate of enrolment. That's, that's our long term. Or even better. Or even better. That's correct, Senator. That's our long term aim. And it's why we started in 2013, Senator, looking at other ways of engaging Indigenous communities. So we, we think what we were doing previously, in fact, I might just preface this, there's no criticism of any previous member of the AEC. Everyone's been doing their best and working out how to do this, so it's very important that I make that statement. But in 2013, we started a partnership model and experimenting with different ways of engaging with Indigenous communities. And it's what's led us to the current state where we've got, as I mentioned before, 48 partnerships around Australia with a number of other organisations that are assisting us in that process. It's also why we, why we go the extra mile in creating in-language materials for Indigenous communities. And I think I mentioned before, um, we'll be translating much of our campaign material into about 18 different languages. Also, on top of that, there will be some verbal and non-written languages that we're translating into as well we are working with those community groups to make sure uh, that they are able to exercise the franchise. And I, I say this carefully as a positive, not as a, a negative, but as a group, we spend more time looking at that single group of voters than any other single group of voters in Australia. And it's based on need because there's that gap. We're doing as much as we possibly can uh, to ensure that Indigenous Australians have the same, op same opportunities. So it's a long-term body of work. I think, as I mentioned before, in many ways, the estimated growth, no, let me rephrase that, the rate of growth in the estimated Indigenous role has outstripped mm. consistently over the last few years the rate of gro growth in the non-Indigenous role, which is great. So we're, we're seeing all of those green shoots, and in some cases, that's been significantly outstripped. So we're very conscious of that. Uh, it also shows we're on top of that the role isn't just growing in, in the, the estimated rate of Indigenous enrolment isn't just growing in line with their population growth, it's exceeding the population growth in that community as well. So we're focused on that, we're looking at the data, uh, we're coming up with ways of working with those communities. Before COVID hit us, uh, the Deputy was involved in a number of community meetings in a number of, uh, in, with a number of Indigenous groups uh, in various parts of Australia that got truncated because of COVID and we're going to continue that. Uh, after the election, mm -hmm. and we'll be continuing a very solid focus on this issue. Thank you, Commissioner. I just have a few questions relating to misinformation. Um, I know you, you answered some questions on this topic more broadly with Senator Waters, and that the AEC is working hard to combat misinformation and disinformation as it relates to the election process. Um, all of us here have seen very recently with the anti-vax protest which took place at, at Parliament House, that there is an increased anti-government sentiment that could have a flow-on impact or effect on the election. Have these protests and this sort of sentiment that we've seen over the past weeks in Canberra caused you to invest more resources in this area or look at this differently? We were aware of this in any case, Senator. We've been preparing uh, for this event in this particular area for quite some time. I mean, like everybody, we saw what occurred overseas. I, I don't want to mention particular jurisdictions, but it's obvious what we're talking about, other, other large democracies, where there was a large-scale um, misinformation and disinformation campaign. So for the first time ever, uh, we have created a thing that we're calling our reputation management strategy, because we think what happened in part overseas was the collapse of the reputation of the electoral system based on misinformation and disinformation. So where we see those sorts of things here, and we've seen uh, a lot of it, we are taking action. Now, as to the protesters on the weekend, it would be wrong of me to criticise individuals or, or, or to become involved in making a judgement call. 
we do note that there were some pretty outrageous conspiracy theories about the election at some of those rallies. And the, the reason we know that is other citizens have provided some video clips to us, including a wild one uh, about Dominion voting machines. I don't know whether you know, the US Dominion thing, there was a, a speaker at the crowd that kept repeating this over and over again that the AEC is using Dominion voting machines and that in some way there's some sort of secret going on and the election's going to be stolen. Uh, and that's also been repeated on some of our social media pages, which is very disappointing. And again, we're batting that back as much as we can. I've mentioned some of the other ones this evening. We've even got on our video AUC TV page, we even have um, the, a video about Dominion voting machines. Also, uh, because we want people to think about this, we're rerunning at the election our Stop and Consider campaign, which we ran in 2019. So, that's designed to help citizens think about the source of information. We think that was successful. We got over 50 million social media impressions at the last event from that campaign. We got 100,000 click-throughs to the website and many thousands of downloads of the information. We'll be running that even more fulsomely at this event. And we're really focused on the issue of misinformation, disinformation, particularly when it comes to the electoral system and the integrity of that process. So we, we have been preparing for that for quite a while. I'm really proud of the work that the staff have done. Sorry for doing this, but it's an important community message as well. I've mentioned before, uh, this is the first election at which we have a, a proper command and control centre. We will be monitoring a range of issues, including social media. Uh, we're using various social media monitoring tools to help us help citizens understand uh, the, the electoral process. Plus, uh, most importantly, we have the Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force which is a group of other government entities, including security agencies, that are assisting us with the election. The board for that is co-chaired by the Deputy Commissioner and the Department of Finance. Uh, many of those will be co-located with us at election time, and they'll be helping us in that regard as well. So we, we've done a whole range of things where we're looking at the environment, we are uh, watching what's occurring, and we think we are in a, the best position we've ever been to be able to respond to some of that. Mm. Can I ask, what sort of progress have you made on reaching agreement with social media companies about taking disinformation and misinformation down? So, Senator, I used an example before today where Twitter removed something at our request within three hours. And in fact, there's a couple of other things that they're looking at at the moment, and we expect that they'll remove uh, some of that as well. So that's a good example. I think I had mentioned to this committee previously that I had hoped that by now we would also have a formal protocol in place with the industry body, Digi, that sits, uh, you know, well, it doesn't sit on top of it, it's the industry body for the social media companies. That protocol, we had hoped, would not just be a protocol for the uh, AEC, but also for all the state, territory, and the New Zealand Electoral Commission as well, so that's a collective approach. We haven't quite got there. We're still negotiating with Digi and the social media companies, but our individual relationship mm -hmm. with those social media companies has been pretty good. Uh, there's examples, Senator, from the last election where there was information online that did not necessarily breach the Electoral Act, but we felt was confusing to voters, but did breach the terms of service for those social media companies. Uh, at least one famous occasion, we asked them to remove that material, and they did. So we are, the relationships are good. I think at the last election, if I, if I go too far with this, I'll be corrected, but I think we were the first commission in the world that took the time to go and meet uh, all of those social media companies. Um, Mr Pope, uh, people from the Department of Communications and others went and met the social media companies, including Tencent, uh, the holding company for um, WeChat. WeChat, and you know, we went to whatever, wherever you went to, Mr Pope? Shenzhen. There we go. Uh, and met with them to explain the process, so we're pretty comfortable with where we're heading with those social media companies, even though I would have preferred to have a more formal protocol in place. Look, this is just my last question on this topic. I can feel the chair's eyes bearing down on me. Um, you mentioned that you had one case where Twitter took down something after three hours, but in reality, in an election period during an election campaign, when we suspect that there will be significant amounts of misinformation and disinformation online, how quickly can you expect that you will be able to act to make sure that these false claims are removed, and specifically that they're removed before people vote, either in person, in their postal votes at pre-collect? 
Um, Mr Pope might uh, talk about that, but I, I, I'd also point out that, generally speaking, that at particularly at election time, the social media companies have been relatively responsive. Mm. But I'm very conscious of what you've just said, because once something's up, it's seen mm. and then can be spread. But Mr Pope, you might. Senator, we have a very close relationship with all the social media companies, and we meet with them very regularly at various levels. And, um, and they are very responsive. And it's, that's been a particular area of focus for us. And at election time, uh, as many of them did last time, however, for this election, uh, we're getting assurances from all of them that they will be uh, expanding their hours of service, including having uh, not just expanded hours of service here in Australia, but then actually having staff in other parts of the world so that they can try and get as close to 24 by 7 coverage so they're not confined by the business hours of their staff here in Australia. So for instance, some of them have staff here in Australia, they have a regional office in Singapore, then they have another office in Europe, and they'll be effectively following the sun um, uh, as we go through the election to try and get as ma maximum coverage as possible. There's one, one twist with that, Senator, about taking stuff down, just a, a, a cautionary note for us. With the nature of some of these conspiracies, when they're actually removed, it actually encourages further conspiracies about the removal of the conspiracy <laughs> and it can become very circular. So you need to exercise some judgment about how we deal with those issues. Thank you. Senator, I have an answer to one of your earlier questions, okay. along with a bit of performance feedback for myself, which indicates that I'm rightly the Deputy Electoral Commissioner and not the Deputy at the ABS, because I don't understand stats clearly. Uh, I'm advised that we would require 127,000 electors to reach the 97 per cent enrolment rate for this election. Well, Mr Pope, your confidence meant we never had to call on the Finance Minister to do the math and testing skills, so I'm sure he'll be thanking you. I appreciate you bringing that back, and that's all for thank me. You so thank you so much. Senator Ayres. Uh, thank you. I'll resist jokes about the Finance Minister's um, modelling and staff. It's been a long day. The, um, Senator Ayres. The, uh, I just want to ask a couple of quick questions about uh, the electoral funding and disclosure reforms. Um, I understand that for the 2019 election, Senator Hanson's One Nation was required to pay back $165,000 or so. Um, was this the result of a routine compliance review or was it because it became, the Commission became aware of it because they had already rejected um, One Nation's initial claim? Um, as you mentioned, Senator, as uh, Ms Reid comes up, that was a brand new yes. uh, scheme in place with the requirement for parties to produce receipts for you know, a certain amount of the funding, etc. And I do know there were some issues, but Ms Reid, do you rec recollect them? Yes, yes, Senator. So because it was a new scheme, we made the decision to do a compliance review of all election funding oh, claims. So yes. it was part of a routine compliance review that that was detected. And, and why was it found that there was an overpayment? Was was it because the the items weren't electoral expenditure, or because the ex, the electoral expenditure that had been claimed had not been incurred? I'd prefer not to go into the detail of exactly why the notice that we published set out that it was either of those criteria that was not met. I see. We might come back to you on notice on that question. I, I just haven't Certainly been advised so. as to whether or not. In fact, if I could just put that question on notice, and you might we'll come back. Tell to us, second. yes, yes. Um, has the money been paid back by Ms. Hanson or by Senator Hanson? Yes, it has. Uh, there is an enforceable undertaking. I understand for future claims. What are the terms of that undertaking? Uh, so the undertaking essentially states that if that offence is repeated, then we can take Senator Hans take the party to court if the offence is repeated. Uh, any penalties applied? Not at this stage. So the enforceable undertaking is in lieu of penalties? Correct. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Ayres, and thank you so much to the AEC for coming thank along you. tonight and for answering our questions. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank Thanks, the Minister and all of the officers who have appeared before the committee today and provided us evidence. I'd also like to think, thank Hansard and Broadcasting for their assistance. And I now declare this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks.